Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1 Beyond the waves and crashes of the narrow sea, on an island of barren rocks and old dragon gargoyles facing the sea. The highborn lords and ladies of Dragonstone were celebrating it was a joyous occasion for such a celebration on this day. The day was to be cherished because members of House Florent had prideful and self-righteous they were the ones throwing the celebrations in the first place. There were many foods imported from the Reach and some from the Stormlands to enjoy the festivities. Inside the castle of Dragonstone, the banners of House Florent and House Baratheon were waving proudly through the winds. The reasons for the celebrations were for Lady Celis and Lord Stannis they had produced a trueborn Baratheon boy, an heir. This meant an advancement for House Florent, having a boy who had ancient blood of House Gardner. Most of the nobles around the island never thought the Lord and Lady of Dragonstone will have a son the Seven had blessed them with good fortunes. The cashing of the waves at sea were drowned out by the music playing through the hallow castle walls, there were few singers playing music which graded the Lord of Dragonstone himself. Such music and songs were only common to the nobility of the South, whom cherished the songs of chivalry and courtly love. Lady Celis was in her bedchambers cradling her newborn son in her arms he had blue eyes and black hair, as there was nothing florent about her son, he was all Baratheon. She was smiling, as she had done her duty to her husband to give him a son to take after him. The Lady of Dragonstone was welcoming of her florent relatives, as they were celebrating her son's birth and being brought into the world. Celis had her own special little boy to love and to care for she knew she will be able to give her husband other children in the future. My lady. You should join the festivities. Her uncle Axel had appeared at the doors of the bedchambers. Her uncle and most of the Florent relatives were staying on the island, only at Celis' behest to have some kind of family around her. I would like to spend a few more moments with my son, Uncle Celis replied sternly, there is nothing Florent in him. It doesn't matter you have a son and an heir. I'm glad that day is finally here. The rest of our house sends their good fortunes to you from Brightwater Keep. Even my foolish cousin Delena, whom had spoiled my wedding bed and spawned a idiot. The gods are smiling on you, it doesn't matter, and it was their crime, not yours. Celis cooed at her son, as her uncle smiled at her. Doesn't he look sweet? So solemn and silent. What have you named him? I have thought of naming him after Lord Stannis's father, but he is not receptive of having his children being named for the dead. Have you thought of a name? Jacob. Lord Stannis had liked the name when we discussed it. I will ask the servants to bring food to your chambers. He hardly cries he is sound asleep. She said, with her uncle exiting the bedchambers. The woman had developed a dislike of her foolish cousin Delena, who had spoiled her wedding bed to Lord Stannis for her own selfish desires. As a result of such dishonor, Delena was to be married off to some hedge knight to pay for her shame, to be married off and out of her father's way. She felt a lot of affection and love for the son she had borne. The boy may have been conceived from duty but he will be raised with love. She should have thought of that before she stupidly soiled my wedding bed with the king. The babe in her arms was silent and fast asleep. Her son Jacob was in the image of his father, as he had nothing florent about him. No sharp nose or large ears, as he was all Baratheon in looks. Celis had felt some pride in knowing, she had done her duty to give her husband a son. A son, who could take after his father and further the Baratheon bloodline for the future. Celis was fortunate that her son didn't inherit the known ugliness of the members of her family, which the lords and ladies of the South mocked them for. The Lady of Dragonstone sensed it in her heart her little boy would grow up to be someone special. My son will be a great man I know he will make me and his father proud one day. Her boy will grow up to be an honorable and dutiful young man, who will make his house proud and take his rightful place as the rightful Lord of Dragonstone and Storm's End. Chapter 2 Young Jacob Baratheon had become older brother to Shireen, who was a sweet little girl, who was cursed the grey scale it didn't matter to him, because he loved his little sister no matter what the lords and ladies whispered about her. Jacob was close to his father Stannis, as he had the Baratheon colouring of the midnight black hair and the sapphire blue eyes, with nothing of the features from House Florent. 
His father would teach him all the lessons he needed, in order to learn how to be a competent lord and an honorable man. The young man had sought out companionship from his grey stallion named Misty, as it was a gift from his uncle Robert on his eighth name day. The horse had always had been a friend in the young boy's life, as Shireen loved the horse also, it made Jacob feel happy to know he made his little sister smile. When it had been time for young Jacob to foster with another highborn lord. To his father's misfortunate his king uncle sent him away to Highgarden to foster with the Tyrells in order for his uncle to pacify relations with the Reach, much to the fury of his mother and father. His mother's house the Florence were livid at such a proclamation, due to the fact they thought they had more rights to the seat of Highgarden because of their ancient blood ties to House Gardner. And they didn't want the Tyrells to poison Jacob's young mind with their schemes and plots. Jacob found his mother's side of the family to be strange people, who were always unhappy and something to gripe about, but he was close to his mother Celis in terms of being able to comfort her through the sadness of the unfortunate stillborns and miscarriages. The young man noticed his father Stannis's silent contempt for his uncle Robert, but he was king and he had to do his duty and let his only son be fostered to earn his knighthood through doing his duties and bring honor to his house. When Jacob had traveled to High Garden, he was amazed by how fertile, luscious the lands of the Reach were, and how prosperous the region has been throughout the centuries and it was the heart of the South. At first, the young man was frightened, at the prospect of being so far away from home and in the region, of a great house, whom his father called Lannisters with roses. Jacob knew this could be where he makes his own name, other than being his father's son. The immediate members of House Tyrell made his fostering pleasant as Jacob got to keep company with Willis, Garlin, Marjorie and their extended cousins in Highgarden, having many other friends in the Reach, despite being his father's son. Jacob had the opportunity to take his lessons with Maester Lomais along with the main Tyrell children, as he excelled in history, geographics, and numbers, trained in various songs and learned all his history of the Seven Kingdoms. The young boy excelled in his swordplay, as he was deadly with a blade from his training at Horn Hill, he also learned how to sail from his visits to Old Town. In some moments, Jacob would always hide away in the Tyrell library with his nose stuck in a book, as he focused more on scholarly studies and learning about politics and war strategy from the old ages ago. Jacob would studying alongside his comely friend Willis. Jacob developed closeness with the crippled heir to Highgarden, as Jacob strived to be knowledgeable and improve his mind, and not be like the fools of his mother's house. Grown into manhood. Years later, Jacob had grown to be a gruff and unfriendly to some people of the Reach, but a few selected individuals, who were smart enough not to perpetrate their own stupidity and foolishness. He had become a man of five and ten with longish, midnight black hair to his shoulders, tied in a simple ponytail, his sapphire blue eyes reflected the stillness in his gaze towards those whom look upon him. The young man quite tall with his slender, strong build, due to him being good with a sword and a fluid warrior. Jacob had grown into a well-rounded young man, under the tutelage of the Tyrells he had learned his courtesies and manners from Lady Allery and had learned how to play Sivas with Lord Mace. Who was eager to please his uncle Robert, as he made Jacob stay in Highgarden very welcoming. The young man knew of the great game, the game the highborn of great houses in the Seven Kingdoms play. The Game of Thrones was a play for alliances, power, wealth and the Iron Throne. For Jacob, it was like Sivas, but with more players, than the limited set of Sivas pieces. And the stakes were higher. The young man had learned the importance of the game, learning from Lady Olena Tyrell, Lord Mace's mother during his stay in High Garden and his revisits. The woman had given him wise counsel and taught him the real truths behind why the High Lords play this game. Jacob understood what it took to move up the game board, even if there was betrayal, bloodshed and family bonds to consider when playing the game. At times, he was hesitant in being sent to court, as it was the cesspool of corruption and deceit in the Seven Kingdoms, but his uncle was king and his cousins were the royal children, so it was important for him to visit sometimes. Jacob often clashed with his cousin Joffrey, who in all accounts was a spoiled, weak and pompous boy, who was going to be the future king of the Seven Kingdoms. Gods help us when that fool ascends the throne. Jacob had thought in his mind, he is still young, but a young mind can be easily manipulated. Jacob thought he was destined for more than just being a high lord maybe there was something else in his future which could make him a powerful player in the Game of Thrones. Chapter 3 
Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone and Master of Ships to his brother King Robert was staying on Dragonstone, a barren place of rocks and dragon gargoyles, it was not what he wanted for his undying loyalty to his older brother. He was the rightful Lord of Storm's End, the Baratheon stronghold, as it was his by rights and his was to be passed down to his only trueborn son Jacob, from his marriage to Celis Florent. The middle Baratheon had done his duty to the Florent woman, the one Robert decided he married to secure ties within the reach they had actual blood relations to the old house gardener to put the Tyrells in their place. Stannis had not seen his son, since he returned from Highgarden he loathed Robert for selling his son to whom he called Lannisters with roses, because he was afraid Lord Mace would use the boy, as a pawn in his own game. The game of hard for Stannis, knowing snooping around court with Lord John Arryn would result in death, as there were more Lannister loyalists, than Baratheon ones in King's Landing. Stannis had been sitting around the chamber of the painted table he was trying to think of his next game plan because the events coming will turn out for the worst. Stannis was seething through his teeth when Robert suggested his only son needed to be wed and soon. Jacob was a headstrong boy, who didn't like being commanded into what to do, but he will be willing to do his duty when it mattered the most. He is being sent to Winterfell ahead of the royal court to stay with the Starks. Stannis loathed Eddard Stark, for being the brother Robert loved more than him and Renly. He didn't want Jacob gone from him, but it was the king's command, as Jacob needed to forge a friendship with Ned Stark's heir Rob, as a wish fulfillment. The Lord was adamant in commanding Jacob back, as Robert was right about one thing. Jacob was unmarried and needed a wife, but Renly was the Lord of Storm's End and still unmarried, which questioned Renly's suitability to even find a wife. His wife Celis was with Shireen, his daughter cursed with grayscale. Stannis was equal to the love he gave to both his children, as he knew Jacob and Shireen will be important in the says coming into the game. Stannis wed Celis out of duty in his brother's command, but he didn't love her that much, but after Jacob was born, he showed more affection towards his wife, which improved their relationship and ability to communicate with each other. The Lord of Dragonstone had no interest in his wife's devotion to the Red God, as he himself was not a religious man, but the Seven did give him a trueborn son, that can take over his duties when he dies and will be a good lord. The old and wise Maester Cresson was passing by Stannis had admiration for the man, who took the responsibility in raising him, Robert and Renly when their mother and father had died in Shipwreck Bay. Stannis had no understood why the Maester followed him to Dragonstone, as it was his duty to serve Renly, as the Lord of Storm's End. He welcomed the elder man's counsel, he suggested finding Jacob was suitable bride from a great house, but Stannis knew Robert would betroth his son Joffrey to Ned Stark's daughter, along with appointing him as Hand of the King. There were other young ladies suitable for his son, but Stannis wanted to wait until he, Celis and Jacob were together, to make such an important decision of his son's life. Stannis knew what Lord Aaron was planning, he caught wind of the truth of his brother's children not being fathered by his brother at all but were bastards born of incest between the Lannister twins whom one of them being Robert's hateful wife and the other a kingslayer. If this was the truth, then Jacob would also be heir to the Iron Throne by rights, as Stannis would be the rightful king after his brother. He had seen Maester Crescent enter the chambers, as he was growing very old and will need a replacement soon but he was dutiful and gave good counsel. I see you miss your son, my lord. The Maester suggested, he could see it in Stannis's solemn face. Why did he have to go he should be here? Stannis replied in a scowl. Your brother, his grace commanded it. At least, it gets him to stop socializing with the crippled Tyrell boy. There is no harm in forming an alliance with the Starks. It's one of Robert's wish fulfillments he wants to unite House Baratheon and House Stark together, along with securing a good match for Jacob. Lord Jacob has been fifteen name days pass and has not been wed yet. It's difficult to find a match, as my son is more like me in personality. Negotiations with House Tyrell will benefit. No. The man starved me for a year and I will give him my son to manipulate, no. My lord, Jacob needs to marry soon you and the Lady Celis cannot protect him from duty. You are right. Jacob is willing to do his duty, but the game will tear him apart. You underestimate your son, my lord. His fostering in Highgarden would have given him lessons on how to play the game. Jacob is my only son since I cannot have any more with my wife. 
It's most unfortunate, my lord, but Jacob and Shireen are good children. They can further the Baratheon line and gain suitable matches. I would suggest arranging a betrothal between Shireen and Lord Robert Aaron. Why? The boy is sickly and may not see manhood. He is John Aaron's only heir, as sickly as he may be. There were plans to let the boy foster with me, but his mother rejected those plans. You cannot blame Lady Aaron, as she is newly a widow. The game still goes on, even in death. Stannis knew Maester Cresson was right, if John Aaron's son had been healthy, then he would have considered betrothing him to Shireen to secure an alliance with the Vale they had formidable military power and the Vale men were honorable so it would not be a problem. Securing allies was not easy for Stannis he was not as popular as Robert and Renly when it came to winning people over, but he knew it was foolish admiration because most people were fools and slaves to appraisal. Stannis had known Renly was growing to be friendly with Mace Tyrell and his family, which made him suspicious of his brother's intentions. Because there was no way Renly will be winning this game, as he already stole Strom's end from Stannis and he will not steal the throne this time. Jacob was sailing with a group of Baratheon retainers, along with the Onion Knight, Ser Davos and his son Devon, who was Jacob's squire. The former smuggler was forever loyal to Stannis, as he was blessed with the chance to accompany his son to Winterfell. However, Stannis met with harsh criticism from Ser Axel Florent and most of the other members of his wife's family because they thought Ser Davos was an upstart smuggler, who shouldn't have a place by Stannis's side in Jacob's either. The Lord of Dragonstone had seen Ser Davos bond with Jacob, as they developed a close friendship through traveling together and Jacob learning how to be dutiful and royal to his house, it grated Ser Axel very much. Jacob didn't like it when Ser Axel would insult Ser Davos and his family, as he had seen his son be able to command respect and fear among men, and put that man in his place. Stannis gritted through his teeth, when the old maester or Ser Davos had mentioned Ned Stark, as the man envied the Lord of Winterfell because Robert trusted him, unlike he did his own brothers. The middle Baratheon feared Jacob being corrupted by Mace Tyrell it seemed his son had learned how to play the game and how to maneuver himself on the game board. Stannis had been impressed with how much of a political strategist Jacob had been, as it was owed to the Lord of Highgarden and his mother. Stannis had known the dangers of playing the Game of Thrones, as he was lucky to have escaped when he had the chance. He feared for Robert, as the Lannisters were circling him, like lions around dead prey. John Aaron couldn't protect him anymore, either can Ned Stark, a man with no experience in playing the great game. Jacob's safety was paramount, which was why Stannis had sent a few Florence with his son, as they were cousins of Celis and she insisted on having them go with their only son to the north. Stannis was certain Jacob was able to handle himself, when it came to sword fighting, archery and training with his uncle's war hammer, thanks to Lord Tarly, who spent endless nights training Jacob into a well-rounded warrior. The idea of Jacob being friends with Ned Stark's son would be good for Jacob, as Stannis was in need of securing allies when the war comes. The Starks of Winterfell had military power and were tough warriors, Stannis wouldn't mind this friendship, as it would please Robert. Stannis had been concerned when Lord Tywin suggested a match between Jacob and Ser Kevin Lannister's daughter Janiae, then he fled from King's Landing because Stannis knew what the old lion was playing, taking his son as a hostage. The old lion had tried to do the same with John Aaron's son, but Lady Aaron was smart enough to flee to the Airy with her son. Stannis's son was safe from the grasp of the lions, but he was to enter the den of the wolves of the north. The Lord of Dragonstone was reminded of his wife's pleas, as she was worried Jacob was unable to secure a match because he displayed most of Stannis's personality which made him unlikable and gruff in the eyes of the women in Westeros. The man was looking outside of the balcony of Dragonstone to see the sea crash through the shores, the sounds of the waters brought Stannis some peace and tranquility away from the stresses and worries of securing the future for House Baratheon. My lord, I see you are making plans for Jacob's future. Ser Axel Florent had interrupted Stannis, as he was seeking peace from the sea. Stannis had not liked the man Ser Axel was ambitious and a very judgmental man, he judged Ser Davos and his family harshly because he was desperate to win Stannis's trust and allegiance. I was trying to find a suitable match for Jacob, if you mind. Stannis commanded in a stern tone. Of course, a wife for Jacob is needed, since these times are becoming dangerous the old knight had replied. 
Has my wife converted you as well? The Lord of Light is a blessing to some of us. I told her, she could keep her religion, if she doesn't go around converting my court. You should take up with the Lord of Light, my Lord. Sir Axel said slyly. Why should I? The Red God holds real power, my Lord. I do not keep to any gods, but my son is a regular visitor into the September. His power is magnificent and divine above all others. I need allies in these times and I cannot gain them if I abandon the seven. I understand you need time, my lord. The other nobles of Westeros are not going to be welcoming of a foreign religion, I cannot waste precious time in causing a war with the faith. Will Jacob be wed? No, my son and I have agreed, only when the time was right. Of course, my lord. Leave me be. Stannis had seen Say Axel scurry away he was glad the large-eared man was gone. He had explained his dislike for the man, but his wife was adamant in having him on Dragonstone. Not even Jacob liked his florent uncle, but he tolerated his presence for the sake of his mother. The man was a devout worshipper of the Red God, along with a few other Florents, but Stannis was not interested because the seven may have taken his father and mother away from him, but they have blessed him with two children he could be happy with. Stannis was concerned for Ned Stark, because of his inexperience in playing the game and the pressures of what Hand of the King will bring to him, as it will become too much to bear, as Stannis wondered why Lord Aaron didn't go insane. There will be distress in the circles of King's Landing, with the Lannisters positioning themselves to be the ruling house, with Renly befriending and bringing the Tyrells into the fold and his brother's inability to control those inside his own court. Stannis was lucky, not to be part of the power struggle in court, because he had his own plans to put into action, as sending Jacob to Winterfell is a smart idea, as he could gain friendship with Ned Stark's son and his other children. He was adamant in winning this game against whomever, whether it be the Lannisters, Renly and the Tyrells or will it all go to hell. Jacob being in the north could gain him a new friendship and a new ally in the Lord of Winterfell. Chapter 4 Jacob Baratheon, the heir of Dragonstone and to Storm's End, unless Uncle Renly dies and fails to produce an heir. He was riding through the wolfswood, with a gold trim and black cloak around his shoulders, as they were the colors of House Baratheon. His black hair was blowing through the cool winds, riding misty through the snowy grounds. The young highborn was on the fields with his horse, he wanted to explore more outside of the high castle of Winterfell. Jacob had enjoyed his stay with the overlords of the north, as they were very hospitable to the prince and made him feel welcome. Jacob was five and ten in terms of age, with long midnight black hair to his shoulders, his sapphire blue eyes reflected the sternness in his face. The young man quite tall with his slender, strong build. He was constantly followed by his florent cousins Aaron and Colin, they were quite annoying and overbearing, but he didn't mind having them with him. Being in the north has been a welcome change for him, staying in Highgarden and Old Town for a few moons. Jacob's squire Devon Seaworth was riding through the fields with him, along with his father Ser Davos, his father's onion knight and most trusted adviser. The young Baratheon man bonded with the onion knight through their travels by the sea and him telling stories of pirates and smugglers, which incited Jacob, being highborn and constricted by rules of honor. The young man's heart ached, missing his sister Shireen, who was stuck on Dragonstone with his mother and father. The idea of being away from home again frightened Jacob, but he had no choice in the matters because it was the king's command. Sending him to Winterfell was a strange change for Jacob, being a southerner and being used to warm weather and the comforts of home waiting for him. He grew to be chummy with the Starks, as per Uncle Robert's wish. My lord, are you sure, you should ride Misty in this weather, Ser Davos said politely. Your father warned you about the chills of the north. Jacob smiled, riding on the ground. Ser. You need to lighten up a little, honor and duty is not everything. He replied. What are we doing today, my lord? Hunting, I must learn on my own to be a man. What are we hunting, my lord? Whatever is out there. Do you know how to use the weapons? Devon piped out. I was hand trained by Lord Tarly, so I can use different weapons in battle and hunting. How was the fostering in Highgarden? The Onion Knight asked. It was scary at first, but it was fun when I got used to the hot weather. 
more fields for me to ride and the fruits were delicious, you should try the peaches. I heard you learn Sivas. It was the first game I learned to play. Lord Mace was not an accurate player than I hoped he would be. You have a bright future ahead of you, my lord. Lordship of Dragonstone and the Stormlands. Jacob's eyebrow arched above his eyes, with his lips curling onto a snarl. If Uncle Renly failed to marry and conceive a son. Prancing fool. He is the Lord of Storm's End and your uncle. Ser Davos. My uncle is nothing but a fool, who likes to wear expensive cloths to court. I doubt he has ever eliminated a man. How was the wedding? It was a splendid feast. Ser and the tourney to accompany it. Lord Garland and Lady Leonette were great hosts, only because Willis insisted I was to attend the event. Also, it's important for me to attend, to establish good relations with House Tyrell. As it will gain you swords, fruits and fertile lands. Don't be absurd, Sir. Lord Mace would not allow me to marry his daughter. He intends to make her a queen and marry her off to my cousin. Who will you marry, then my lord? I don't know. If a suitable match comes for me. I have heard many ladies of the Reach have taken a shine to you. No. It's my title their fathers are after. A king's nephew is the ultimate prize in the South, after the princes of course. Your father has expressed his grievance in sending you too far from home. He gets over things very quickly. It's only to appease my uncle and establish good relations with House Stark Jacob said, raising his hand. Jacob was very fond of the Onion Knight, he thought of him as a second father figure in his life, as they always talked with each other. The young man didn't like his florent uncles they were ambitious and desperate to win his father Stannis's trust and allegiance, he always defended Ser Davos against their cruel words. Hunting in the wolf's wood was dangerous, but for Jacob, the forest was home to a Baratheon, as he was a Baratheon of both Dragonstone and Storm's End, he learned from Uncle Robert that a careful eye will always catch the target. Jacob unmounted Misty, as he had his bow and arrow with him, it was a gift from Uncle Alistair of Brightwater Keep. He had been hunting many times with Uncle Robert, but all he saw was his favorite uncle get drunk and start pissing himself. The forest was very cold, as the cloak and trim was enough to warm him up. Jacob knew he was used to warm weather, coming from the south of the kingdoms. He caught Ser Davos and Devon behind him, as he wanted to include them on his hunting expedition. Jacob attempted to try and be more open, to show a little of his true self to the Starks. He noticed Ned Stark's heir Rob to have more of his Tully mother's features with the bright blue eyes and light auburn hair. The same can be said for Rob's brothers Bran and Rickon, who also had the Tully features, along with his sister Sansa, but the only ones with the Stark appearance were Arya, the younger girl and Jon Snow, the idiot of Winterfell. The tactic worked, as Jacob gained a budding friendship with Rob, with the two sparing each other with swords and riding through the fields of the north. The only friendship Jacob valued in the world was Willis Tyrell, the crippled heir to Highgarden, he had pity for him because no woman wants to marry him, even though he was from a family that rivaled the Lannisters in terms of wealth and power. The northern traditions and customs seemed outdated to those in the south, but for Jacob, it established the north valued and honored their traditions, as it was something the young man could take away and implement into his daily life. At the corner of his eye, Jacob had seen a stag with huge antlers he prepped his now and he looked carefully with his eye caught on his target. The arrow was pointed at the right direction, as it was aimed at the stag. His eye was carefully monitoring his target, as he shot the arrow. It hit the bullseye correctly, right in the back of the deer, as it was dead. The young man ran through the snows he looked at the animal, as he tied it with ropes and put it in the wooden cart. Jacob was not an expert hunter, but he was getting there and improving his skills. At least, Jacob had something to prove to Theon Greyjoy, the ward of Winterfell and Jacob's least favorite person. The boy was arrogant and judgmental, he thought Jacob was a good-for-nothing southerner, who cannot survive the cold. As he was in the wolf's wood, Jacob wouldn't mind staying in Deepwood Mott, as the Glovers liked him well enough. Ser Davos and Devon brought the horses to assist Jacob on taking his fresh eliminate back to Winterfell. Misty was Jacob's closest companion, being a horse because she had accompanied him to Highgarden and had been compatible with the other horses. 
Jacob had ridden other horses in the reach, as they were faster and well-bred, but Misty will always be his horse. The young man mounted his horse, along with the Onion Knight and his son to go back to the regional seat of North, to bring the fresh Eliminate back for dinner. On the journey, Jacob would see the high castle of Winterfell in his sights, as it was like a cold fortress to shield men from war. He was allowed to do what he wanted, as he was a guest of honor of the Starks. The death of John Aaron was hard on the young man, as the Lord of the Airy saw Jacob was destined for greater things in the future. Within the castle's great keep, the young man rode his horse in, along with the Onion Knight and his squire. Jacob was welcomed into the castle, as he saw Rob with Theon. He was confused why the Stark heir only had his father's long face, while his idiot brother had the whole Stark look. Jacob unmounted his horse, as he commanded Devon to take Misty away, with the boy and his father walking towards the stables. The young man hated Theon with a venom, as Jacob was proud of his father's achievements in crushing the Iron Fleet, during the Greyjoy Rebellion. There was bad relations between the two because of the history between their fathers. I see the stag has caught himself, the Greyjoy heir said arrogantly, with Jacob ignoring him. Did the wolf's wood freeze your arse off? No. And I would rather if you didn't have any of the fresh eliminate for dinner, Greyjoy, Jacob replied, looking at the other boy in the eye. I can prove I can survive the cold. You are your father's only son after all. So are you. At least, I'm not a good-for-nothing southerner. Greyjoy sneered. You are the only heir to one region, which is barren of rocks and sea salt. Jacob said in a controlled tone. Remembering his courtiers, even though he wanted to get Theon riled up. Jacob paid no attention to Theon Greyjoy and his foolishness, so he wanted to take a walk with Rob alone, away from the other arrogant nuisance. I'd rather marry some reach lord than suffer the presence of Greyjoy for any longer than necessary. Jacob thought. He was taught by his father Stannis the Greyjoys were traitors and thieves, and cannot be trusted, as he said, if he had the chance, then he would have ended the Greyjoy bloodline. Why must you hang around with him? Jacob said, not understanding why Rob and Theon were friends. He can be arrogant, but he is a good friend. Rob replied. Some friend he will turn out to be. Well. Jacob, if you get to know, then you might like him. Thanks. I'd rather stand my chances of fighting the Red Viper than be friends with the only son of the salt-smelling craven. Would you actually fight him? Rob. Dornishmen use tricks and cheap undercuts to win. Could you try and make an effort? I don't socialize with traitors, especially their sons. Jacob whispered. Jacob thought this visit was going to be a disaster, apart from having to tolerate Greyjoy's presence. The young Baratheon established a budding friendship with Rob Stark, he would like to see last for a long time. He liked him, as he had potential to be a good lord, like his father Lord Eddard Stark. The young man envied Rob because he was easygoing, likable and a charm compared to Jacob, who in all accounts was a bore and a humorless git, as said by the ladies of the North. However, Jacob didn't care what women and girls thought of him, except for his mother Celis and his sister Shireen, whom he loved and missed very much. I'd rather fight a spear-wielding Dornishman, than suffer the presence of the Lannisters, my uncle has bound himself to buy the laws of marriage. Jacob thought bitterly. Jacob enjoyed his time with the Starks he had a knack for climbing with Bran, since he did with some of the boys of the Reach, during his fostering. He didn't mind having Arya around, not being a proper lady was something new, being a southerner and seeing women in constricted roles. He may not be as golden as his cousin Joffrey, but he was quite a looker in his own way. Jacob was lesser than royal cousins, but he got attention from the girls of Winterfell, giving him wily looks and giggle when he came by. Jacob didn't understand what girls saw in a humorless boar like him, but it was something Rob, Theon and John around funny and laughed at it. The idea of charming and wooing women are for prissily knights with nothing to show for it. His uncle Robert was bringing his court north, so he could get a new hand of the king in a possible betrothal for his cousin Joffrey, who in all accounts was a spoiled little, destined to be the second coming of the mad king. The dual heir smiled at his surroundings, as it was quite peaceful. There was little time, until he was to see his uncle and his cousins in Winterfell. Chapter 5 Two days later, 
Jacob had been standing in front of the long view mirror of his room in Winterfell, as it was the best for a king's nephew. His face was clean shaven and was neatly dressed in a long white tunic, with blue and orange patterns, representing the white, orange, and blue colors of House Florent, the family his mother Celis belonged to before she married his father. He was in a pair of white breeches and a pair of dark orange colored boots, being in the north and the weather not being agreeable to Jacob's southern sensibilities. The young man tied his hair back in a ponytail, as he noticed the growth of his hair, since his last visit to Old Town. His sapphire blue eyes reflected the coldness inside him, as his stare was blunt and still. My uncle and his court are visiting, I must be wary of my surroundings and not be blinded by the grandeur and the gold. Jacob put the gold and black furred cloak on his shoulders, brushing it down, as he wanted to look presentable when his king uncle came to Winterfell. The young man scowled at his reflection in the mirror, as it was one of his father's traits the boy of five and ten inherited, much to the dislike of his uncle Renly and some of the stormlords. A prig, humorless and a bore. Just like his father. Jacob heard in crueler circles in court and around the south. Jacob never paid attention to what a bunch of arse-licking nobles said about him, because if he was king, then he would have cut some of their tongues out and maybe put the dumbest of idiots to the sword, to save the realm from such stupid ramblings. He remembered the times his uncle Robert wanted to have him in court, as he was surrounded by blonde-haired, green-eyed schemers and needed someone from his immediate family to have around. Jacob rejected those offers, as he couldn't stand the stench of King's Landing and the fruitless ladies, who would follow him around like the irritating hounds Willis would take care of. Thank the gods, I don't have to see Patchface, if I saw him near my sister again, then I might slip up and eliminate him. Of Patchface the fool, Jacob felt a coldness from the clown, as he didn't approve of his sister not having any friends her age, but playing with the fool, whose intentions were unknown. The only reason why Jacob didn't eliminate the fool, was the love he had for his little sister and how sad she would be if her only friend was dead. Jacob fastened his scabbard, which contained his sword named Limos, as it was a fifteenth name day gift from his fostering family the Tyrells, one of the only gifts his father Stannis didn't send back. The doors of his chambers opened for it to be his squire Devon Seaworth, one of the seven sons of the Onion Knight. He was a good boy and served Jacob well, even though the young man was once a squire to Lord Randall Tarley in his youth. The king has almost arrived, my lord. Devon announced, with Jacob turning around to give a short huff of amusement. It's strange, it's only been a few moons, since I saw my uncle. He insisted on throwing me a tourney for my fifteenth name day, but my father and mother refused. Jacob replied politely, where is your father? In the great hall finishing his meal. Tell him to make preparations for our voyage home, since I don't plan to stay in Winterfell after my uncle and the royal family leave the north. Yes, my lord. The boy said, leaving the young man's bedchambers. A smile perched on Jacob's face, he liked Devon, being a dutiful boy and was a good companion for Shireen, as the two were the same age. Jacob rarely smiled, one of the only times he truly had a great smile on his face, was his first kiss with Lady Desma Redwine, something he only told the Onion Knight and no one else. Desmara was a nice girl, but Jacob disliked her brothers Horace and Haber, only because of their unfortunately stupid names. Gods! What stupid names, more fruitless than Uncle Robert's Lannister Squire! Jacob exited his guest bedchambers, to pass down the stairs of the Great Hall, as the inside of Winterfell was more imposing than it was outside. A lot of the servants and maids were scurrying around, as it was the day his uncle Robert was to visit his old friend, and bring the royal family north with him. Jacob was careful not to get in the way of the caretakers of the great castle, as he stepped outside of the keep to feel the rush of the coolness hit his face. I hope cousin Joffrey behaves himself, as he is a guest in another's home. Jacob thought sourly, of his royal cousin. Jacob hadn't seen his crown prince cousin, since the prince's last name day tourney. The relations between the two were harsh at best. He envied Joffrey for not being forced to be fostered anywhere, as Jacob had to stay in Highgarden with the Tyrells and earn his knighthood. Jacob thought Tom and Marcella were tolerable, as the prince and princess had more manners and respect, expected of children of the king and queen. The young man saw many people assemble into a straight line, as he was looking around to find Rob, 
he couldn't see the auburn-haired heir to Winterfell through the sea of people. His eyes were wandering around, with the young man pushing through some of the others, as he made his way to the front of the line to find Rob, standing with his idiot brother John and Theon, the empty-headed ward. Where have you been, my father has been looking for you. Rob said, with a hand on Jacob's shoulders. Making myself look presentable, as I don't want my uncle seeing me look a mess. Jacob replied. Theon sniggered from behind, but Jacob was trying to contain the surge to slap him. Have you ever smiled, always with that sad look on his face? Only because I am in your presence, Greyjoy. Jacob said slyly, with a quick smirk on his face. Glad to be of service, Southern Git. At least, after the king's visit I don't have to see your ugly mug again. Jacob said, catching the eye of Lord Eddard Stark and sliancing himself. Jacob has seen intimidating men before, being in the presence of his father, Lord Tarly and now the Lord of Winterfell. The young man saw John hiding in the back, as he didn't know why. Why is your brother hiding at the back? My lady mother thought his presence would offend the king and the royal family, during the visit. Rob said solemnly. Jacob looked over at Jon Snow with a saddened look in his eyes. Pity, he's not a bad person or has done anything wrong. Happy to see your uncle again. I have not seen him, since my fifteenth name day. Jacob said, with his ponytail pushed back. Jacob pitted John, only because his bastardy status condemned him by most of the people to be a stain on his father's honor and an insult to Lady Caitlin and her trueborn children. It was the same pity, Jacob bestowed on Willis, as his broken leg deemed him unsuitable to marry any woman, but if he was a woman, he would have married the man for his good heart, not because he pitted his bad leg. Jacob's eyes were on the retinue of men at arms, guards, and at least two members of the king's guards riding through the gates of Winterfell. Most of the guards were in red, as they were mostly Lannister men, but there were men in gold and black, signifying that there were Baratheon men after all in the retinue. A red and gold patterned wheelhouse riding in, as Jacob had seen the royal wheelhouse before, on one of his many trips to court, as it must have housed the queen and the royal children, along with some handmaidens for the princess. A hair from Jacob's head was misplaced, with his two fingers smoothing it down. He didn't want to look unkempt, as it was one of the southern influences his mother had instilled in him. There was a knight in black, as Jacob spotted the knight to be Sandor Clegane, his cousin Joffrey's sworn sword and was a dangerous killer, with Ser in his title. More knights in white and gold had come through the passes, as he, along with most of the people around had gone on one knee and knelt. At the corner of Jacob's eye, a horse had come between two Kingsguard knights, beside the royal wheelhouse, with the young man's eyes widened, seeing his uncle Robert came past the knights in gold and white. Jacob was shocked to see how fat his uncle had become, he was not the demon of the trident that he was years ago and had let himself go, significantly. It must be the stresses of ruling and keeping the kingdoms together. The young man had seen his uncle was bigger than the stead his rode, as he had sympathy towards the horse. Behind his uncle, was Jacob's cousin and the crown prince Joffrey, who was dressed in the colors of House Lannister, no doubt his mother's influence. The prince had a look of disdain on his face, as if those in Winterfell were not worthy of his presence. The people around him rose, as the king commanded. Jacob watched, as Lord Stark and his uncle Robert hugged each other in brotherly camaraderie his heart warmed, as he longed to have a long, historic friendship, as the two men in front of him did. Boy! Aren't you going to give your uncle a hug? His uncle shouted, with the young man becoming red-faced. Sure. Jacob stuttered, then making his way to be pulled into a crush, blowing hug by his uncle. Jacob could feel his uncle's weight crushing against his body, but he was warm and smiled at seeing his favorite uncle again. After his uncle greeted Lady Caitlin, Jacob's eye caught on his uncle's wife and Queen Circe, who strode along gracefully, her green eyes were snake-like, as if she saw something not worthy of her view, as the queen. The queen brought the other royal children Tommen and Marcella with her. Jacob noticed all three of the royal children had the Lannister looks of golden hair and green eyes, while he had the Baratheon looks of blue eyes and black hair. The royal family made their way into the great keep, as Jacob followed them through with eyes watching his surroundings everywhere. As the hours grew late, the feast was an enormous fair, far enough for the north to pull out this much extravagance, 
when royalty is visiting the region. There was a lot of food on the table, even though Jacob couldn't stand the sight of more food than necessary, it was the same feeling his father had about Uncle Robert hosting a lot of tourneys. Jacob understood, sometimes a little bit of extravagance was all right, to keep the common people satisfied and loyal to their respective lords, but too much will make people spoiled and ungrateful. The young man sat in between Rob and Arya, with Jacob's eyebrow arching at the sight of the queen's brothers Sir Jamie and Lord Tyrion entering, whom were different to each other in terms of appearance and height. And I thought the royal children and I were different in terms of looks. Jacob thought to himself. After everyone took their seats, the king called for the feast to begin, with many people around him diving in to get the best piece of meat. Whilst eating, Jacob caught his uncle pulling a serving girl to his lap and shamelessly throwing himself at her, at the presence of his lawful wife and queen. The young man was taught to respect a woman's honor, even though men take their status, as the preferred gender for granted, but he ignored the noise and cheering around him. For a boy used to silence and calm, Jacob did not like huge feasts because of the nonsense songs and stupid bards trying to sing for a bit of gold. My lord, why do you always think the sky is falling down? Rob japed, noticing Jacob's grim expression. Such camaraderie and parties are not amusing to me. Jacob replied in a stern tone. Jacob's eye caught on Arya, attempting to throw a piece of bread at her sister Sansa's head, who was staring lovingly at Prince Joffrey it was normal for girls to look at his cousin, being the heir to the throne and the crown prince. The young man groaned, at the sight of Uncle Robert putting his hands under the serving girl's skirts. He had the urge to slap him silly, for dishonoring himself in front of his wife, whom was present and had a cold stare in her eyes. Jacob learned the players of the game well, as Lannisters did not take dishonor and questioning of their power very lightly, just ask the extinct houses of Tarbeck and Rain. What's it like, in the capital? Rob asked. The capital is the cesspool of treachery and deceit, it's the snake pit. Jacob said lowly. I always thought King's Landing was glamorous. It's what people say to those who haven't seen through the veil, all that stuff is just a mummer's farce, to cover up the truth. Jacob said tiredly. Most of the ladies believe you to be half-horse. What? Jacob exclaimed, keeping quiet so the royal family and Lord and Lady Stark didn't hear. It's a compliment to how well you ride a horse. Spending most of my childhood in the Reach has taught me a few things. Are you lying? No and why? A young man such as yourself, being fostered in a region known to be the heart of chivalry and courtly love. It's where I attended my first grand wedding, earned my knighthood squiring for Lord Tarley and where the arbor wine tastes the best. Not a fan of Dornish. No a bit too sour for my tastes. The Dornish love their spices and flavors, when it comes to food. As the two young men were talking, Jacob knew the Onion Knight and Devon sat at another table, with Colin and Aaron. He wanted to sit with them, but it would be rude to leave the high table, as the king wanted him to sit there. Jake you refused a tourney on your name day, why? Uncle Robert yelled, slurring through his words. He was drunk, as it was obvious. I'm not a fan of tournaments, uncle. You know that. Jacob said clearly, in what his mother called his authoritarian tone. You will be wed soon you are of age and your father cannot refuse. Uncle. Jacob snapped, with his face turning strawberry red and a hand covering a part of his face, to not allow the Starks to see him embarrassed. You may be my nephew, but you are talking to the king. My father and mother are finding prospects, there is no need to worry, uncle. You have more important things to worry about. Before the dreaded winter comes, you better be married to some highborn girl with a rich father and can bring swords to Dragonstone. The feast carried on, with Jacob being a bit red-faced and embarrassed from his uncle's drunken humiliation, but he knew it was the wine making his uncle speak nonsense. Jacob sat back and smiled briefly, so the others don't see it for themselves. He sighed, under his breath he wanted this feast of loudness and noise to end soon. Chapter 6 Personal Favorite of the Chapters Davo Seaworth, the Onion Knight and a former smuggler turned knight, by the order of Stannis Baratheon, whom he did a great deed for. He was riding through the fields of the north, trying to catch up with the Lord of Dragonstone's headstrong son Jacob, whom many thought was half-horse himself. 
It was a compliment to Jacob's superior horse riding ability, only if his niceness towards women was on par with his horse riding skills. His eye caught on Jacob riding towards him with his horse Misty in tow, with his son Devon riding beside him. The smile that appeared on the young man's face was something rare, as Jacob never openly expressed his feelings, due to him being an expert in hiding them. Are you losing your touch, sir? Jacob said, in a gentler manner. No, my lord. Sir Davos replied. Jacob's fingers were brushing against the mane of Misty, a grey stallion given to him by his uncle, King Robert and his eyes were sullen, like his father. Shame, you can't catch up. My lord, you've been riding a horse, since you were a little boy. Luckily, the Reach has a lot of excellent horse riders. The young lord said, with a hidden smirk on his face. What do you mean, my lord? You'll know soon enough. The young lord said, commanding his horse to go in the direction back to Winterfell. The Onion Knight was riding behind Lord Jacob, with his son Devon in tow, as his fifth son was the young lord squire and did his duty well. Ser Davos was lucky, to blessed with the opportunity to accompany Lord Stannis's son on his voyage to the north and to spend time with a boy, whom he thought of as an eighth son. The knight and his son followed the young lord through the front gates of Winterfell, as the former smuggler had not been inside a highborn castle before, since the siege of Storm's End, but as a landed knight he was getting used to the finer things in life. After the knight and his son put their horses in the stables, the onion knight followed the young lord, he was supposed to be watching for Lord Stannis's sake. Where can this boy be? Ser Davos thought to himself. Father. He's in the courtyard, watching the prince and Lord Rob spar. Devon called out, then scurrying after Jacob. For the Onion Knight, watching out for Jacob of the House Baratheon was a tough responsibility, even the boy's florent uncles didn't like him so much. He spotted a head full of black hair, as he caught Jacob standing on the sidelines, watching the Stark air spar with the crown prince. Ser Davos was no expert in sword fighting, but from his view, it seemed Prince Joffrey couldn't swing a sword to save his life, as that was shared by Jacob's unimpressed expression, at his royal cousin's poor attempt at disarming Lord Rob. The Onion Knight stood beside Jacob, as the young lord's eyes widened. Terrible Jacob muttered under his breath. Jacob saw the crown prince sneered, with a scowl on his face and said. This is a game for children, sir, I am a prince, and I've grown tired of swatting at Starks with play swords. If I recall correctly, you fail to swat at me at all. Rob chuckled, as Theon sniggered, as well. What do you suggest, then Prince Joffrey? Sir Roderick Castle, the master at arms asked. I want live steel. Joffrey proclaimed, causing Jacob to roll his eyes and scowl. Sir Roderick shook his head. Out of the question, live steel is too dangerous. Joffrey scoffed at the master of arms's words. Why should I bother you northerners seem to only play with toy swords anyways? It caused some of the Lannister men at arms watching to laugh. Live steel should be for those who are skilled in swordplay, it seems you are ill-prepared to face a real battle with your lack of skill, cousin. Jacob affirmed, with his arms folded. I don't have to answer to you, heir to Baron Rock Island with old gargoyles. The prince snarled. As the crown prince, cousin, you should remember your courtesies and manners, when you are a guest in one's home, if Sir Roderick doesn't want you to use live steel, I suggest you heed his words, before you get seriously hurt. The young lord warned. How comes you have a live steel sword? The prince questioned his cousin. Only because I have been trained to use one and I can swing one very well. The Lannister guards were silent, in their contempt and glaring at Jacob. Joffrey had his fists clenched, as he was seething with anger. Instead of attempting to start a fight, the prince stalked off indoors. Ser Davos had seen the iron steel within Lord Jacob, as he had just put his royal cousin in his place and didn't flinch in fear. The young man was as brusque, as his father, but he carried himself, in a way that a true lord should. He will be a great lord someday. The Onion Knight thought to himself. Ser Davos had followed Jacob behind the broken tower, as he saw the young lord laugh out loud, as it was unusual for Lord Jacob to do so, being so serious and humorless, like his father. What are you doing behind there, my lord? 
The Onion Knight asked. Hiding, I bet the queen will skin me alive for chastising her golden boy. Jacob replied, with a haunt of mischief in his voice. Such things are not true. The queen only tolerates my presence because of Uncle Robert, since I am his only nephew. Are you sure hiding here will solve things? Only until I get my hair out of this blasted ponytail. The young lord said, removing his hair from the ponytail to see it flowing past his shoulder. Lord Jacob and Ser Davos heard rustling of the leaves, as the young turned around for it to be a tomboyish looking girl, with brown hair and grey eyes, the primary features of the members of House Stark. Arya, what are you doing here? Jacob said, in a fright, pulling his cloak over his shoulders. Are you scared of the queen? The Stark girl gestured. I'm hiding to release my hair from this accursed ponytail. Lord Jacob lied. Is this your knight? He's my father's advisor, he came to look out for me, like a sworn sword. Jacob clarified, this is Ser Davo Seaworth, he used to be a smuggler, but he saved my father from starvation and was rewarded with a knighthood. Nice to meet you, my lady. Ser Davo said. As a result of Ser Davos's crimes, as a smuggler, my father cut off his fingers, as a punishment. Jacob said grimly. Arya's eyes widened, as Jacob couldn't blame her. She was a highborn girl, not supposed to hear the grimness of punishment. I saw you stand up to Prince Joffrey, put him in his place. I guess you don't like him. He is betrothed to Sansa she is blinded by his golden looks to see him what he really is. Jacob knelt down to be at Arya's level and look her in the eye. When you go to King's Landing, only trust your family, little wolf. They are the only people, who should matter, when entering the snake's pit. If you say so. Your brothers will miss you. Won't you be leaving as well, my lord? I will be returning to Dragonstone, my father doesn't like me being too far away from him, it grinds his teeth. Have you fought in any tourneys? Arya questioned, wanting to know if this young lord did have any victories. I fought in the melee and fought against twenty-nine men, but only eliminated three in one melee match. Don't you joust? Arya, jousting is for prissily men and boys, who only care about the most expensive horse and whom have never seen a real battle before. Ser Davos's heart warmed to see Lord Jacob bond with the third Stark child the young lord showed the girl his sword, as it was a gift from the Tyrells. The only other person Lord Jacob bonded was with his sister Shireen, who was in Dragonstone with Lady Celis and Lord Stannis. Are the jewels real? Arya asked, with her eyes on the little engrafted jewels on Lord Jacob's sword. From the finest sword makers of the Reach. Rob said you were a good rider. Most of the lords of the Reach thought me half-horse myself, since I can outride even the Knight of Flowers. You don't look like a knight. Come, young lady. Your mother wouldn't be happy with you hiding behind a tower with me and the Onion Knight. Jacob advised, with a hand on Arya's shoulder. Ser Davos trailed behind the two, coming out from behind the broken tower he sensed the young lord was calm and not so of iron steel inside him. Why call him the Onion Knight? Arya asked. It was what he brought to Storm's End, during the siege to feed the starving garrison. Ser Davos followed behind Lord Jacob and Lady Arya, as the young lord was telling the girl about his horse, whom he had for a long time. The Onion Knight had seen a gentleness in the young lord, the young lady laughed at something Lord Jacob had said, as the knight smiled to himself. Chapter 7 Winterfell was in a state of worry and concern, as Jacob heard about Bran Stark falling from the broken tower, as he stood in the middle of the great hall. He had been hunting with Uncle Robert, Lord Stark some of the other Northmen, as his uncle insisted because of how he is capable of hunting on his own. The servants were running around during the day and the dire wolves were howling all night, leaving Lord Jacob not getting any sleep for the night. He didn't care anyways, but he had to contend with Cousin Joffrey's whining and spoiled attitude throughout the night. This morning, Jacob strolled through the halls of the Great Keep, as he knew this time would complicate Lord Stark's travels to the capital and assuming his position, as Hand of the King. He found Lord and Lady Stark beside Bran's bed, as the body almost looked comatose and had no life to him. Jacob didn't like having feelings of pity because it made him weak, but the boy was a great climber and never had an accident. It made Jacob think a little, 
after seeing Lady Caitlin weaving a prayer web like her life depended on it and never thought of much else. I cannot express my sincere apologies for what has happened to your son, my lord and lady. Jacob said politely, remembering his courtiers from Highgarden. Don't worry about it, my lord, it's not your fault. Lord Eddard replied. I know, said Jacob. In any case, if there is anything I can do to help, anything at all. Lady Caitlin looked up from her prayer web. Thank you, my lord, you are most kind. Will he live, maester? Jacob had to ask, as he didn't want to see a boy so young scum to the stranger so quickly. The aged maester spoke. I think so, but he will never walk again though. He will recover in time. Jacob gave a small bow, and left the area to go and see his youngest cousins before the royal court was to leave the north and go back to King's Landing. He was outside of the great keep, as his eyes and ears caught cousin Joffrey and Lord Tyrion, it seemed the imp was scolding his nephew. This was a welcome sight to see, since Jacob was about to leave the north and go back to Dragonstone, but not without its entertainment from Joffrey being scolded by his uncle. Jacob moved a lot closer to hear what was going on, he was hiding behind the wall so he wouldn't get caught by any of the Lannister men-at-arms. You will go Lord and Lady Stark and offer them your sympathies. Lord Tyrion said. What good will my sympathies do for them? Joffrey asked, in his usual arrogance. Nothing. The little lord admitted, it is expected of you, your absence has been noted. Joffrey scoffed, and positioned himself, like a mummer's king. The boy means nothing to me, can't stand the wailing of women. Jacob expected this kind of selfish and ingrate behavior from his cousin, as it seemed his Lannister mother's influence is ingrained in him, he had the urge to slap him silly. Unfortunately, the imp beat him to it. The young lord rolled his eyes, at the sight of Joffrey being slapped again, he closed his lips to stop a loud laugh from exiting them. Joffrey was meant to be the crown prince, the future king, but he was just a little boy whimpering like a toddler for such a harmless punishment, but it was good he was getting some much needed discipline, something his mother and father failed to give him. One more word and I will hit you again. The little lord warned his spoiled nephew. I'm telling mother. Joffrey yelled. Lord Tyrion slapped him again, causing Jacob's cousin to whimper, like the spoiled child he was. Go ahead, but first you will go to Lord and Lady Stark and you will offer them your condolences. Do you understand? You can't, the prince objected, as his uncle slapped him again. Do you understand? Jacob saw his cousin give a reluctant nod and walked away, then some words shared between Lord Tyrion and the Clegane knight with a frightening look about him. The young man came out from the hiding place and rubbed his fingers together. Jacob knew he was going into hostile territory, as it's where the queen and her brothers were, alongside his younger cousins. Jacob was ready he learned from the Queen of Thorns, knowing your enemies is the best way of being able to beat them at their game. He made his way into the Great Hall, where his cousins and the rest of the Lannisters were, eating their breakfast of eggs, ham, bread and fish and ignoring his presence. Jacob had a sickly feeling in his stomach, as it was just after breakfast and he didn't feel too good, it didn't stop him from spending the last few minutes with his younger cousins. Tommen and Marcella were good children, had none of the spoiled and vain behavior Joffrey had. The two always had questions, as Jacob was happy to tell them stories about Dragonstone, how the stone dragons above the island were dragons, whom were frozen by powerful magic from the far east of Essos. The only question Jacob couldn't answer was why the royal children were different to Jacob in terms of looks, as he didn't know the answer neither. Tommen and Marcella were the only ones, who smiled brightly in Jacob's presence, but the queen's eyes were like sharp assassin's daggers, ready to eliminate late at night. Her nose wrinkled upwards, as she was hesitant in being the presence of anyone from the king's immediate family. In otherwise, the queen's brothers Sir Jaime and Lord Tyrion were indifferent, but were still suspicious of Jacob, as he was of them. If I had to choose between the fighting pits of the east or facing the Lannisters, then I would choose the pits, at least I have a chance of being alive at the end. Jacob thought cleverly. Is Bran going to die? Princess Marcella asked. Jacob smiled, it seemed she and Tommen had a sweetness Joffrey lacked and something they could use to their advantage, when they are old enough to play the game. Apparently not, he is still alive, 
but it will take him a long time to recover. Jacob replied. Tommen and Marcella smiled, as they were delighted of the thought of Bran still living in this world, but Queen Cersei looked concerned, as it showed in her face. What do you mean? The queen said, with her voice stern and blunt. She didn't like the Baratheon young lord's presence, no more than he did of her. The maester said he would survive. The queen and the kingslayer exchanged a look between each other, as Jacob caught it and wondered why such a faint and disappointing look on their faces. He knew Lord Tyrion caught it as well, but didn't say anything. Know your enemies, the Queen of Thorns taught me and I know them well. Jacob thought. Will he be all right? Tommen asked. Jacob looked at his younger cousin, even though he and his sister looked much like their Lannister mother. I'm afraid, not his back is broken from his wall and if he wakes up, he will never walk again. He said, brushing his fingers between his cousin's fair hair. When he wakes up, is that likely? The queen now looked wary, not sure about how to feel. Northerners are a tough bunch, but it's in the hands of the gods. Even if the boy lives, he will be a cripple. Lord Eddard should end his suffering it would be mercy. The kingslayer added. Jacob couldn't believe a man so honorless can think of such a thing, giving Bran a mercy death, like he was a horse unable to live its life on a pasture. For a man, who eliminated his king, he had no right to say whether someone lived or died. Maybe, it was how he eliminated the mad king and got away with it, without any form of punishment. Bran isn't a lame animal that should be disposed of, he is a child. Just because he can't walk, it doesn't mean he has to surrender his life to the strange, especially for someone so young, Jacob said, in a forceful tone. You should know about mercy killings, as it was what got your current moniker. Jacob succeeded in getting the attention of Lord Tyrion and Queen Cersei, as the two of them were dumbfounded, not knowing how to react. Sir Jaime raised his hand in defense and was a little agitated around the eyes, as Jacob's words must have rattled his cage. I'm not sure what my past has to do with the present. Sir Jamie huffed, in a bit of agitation. Nothing, but if I remember correctly, Willis Tyrell is similarly hampered, by that dreadful tourney, but it didn't stop him from living his life. I didn't see his family plotting to end his existence, since I fostered with them. Jacob replied. Must be dreadful, a man like yourself surrounded by chivalry and such foolishness in the reach. I pity you, Sir Jamie. Having to serve a king, who has little to no regard for your sister. My uncle should make an effort to at least respect her as his wedded wife and queen, not to dishonor her in front of our northern hosts. Jacob said quietly, not to have the prince and princess hearing him. The queen's eyes saddened, but quickly her expression turned to disdain and a coldness on her face. You are nothing like your uncle, yet you share his looks and his blood. Have you played Sivas, my queen? Jacob asked. No, my lord. The queen replied hastily. It's a good game, good for political strategy and time away from ruling the kingdoms. Are you going back to Dragonstone? Marcella questioned. I have to my father doesn't like me being away from home too long. Jacob said. Can you awaken the stone dragons? Tommen said, but it made Jacob smile. Both the little prince and princess hugged their older and gruffer cousin, as the other Lannisters ignored the sight. A child should be free and innocent, until they are forced to grow up fast and become pawns to the Game of Thrones. Poor kids, when they get older. They will be targets of the high nobility and those who want to get close to the Iron Throne. Jacob thought. Jacob left the Great Hall, as it was an interesting mind exercise, debating with the Lannisters over the subject of life and death. As the Queen of Thorns taught him, Jacob had gotten to know his enemies a lot better than he did previously, but he was sad to say goodbye to Tommen and Marcella. Jacob had found Rob and John in the God's Wood talking about things he couldn't quiet catch. As the young lord approached, the two of them gave him a polite smile. Being the realm of the old gods made the young lord feel strange, as he was a worshipper of the Seven, being a regular visitor of the small September in Winterfell, of Lady Caitlin being born a southerner and wanting the comforts of home with her. Mind if I joined you? Jacob asked attentively, as he knew it was the last time he would see them. Sure, we could use your company. Rob replied. 
Has Bran always been a good climber? Jacob started to ask. John nodded, making himself feel small. I've seen Bran climb anything, from rain, snow, sleet and whatever. Every time he was sure-footed. He has never fallen. The Stark heir shook his head, never, if he had then we would have never let him climb as often. Hmm. Suspicious. Jacob thought to himself. John is going to join the Night's Watch. Rob announced. Jacob knew what the Night's Watch had become, a once well-trained, well-organized band of professional warriors had slowly transitioned to be a horde of thieves, murderers, rapists and green boys, who have never used a steel sword. The young lord knew joining a dangerous endeavor at such a young age was a cause of concern, but he didn't blame him. Jacob had seen Lady Caitlin become in short of cruel to him, she merely tolerated him, as it was like walking on hot stones. Are you sure you want to do this? Jacob asked, as he didn't want John to make a mistake he could never come back from. I'm ready to swear the oath. John added. If you are prepared, then you must be aware of the state of the night's watch, it's not as grand as you think. Are you trying to change my mind? No, my father always said when a boy turns into manhood, then they are allowed to make their own choices, as foolish as it sounds. What do you mean? I mean it's good you want to choose your own path, make the best of what you have however, judgments based on naivety and emotions will make you a lot of enemies. What do you suggest, my lord? Watch out for yourself, and only trust those who seem genuine and not those at the wall, who might want to eliminate you because of who you are. It was time to depart from Winterfell, as Jacob had to move forward with his voyage with Ser Davos, Devon, Colin and Aaron back to Dragonstone. Jacob saw the two brothers embrace each other one last time, as he wished he had a brother, but having Shireen around made him feel at one with himself. The Baratheon lord extended his hand towards the Stark heir and he shook it in reply. I hope we see each other soon, not as enemies, but as allies. I hope so too, Lord Jacob. After the simpering goodbyes, it made Jacob miss the north a bit, but he rode Misty down the King's Road and it was uneventful. Uncle Robert wanted Jacob in court with him, as he felt alone and isolated without his father Stannis, as master of ships. Jacob respectfully declined the offer, as he didn't want to spend more time around the Lannisters than he had to, before he would eliminate one of them. He felt guilty, as Uncle Robert didn't want to speak to him anymore nor did he want to see his rigid nephew again. The young lord was ready to leave the grisly north and go back home. Are you sure about going to the wall? I'm ready to swear the oath and fulfill my duty to guard the realm. John replied. I'm not going to change your mind, because you are a man grown and it's your own choice to make. Not going with your uncle. No, returning back to Dragonstone is the best thing for me. Jacob said sternly, however, you never know, we might see each other again, as allies. After Jacob Baratheon and Jon Snow shook hands, the two young men made their own separate ways towards their future destinations. Jon rode towards the wall and Jacob was following the horses of his comrades, as he was going home to see his family for the first time in a long time. Chapter 8 Stannis was greatly concerned, as he knew his son was making his voyage home and should have been here by now. It had been three days, since Jacob stayed his last night in the north, but it was time to return and assume his duty, to his father and to his house. The Lord of Dragonstone blamed Robert, for sending Jacob to Highgarden and exposing him to the corrupt forces of the game. Some of the Florents were getting restless, as two members of their house accompanied Jacob on his visit to Winterfell and were not sure if they made it back safe and sound. Stannis trusted his son enough to keep himself safe on his visit to the north and to keep a watch out for their enemies and possible allies in the war to come. Standing out to look at the seas crashing onto the shores of the narrow sea, as it was the gateway into the eastern continent of the world. As a security measure, armed guards were positioned around the island because of how dangerous the realm will become when the time of war comes. He stood with Maester Cresson and his wife Lady Celis, as they were the other people who were concerned for Jacob's safety, being a young lord and his only son from his marriage. It's been too long since, I've seen my boy. Celis said. He will come, since his business in the north is over. Stannis replied. I'm glad to finally have him back, after you sent him away twice. 
My lady, those were my brother's orders. I cannot do anything to displease a king. He will stay home and go nowhere else. The lady of Dragonstone said harshly. Stannis had known his wife was overprotective of Jacob, as he was the only son born from their marriage, as it kind of saved it from becoming an existing misery for the two of them. It was a shame, he couldn't have any more sons, but Jacob proved himself to be twice the man his younger brother failed to be. The Lord of Dragonstone trusted the Onion Knight to take care of Jacob, as he was entrusted with this task and better well have done it well. Stannis knew Lord Stark was a fool to accept the offer of being Hand of the King, as it was basically a trap so the Lannisters had one more enemy to get rid of. He was smart enough to never let his son see court or even step through it, only on family occasions where his presence was needed. A group of armored Florence soldiers were blocking the entrance of the hand-painted table, as he heard some discrepancies outside of the castle, as the lord himself had to deal with it. Then, a young man of black hair and blue eyes entered the space, with the Onion Knight and his own squire being one of the younger of the Seaworth sons. Jacob had returned, and a looked a bit disgruntled, must be because of the guard stopping and questioning him. Celis rushed over to hug Jacob, as she was squeezing him tightly, with her head on his shoulder. Father, what is going on? Why are there soldiers on the outskirts of the island? Jacob asked. Leave us. Stannis commanded. The Lord had gestured the Florent and Dragonstone soldiers, Maester Cresson, his wife Lady Celis and the Onion Knight leaving the area. Only leaving the Lord of Dragonstone and his son, two sit on the painted table to look through the engraftments of the map of Westeros on it. It was for security measures. Stannis answered, about the soldiers on the outskirts of Dragonstone. Are we preparing for war or something? Maybe. It's always after a certain number of years in peacetime, it seems war will eventually come, since the first steps are set in stone. Stannis didn't know what the Tyrells had taught Jacob, during his fostering, but it was political smarts and intelligence in the area of court intrigue. How so, son? Uncle Robert is a terrible king, many of the noble houses tend to use his weakness to further their own ambitions and his queen hates him with a venom. Jacob explained, using pieces of the noble house animal symbols. You are not wrong about your uncle's ruling skills or lack thereof. Now, that Lord Eddard has entered the game, without even knowing it. Being Hand of the King grants him certain privileges, but they will not protect him from the grasp of the Lannisters and others, who seek to get closer to the throne. Jacob moved the piece with the wolf across the board, with his fingers on the stag and rose next, with his father watching on. Lord Stark is a northerner and doesn't know the game he is unwillingly playing. Stannis said. At the wedding of Lord Garland and Lady Leonette, Uncle Renly was a special guest and was befriending the Tyrells, especially Lord Mace. I don't know what his game is, but it has something to do with court. I knew my suspicions were onto something, but Robert dismissed them, as idle babblings. Jacob took the piece with the sun and spear on it, as he looked at it with an unfamiliar expression on his face, as he placed it far from the other pieces. The strange thing is, father. House Martell are the unknown factor within this whole game, the Tyrells hate them for what happened to Willis and the Martells hate the Lannisters. A bunch of dishonorable and cheating Dornish people don't matter in the grand scheme of things. Don't dismiss them too soon father, the Martells would only support one house, and it's the Targaryen. The two families had blood ties through marriages and a strong alliance. Why does that matter, son? Uncle Robert in all honesty is a king, who couldn't give less of a damn about ruling the kingdoms or putting the Lannisters in their places. As much as we don't like it, there are still those in the Seven Kingdoms, who call him Usurper, and it's a dangerous thing, especially so close to wartime. How was your uncle, in his visit to the north? Stannis asked, changing the subject of game playing. Fatter than the last time I saw him. Jacob replied, causing his father to smirk. I heard about the Stark boy's fall, unfortunate. Bran will be all right, it's Arya and Sansa I worry about, two young ladies who have no experience in court entry, and being surrounded by Lannisters, it's too dangerous. They should have been left at home, where they would most likely be safe. I didn't know my son grew sentimental over children, it seems you have matured beyond your age and carry the wisdom of a lord. Thank you for the compliment, father, 
Jacob said, with a smile on his face. How was mother and Shireen? Your mother and sister are content and they were missing you. I missed them too. Was the Onion Knight good company? He was great, kept me and my retinue entertained throughout the voyage. Were the Starks hospitable? I don't know how they do it, especially with the royal family to tend to, during their visit. The feast was madness. What happened, son? Uncle Robert in his usual ways, drinking too much, rambling a lot of nonsense and getting his hand on every available serving girl. Disgraceful. Stannis muttered. He started telling me of how I should be married before the winter came and how you and mother cannot keep me from marriage any longer. My brother may be a fool, but he is right. A suitable wife must be found for you immediately, since times of war are upon us soon. The woman better be from a respectable family, who can bring swords and provisions to Dragonstone, since the dreaded winter will be here soon. Your mother doesn't like it, the idea of you settling down, but she must understand that it is duty and you cannot escape from it. How comes Uncle Renly hasn't found a wife yet, and Uncle Robert hasn't done anything to make sure the future of his former homeland is in good shape? I have always wondered the same thing. Anyways, is Uncle Axel still trying to lick your boots, father? Jacob said, with a smirk on his face. I grow tired of that ambitious fool he needs to go back to where he came from. No doubt, the man is loyal, but I'll have someone keep an eye on him. The man cannot be trusted, especially when war eventually comes. You are right, son. Stannis and Jacob had an interesting conversation, as father and son. They both agreed on how Ser Axel Florent cannot be trusted and needed to be kept away from Celis and Shireen. The Lord of Dragonstone agreed with this son in terms of political intrigue, if war did come then there will be a lot of scattered players, who formerly played the game and wished to come back to set fire to the kingdoms. Stannis and Jacob looked at the set pieces, symboling the great houses of the kingdoms engraved with their sigils on them. Jacob moved the pieces of the wolf and the stag knocking them backwards, as if to foreshadow what was going to happen in the near future. For a war to start, two vital players must be eliminated or eliminated, for pandemonium to peruse. Jacob said, folding his arms for his father to see the two pieces knocked down. Chapter 9 Jacob stepped outside for a moment into the barren outside of the island, as his grayness and dreariness made him feel a bit sad inside. As a young child, Jacob was always curious of the stone's dragons that were above the stronghold and never moved a muscle. Whilst studying under the guise of Maester Lomais of Highgarden, Jacob had learned a lot about the history of how this stronghold was made, for the surviving Valyrian people, who had escaped from the doom, that ruined their civilization. Strange, as I have a bit of Targaryen blood tracing back to Princess Rael, the daughter of Aegon the V. Jacob threw in his mind. Targaryen history and the history of Valyria has always intrigued Jacob, as the stories of sorcery and dragons enchanted him, as he needed an escape from the mundaneness of everyday life. Being a highborn man in a constricted role of becoming a lord and running a castle in his name. Sometimes, Jacob wished he was someone else and didn't have to worry about finding a suitable woman to marry because he didn't want to anyways. Those of the opposite gender frightened him, because Jacob was never good at talking to girls, like Rob was and didn't have the charm Theon had, as much as he hated to think that. Jacob managed to scare away any woman in the South from wanting to marry him because of his gruff, humorless and blunt nature, which made him unlikable in the eyes of women all over the Seven Kingdoms. I don't care about what some silly girl thinks, as the only one I will care for will be the one, who will be my unfortunate wife. At the corner of his eye, Jacob saw his little sister Shireen playing a game with the fool Patchface, as his presence made Jacob's skin crawl. The young lord didn't trust him, as he knew the fool had unknown intentions, which were dangerous and he was a foreigner from Volantis, a city from the far east of the world. It must be because the fool saw Shireen as a person, not the grayscale that covered half her face. Jacob got off some of the rocks, to see what was going on and how he could get to know the fool a bit better, if he had stepped out of line. Then, he will put the fool to the sword. Jake. Shireen called out, as she rushed to hug her big brother, as the two siblings had the same look of black hair and blue eyes, more Baratheon than the royal children. Little sister, it's nice to see you and your friend. Jacob replied, 
seeing the fool fight behind her. Patch Face was dressed in a green and red motley, as his face was painted in the two colors, which made Jacob shiver a little with quickened fear. Jacob saw the half of his sister's left cheek covered with grayish, flaking black skin, as a result of her disfigurement from the grayscale. He didn't care what anyone said, Shireen was still his sister and he loved her, even if he had to eliminate a few people to defend her honor. I thought you got lost at sea. Shireen said. The sea made me feel a bit sick, especially Lord Mandalay's pies. Jacob replied, not wanting to remember the fat merman lord, who was fatter than Uncle Robert. Did you have fun? The north was cold, but the people were pleasant, better than those in the south. It's not fair, you are always away and never come to see me. Little sister, I don't trust the fool, he scares me and I don't like his intentions. Jacob placed a hand on his sister's shoulder. Patches is good he wouldn't hurt anyone. I hope you are right, Shireen. What have you learned from Maester Cresson, since I was away? The names of the great lords, the sigils, words and their histories. Shireen replied. The fool Patchface appeared from behind, as Jacob was close to reaching for his sword, not liking that surprise and would have eliminated him. Gods, the fool could have eliminated me by shock. Jacob gasped, with his heart racing through his body. Don't worry, Jake. He always does that, since we play a lot together. I'm not sure about this. Don't be grumpy, Jake. The cold of the north must have gotten into your bones. Jacob ignored that, as his sister was right, the chills of the north has made him a bit unpleasant at the moment, but he was glad to spend this time with her. Aegon's garden was quite barren and wasn't too pretty. Jacob had learned of how this place was where the conqueror came to when he needed time to himself. Patchface half green and half red checked face was behind the two siblings, as he waved to Shireen with a smile. Jacob's eyebrows arched at the gesture of the fool, as he didn't trust him and had to keep on his toes and watch out for the clown. How was your time with the Starks? Shireen asked, curious on how her brother's visit was. Cold, but comfortable. Jacob replied, as he rubbed his hands to warm them up. Mother and I missed you. It's all right now, little sister. I don't be going away any time soon. Jacob placed a hand on his sister's shoulder. Mother and father have been talking about finding you a wife. Oh. You listened, weren't you supposed to be in your lessons with Maester Cresson? He let me go early. Jacob stopped walking, as he kneeled down to get on Shireen's level with a sullen look in his sapphire blue irises. Shireen, even if I get married. I will never leave you, you will always be my number one lady. He said solemnly, brushing strains of his sister's hair away from her face. Did the Onion Knight enjoy the North? Ser Davos is losing his touch, his horse riding prowess is not as good as I expected. He doesn't have many fingers to hold on to the horse with. True. Why are there so many guards outside of the island? Jacob didn't know how to answer Shireen's question, as she was only ten years old and was too young to know about the dangers of war and the Game of Thrones. The guards are there to protect us, as times are becoming dangerous. Jacob answered. Is there going to be a war? Shireen questioned. But you never know when a war will come, some come unexpectedly and some wars are deliberate, as some lords start them for petty reasons. I hope you never go away to war. Shireen said, as Jacob gulped, swallowing uncertain feelings down his throat. I hope so too, little sister. Jacob didn't know how to explain things to his sister, as she was only a child and didn't need to know about the horrors of the battlefield yet. The young lord strolled through the gardens with his sister and the mad fool in tow. Chapter 10 Events of the Seven Kingdoms were at a tipping point, as Jacob was sitting in the chamber of the painted table, as his father had an upset stomach and wasn't too well. The news was of how the Lannister armies had attacked the Riverlands in retaliation for Lady Caitlin taking the imp hostage, sending him to the Airy for a trial. Stupid woman, does she realize what she has done? Jacob thought bitterly, as he looked at the pieces laid on the painted table. The young lord knew Lord Tywin wasn't going to take this slight on his honor too lightly, as this was the same lord, who destroyed two notable houses of the Westerlands, killing all their family members and remaining relatives. 
In other bad news, there had been a fight in the city streets between Lord Eddard and Sir Jamie, which made things a lot worse. Are the Stark so honorably stupid to cross the lion's claws, remember the last person who did such a thing, as that same person's good daughter and grandchildren were murdered, only because they were threats to the new king and their rise to power. Jacob had spent more time with his mother and sister the best he could, as he felt like a stranger because he had been away for so long. He took to running the island well, as some of the guards were posted outside of the castle for security measures and how dangerous times were becoming. Jacob was good at running things, as he had to deal with those belligerent Florent uncles and cousins, desperate for his trust and allegiance. When things got a little much, Jacob turned to Maester Cresson for advice and a bit of wisdom, as he needed it, before he eliminated anyone in the castle. At the corner of his eye, Jacob saw the old maester enter the chambers with a few books in his hands, as the young lord stood up to help him out. Thank you, my lord. The maester said, grateful for his help. Jacob looked at one of the titles of the books brought in. The History of War Strategies in the Seven Kingdoms, great book but the archmaester, who wrote it unfortunately passed away. Died of the spring sickness. Terrible, but at least the summer is upon us and no sicknesses to arrive any time soon. Your father will be well enough to eat with the family. Great, but I've never seen my father ever get sick before. When he was a child, your lord father was quite good at hiding things, such as his feelings and if he was upset. Maester Cresson, I want to know about my grandfather Lord Stefan. Father wouldn't tell me anything, as he doesn't want to tell me anything of a man I don't know. I delivered your lord grandfather, when he was no more than a babe, as I delivered both your uncles and your father. Jacob's expression changed, as he didn't want to hear anything on the subject of childbirth and people being born, mostly because of the respect he had for his mother, for enduring all those miscarriages and stillborns all those years. The young lord wanted a brother, but Jacob knew that was not going to happen, unless a miracle was bestowed on his mother. Where did the fool patch face come from? Lord Jacob asked. The fool was brought from Volantis by your lord grandfather, as a means of entertainment for his sons, he hoped the fool would make your father laugh, as a child. Jacob's mind blanked, not wanting to create an image in his head of his humorless, uptight father laughing at anything the idiot clown did. Gods, save me from my own corrupted imagination. Jacob's thoughts pleaded to the seven. Maester Cresson looked upon Lord Stannis's son and saw more than just his father and mother in him, but he shared characteristics akin to his lord grandfather Stefan. Those in the Seven Kingdoms fear me, but Maester I haven't eliminated a high lord or started a war. Jacob wondered. People fear what they don't understand, as most are fools to charm and wit, not honorable qualities in a man. Maester Cresson replied. Would have I been successful at court? You should have taken his grace's offer. Maester, I love my uncle, but I cannot sufferance myself to be around those blonde-haired and green-eyed shits for any longer than necessary. Language, young man. What would your lord father say, if he heard you saying such things? Blame Uncle Robert for his bad influence. Have you thought of visiting Storm's End, my lord? The stronghold that was supposed to be passed down to me, if father died. Jacob spoke bitterly, not wanting to dig up any old wounds. Lord Renly would have wanted you to stay for a few days. No, Maester. Things between Uncle Renly and I haven't been the same, since the wedding when I questioned him of his intentions of befriending the Tyrells. A man's ambition can only be matched by a woman's, my lord. It's the way the highborn play the game. Learning southern politics is different to those of other regions and continents, Maester. The game southerners love to play has dire consequences, such as death to ensure power and an alliance. I remember when your father came home from the Greyjoy Rebellion, quite hardened and had achieved a lot, during that war. If I had been king, then Balon Greyjoy would have been put to the sword. Jacob grimaced. Your uncle saw something redeeming in Lord Greyjoy to allow him to keep his lands. Redeeming, Jacob exclaimed, starting to chuckle. Lord Balon Greyjoy is nothing, but a chinless craven who hides behind sea and salt. How did things leave off between you and his grace? Not good, maester. Uncle Robert doesn't want to see me again, after rejecting another offer to come to court, if he was so desperate to have me with him in King's Landing, 
then it meant he had little faith in his old friend Ned Stark to keep him safe from the Lannisters. You play the game of intrigue well, my lord. The best thing about being stuck with the Tyrells is you learn a lot, more than the usual thing sons of highborn lords and ladies learn to be successful in ruling a region, a castle, and a stronghold. Every lord should teach their children about the game and how to play it, less deaths means an even playing field. The things said about Lord Stark are worrisome, if he doesn't play carefully. He will get into serious trouble. It's a shame, Cresson. Northerners are an honorable lot, but cannot play the game, it's why Northerners are unlucky, coming down to the south. What will happen now? Uncle Renly should do his duty to protect his brother, the Lannisters have an open opportunity to seize the power they want, under Joffrey, I'd rather die than see that become king. Jacob wanted to believe Maester Cresson at his word, the man never lied to him, as he was always available to the young lord at any time. In time, maybe Jacob will learn to grow into a man and fight his own battles, whether the battle of armors and swords, or the battle of politics and intrigue. Chapter 11 Jacob was sitting on the painted table, as he had just gotten the news of how Uncle Robert was injured, during a hunt and was defeated by a wild boar. He didn't like the sounds of that, because as a child, he had always known his uncle to be strong and to win wars, and eliminate those who crossed him. Not the sad, excuse of a man he was nowadays, who wanted to whore and drink himself into a grave. Just now, a raven had come by to deliver him a message, which came from King's Landing, no doubt from Lord Eddard, as he was still Hand of the King after all. His squire Devon had just delivered the letter to him, as he went back to spend time with his brothers and his father. Jacob had known all seven sons of the Onion Knight, named Dale, Allard, Mathos, Merrick, Stannis, Stephen and his squire Devon. The young lord was charmed, as two of the sons of Ser Davos were named after his lord father and late grandfather, which made Jacob a bit sentiment. Jacob had seen the seal of the king on it, as he was adamant of reading the message before it had been too late. It read. Lord Jacob. This message may seem in haste, but your uncle doesn't have much time before he is dead, and pandemonium will presume in the seven kingdoms. Your uncle has apologized for how he treated you on the king's road and wishes you to inherit his old stag pendant, which was all he had of his lord father, before he died in shipwreck many years ago, when he was a young man. Things in court are dangerous, especially the knowledge I possess, which will label me a threat to the Lannisters and their hunger for power. I should have listened to you, as you have more experience in playing this dreadful game, learning from the Tyrells. Lord Renly has left the city of King's Landing and I suspect he is going to the Reach, alongside the Knight of Flowers, and I do not know why, since his brother is close to death. As your uncle tells me you are an expert at intrigue, have studied under the tutelage of the Tyrells. Speaking off, Lord Renly had suggested days ago, for your uncle to marry Lady Marjorie in exchange to set Queen Cersei aside. It was a fool's game, as the Lannisters do not take slights very easily, as destroying two houses in their own lands because those lords were foolish to challenge Lord Tywin's authority. Speaking of the old lion, he has been burning the homelands of my wife and my son has gone down south to liberate the river lords with much of the northern host. If things go wrong, and I end up in the grave, alongside your uncle. You might be the only person capable of saving the kingdoms. My own son is honorable, but doesn't know the game, Lord Renly has his own ambitions and your father is no friend of the nobility or the small folk. You have a mind for the game, but the prowess of a battle-ready warrior. I have faith in you, my lord and your father, if he receives my message soon. Lord Eddard Stark Hand of the King and Warden of the North Jacob felt a coldness inside of him, as Uncle Robert was dying and he couldn't do anything to save him from such a fate. Maybe, for him, it would end his suffering of being stuck to a wife, he hates and children he couldn't give less of a damn about. I didn't know Lord Stark liked me so much. Jacob thought in his mind. His hands must be tied, with my uncle dying and the Lannisters waiting to get rid of him. Jacob found a golden pendant, along with the letter, as it was fashioned from real gold and it still looked, as good as new. The pendant must have belonged to his grandfather Lord Stephen, then had given it to Uncle Robert and now it's in his hands. Jacob felt a bit honored, as it kind of made up for what had happened on the king's road between uncle and nephew. He placed the pendant around his neck, 
as it made him feel like a real Baratheon with the symbol of his house around his neck. It's a shame, my uncle can't give it to me himself, I bet Joffrey would have been jealous. The thought of Uncle Robert dying hurt Jacob, as he would be losing his favorite uncle and being left with the uncle he hated the most. Jacob didn't like his uncle Renly very much, as the two always clashed and fought over the simplest of things, such as appropriate cloths and wanting to go to court with him. He didn't like how his uncle pranced around court, wearing expensive clothes, in which Jacob wished he had worn, being the rightful heir of Storm's End after all. He may be the lord of Storm's End and my uncle, but he will not get away so easily. Two days afterwards, his uncle Robert had died, as he had apparently wanted his pain eased by the milk of the poppy. Jacob felt a stoniness inside, as he didn't want to talk to anyone and kept himself away from most of the people on Dragonstone. It was too late, because Lord Eddard would be in danger, not knowing how to play the game and being surrounded by fools and bootlickers. The worst were the people sitting on the small council, a position Jacob would have liked to have taken, but Uncle Renly didn't like the idea of him stealing his seat. The eunuch Lord Varys, as he was the strangest of them all and was a foreigner, which was something Jacob had to be aware of. The old Grand Maester Pycelle, who liked to play up this act of being frail, but underneath the chain was a sad, chinless man, who was loyal to one lord, and it was Tywin Lannister. The one Jacob despised the most was Lord Baelish, the low-born upstart, who got lucky because of his childhood connection with the former Tully sisters and was given the position of Master of Coin, by John Aaron himself. I bet Baelish had something to do with Aaron's death, since he didn't like him very much. Jacob pondered. With Uncle Robert dead and Joffrey is king, the kingdoms are going to burn, before peace can last throughout the summer. In Jacob's eyes, Joffrey wasn't qualified to be king, because he wasn't educated, as a king should be. It was obvious, the poor idiot was just a figurehead for the Lannisters to control the Iron Throne. Jacob was in black clothing, as he was still grieving for his uncle and didn't want to talk to anyone, apart from Shireen, Maester Cresson and his mother. He had a brief argument with his father, about him being able to grieve properly and how his father hardly had any feelings towards his now dead brother. Others would assume his father Stannis had a cold heart and didn't care for anyone, but he closed off his feelings because he wanted to appear strong and put together. At the corner of Jacob's eye, he caught his father entering the chamber, with a sullen look on his face, as he had time to mourn for his late brother. I see you are wearing your uncle's pendant. His father asked, seeing it around Jacob's neck. It's the last thing he gave me. It's unfortunate, on how this game seems to take good people away and leave the bad ones behind. What do you mean? Soon, son. We will be at war and it will not be a pleasant time for most in the kingdoms. Why? I suspected for a long time, the royal children were not sired by your uncle, but by the queen and the kingslayer. His father sat down, and said the statement in a hush whisper. Incest. Jacob said, with his eyes wide open. He didn't think such a thing can still be in the Seven Kingdoms, when the Targaryens left. Lord Aaron and I suspected for the longest, but it cost the man his life and I was lucky to be alive. Who else has knowledge of this? Lord Eddard, he sent me an important message, but I cannot tell anyone else until the time is right. It's better that way, since there might be spies on the island, working for the crown. Lamwick fools looking to earn a little gold. If what you say is true father, then you are king and I am your heir. Jacob said quietly. I'm afraid Lord Eddard might not live to see this war transpire. The Lannisters may be cruel, but they are not stupid enough to eliminate the Warden of the North, it will send the North and the Riverlands in rebellion, not to mention if the Vale joins Rob. They will remove any obstacle in their way to power, even if it means starting a war. A lot of blood will be shed, for a king who doesn't belong on the throne, and for rebel lords wanting to win their way into court. Renly fled the city, the smartest thing that fool has done in a long time. Father, Uncle Renly may have motives of his own, like putting himself forward as a contender for the throne. That would be reckless and not to mention disrespectful. Jacob's previous prediction was coming true, two powerful players in the game had to be eliminated, in order for a war to begin. Uncle Robert was already dead, but Lord Eddard was already going to make his way down to a grave. It was a shame, 
because the two men were ignorant of the backstabbing, scheming and arse-licking around them. As a young man growing up and soon to be a young lord of six and ten Jacob was ready to take a chance and become the man, his uncle Robert wanted him to be. Chapter 12 Lying down on the floors of his chambers was what Jacob did that day, he was solemn and silent of the sounds and noise around him. The days coming were going to be of bloodshed, scheming, and possible alliances to be made and flaunting about marriages to signify two families joining together. Lord Stark is dead, and the North and the Riverlands have revolted in rebellion, while the Aryan Dorns sit back and watch the impeding massacre of houses commence, Uncle Renly has his own ambition and is a problem that has to be dealt with soon. Death and people dying was what Jacob anticipated, when he was to play the game, but he didn't think his uncle Robert would die in order for those in his court to seize the power they want. The young prince didn't want to talk to anyone, as he was still hurting from the loss of his favorite uncle, and the one he hated still lived and made the fight for the throne a lot harder. His eyes were staring at the selling of his bedchambers, as he was withdrawn and distant from most of the people on Dragonstone. How can I go to war now, when my little sister hardly understands the game and the sacrifices made to keep things together? Jacob felt an abundance of guilt, for essentially leaving his uncle to be torn apart by the lions, as he could have had a part in saving him from them. If the impeding war wasn't bad enough, a foreign shadowbinder from the distant city of Ashai arrived on Dragonstone, proclaiming his father to be the chosen one and the hero to destroy the great other. Funny, the eastern sort were raving mad, and I hope father and the rest our men are smart enough not to listen to her foreign babblings, which can lead us into a war against the faith. He knew he had to deal with the Red Priestess sooner or later. Jacob thought of how only he and his father knew of what was coming to Eddard Stark, knowing the information he knew about his not biological cousins, whom were all bastards born of incest. It was for the best, until his father was ready to tell those in his council and those vassal lords, who were obligated to supporting his fight for the Iron Throne. The Lannisters may have Sansa captive with other highborn hostages, with a little persuasion to make those other lords bend the knee to get their relatives back. But little Arya escaped the claws of the lion and is lost out there in the realm, ready to bleed for a king, who doesn't deserve his crown. Under the tutelage of the Tyrells, Jacob learned a lot, when it came to playing the game and moving himself on the game board and having advantages to survive. At the back of his mind, Jacob thought of Rob, who was the same age as him and was a young lord going to war, in vengeance of his father's wrongful death. The young prince hoped his northern friend wasn't stupid enough to trust anything Theon Greyjoy tells him to do, as his family sees this war of kings to be an opportunity to get their revenge on the Starks. Jacob sat up from the floors, as he stood up to tie his hair in a longish ponytail. His hair has significantly grown, since his last name day and his next was coming in two days' time. Great, my sixteenth name day to coincide with a war. As a way to distinguish the differences between the two Baratheon contenders, his father had adopted his own sigil, which was a heart gules and flamed proper charged with a stag's head sable crown of the field. It reflected in Jacob's clothing, as well his undershirt, breeches and cape were primarily in flame orange, with ruby red and bright yellow details in the patterns of his newly made outfit, as the colors were more vibrant and bright. Jacob couldn't see his sister, as often as he could because his parents wanted expand on Shireen's education, as a well-learned princess was important because Jacob could die on the battlefield, and only she will be the heir to the throne. Pylas is no older than Willis, but fresh from the citadel to assist Crescent in his duties, as he is unwell and unable to do his regular duties, like before. He has been in charge of my sister's education going forward. The new young maester on Dragonstone was the only person, Jacob did not view as a threat, but it made him face the reality of Crescent's age and how he might not be around to counsel him anymore. Shireen was lucky to be educated by Crescent, whilst Jacob was under the tutelage of the Tyrells, and learning the game of courts from the walls of the flowery castle of Highgarden. Jacob had seen his mother Celis a lot calmer and less overprotective, maybe it was the influence of the Red Priestess's religion, as it converted many of the Florence and their men to worshipping this foreign deity from the east. The young man knew some of his father's men still kept to the faith, like he did and were at odds with the men converted to the Red God. We are preparing for war, we shouldn't have in fighting within our own army, when our enemies are getting stronger. There were many enemies in the kingdom, 
with the Lannisters in the Crownlands, the Northmen and the Rivermen right next to the Westerlands and his uncle Renly in the south. The doors of his chambers opened for Ser Davos to enter, as Jacob was glad to see a friendly face, amongst the bootlickers and those who wanted to win his allegiance. The Onion Knight was one of the men not overpowered, by the priestess's religion, but was adamant of her being a threat to his father. The new title of prince and heir to the Iron Throne felt strange for Jacob, as that skin didn't fit him well, but by honor and duty, the titles were his. It feels strange, doesn't it Sir? Just days ago, I was a lord and now a prince, funny how titles change in a short space of time, Jacob said, in an exasperated tone. Loyal soldiers follow the leaders, they believe are worthy to their cause, your grace. Ser Davos replied. The priestess's religion has overwhelmed the island and there is potential for a civil war in our mists. You should talk to them, they would be more likely to listen to you, being the heir to the throne. Those licking Florence wouldn't do anything for me, unless it benefits them. Especially, when great uncle Lord Estermont has thrown his weight behind that thieving uncle of mine. Jacob said, raising his voice. Would reconciliation with your uncle be of consideration? No, Ser Davos. Uncle Renly and I have an impaired relationship, he was jealous of how I was smarter than him in court politics and how I almost stole his seat on the small council. How can an uncle hate his nephew so much? When that same uncle is jealous of said nephew's achievements, learned intelligence and the ability to put lords and ladies in their place. The red woman in etching closer to your father, and I might not be able to stop him. She could be useful, but her religion is a threat to us getting allies, whom all believe in the faith of the seven and the old gods. Don't tell me you have converted to the red woman's god. Jacob held his hand out and said. Of course not, Sir. Learning under tutelage of the Tyrells taught me the faith is the dominant religion in Westeros, and any opposition will ignite a war for religious supremacy in the realm. It's why the woman's religion and rambling should not spread within our camp, or otherwise we will not get any allies to our cause and end up in a losing war against the faith. What should we do? Are you alone in your misgivings, Sir? Jacob asked. Maester Crescent has his reservations, along with the men loyal to your father and, also keep to the seven. The woman believes my father is the chosen one against the great other, it's an age-old legend told to children of the north. Jacob started to laugh, at the idea of his father being any kind of shining hero, when he was just a man, wedded to duty, honor and justice. I'm not sure he feels the same way, as you do, your grace. How was your mission in the Stormlands? A failure, most of the Stormlords have no love for your father and have decided to join your uncle instead, along with the Lords of the Reach. Jacob brushed a hand across his head, and breathed a sigh of exhale. Really, Uncle Renly was always the showman, begging for attention and praise. Are you not concerned? I saw it coming. At Lord Garland and Lady Leonette's wedding, when Uncle Renly was a special guest. The times I would go back to High Garden, my uncle and Lord Mace would converse in private, but I knew it wasn't for a friendly chat, especially with Lord Tyrell being the ambitious man he is, and wanting his family close to the Iron Throne, by any means necessary. Do you still care for the Redwine girl? I suspect Uncle Renly to marry Lady Marjorie to get her father's support and his bannerman, but he could have married Desmara to spite me. Jacob's sapphire blue eyes widened, and were still. Your uncle has instituted a new king's guard, called the Rainbow Guard. Ser Davos said grimly. Normally, the son of Stannis Baratheon didn't laugh much, but he took light at the expense of his most hated uncle and his stupidity and foolishness. The young prince began to laugh, at the thought of his uncle's best knights wearing all colors of the rainbow on their arms. It fits with my uncle's outlandish tastes, imagine all the knights wearing all those bright colors on the battlefield, they would blind their enemies with the sight of their colors. Jacob laughed. With the Knight of Flowers, as their Lord Commander. It would be a shame, since Willis and I were great friends. Killing his brother would surely make us enemies. Does your father know? I prefer he doesn't, sir. He is king and has his duties and work, as I have my own plans to put those belligerent Florence and vassal lords in their place. What of those relatives of yours, who have deserted you and sided with your uncle? They will be pardoned, 
but never forgiven or unpunished. My father makes the rules, as I implement them. Marriage is the next step, your father is adamant in finding you a suitable match to gain alliances, but your mother is determined not to have you married off. I love my mother, Sarah, but she must let this happen. It's because I am her only son, and doesn't want me to get hurt. A mother's love is a powerful thing that is not a weapon or poison. The options are quite thin, your grace. Are the rumors true of Rob Stark crowing himself King of the North and the Trident, Maester Crescent told me earlier? Yes, it's true. Your Grace. Jacob's sapphire blue eyes changed, as they were light before, but now have darkened and full of rage behind them. Traitor, he will answer for his usurpation of my father's throne. Jacob barked, in a tone seeped in bitterness and anger. Within himself, Jacob was raging and surprised of how Rob wasn't mustering his forces to support him, as they had grown to be friends in Winterfell. It seems war and its aftermath changes people, for the worse. My uncle got fat from the pressures of ruling the kingdoms, Rob and Uncle Renly became traitors and my enemies. If it came to battle, your grace. Would you eliminate the Stark boy? It depends, if he hopes the mother gives him mercy not to die by my blade or the stranger not to take him away from the world. The Stark boy has the forces of the North and the Riverlands on his side, and your uncle has the strength of the Reach and the Stormlands behind him. Most of the Reacher lords are not as smart, as they think they are. The only ones with brains are Lords Rowan, Tarly and Hightower. Lord Mace is fortunate his mother and Willis are the smart ones in the family. Will peace be an option? Uncle Renly may be ambitious, but stupid. He is only crowned king, so Lord Mace can have his dream of his daughter being queen and a grandson on the throne. It's swapping Casterly Rock corruption with Highgarden corruption. The prince spoke. Jacob saw enemies everywhere, and didn't feel safe outside the island of Dragonstone and those who cared about him. Growing into a man has a lot of weight behind it, as war, bloodshed, politics and the battlefield awaited him. Chapter 13 The aging maester was strolling around on the Isle of Dragonstone, after seeing the red comet across the sky, as it must be a sign of an omen. Cresson had seen a white raven arrive from the citadel, declaring the end of the long summer in living memory and the coming of the long winter. His eventual successor Pylas was responsible for the education of Princess Shireen and most of his day-to-day -day duties, as he was growing old and feeble. Seeing the fool Patchface entertain the princess made him smile a little as Cresson saw the princess as the saddest child he has ever known, and he considered her another mark of his failures. The grayscale on the left cheek of the princess almost claimed her life, but since the return of her brother Prince Jacob, she had become happier and a bit more cheerful. Nevertheless, Prince Jacob was successful on his own right, under the tutelage of the overlords of the Reach and finding his own place in the world. Death had forced Prince Jacob to become a man and face the cruelty of the world, and made him see enemies everywhere, paranoid and reclusive just like his father. Cresson saw a lot of the growing sadness inherited from his king to the prince, as Prince Jacob isolated himself from a lot of inhabitants of Dragonstone, apart from his immediate family and the sons of Ser Davos. He couldn't blame him, as the young man just lost his uncle and feels betrayed by the Stark boy, whom crowned himself king in the north and his uncle Renly, who crowned himself the king in Highgarden. The maester was thankful the prince was strong enough to resist the red woman's influence, as he was smarter than that and knew better. I worry for the prince, his anger is not as expressive, but deeply concealed, and uses his mind to plot such wickedness inside his mind, not forgetting he is only a man of five and ten and is about to experience his first war. Cresson knew the red woman was not good, if King Stannis wanted to win the Iron Throne, but it seemed he was thankful his son Jacob, being his heir was the one his king listened to the most, rather than the Lady Melisandre's babblings. The Onion Knight's mission in the Stormlands was a failure, the Stormlords have no love for his grace, but his unmarried son soon to be a man of six and ten was an advantage. But the Queen Celis was apprehensive of her only boy being wed, as she wasn't trusting of whom might share her son's bed. The maester could see the queen's apprehension of her son being married off there were a lot of falsehood nowadays, as people were not worth trusting, with many having agendas of their own. Cresson knew his king couldn't protect the prince from war, 
as Prince Jacob was a battle-ready warrior, trained by one of the greatest military commanders in the South. It's ironic, as the young prince will be going to war against his uncle, the people who fostered him, and the now northern lord he called friend days ago. The Red Woman's arrival was when Prince Jacob was away in the north, as he would have been challenged for the Lady Melisandre, with the prince being a devout believer in the Seven and is devoted to protecting his family from her madness. Prince Jacob has no love for his uncle Renly, the two would constantly clash and fight over this simplest of things, it was the bitterness of not inheriting Storm's End, which belonged to him by the laws of succession, after his father. The young prince has his late uncle's ability to hold a grudge for a long period of time. Cresson thought of Prince Jacob, as another son, but more politically savvy than his father and uncles, but hadn't experienced war and bloodshed, like his father did years ago and will see his first battles and those he called friends will be his enemies. He knew the Lady Melisandre had to be stopped, but Prince Jacob would properly have her thrown into the sea, if he caught any whiff of falsehood, then the men in their camp would have no choice, but to listen to their prince rather than the foreign red woman. The maester opens the doors to the chamber of the painted table, as he finds Stannis in the top room of the keep, looking down at the painted table, which was detailed map of Westeros. He could see his king was sheltered, keeping all emotions at bay and alone. With his son still grieving for his uncle in peace and quiet. I knew you would come, even though you haven't been summoned, the king said bluntly. You need your rest now. I am here, if my king needs counsel. The right of Storm's End should have belonged to me, then passed down to my son, when my brother assumed the throne. I occupied it, built his fleet. The island doesn't give me the supply of men I need to seize the throne. What you brother did was an injustice, but he gave you Dragonstone because he needed a strong lord, who can hold it, as Renly was only a boy at the time. Still a boy, but a thieving boy who hasn't done anything to earn the throne. The king said, with bitterness in his tongue. Why did the gods inflict me with brothers? Renly is not as politically smart, as the prince, but he is bold and heedless, just like Robert. What am I to tell those banner men, who I do command? Tell them that the Lannisters are the true enemy, and suggests we join with Renly to defeat them. I refuse to join with that thief, who decides to command the armies of the Stormlands and the Reach against me. Mind you, it was Robert who suggested my son foster with the Lannisters with flowers on their banners. To be educated alongside their sons and daughters, trained by a stern lord and knows how to sail better than any ship captain I've seen during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Would a partnership with Rob Stark prove fruitful, he commands the armies of the Riverlands and the North behind him. He is another green boy and another false king, daring to steal half of my kingdom. Robert's idea to make the Stark boy and my own friends was a disaster, and now Jacob wants to eliminate him for defiance and treason. Half a realm is better than none, the boy might bend the knee in exchange for help in avenging his father. Why should I avenge him? He means nothing to me, only sent my son that letter and now he wears my dead brother's pendant around his neck, as rightfully so. I was his true brother, not Stark, but he treated me, as if I wasn't his brother. I held Storm's End for him, watching good people starve to death, while Mace Tyrell and Paxter Redwine were feasting over the other side of the walls. Did he thank me? No he thanked Stark for lifting the siege. I built a fleet at his command, took Dragonstone in his name, but he blamed me for the Dairy Knight and the Targaryen children escaping, as if I could have stopped it. I sat on his council for fifteen years, whilst I allowed him to send my son to Highgarden to be fostered, to help John Aaron rule his realm whilst Robert drank and hoard, but Aaron died, did my brother name his own brother his hand? No, he went riding off to his dear friend Ned Stark and offered him the honor. He could have removed Renly from the council and instilled my son instead. And small good it did either of them. I would suggest a marriage pact between the princess and Robert Aaron. Dragonstone is too grim of a place for a child. It was planned to have the sickly child brought to foster with me, but Lady Arryn will never let her son leave the walls of the mountains, she is paranoid and sees enemies everywhere. Sending the princess and her fool to the Arry would be a better idea, she will be safe from war, as the Vale men are not fighting for any of the claimants of the realm. It's worth a try. Then, Stannis's wife Queen Celis and son Prince Jacob entered, 
with the prince having a stony look on his face, as he looked to be fighting an internal war with himself. You don't need to beg or bargain with anyone, they all owe their allegiance to you, the true king. The queen said sharply. I need swords to my cause, and do you have an army? The king argued in reply. House Florent can provide an army. They can only provide two thousand men and are too close to High Garden. The comet is a sign, a sign the Lord of Light will aid you on your conquest. How many men will the Red God provide for me in the war? Rulaller will bring you the power of High Garden and Storm's End to you side. Queen Celis insisted. Mother, those men are fighting for Uncle Renly, especially those of House Florent and House Estermont, who have blood ties to me and Shireen. The prince spoke up, as his parents were listening. Don't worry, my boy. They will release the error of their ways and will fight for us. If only you were not as stubborn in delaying the inevitable, Jacob will get married, whether you or Lady Melisandre dislike it. The king said, to the queen. If Renly should die, then his armies will flock over to you. The queen suggested, Lady Melisandre has looked into the flames, and has seen Renly's death. Crescent saw the prince's eyes finch, as his shoulders were hunched back and parts of his hair covering his face, as he pushed it back to see his saddened irises and fumbling fingers. It's an evil fratricide and should not be entertained. The maester said. The maester was horrified by the notion, of having Lord Renly assassinated for some hope of his armies coming to his side. It's a dangerous idea and should be put away, as he didn't want to see the men he raised fight each over for a sword-melted throne. I have heard your counsel and will hear hers, you should leave. The king said bluntly, as the maester did as he was bid. After the seemingly harsh conversation with the king, the maester slumped back into his rooms, with the help of Maester Pilus, his soon-to-be replacement. He contemplated his options of what to do. Cresson raised Robert, Stannis and Renly after their father was taken by the angry sea, and cannot bear to watch one eliminate the other. He knew every word Queen Celis said was preached to her by Melisandre, it is she who must be silenced, before she can convert the king to her evil schemes and spread her mad religion beyond the island of Dragonstone. The maester was fortunate it won't happen, with Prince Jacob holding a considerable amount of influence over his father, being his only son and heir to the throne. Cresson was concerned for the prince, as Ser Davos told him of the prince wanting to eliminate Rob Stark for not supporting him and crowning himself king. How could things go so wrong, war and bloodshed changes people, as the prince is now etching to eliminate a boy, he once called friend, as the Stark boy betrayed him for his own ambition for a crown. The Strangler The maester knew poison was a terrible, honorless crime, but it was the only poison in the world, which can ensure a quick, painful death, surely the gods will forgive him for such a crime, as it was to remove a real threat to King Stannis's path to the Iron Throne. He made sure the poison was dissolved into the wine, as it was to look harmless to the average eye, but the red woman's eyes were not average at all. Crescent plans on giving the cup to Lady Melisandre at the feast, King Stannis was holding for his banner men and the lords of the crownlands. He knew it was a dreadful thing he was planning, but it had to be done to eliminate the red woman from the king's side. On the contrary, the doors of his rooms opened for Prince Jacob to enter, clothed in the orange, red and yellow colors of the king's new sigil, adopted from the red woman's religious emblem. The maester was quick to hide the poison and the cup away, he didn't want the prince to turn on him, as he suspected the king already did. I didn't see you were busy, maester. The prince said kindly, unlike the tone he used against the bannermen. I didn't expect you to visit me. Cresson replied. My father didn't mean to make you feel insignificant, but he has a lot on his mind. Preparing for war, trying to gain allies across the realm and making his claim known. The Red Woman is influencing your mother. Can't blame her, she has been through a lot, miscarriages and stillborns. It's nice she has something to believe in, even if it's not of the faith. What has my mother done to deserve the suffering of losing potential brothers and sisters? She is starting to have an influence on your father, since he was the one who brought her to Dragonstone. Don't worry, maester. I still have my father's trust and confidence, over some foreigner from a distant city in the east. What of the rest in your father's court, the men who are devoted to her religion and your mother converting them? It's to be a grand feast, and I don't want you to miss it, 
all because of a misunderstanding. The prince said, resting his head on the maester's shoulder. Crescent started to smile, as his heart softened. You know to soften one's heart, your grace. Hours late in the day, Crescent had been late for the feast King Stannis was holding for the bannermen and vassal lords on the island. He was thankful for the knight, who helped him get to the top of the keep, but the fool Patchface was rambling on in song and looked to be disturbed. The maester knew his plan could fail, and he could die. Leaving Prince Jacob to grieve over someone else he cared for. Lady Melisandre was an enigma of her own, from a distant land and a foreign religion spreading through Dragonstone and the king's court. Her wicked and foreign beauty, may have seduced some of the men into worshipping the Red God. Luckily, the Red Woman didn't convert the prince to her mad religion, as the prince knew better, from studying under the Tyrells and not wanting to be a part of a war against the faith. I hope to the seven, the prince doesn't lose his good heart and stain it with the blood of the young wolf and his uncle. When he reached the high table of the chamber, Crescent sees the king has given his seat to Pylos. Why did you not wake me? Crescent asked, of the young apprentice. I was told to let you rest and you were not needed. Pylos replied. Crescent didn't blame the young man he was only doing his duty to the king and wanted to be kind. The maester looks at all the lurid knights and captains, the aged and sour lord Ardrian Celtigar, the handsome lord Monford Valerian, the young lord Durham Bar Emmon, the uninviting Sir Axel Florent, the pious lord Gunser Sunglass and the Lycine Captain Salador Song. Only Sir Davos was dressed simply. Prince Jacob sits to Stannis's right, in the place of high honour, as it should be. Lady Melisandre sits with Queen Celis, no doubt influencing her more with her religion and flame visions of victory for the king. Pylos will assume all of your duties for the time being. You are to rest and think of your health. The king spoke bluntly. The maester was heartbroken, as he didn't believe they were Stannis's words, remembering how it was him who was unloved and needed it, rather than his brothers. The rejection pained him, as the blank expression on the face of Prince Jacob, who couldn't use his clever mind this time. Out of all the assembled lords, Ser Davos offered him a seat, as the Onion Knight shared his misgivings on the Red Woman and her religion. As the fool Patchface begins to entertain the king and the assembled lords. We should wear motley, as we are about fool's business. The Onion Knight commented. Your grace, it would be prudent to ally with Rob Stark or Lady Arryn. The maester urged. Rolaller is the only ally the king needs. Queen Celis insisted. Gods and deities make uncertain allies, and Rolaller has no power here. Crescent replied. If you believe it to be true, then put the fool's crown on. Lady Melisandre suggested, with the queen agreeing with her. Fool. Give the crown to Crescent. The king grudgingly orders the fool. The maester felt no short of a court fool, playing for the entertainment of those in the royal court. You should sing. The queen suggested. Prince Jacob raised his hand, and glared at his mother and the red woman, with a stern look in his blue eyes. Mother, he shouldn't do such a thing, he is a maester, and not a fool to be prancing around for such entertainment, Patchface can do that finely. He has served father well and should be left alone. Crescent saw the opportunity, to get rid of Lady Melisandre once and for all, but if he was successful, he knew Prince Jacob would hate him for committing such a crime. After all, the man soon to be of six and ten saved him from further public humiliation, and wished the prince let go of vengeance in killing Rob Stark. He slips a crystal into Davos' cup, he is sure only the Onion Knight notices. Shall we propose a toast to the power of Rolaller? You shall, Lord Maester. Lady Melisandre agreed. This is madness. Ser Davos whispered, as he knew what was going to happen and didn't want the prince to see it. It's for the sake of the realm and my lord's soul. Crescent insisted. It's not too late to refuse the drink, maester. The red woman said, as an ultimatum. No, my lady. Melisandre drinks most of the cup, leaving a small amount for the maester. He was uncertain, but he knew it was for the sake of the realm and to break his king and queen free from her influence. In spite of this, Crescent pushes away his fears and drinks as well. With the ruby at Melisandre's throat glowing brightly, and said. Rolaller does have power. 
The maester tries to reply, but his throat began to constrict and close up inside. He was struggling to keep his balance with the blood running under his nose. Unaffected by the poison, the red woman looks on with pity, as Crescent collapsed onto ground. The last thing the maester heard was the loud, heart-wrenching screech from the prince, he would leave and never thanked for his kindness. Chapter 14 Flickers of the flames of horror burned through the stone statues of the seven gods, as hundreds of men watched on with apathy and nothingness in their hearts. Jacob of House Baratheon, rightful prince of the seven kingdoms outside on the beach of Dragonstone, watching the idols of the faith be burned at Melisandre's command. The young man was standing with Ser Davos, the Onion Knight and his sons Allard and Dale. And a tear came from his eye, seeing the idols of the religion he worshipped, since he was child burn, along with the stained glass and the sept. The prince knew he couldn't stop them, as the most fanatical of Rolalares followers on the island will eliminate him, but luckily Uncle Axel Florent had control over those men. The spectacle of the burnings confused Jacob, as he was in mourning again. For the death of Maester Cresson and the destruction of the seven before his eyes. The Lady Melisandre knew what Cresson planned for her, and made him drink his own poison and eliminated him. Prince Jacob saw Septon Bar imprisoned for protesting, but the man had a right to, since his sept was destroyed by those belligerent men with no respect for elders. If the Queen's men could do such a thing to a Septon, then I wouldn't imagine what my father would do to me, if he finds out I still wrote to Willis, before the war started. It seems we are enemies, with his family declaring for Uncle Renly. Jacob watched the fire flicker, looking around to see many men uncertain and a bit torn between wanting save the idols or themselves. Especially when, Lord Sunglass was imprisoned, along with his sons for daring to protest, being the pious lord he was, his loyalty was to the faith and nothing more. Lord of Light, come to us in our darkness. We offer you these false gods, take them and cast your light upon us for the night is dark and full of terrors. Melisandre chanted. Jacob saw his mother Queen Celis chant the words loud, among her loyal men, who also were converted to Melisandre's religion. This religion may be a menace, but it gave his mother something to believe in and made her happy. On the other hand, the burning of the seven idols made the prince cough from the excessive smoke, as did Lord Celtigar, Lord Durham Bar Emmon turned grey and Lord Valerion watched the prince's father, then the fire. Prince Jacob had to hand to Lady Melisandre, she may be a temptress, but she was an affluent storyteller, telling such tales of the ancient hero Azor Ahai, something Jacob had seen reading about the history of Valyria and the dragon lords of the east. Yet, my mother's men will throw themselves for the Red Lady, but will either of them be so devoted to a prince, who worships the faith? The prince was apprehensive of his name day coming soon, as it coincides with a war and will not be able to have his family around him. My not-so-cousin Joffrey is a figurehead for the Lannisters to control, and has started his reign in an appalling fashion. Killing Ned Stark, keeping the dead lord's daughter hostage and waging war against Rob, who fashioned himself king in the north. Stupid boy, he will pay for his treason, either he changes his mind and bends the knee to my father or he will die by my blade, to never feel the warmth of a woman's body. Oh and Uncle Renly has crowned himself the king in High Garden, with the power of the Stormlands and the Reach behind him. I'm sure this was a lot designed and planned by Lord Mace and Ser Loras, the eager lover of my uncle. Jacob didn't want his mind to drudge on about his traitor uncle and his traitor northern friend, as he wanted to save those bitter feelings for the battlefield. The prince watched his father King Stannis pull out the flaming sword from the pyre, but was sure his father wore a glove to keep safe, as he didn't believe him to be a hero. The queen's men and his mother chanted the prayer of their new religion, for the night is dark and full of terrors, which were the words echoed through the island. Father must know how ridiculous this is, and mother is enthralled by Melisandre that she can't see sense. Jacob wasn't stupid, he knew Uncle Renly had certain affections for the Tyrells, especially the Knight of Flowers, but didn't judge as he had his own reservations in terms of feeling affection or even receiving affection from anyone. The prince didn't believe in love, as he believed it to be for children because he had been hurt and scorned by it. He had been hurt by Desma Redwine, as she still loved him, but her father was to broker a betrothal with Ser Davin Lannister, a man who looked like a lion and was a fearsome fighter. Jacob had seen some of the more distant Lannisters, mostly at the tourneys of Joffrey years ago, 
but never entertained in talking to them, because they were of the enemy house. I wonder how she is, stuck back at the arbor or in Uncle Renly's camp with her lord father. Does she still dream of marrying me or are her affections are toward some other boy? The prince liked to walk on the edge of what was conventionally right, and what he wanted, as a young man discovering what his feelings truly mean. During his time in the Reach, Jacob enjoyed the company of men and women, and even a son of House Rowan foolishly thought himself in love with the then dual heir. Jacob entertained the idea, but the Rowan boy was a jealous man, as he hated Willis for gaining his friendship and trust. Different times, when I was just a boy coming into manhood. And I have gotten there. There will be no more songs or poetry of such, as I closed off any kind of feelings for, as long as I live. The prince began to walk away from the fiery display, as he didn't like what he was seeing and felt guilty for not stopping the poor Septon from being imprisoned, along with Lord Sunglass and others who opposed of Melisandre's religion. His mind was clouded by war, betrayal, seeing enemies everywhere and wearing the faces of his friends and wanted to shake of the nightmares of Uncle Renly sending the Knight of Flowers to eliminate him in battle. Truthfully, Ser Loras wouldn't eliminate me, even if he wanted to for Renly, but he knew very well Willis and I were close friends, and my death would certainly send the poor man into grief and madness. As I was the only highborn willing to be his friend and looked past his broken leg, and cared for him a lot, even if it put us on opposing sides of the war. Prince Jacob headed into a crowed port, as it was way he could be free and away from the constricted role of being prince. He wore the orange, ruby and yellow clothing his mother suggested, as it were the new colors adopted from her strong faith in Lawler and Lady Melisandre. The colors befitted him in his new role, as the rightful prince of the Seven Kingdoms. His eyes caught on Ser Davos leaving an inn with a flamboyantly dressed man, as Prince Jacob recognized it to be Salador San, the Lycian pirate the Onion Knight brought to his father's cause. The Onion Knight was one of the only other men, who never betrayed Jacob or broken his heart, so it was easy to see why Jacob attached himself to his father's best man, then Uncle Axel Florent, his mother's best man. Your Grace! The Onion Knight called out, as he caught Prince Jacob among some of the common folk, as he wanted to see him. Jacob looked up to Ser Davos, as a second father, even though he was a smuggler in the past and owed his knighthood and new status to his father. The Lycine pirate dressed outlandishly, as it must have been customary in his homeland to dress in such a way, but Jacob minded his tongue when around cutthroats and thieves. This is no place for a prince, you should be with your father. Ser Davos commented. Couldn't stand the burning, the smoke was too much and I thought Lord Sunglass was going to die, protesting the way he did. Such sights are common in Lys, burnings bore me, as they will your father, young prince. Salador muttered. I doubt anything can faze him now, going to war and many lives to be taken. The three men started to walk along the crowded port, as Prince Jacob stayed close to Ser Davos, as he knew he would protect the knight from his own parents and the lords, who berate him. One of my trading ships arrived from King's Landing, with news of the Lannister lord overseeing the capital city and has driven out Jan Oslant, as commander of the city watch. The imp is in charge, heard of the rumors of Lord Tywin being stuck fighting in the Riverlands and Rob disarming the Kingslayer in battle, impressive for a boy who hasn't seen war. It's a good thing Lord Tyrion has sense to get rid of that bootlicker, never liked Slint. Always tried to undermine me, and was spreading indecent rumors about me. The prince said bluntly. How well is the city defended? The walls are strong, but defended only by the gold cloaks, who are too few and are inexperienced. We would strike now, while the opportunity stands, with the little lord dressed as a fool and Queen Circe to warm my bed, as part of my payment. The pirate replies. Prince Jacob was disgusted hearing such things, as he was taught better not to herd such filth, especially about a woman Jacob had nightmares about, every time he left King's Landing from his small visits to court. I will assure you will be paid. I want gold, Davos not words. There is gold in the treasury at King's Landing, unless Uncle Robert emptied it all before he died. My father is an honorable man, pirate and will pay his debts to those who loyal to his cause. The prince said gently, with a stern tone. We should attack the capital. Salador urged. How long can we hold it with Tywin Lannister and Renly Baratheon against us? 
It's a fool's game, pirate. My uncle has the power of the reach and the stormlands behind him, as those stormlords should be behind my father and not licking my uncle's boots. And Lord Tywin will be busy fighting in the Riverlands against King Rob. The prince said, as the word king was said like a slur. Lord Renly has left Highgarden with his army and new queen to match on King's Landing with him. The pirate foretold. Jacob was right about Uncle Renly marrying Lady Marjorie for her father's support and his bannermen on his side, and also certain alliances came with its own rewards and positions in his new royal court. Uncle Renly bringing his queen suggests either great love, which was a complete lie because Jacob knew his uncle enjoyed the company of men and loved Ser Loras. Uncle Renly is like Joffrey, a figurehead for the wealthy family in the court to control the realm. If my uncle does win and sit on the Iron Throne, Mace Tyrell will be his hand Randall Tarly his master of laws Ser Loras, as his lord commander of his Rainbow Guard, gods what a stupid idea. Pax to Redwine, as his master of ships Mathis Rowan, as his master of whispers and some Hightower I can't remember, as they were too many of them, as master of coin. Certainly not, old man Layden, as he has never left the Hightower in years. Prince Jacob saw Uncle Renly set up to be just like Uncle Roberts, but at least Lady Marjorie was pleasant and kind, as Queen Cersei was the devil in a lavish gown of gold and red. The king must be told of this. The Onion Knight pressed on. Already have done, old friend, but your king doesn't approve of my presence. My father likes to keep those he doesn't trust, as far away as possible, don't take it too personally, pirate. The prince has a sharp tongue, and a mind for games. Being unmarried gives your king an advantage in a whole other arena, Davos. Sir, there is still a chance for us to join with the Starks and Tullus, if Rob is willing to listen, like a sensible person and not listen to the words of those loudmouths, who were responsible for crowning him in the first place. Your father will not hear it, since Cresson suggested the same thing. Rob is winning battles he has liberated the Riverlands from Lannister tyranny, has victories in the Green Fork and the Whispering Wood, and has captured the Kingslayer. What are you suggesting, Your Grace? I'll propose it at the next council meeting, but I'm not sure if my father will receive it well and it would put me at odds with my relatives of House Florent, but it's the most sensible and worthwhile decision I thought of. Your king's sword is not the true lightbringer, and how will a burnt sword serve him? The pirate claimed. It is a burning sword. Ser Davos insisted. After two failed attempts, Azor Ahai labored a hundred days and nights on a hero's blade to oppose the darkness. Then, he tempered the word into his wife Nissa Nissa's heart and her blood, soul, courage and strength went into the steel to create the red sword of heroes. Be thankful your king's sword is not real because too much light can burn the eyes, and fire burns. All fairy tales and nonsense. Prince Jacob grunted. When will he sail? Salador asked. It depends on the will of the king's new god. Ser Davos replied. Who is your god? My god is my king, as I owe everything to him and has blessed me with his outmost trust. Soon, old friend. We will be feasting in the Red Keep, and your king owes me another thirty thousand dragons come the black of the moon, the statues they burnt might and brought a noble price. My father is a man wedded to duty, justice and honor. He will honor the debts he makes to those, who help him on the quest to the throne, pirate. If your father grants me Queen Cersei for the night, boy. Your father shall be forgiven. The pirate said, as he leaves both men at the port. Prince Jacob had heard of the stories of Azor Ahai from the bedtime stories old Nan would tell the Stark children, on his visit to Winterfell, as the hero and Bran the Builder formed an alliance to raise up the wall and defeat the great other ones. He knew all that nonsense of his father being the hero reborn was all a farce and a lie, as he didn't believe it to be true because fire was not a Baratheon's weapon, but a Targaryen's asset. Your old friend is a little eccentric for my tastes, sir. Prince Jacob spoke up. You believe in your father to be the chosen one, your grace. No, and I hope my father doesn't let this nonsense get into his head, we are at war and there is no time for silliness. Your name day is coming soon, have you thought of what you wanted? The things I want will never happen, sir. Wanting to give Rob Stark a chance to fight for me, 
destroy the Greyjoys before they get a whiff of revenge in their mind, Uncle Renly giving up this silly notion of being king and fighting beside his brother and Willis still being my friend. The prince said sadly, knowing none of those things will come true. You still have me, by your side. I'll never leave you, unless you die on the battlefield. Good, at least you haven't betrayed me or broken my heart yet. The prince said kindly. Between you and I, your father doesn't know about your friendship with the Tyrell boy was still continuing, before the war. If he found out, he will throw me in the dungeons, along with Lord Sunglass Septon Bar, Sir Hubard and his three sons. Your father wouldn't do such a thing, over a simple matter of boys being friends. Besides, he values your counsel over the Red Woman's. A sour feeling within was what Jacob couldn't escape, as seeing the idols of the faith he worshipped turn into charted smoke and ashes. It was a sign of even worse things to come, unless he had a plan to curb Lady Melisandre's influence throughout his father's court. After dark, Jacob was sitting at the painted table, bored and so were the important bannermen were leaving the chambers. Being the rightful prince of the Seven Kingdoms was a chain handcuffed onto his wrists, as he had watched what he was doing from now on. He had seen Ser Davos and Devon arrive, by the summons of his father King Stannis, who sat at the head at the table. Jacob's eyes caught on Uncle Axel Florent, a man who was the leader of the Queen's men and a loyalist of the Red God. What did you think of the Burning Gods, I saw a vision of the glory waiting our king when we take King's Landing. Ser Axel said, in a stone, which seemed arrogant and overconfident. All I saw was fire. Ser Davos replied, pushing past the knight and must wonder why the man bothered. The Onion Knight finds his place at the painted table with Maester Pylas, who seemed comely and was a good influence on Shireen. Have a look at this. His father commanded, handing the letter to Ser Davos, who looked a little agitated. Prince Jacob had his hand under his chin, as he was bored of such delegations and wanted to get out into the field and fight. Maester, you read the letter instead. The king said, as the maester was handed the letter. It read. All men know me for the trueborn son of Stephen Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, by his lady wife Cassanna of House Estermont. I declare upon the honor of my house that my beloved brother Robert, our late king, left no trueborn issue of his body, the boy Joffrey. The boy Tommen and the girl Marcella being abominations born of incest between Cersei Lannister and her brother Jaime the Kingslayer. By right of birth and blood, I do this day lay claim to the Iron Throne of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. Let all true men declare their loyalty. Done in the light of the Lord, under the sign and seal of Stannis of House Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Undols, the Roiner, and the First Men, and Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Add Ser to the Kingslayer's name, since he is still a knight. Stannis ordered. And remove beloved brother, since it's a lie. Father, a bit of harmless courtesy would make some of the highborn sympathetic. Prince Jacob said. All 117 ravens will be used to carry out copies across the realm. It's likely the letters will be burned by lords, who fight for others' kings, when they should be supporting their rightful king. The prince grimaced. Ser Davos, you are to sail north, as far as the White Harbor, while your dale sails south as far as the arbor. They are to post the declaration in every port and fishing village they pass, for every man who can read. Some of the small folk cannot read in sending some knights, whom will read the declaration out loud, Your Grace. Ser Davos pointed. I will have a hundred knights, who would rather read than fight. I plan to send Allard across the narrow sea to carry my declaration to the free cities as well, so the world will know of my claim and Cersei's infamy. The king said, as he dismisses the maester from the chambers. Prince Jacob was a bit saddened within, even though Tommen and Marcella being born of incest, at one time he did care about them and didn't want them to be eliminated in a brutal fashion or whatever the Lady Melisandre has in mind. What did the lords think of the letter, Your Grace? Ser Davos asked. They all flattered me, except Valerion, who said Steele would decide the matter, as I never suspected as much. I want the truth, not minced words. Stannis replied. The words are strong and blunt, your grace, but you have no proof of the incest. There is proof of sort, 
at Storm's End, my acknowledged idiot cousin Edric Storm looks just like Uncle Robert, yet Joffrey and Tommen look nothing like him. Prince Jacob interjected. You are unable to reach the boy at Storm's End, and I would suggest removing the reference of the Lord of Light from the letter in favor of something else. When have you become so devout? I do not know this new god, but I knew the ones the men burned on the beach. When I was a begging boy, charitable septons would feed me. The people will not love you if you take away their familiar gods and give them a foreign one. The people never loved me anyways. Father, this is madness you are speaking of, going to war against Uncle Renly and the Lannisters is one thing, but going against the predominant religion of Westeros is a war we cannot afford to fight against, unless you want the Red Woman to coronate you as king. You will mind your tongue boy, you may be my heir, but you are still my son and I will remind you so. The prince watched his father gaze out of the window, as he looked solemn and sad within himself. I stopped believing in gods the day, I saw wind crowd break up on Shipbreaker Bay, I refused to worship any gods monstrous enough to drown my parents. The High Septon would always go on about justice and goodness flowing from the gods, but I insisted all saw was either was made by men. Stannis declared. Why trouble yourself with a new god, if you don't believe? God or no god, the Lady Melisandre has power. Maester Cresson had wisdom. Cresson's advice did no good the Storm Lords laughed when I went begging, but there will be no more begging or laughing. The Iron Throne is mine by rights, but out of the four kings I have the fewest men and least gold. My only assets are my ships, the Red Woman and my son's intelligent mind. Do you know half of my men are afraid to even utter her name a priestess, who can inspire such dread is not to be despised, and I mean to find out if she can do more. Only because they saw what happened to Cresson, and dared not to challenge her or her god's power, Prince Jacob rambled. We need allies and ones with gold in their coffers, and men able to fight for us. You still think I should give the Stark boy a chance? It's worth a try, as he has a large host of men from the north and the riverlands behind him. The king stood eye to eye with his son, if Jacob saw the wrath of the gods in person, then it would be in his father, the way his eyes were on him. Rob Stark is nothing more than a green boy playing war and stealing the northern part of my kingdom and to forgive them, it seems your time with Ned Stark has made you soft. Jacob and I will not stand for it, a lesser man would be arrested and punished, but you are my son and I have a use for your political mind. Jacob felt shut down, the idea of teaming with Rob was null and void, and his father was king and he was his son, and his word was law, no matter how wrong he was. As a boy, I nursed an injured goshawk named Proud Wing, who would follow me and eat from my hand, but will not hurt. One fay, my great uncle Sir Harbutt told me, rightly that I should try a different bird because I was embarrassing myself. The king foretold. You owned a goshawk, I've always wanted a hunting bird, but Uncle Renly said hunting birds were disobedient and dangerous. The prince said, surprised of something from his father's past. Jacob knew his father was closed off and never talked about his childhood much, but his mother Celis told him a lot about her family and how Uncle Alistair worked tirelessly to find her a husband. His father turned back to him and said Davos. The seven never brought me, as so much as a sparrow. It was time I tried another bird, a red hawk. His father declared. Chapter 15 The stronghold of the house Baratheon, which was meant to belong to him but it was given to Renly, his thieving brother and a false king, trying to steal his rightful throne. King Stannis brought his host, and those banner men who were loyal to him near the walls of the stronghold, in which he seeks to claim, in hopes of using Robert's known idiot son, as a way of proving Cersei's incestuous crime. He looked warily at his son Prince Jacob, who looked sullen and sad all of a sudden, maybe because the king was too harsh on the boy. No, he needs to learn his place, even though he is my son and heir. Jacob is too clever for his own good it will be his downfall, if he is not careful. Nevertheless, the war was a continuous strain on the king, as the search and acclamation of allies was an even harder task than thought out. It didn't matter because the Onion Knight was on his mission to declare the king's claim for the Iron Throne and maybe, some of those dishonorable would come to his side. Foolish hopes and whims, Jacob was more suited for this job, but I need him with me, in case negotiations with Renly went south and a battle is to be had. 
The king had no choice to leave his wife Queen Celis and his daughter Princess Shireen on Dragonstone, as Ser Axel was the castellan of the island, while he was on his path to seizing his rightful stronghold. Men were bustling about, as they gathered for camp and were preparing to take the castle, any means necessary, but Ser Courtney Penrose holds the castle in Renly's absence and if the man was good and true, then he would surrender. The Lady Melisandre was instructed to accompany the king on this voyage, as she has had more of her visions, involving king's blood and promises of victory in his hands. Stannis knew his son didn't believe in Melisandre's babblings, because he was logical and knew such things were all fairy tales and nonsense. He can admit he had been too harsh and blunt with Jacob, but he had a lot on his mind, with the war, gaining allies, and his quest for the throne. Stannis had to realize his son was no longer a boy, but a man of six and ten and was ready to fight his first war and to eliminate people, whom he used to see as friends. As a king in need of assets, the rightful king didn't want to lose his son's trust, over a misunderstanding of opinions about religion. His son approaches him, in the colors of his new sigil and his reach-made sword at his side, it seems Jacob was more ready for battle, than the king was. Sir Courtney will know what is good for him and surrender the castle. Prince Jacob started to speak. He is loyal to Renly and will die defending the castle and Robert's idiot son. King Stannis replied grimly. Such a waste of an average knight, only to die for a pretender, who now likes to sleep with flowers in his hair and to service a fat lord, who wants a grandson to be king. Jacob muttered, causing his father's lip to curl into a short smile. Stannis was not a man for jokes and laughter, but his son must have inherited Robert's accursed ability to insult others, but without dishonoring himself. Renly will be here soon, with his army of storm lords and reacher lords by his side, like the mummer's king he is. Uncle Renly wouldn't be so foolish to bring his whole army, but only a sizable host if he wants to see storms end again. Prince Jacob mentioned. About the council meeting the other night, I admit I was harsh and didn't consider you to be well versed in religious politics. Jacob's face didn't seem so sad and sullen, but now was serious and was ready for war. He had the face of a battle-hardened warrior, even though this was his first war. It's all right to admit you are wrong sometimes, father. A king must have flaws, if he is able to win the support of his people. I was wrong for speaking out of turn, especially when religion is a sore subject for you. Jacob apologized to his father. And I agree with what you said about Rob, being a false king. I thought you would fight harder for your northern friend. Stannis said, in a bemused tone. After having the sea voyage to think. He may be winning battles, but what will he do after, he cannot claim the Iron Throne, since it's ours by rights. What will Rob do if he gets his sisters back? You have finally come to your senses. Like I said, father. I had time to think and waiting up the logical options. Rob Stark did this to himself, he could have refused the crown and fought with us, but he then instead accepted the crown of a false king, even though you are the rightful king. Will Renly surrender his mustard power or will he fight us? Prince Jacob started to laugh, as it wasn't a laughing matter. The possibility of kinslaying waited on the king's shoulders, as he didn't want to be cursed by the gods he had allowed statues of to be burned on Dragonstone. Uncle Renly wouldn't be so foolish to fight us, we are his kin and if he kills us, then he is cursed of being a kinslayer. Your uncle never earned anything he had, only had the privilege of being on Robert's small council. Never took his title of Master of Laws seriously, only wanted to be in court to prance around like the ostentatious fool he was. There are rumors father, of Lady Caitlin riding from the Riverlands to Bitterbridge, it's where Uncle Renly and his army are stationed. Rob cannot be serious in throwing his weight behind a false king and not us. If Rob Stark wanted to prove himself a man and a king, then why send his mother to do his work? I'm not sure father, but I have a feeling it's not going to go well. Poor woman, having lost her husband by a false beheading, one of her daughters imprisoned by the Lannisters and the other one lost in the realm. Grief and vengeance is a dangerous toxin, but women can hide it well, beneath the courtesies and dimness of being noble lady. What are you suggesting, son? The king prattled. Rob is a young man, a warrior for the battlefield and doesn't know politics and court intrigue, but it means his mother is his political voice in his council. 
it's a good chance to delude Lady Stark from Uncle Renly's side and onto ours. Not a terrible idea, but her stubbornness and being blinded by her emotions was what caused this mess in the first place. The kingdoms were going to hell anyways, at least the war is on and we can fight it with troops on the ground and not in court any time soon. The king caught on the Lady Melisandre making her way to the king's side, as she was important to his cause and the mystery of her power interested him. His son looked bristly at the red woman with good reason he still clings on to his faith of the seven and will defend those of the king's men, who keep to the faith. Nevertheless, the Lady Melisandre was willing to earn Jacob's trust, but the king knew it wasn't going to work, with Jacob being as headstrong, as Robert was. The false contender will arrive soon, my king. And his armies will be soon delivered into your hands. The red woman said. Only if the head of the army is dead, as you saw it in your visions, my lady. Prince Jacob replied. Yes, I have do not mistake the Lord of Light in the visions he gives me, stag prince. Your father is the Lord's chosen and he will take his rightful throne. The only way my father will win the throne is by allies with gold and men to fight our enemies, not by a magic sword. The winter will arrive soon my lady and we need to survive through it. The Lord will assist your father to the throne. Stannis didn't see what was going on, but he understood clearly. His son Jacob knew how to play games, and to assure his good intentions, even though they were the opposite. After riding through the Stormland fields, the king caught his sights on Lady Stark, on a horse of her own and with three men by her side. The northern usurper sends his mother to parley with me, pathetic. The king thought sourly, as he brought his son Prince Jacob and the Lady Melisandre to this meeting. The red woman stood in, as his standard bearer. Stannis knew his brother will arrive soon, but he is surprised to find Lady Caitlin here near Storm's End. I am surprised to find you here, Lady Stark. My condolences towards Lord Stark, but he was no friend of mine. The king mentioned. He did you a service, my lord. He broke the siege in Storm's End and saved those inside the castle. Lady Stark replied. Eddard Stark only broke the siege under my brother's command. Regardless how I feel about Stark, you will have your justice for his murder. Lord Renly promised me the same thing. You shouldn't place your hopes in having the Lannisters eliminated on my uncle's shoulders, my lady. Uncle Renly is not much of a killer, but my father will do it, being a seasoned battle commander. Prince Jacob responded. I would rather have my daughters back. Your daughters will be found, when I take King's Landing. Father, only one of her daughters is being held in the castle. The other one Arya escaped, as I would know because I have sent three men of mine to find her and to have her smuggled into the Vale, under a false disguise. The Riverlands is a war-torn place and not suited for a child, as she will be protected by a few friends of mine in the Vale, who are not fighting for any of the kings in the land. Stannis saw the hope and emotion on the face of Lady Stark, it seemed she drew a breath of relief, and of finding out his son did a considerable deed, even though he disliked Lord Stark. Thank you, my lord. I do not know how I can be thankful for this good deed. Lady Stark said kindly. I shall reveal her location in decree secrecy, my lady. After I deal with my meddlesome uncle. Prince Jacob replied. Lady Stark, then turned her attention to King Stannis, as she still wanted to discuss something of importance to the king. King's Landing is closer to Dragonstone than Storm's End, is it not my lord? Lady Stark questioned. I need the power of the southern lords to take King's Landing, and I must take them from Renly, who owes me obedience and loyalty, as his elder brother. Has Rob thrown his lot with my uncle? Prince Jacob asked. No, my lords. He is king of the north by the will of his lords and people, and only holds your father's hand out in friend. The king's son cleared his throat, and said loudly, as the men would hear him. The will of those loudmouth northmen more like, my lady. If you see Rob again, consider our friendship dead, like my uncle and all my enemies, when this war is over. My lord, you shouldn't be so hasty, Rob may have spurned your offer of an alliance. My husband has been nothing, but loyal to you, Lord Jacob. He did send the late king's pendant you wear around your neck and believes you can save the seven kingdoms from the Lannisters. Jacob's eyes changed, with them being still and sunken. 
he held on to the grey horse he named Misty, as it was a name-day gift from Robert long ago. Kings have no friends or attachments, only subjects and enemies. King Stannis said strongly. At this point, the king and his heir turned around to see Renly's party arrive with a mixed host and stormlords and reach men in his vanguard, as the flag of green and gold was waving in the air. Stannis saw Jacob roll his eyes, and exhaled a breath out, as he knew Renly was short of being here and seeing his nephew on the opposite side of the war. Then, he saw his younger brother outfitted in green antlered armor, as Stannis didn't see the warrior fitting his brother nor was he capable of leading an army to claim a throne, which didn't belong to him. You've changed your sigil, brother. Renly said, mocking the king's new sigil. It's the fiery heart of the Lord of Light. Lady Melisandre replied. If we had been under the same banner, the battle would be confusing. I hope no battle can come from this. Lady Stark refuted. The Iron Throne is mine by rights, and those who deny it are my enemies. This is folly, my lords. With the Kingslayer's host reforming at the Golden Tooth, another Lannister host gathering at Casterly Rock and Lord Tywin at Harrenhal with twenty thousand men, and Lannisters holding King's Landing. Bend the knee to me, brother. Renly said arrogantly, showing off his pretender strength. Never, as I am the older and you the younger, and I denounce you as a usurper. Stannis argued. The Targaryens called Robert a usurper and he was able to take the shame. The difference is uncle, the king was a madman and the crown prince was a fool. You seek to take my father's throne, and you are not a true king. A true king would not betray his kin to further his own ambition. Prince Jacob spoke. Please, my lords, be reasonable. Lady Stark tried to convince the three men, but they would not listen. Your son is no less than a traitor to me than my brother, my lady. And I will deal with Rob in due time. How are you the rightful king, when your brother has two sons? Lady Stark asked. It seems, Lady Stark. You have no seen my brother proclamation. Renly laughed. Joffrey and his siblings are not of my brother's seed, but are bastards born of incest between Cersei and her brother. Stannis foretold. Why have you kept this knowledge to yourself? Lady Stark asks. I approach John Arryn with the knowledge, knowing Robert would listen to the man, who he loves and cares for, and would be more likely to believe than me, from whom such accusations would have seemed self-serving. John Arryn is dead, brother. His death was not by happenstance, and it was Cersei who poisoned him. The king stated. You may have the greater right to the throne, brother, but I have the bigger army. Renly said, reaching under his cloak. It caused Stannis to reach for his sword, along with Jacob, but his brother brings out a peach. Fool. A peach, brother. My nephew is all too familiar with the tastes of the reach and its harvest. Renly offered. I did not come here to eat fruit. Stannis resorted. A man should never refuse a peach, because life is short and, as the Starks say, winter is coming. Are you trying to threaten us, uncle? Jacob shouted, as the men in Renly's vanguard paid attention. It's not a threat to you or your father, nephew. Renly states. And I never liked you, or your father for that matter. I despised you for years, uncle. I know Cresson said having such hatred for family was an evil in itself, but I had no choice. You took away my father's right as Lord of Storm's End, and envied me because I was politically smarter than you and was close to stealing your council seat from you. And now you steal his throne because you want attention and those lords, to praise you with flowers and gold. Jacob gritted between his teeth. You are my blood, despite our differences. If it's Storm's End you want, then I will give it to you. Renly offered. It's mine anyways. Stannis replied. You refused a peach, a castle and you nor Jacob didn't even come to my wedding. The wedding is a farce, considering you married a woman you were scheming to make one of Robert's whores a year ago, but years earlier Robert was considering making her my son's wife, as John Aaron and I were the only ones, who knew of it. I was going to make Marjorie Tyrell his queen, but Robert was eliminated by the boar, and so I have her now, Renly said arrogantly. However, I plan to have a son with her within a year. 
Unless, you live to see that day, uncle. Jacob muttered bitterly. How many sons do you have, brother? One more than you, that's for sure. It's a shame the poor girl was to marry my dower and ugly nephew, who had never lain with a girl. Stannis had seen the fire and anger, in the way Jacob glared at Renly, as if he wanted to throw him of his horse and have him beaten up. If I had a wife, who looked like yours, then I would send the fool to service her as well. Renly sneered. If there was one thing Stannis would not tolerate is the disrespect and dishonor of his wife Queen Celis and the mother of his children, it seemed his son's eyes were wider and had his sword out. Infuriated with the dishonor, Stannis drew his sword, as it shines strangely having been picked from the pyre of the burning seven idols. On the other hand, a broadly built woman stood in between the king and his brother. Prince Jacob gripped his blade tightly, waiting to eliminate those who stood in the king's path. That is my mother, you honorless monster. You will regret the day you insult my mother and sister. Will you truly get a son on the Tyrell girl, if you think so then you are a bigger fool than I thought, especially marrying someone so late in the game, dear uncle. Jacob smiled wickedly, as Renly's eyes struck with fear. I have said nothing of a sort, dear nephew. Renly said, cowering with fear of what Jacob's wicked tongue would spill out. Ned Stark wrote to me, saying you insulted my sister, calling her ugly, knowing well the grayscale is no fault of hers. Robert and Ned Stark both preferred you to me, I'm disappointed in you nephew, using foul language in my presence and threatening me, it's terrible how that Onion Knight's influence has rubbed off on you. You insulted my mother and sister, seeking to take my father's throne and you worrying about what might come out of my mouth. This is war, uncle, and I don't have time for pretend games, surrender now or else you won't live to see the winter coming. Jacob foretold, in a threatening tone. The lords and knights in Renly's vanguard were wary, as they should because they have seen the anger and seething coming from Prince Jacob, and it was to be noted, he did not tolerate insults towards his mother and sister. I will not eliminate you with Lightbringer, and I will give you one last chance until dawn to pledge your loyalty to me. In return, I will grant you a seat on my council and name you my heir, only if Jacob dies on the field and a grandson is not born to me. If you do not bend the knee, then I will destroy you. Stannis said, giving the ultimatum. With what little army you have, brother. I have the power of the prominent houses of the Stormlands and the Reach behind me, even your wife's house Florent have pledged their loyalty to me. What is present is only the vanguard, but one hundred thousand are still on foot and will arrive soon enough. If those soldiers can make it, without being immobilized by Dornish spears or the Lannisters nearby, uncle. The prince suggested. It's unfortunate, you couldn't pledge your loyalty to a better king, nephew. It is sad we have to meet each other this way, and to potentially fight each other. The ship Lady Cassana would be great for my sea voyage, sitting in Old Town and the Hightowers will not give it to me. The ship is mine, uncle. Old man Layton gave it to me for my name day, and he will not give it you. First, you steal my father's throne and you want my ship, see Lady Stark. Ambition corrupts people from the inside and a man or woman will forget all his ethics and morals, just to get power. Nephew, I know you have ambitions as well. I can use a political mind like yours in my court unless you are willing to leave your dar father's side in favor of a better contender for the throne. Renly offered, hoping to persuade his nephew to his side. Betray my father and soil my honor, no way. The prince replied, to his meddlesome uncle. Under your father's rule, you will never be able to marry your redwine girl, as your father declares everyone his enemies and sees everything in black and white. No room for forgiveness or penitence for anyone. Side with me and you will be able to be happy, nephew. It's something you should think about. No, thanks. I'd rather keep my honor than give it away for some girl, who will be married to someone else anyways. Jacob said, rearing his horse and started to gallop away behind his father and their small host. Lady Melisandre looked back, staring at Lord Renly in a gaze. Look to your sins, Lord Renly. She said, in a melodic tone, as she followed behind her king and prince. Chapter 16 This is a fool's game, your grace. Your father will not be pleased of this. Davin Seaworth said, following his prince into the dead of the night. 
Prince Jacob knew Devon was right, but he was too busy spying on Uncle Renly and his limited forces in this part of the land, rather than the other 100,000 men stuck in Bitterbridge, which gives Jacob and his father an advantage. Nevertheless, Jacob and his father will be going up against seasoned battle commanders like Lord Randall Tarley and Lord Mathis Rowan, but he did not see Mace Tyrell, Pax to Redwine or the other lords of the Reach with him. Probably hiding like cowards, because Tyrell and Redwine are not for the battlefield, but are for politics and court. Prince Jacob was no fool he had spent most of his childhood around the Reach lords, more than his own storm lords, because they didn't like him, being just like his father. Dour, humorless and boring. The prince didn't care what those lords thought, because a battle was coming. Brother against brother and uncle against nephew. Jacob did not want this fight to go on, but he overhead Uncle Renly and his commanders talking about battle strategy, but he knew his uncle was dumb enough to give the vanguard to Ser Loras, when he could have given it to Randall Tarley. Seeing Lady Caitlin made Jacob reflect a little, because she was a mother and was tired, by the exhausted look in her eyes and her face. He felt bad for her, having lost her husband, having to leave Bran and Rickon in Winterfell, to provide a voice for House Tully and the Riverlands in Rob's War Council. The relations between Stark and Baratheon were fractured, not what Uncle Robert would have wanted, but Rob was a traitor, his enemy, and will die soon. Jacob was hanging outside one of his uncle's pavilion tents with Devon, and two knights with him. He knew he would be caught and used for ransom against his father, which will complicate things even more. Jacob heard many things, of how Uncle Renly told Lady Caitlin, how he was jealous of how clever he was in the field of intrigue and how lords and ladies feared to look at Jacob, afraid he could cut them down by the stare in his sapphire blue irises. Hmm. He would tell Lady Stark things he can't tell me to my face, afraid of being wrong and admitting his shame. I must watch for Brienne of Tarth, she is strong and could crush me, if she wanted to with great strength. The young man was looking around to see if any knights were present, as some parts of the camp were gathering for battle. Be careful, your grace. Devon warned, afraid for his prince being caught and eliminated by Renly's men. Don't worry, dear boy. I'll be fine. Jacob replied, placing a hand on Devon's shoulder to reassure the boy of him not dying so early in the war. Jacob and his three men were creeping around the camp, as he was making his way down to the local village near Storm's End, but many of those people were familiar with his face. Arriving at the village sept, with the seven walls of the seven gods all crooked and cracked, but it was fine for the time being. The prince looked around to see small candles being lit in a vigil, as he knew death was coming after this foolish battle is over. Prince Jacob remembered going into the sept, when he was a child, praying alongside the Tyrells and going into the small sept in Winterfell. In his mind, prayer and belief was what separated his negative emotions from him and learned to calm himself in peace and tranquility. The prince started to light up seven unlit candles, all representing the seven gods with his men. The father to give honorable justice to those who stain the great September in the blood of an innocent man and who have deceived the common folk into being ruled by a king born of incest. The mother to give mercy and compassion to my mother and sister, stuck in dragonstone and give them good fortunes and courage. The maiden to protect the innocence and virtue for those who will need it the most, as war has a way of taking innocence away and changing people. The smith to give my father aid, when he needs it, so the mad red woman does not influence him more with her mad religion. The warrior for strength in battle, for my father, myself and all of our men, who are loyal to the rightful king. Guide me wise crone. I do not know where I am going or whether I am doing the right thing, doing my duty to my father and my king. Finally, the stranger to take the sinful, dishonorable lot into the graves with them. All traitors, oathbreakers and ambitious cowards. From the corner of his eye, Jacob saw someone in a dark cloak praying towards the seven, with him knowing it was a woman. Prince Jacob started to follow the woman out of the sept, and into the village town, as he had an idea of who she was. Outside, in the dead of the night Prince Jacob had followed the woman back to his uncle's war camp, as the men were getting ready for battle. Then, the young man was close enough to the woman to approach her carefully, not wanting her to be spooked or frightened. It seems you visit the sept more than often, Lady Stark. Prince Jacob called, quietly, as it was dark. It's the only reassurance I have, 
since I lost Ned and my daughters are not with me. Lady Stark replied, pulling down the hood from her head, to see her from her tully features of red hair and light blue eyes. It's good to keep faith, especially in times of war. I saw you at the sept, which is strange, since your father allied himself with a red priestess. I still keep to the faith of my childhood, fostering with the Tyrells and spending time in the great September has made me more pious in my faith. Prince Jacob said, in a clear and low voice. Your uncle will harm you, if he saw you in his camps. It's clear he dislikes you, his own flesh and blood. My uncle only cares for himself, and no one else. You must leave, Lady Caitlin, this battle could get bloody and my father doesn't tolerate traitors and those who are loyal to them in his realm. What happened to you, my lord? What happened to the boy of five and ten, who stayed within the walls of Winterfell? Who was kind to my daughters, forged bonds with my sons and played with the horses? Lady Caitlin pleaded. Death, my lady. I lost Uncle Robert and Maester Cresson, but I have to face the fact of losing more people I care about in this war. Whilst Lady Stark walked back into his uncle's pavilion, it made Jacob feel a bit regretful, as he had forgotten the bond he forged with the Stark children. He even helped Arya, by roping in friends from House Hersey of New Keep to help her stay in a protected region, where it was untouched by war. A loud, high-pitched scream was heard through the tent, as he ran towards it and pulled the sheets out of the way to see knights gathering around. Jacob forced himself to see Lady Stark shaken with fear, alongside the knight of Tarth holding his uncle's body in her arms. Prince Jacob looked down, as he saw his uncle Renly, all blooded and lying lifeless on the ground, with blood straining his green and gold armor. All the blood and mess made the prince feel sick, as he has seen his fair share of death and killings. Jacob's first reaction was to run from the tented pavilion in a rush, as he knew if he had been seen, then it would spell trouble for him. Chapter 17 Ser Davos, the Onion Knight was returning from his voyage across the kingdoms, with his king's proclamation through the realm. He had heard how King Stannis was having nightmares, and only Lady Melisandre could soothe him of them. His mind was on Prince Jacob, as he could be having the same nightmares, as well and crying fits through the night. Poor boy, losing two of his uncles and Maester Cresson. How will he not go insane and start slaughtering and butchering all seven kingdoms in blood and grief? Ser Davos was concerned, with Prince Jacob's cleverness and in grief for another uncle's death it would be only time before the poor boy snaps and turns on those who love him. The Lady Melisandre has been sharing the king's pavilion, as of late and was unsure of how Prince Jacob would feel about it. The prince will never allow such a thing he loves his mother too much for her honor to be disrespected. The Onion Knight was on Stannis's fleet, after doing his duty of passing on the king's message throughout the realm, no matter who hears it or ignores the message. He wondered how Prince Jacob was doing, after finding his uncle Renly dead in his tent some thought it was Stannis, who had done the deed. Nevertheless, Davos knew it was the Red Woman's sorcery, which committed the crime of murder. He heard the prince is disposed for the day, as he was not well. Grieving for his uncle, and wants to be alone. The Onion Knight was loyal to his king for true, but he was more loyal to the prince, a boy he thought of as an eighth son and was worried about his well-being and safety, more than he did for the king. He expected his sons to return soon from their duties of passing on the king's declaration throughout the east and as far as the White Harbor. There was a war to be fought and ships to sail, how the Onion Knight could see the ship Lady Cassanna, as it was a gift to the young prince, from the lords of House Hightower and he personally named it after his late lady grandmother. The boy's name day had just passed and the only gift he had was seeing his uncle Renly's blooded body lying on the ground of his pavilion. When King Stannis captures the Iron Throne, then Ser Davos would think of something to get for the prince, as the age of six and ten was a milestone for a man of age. The Onion Knight was on the king's biggest ship in his war galley, but he knew it wasn't enough for him to take King's Landing. Then, he caught the sight of a man arriving aboard the ship, as he had at least three men with him. Prince Jacob and King Stannis emerged from the pavilion, as they were all too familiar with the man. Ser Davos also caught the sight of Ser Alistair Florent one of Prince Jacob's only remaining uncles left, and a man who defected over to the king's side after the death of Renly. In no doubt wanting to butter up his nephew, since his two other uncles are dead and wants to be the favorite. 
The knight in question was Sir Courtney Penrose, the castellan of Storm's End and the man responsible for educating the late king's idiot son. He was a bit of harsh-looking man giving scorn towards the king's newly brought allies, especially Lord Florent. I see these men have easily abandoned Renly's cause to change sides so quickly. And you Sir Alistair, who not only have changed sides, but changed gods as well. Sir Courtney said sourly. Why are you here, Sir, unless you give my father you answer of surrendering? Prince Jacob replied. I will not accept your father's offer. I refuse to surrender Storm's End nor Edric Storm. I propose a match of single combat to settle the issue. Are you mad, sir or are you just desperate and stupid, we are at war and one small combat match will not make a difference. Prince Jacob muttered. I refuse to participate. I will take the castle by storm if I must. King Stannis snubbed the knight's offer. Bring on your storm, and if you do the name of this castle. The knight challenged. You are all dismissed. The king stated, dismissing all of the men around him, including Sir Courtenay, except for the Onion Knight and his heir. The Onion Knight stayed, as the king ordered him to and he was seeking his advice, over the council of all the other lords with him. What do you think of him, Sir Davos? The prince asked, twiddling his sword. I have great respect for Sir Courtenay, a man loyal to his faith, unlike the new additions to our forces. I dislike them as much, but I need their forces if I am to take the throne. I sent Sir Parman Crane to Bitterbridge to gather the remains of Renly's army, but there has been no word. The rest of the Stormlords have no choice, but to join us. However, the Tyrells will not after what happened to Renly and Pax to Redwine having a personal hatred for me. Do you grieve for your brother, your grace? Yes I do, and I dream of a green pavilion and the manner of my brother's death even thought I was asleep at the time of his demise. The king says. But, I did love him Davos. I know that now. I swear I will go to my grave thinking of that peach. No matter how things ended, Uncle Renly will be buried alongside Uncle Robert and the rest of our kin at Storm's End. We should strike for King's Landing, while the opportunity is here. Sir Davos suggested. I will not leave Storm's End undefended in my rear, for men who will consider me defeated there. I must have the boy, as Lady Melisandre has seen it in her flames, and also saw Sir Courtney's death, as she saw Renly's at Dragonstone. The Onion Knight caught Prince Jacob Bristle, at the mention of the Red Woman, as he wasn't ignorant to how his uncle really died. I command you to bring Melisandre by boat under the cover of darkness, beneath the castle, as you did some fifteen years ago. What for what purpose, father? The prince questioned, as he has been doing that as of late. The king ignored his heir, as Ser Davos knew he would not answer such a question because the prince would have already figured out the answer. Later that night, the Onion Knight was sickened by what he has to do for his king and prince in the cover of darkness. He was with Lady Melisandre at this time, but was thankful her influence hasn't possessed the prince, as of yet. If the prince knew the true nature of his mission, then he would never forgive his father for it as it looks to be setting the stage for another murder. My lady, are you good or evil? Ser Davos asked. I am a knight of sorts myself. A champion of light and life. Melisandre replied. You are a liar, for you mean to eliminate a man this very night, as you eliminated Maester Crescent and Renly. The Maester drank his own poison and I had nothing to do with Lord Renly's death, but he was unprotected. The walls of Storm's End have spells woven through the stones, and no shadow can pass through. A shadow is a thing of darkness. Shadows don't exist in the dark, Onion Knight. They are servants of light and fire, provided by Rolaller. Ser Davos and Melisandre were rowing on a small boat under the castle of Storm's End, as the knight was revolted of what he must have for his king. Things were a lot simpler, before the Red Woman arrived on Dragonstone he knew Melisandre first had to convert the Queen, as she will influence her husband in turn. Luckily, Prince Jacob and the Onion Knight were in the north at the time of Melisandre's arrival. The Prince would have proven to be a strong challenger to her, and lead the King's men against the Queen's men for control of King Stannis's court. 
Ser Davos saw how the newly converted Florence treated their rightful prince, some with contempt for the heir still keeping his faith with the seven gods or those who will do anything to earn his trust and allegiance. I wonder how Ser Alistair was laid into the battle, should have sided with his nephew at first, rather than side with Lord Renly. The others of his house seek to influence the prince, while he is still missing his uncle. When they arrived at a gate, in a water tunnel beneath the castle. The two stepped out of the boat to do deeper into the dark caves. Ser Davos remembered coming here, at the time of the siege of Storm's End, when he had to find a way into the castle without being crushed by the Redwine fleet controlling the sea. The prince was right about one thing, was of the hate Lord Redwine had for the prince, as it was over spending a lot of time the lord's daughter, during his time in the Reach. The Onion Knight was the only man in his king's court to know of these secrets, as he promised not to reveal them. The king and queen must find the prince a wife soon, the boy is of age and it's time for him to settle with someone, plus gain extra swords and men to our side. If Ser Davos knew his prince well from, since he was a child, it was how he would never marry anyone else, but Lady Desmer Redwine. Although, it was Lord Jacob that loved the Redwine girl, but Prince Jacob didn't give a damn about anyone, who wasn't loyal to his father. The Onion Knight was hiding behind rocks and boulders, as he sees the red woman remove her ruby red robes from her person. In horror and dismay, seeing the now pregnant woman giving birth to a shadow, as it was as black as the night. The worst thing was Ser Davos recognized the man, who cast the shadow with the red woman. Chapter 18 Celis Baratheon, formerly of House Florent and now the rightful queen of the Seven Kingdoms. She was stuck on the island of Dragonstone, as she and her daughter Princess Shireen had to stay behind, whilst her king and her boy go to war. Her mind fretted about her baby, as Jacob was only a boy and her only boy, from her duty-bound marriage to the king. She was brushing her daughter's hair, as she knew she was surrounded by majority of her men, whom named themselves the Queen's Men. It was after she had converted some of the men into worshipping Lawler and the religion Melisandre brought to the island. My boy will ascend to his rightful place, as Prince of the Seven Kingdoms, all usurpers will bow to him. Uncle Axel was responsible for keeping the Queen and Princess safe, while the King and Prince go to battle against the Lannisters. The Onion Knight was foolish, suggesting my only boy be married off to some rich girl, with powerful relatives, and seeks to have my son taken away from me. My daughter's place as princess will be usurped. Queen Celis didn't like it, the thought of her only boy being married off, like a common livestock. She knew he was the prince, and a grand match had to be made for him, or else they would lose the war and all be dead. Will Jacob come back, mother? Shireen asked. Of course, he will. When he and your father win the war. Celis replied, not knowing what to say to her daughter. I didn't want him to go away again, we just got him back. Your brother is a man grown, he has duties and has to fight with your father. Will he be a leader? Of course, my princess. Your brother will lead our soldiers into the battlefield, sail like a great sea captain. It was the first time Celis had been truly happy, since she had discovered the religion of Rolaller. Jacob was the bane of her joy and happiness, and will be damned if anyone took it away from her. She was saddened by not being able to have other sons or daughters, but she was content in having a son, who will be ruler. Celis remembered what Uncle Alistair had told her, about how Jacob being a prince and her only son meant advancement for House Florent. She scoffed at such a suggestion, because her house had sided with the pretender Renly Baratheon, rather than a boy born of their own blood. Idiots, they should remember their own blood, rather than place their loyalties behind a false king. My son will make those who oppose us pay, either it's by the sword or his mind. The doors were open for her uncle Axel to enter, as the queen sent her daughter away to her lessons with Maester Pilus, a fine replacement from the feeble Cresson. Your grace. Her uncle said, bowing before his queen rightfully. The others of our family have changed sides. Good, they should see the error of their ways. Queen Celis replied. The prince needs to marry, if we win or lose the war. The queen stood up, standing gracefully and her eyebrow raised. I will not have my son taken away from me again, 
not by the drunken king sending him to Highgarden so the Tyrells can poison his mind or he sent my son so far into the north. My queen, with all due respect. The only way we are going in the war and maintain the throne is to give the prince a wife, from a suitable family. The queen soured at the suggestion, not even her uncle Axel would agree with her because he was preaching what Stannis had told him days ago. She couldn't blame him for agreeing because he was loyal to his king, and his queen to extension. The men and I plan on destroying the small sept, as any traces of false faith will be wiped out. The large-eared man suggested. You will not touch it, for it belongs to my son. Destroy everything else, as you will, but you will not touch anything belonging to your prince, understood. The queen said sternly. You must allow the prince to do his duty, dear niece. I must be a part of this decision, the king cannot decide without me being the queen and the prince's mother. Of course, you will be a part of such a crucial decisions, which will determine the future of the kingdom. Uncle Axel left her sight, as he was busy in running the island and was placating to the Lady Melisandre. Long ago, Queen Celis would be proud of whether her son had achieved something or had gained a skill, in which was nothing like his foolish Baratheon uncles. She remembered the first time Jacob eliminated a man, the reason was the man insulted her daughter, calling her deformed, tainted and cursed. Celis knew her son was not for the battlefield, for his mind was suited for court intrigue and politics. Tonight was vital, as she and Lady Melisandre were to execute those prisoners, who wrongfully protested against the Red Priestess. Even thought, the Queen disapproved of her son's forever loyalty to the Seven, the gods she had abandoned from her girlhood and family life. However, Celis was willing to protect the sept that belonged to him, because she will not allow any of those belligerent men to upset her son again. Her eyes watched out of the windows, to see the seas crashing with the rocks on the soar. The sounds of drums played in the background. Matrimony was a dreaded subject for the queen, as she didn't want her only boy to be in a loveless marriage, just like his drunken uncle was. Celis was reminded of her own wedding, and she knew how tirelessly her uncle Alistair worked to find her a decent husband. Marrying the late king's brother was the best match she received, as she was not the most beautiful maid in the kingdoms. The drunk king was smart, he wanted a nephew with the old blood of House Gardner in his veins, as a threat to the Tyrells and their security of Highgarden. If they shall rebel again, my family would have taken Highgarden in wardenship of the south. The queen stood by the torched flame and started to wonder of the great things Lady Melisandre brought to her life. The Lord of Light was great, love and restored her belief in following a religion again. It was the Lady Melisandre, who treated her like a person, a human being in the queen she rightfully was. Even though, there are men loyal to her husband, who still kept to the faith of the seven, and so did her son. Before Jacob was born, her marriage to Stannis had been an enduring existence and they were not so happy together. The queen was thankful of her son being brought into the world, it not only saved her marriage from becoming an unhappy existence, and it gave her daughter a knight in a brother, who will defend her from the cruelty of the world. Chapter 19 Ser Davos's ship Black Bertha was in the second line on the right, as he sees the king's war fleet enters the Blackwater Bay, after leaving the stormlands with whatever resources gathered. The fleet was under the command of Ser Imri Florent, one of the Florent uncles Prince Jacob didn't look at with suspicion in his eye and wickedness in his mind. In his eye, the opposition have fewer ships, but the shore was well fortified with catapults and archers lining the walls of the city. They say back at Dragonstone of the greatness of the prince's sailing skill, but we will see it in action tonight. The Onion Knight had his four sons Dale, Allard, Mathos and Merrick with him in the battle, as Devon was on the ship Fury, with the king and prince, being a good squire for the latter. He knew he owed everything to King Stannis and in some extent Prince Jacob for defending him against the High Lords, whom have come to the king's side. This battle was the one the king has been waiting for, one that will put the prince on the battlefield. It will be the first battle, where Prince Jacob will have blood stained on his reach-made sword. I remember my life as a smuggler trying to make ends meet, Maria always worried about my various trips, unless I got caught and arrested, leaving her to raise five sons on her own. Charitable septons would feed me when I didn't have enough to feed myself. It made me think of how pious Prince Jacob was to his faith. It made the Onion Knight sentimental, when thinking about Prince Jacob he had a lot on his shoulders, 
as his father's only son and heir to the throne. Ser Davos saw him change, from the optimistic young man he followed around most of his life into a hardened man, who was ready for war and battle. The knight looked over at Fury, the triple-decked war galley of three hundred sores, as it belonged to King Stannis himself. The waters and the sea crashing against the ship was what was the norm for Ser Davos, as a former smuggler and had pirates for friends. My lord, should we send scouts to test the defenses the Lannisters have prepared? Ser Davos persuaded. It matters not our superior numbers will outmatch them. Ser Imri replied, in the arrogant tone of how most Florence spoke to him. What of his grace, the prince? He is armoring up, ready to lead our men into victory and glory. At least a few scouts will be beneficial towards our efforts. We have the advantage at sea, with them having fewer ships and we will crush them. It's not a great idea, my lord we should reconsider. I have command of the fleet, and the plan is to strike immediately. Ser Davos knew it was a fool's mission, he knew what situation they were going to get into, it was similar to how he bypassed the Redwine fleet years ago. There were other tactical errors in the plan, such as the engaging with the royal fleet in the narrow end of the Blackwater rush. Ser Imre was quite arrogant and overconfident in his efforts, being a first-time commander of a fleet. Nevertheless, he was the uncle of Prince Jacob and Princess Shireen and the brother of Queen Celis. I'm glad the king listened to the prince by leaving the Lady Melisandre on Dragonstone with the queen and little princess. It was only because the king fears the common folk will say the sorceress won the battle and not the king. The trip down in the darkness beneath Storm's End and what he saw will be imprinted in his mind for the rest of his life. Seeing the dark shadows pushed from where babes were meant to be born, but it was a cursed darkness the knight never wanted to see again. The king's men and I have to keep the prince away from the dreadful influences of those of the queen's men, who want to convert him to the red woman's religion. But the prince is tired of the infighting in our army and wanted us to band together, no matter difference of faith. The knight looked upon his ship to see the war gallery of ships pass two winch towers on either side of the headwaters of the channel, entering the Blackwater Rush. Ser Davos feared for the worst, as the great fleet was being commanded by an inexperienced soldier, who only got that position because he was the queen's brother. Most of the Florence disliked the Onion Knight because they were all converted from the light of the faith and into the fires of the Red God and Melisandre. Ser Imri was by no means a saint or honorable, but he was more tolerable than Ser Axel and others of the queen's men. Most of the queen's men would love the opportunity to set me on fire, to give my charted ashes and bones to their red heathen. They have always wanted me dead, the reason I am not in the grave is because of my king, the king's men and the prince. From afar he heard the tolling of the bells, as it was a signal for the enemy to be playing music in the middle of an incoming battle. The tolling of bells only met three things the death of a king, a city under siege and a wedding. Pounding of the drums were sounded, with men yelling over each ship in the fleet, as it was time to fight the battle in the sea, to get to the shore. As the drums were sounded, men were coming from the lower deck to prepare their bows and arrows, ready to attack at anyone from the enemy fleet. The fleet was organized into ten battle lines composed of twenty ships each. The first three lines, made of the war galleys belonging to the lords of the narrow sea. The first three were to smash against the fleet of the enemy, behind those lines were the smaller Myrish contingent, whom were responsible for landing troops to attack the city gate before joining the first three in line in battle. The smaller and slower ships were to ferry the king's host of men, which was of twenty-one thousand men including the cavalry from the stormlords and a few from the reach. It also included the king's original host from the crownlands and mere, along with sailsails led by Salador. I said goodbye to Maria before the start of the war, she was uncertain as was war. My wife could end up a widow and a mother of four dead sons, if the war slipped throughout hands and if we lose. Despite the inexperience in Ser Imri's leadership, his plans seemed to be working and they were to engage with the enemy ships. Hopefully to crush them and lead them on to the shore of King's Landing, where the real war would begin for the Iron Throne. Nevertheless, leaving the contingent of fifty Lysini mercenary galleys led by Salador San, as the rear guard out in Blackwater Bay. One ship sailed across from them, but there was no crew nor was there a captain on board the ship. It was a strange tactic, to have one ship against a whole fleet of ships and there wasn't anyone aboard. 
most of the men on the Black Bertha held their arrows at the ready, prepared for any surprise or unexpected attacks. However, the ship was empty and it was the only one in the opposite fleet. There was meant to be a whole range of ships, but there was only one and it was uninhabited. My lord, there is no one on aboard. One of the men said. This could be some trickery by the enemy. Another replied, grunting with overconfidence in his tone. There is only one ship, where are the others? A third man questioned. It was on the mind of the Onion Knight, as the presence of one ship and no others was suspicious, considering a battle to be fought and a throne to be claimed. Until, a line of dark green liquid stained the seas around the Black Bertha and several other ships of the King's fleet. Wildfire, dangerous substance with power to eliminate people from the burning of hot flesh and turn it into ashes. A barge containing the wildfire was set alight with the flames of yellow, red and orange in collision with the bright green flames from the substance. The channel turns into a ruin of hundreds of ships in the fleet, many burning from the inextinguishable green liquid. It was a sight of horror to see in front of him, as not even the waters of the Blackwater Bay could put out the hot flames. The mass of wooden debris exploded and splinted in the blaze of the wildfire, as it sent many men either jumping overboard or flung by the heat and strength of the fire. The Onion Knight jumps overboard, as he landed into the waters. As a safe haven for the short term, as his ship and others were set on fire. Ser Davos jumps overboard, as he landed into the waters. With hundreds of men from both sides were dying, whilst screaming in the green blaze of death and ashes. As the wooden debris began to float out towards the bay, and the knight hoped he was able to reach someplace safe to survive for another day. The Onion Knight worried for his king and prince, as they would be fighting without him and the four sons he had, before the wildfire took them away. Thank gods the Red Woman wasn't here, but if she wanted to be useful then she should have warned us about the wildfire, such a thing would have made a difference between us having more ships or less in our fleet. He turned around to see the great chain boom raised closing off the Blackwater Rush, turning its mouth engulfed in green flames. In his mind, the thought of a silent, but peaceful prayer to the ones who died unfairly before the war had started. I hope the prince and king have better luck and lead our men into crushing the enemies and taking the king's rightful throne. The Onion Knight hoped his four eldest sons found peace in the afterlife, as he was lucky to still live. Chapter 20 the king watched the horrifying blaze of the wildfire burning through half his fleet, as he needed those ships to make it ashore and fight those who stand in his way to the Iron Throne. Ho the ships in his fleet burned through the blaze of the green flames, it was what the rightful king expected from those who fight with no honor and tricks. Seeing the green sparks of the cutting fire destroy his ships made him angry on the inside, as he needed most of those ships to make it ashore and fight those lion-armored Cretans, who dared to stand in his way. By his right side, his son and heir Prince Jacob was armored in gold and black, the rightful colors of their house before adopting the new sigil, to stand out against the sigils of the usurpers Renly and Joffrey, whom had their own sigils. His son had his reach-made sword in hand, with a shining glint in his eye. It could have indicated a hunger for battle or nervousness of being put on the front lines and leading by example. Just like Robert, he has a thirst for lion's blood, honor and glory on the field. Let him do so, it might help when it comes to the eventual elimination of all the Lannisters. It was a shame the Onion Knight and his four eldest sons were among the ships that exploded in the wildfire, but the king hoped he would rest in peace for the loyal service the man has towards him and his son over the years. The screams and cries of the dying men on those ships would haunt the king for years to come. May the man rest, but pressing matters are at hand and we need to make it to the shore, to battle against the Lannister loyalists and eliminate them all. I hope the Onion Knight finds rest, along with his sons. Prince Jacob said, attempting to hide the bitterness and sadness in his voice. Are you prepared to spill blood in battle? King Stannis asked of his son. I'll do anything to ensure you to your rightful throne, father. Do not disappoint me son, today you will prove yourself. To be a capable leader, political strategist and to be loyal to your king. Ser Imri is a bit restless and surprised, by the wildfire attack. It seems the imp is more a capable commander than his own ill-born nephew. If he was able to think of such clever trickery. Don't worry father, 
we do have a plan in case something like this occurs. Uncle Robert taught me to be careful on the field because anything can happen, like a trial by seven. Prepare the landing. The king commanded, due to the discontent of some of the newly recruited Florence into his army, the dwarf has had his little trick with the wildfire, he can only play it once. Father, we are so far from the gates and we will receive a heated warning from the archers. Hundreds will die, just to get to the shore the prince explained. Thousands. The king corrected. King Stannis and Prince Jacob began to walk across the deck of Fury, the ship belonging to the king and was the biggest in the fleet. The men on board bowed in respect to the rightful king and his heir, as they were suited for battle. He threw the ship ladder overboard, as it was a way for him to get to the small longboats, which were useful for traveling with a great deal of soldiers onto the mainland. Tonight we fight to remove degeneracy from the Iron Throne, to place a king worthy of governing the kingdoms, that king should be a commander of armies and knows how to lead a war, not a king whom concerns himself with politics and scheming. We will take the city and remove such disgusting individuals from the world. The king spoke out. The men of the army cheered loudly and were chanting for the king, as he and his son were climbing down the ladder onto the small longboats, which were many on the remaining ships, that haven't been destroyed by the dwarf's trick. Other men from the other ships of the fleet were mounting aboard the longboats, as it was a great means to make it to the shore and not have their further ships destroyed. Aboard the longboat, the king and his son began to depart from fury and the oars of the longboat started rowing towards the shore. The swishes of the sea water and the splashes of water were heard when the rowing started, the king had his sword lightbringer in hand, as he was in front of the boat. The embers of victory were far away, as it was behind the mud gate walls and inside the red castle, where the iron throne was. The men were pushing, as many were rowing the longboat through the coats of the sea. With the prince beside his father, with his own sword limos in hand. Stannis looked at the finery of the blade, as it had been a gift from those scheming Tyrells, whom wanted to lick the boots of his brother, when he was still alive. It was a fine sword, fit for a prince and future ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, if he was to die on the battlefield in this war. I remember the last words said to my wife and my daughter, before Jacob and I set a sail for Storm's End. Celis was distraught, at the thought of our only son being eliminated in this war, as Renly not the Tyrells and his army didn't like him. A great idea to sail on the longboats, take advantage of the darkness of the night. Prince Jacob said proudly. I will not have any more of my ships destroyed, we need them in case we need to retreat. If the old lion shows himself and draws away from the riverlands. If he shows, then we will have no choice. He has many men still with him, as he left the Lackwitz to defend the city. If he does arrive with prevailing forces, then we will have no choice. But to retreat with our lives intact. I always envisioned my death to be on the battlefield, not by the happenstance of poison or illness. We have a viable strategy, to storm the shore with some of our army, and then use the ladders for us to climb and eliminate the remaining defenders. Your uncle would have loved another battle he was hungry for war since he crushed the Greyjoys years ago. It matters not, we'll show those gold-wearing heathens the true meaning of Baratheon fury and might. Another thing your uncle would yammer before a battle. It's a shame he isn't here. He would have loved the opportunity to eliminate the Lannisters who made a motley of him for many years. Stannis didn't like to see the shades of his late drunken brother within his own stern, but battle-hungry son who wanted nothing more than to have the blood of Lannisters on his sword. His presence on his side and his likeness to his brother was a way for those stormlords to come to their side and some believing the incest of the idiot pretender royals to be true. Jacob had more of the Baratheon sternness and strength than of Robert's pretender sons, as it showed his thirst for battle and victory. The rowing of the boats took long, as it was the safest way to get to the shore without having more ships put to the torch. Leaving the Red Woman on Dragonstone with my wife and daughter was the best thing. The common folk and the nobility already doubt me and her coming along will prove those loyal to the faith to believe I submitted to blood magic, as a way of getting the throne. The Lady Melisandre had been useful, as she had power beyond anything he could have imagined. That power was what secured some of the men, who diverted from Renly's army into his and brought more of the Florence into the fold. Most of the newly joined Florence were determined to win the alliance of the rightful king and his son, 
by any means, even if it means changing gods. The longboards were close to the shore, as the glint in eyes of the men, who were the most hungry for a little glory and a chance to eliminate some lion loyalist scum on the field. The first four of the longboats landed on the shore, as the sight of the fire-lit arrows were hanging above the city walls. The king, his son and an assortment of men and soldiers came out of the boats, with their swords and shields at the ready to attack. Hold up your shields. The prince commanded, for their flaming arrows will strike at us. Stannis and Jacob were in the front lines, as they ran across the shore to avoid being hit by the defense arrows of fire. The two held out their signature swords, and they were armored and proudly wore the stag of House Baratheon on their arms. Sounds of the battle cry of men brought back bitter memories for Stannis, since the last time he went to war against traitors and thieves. He and Jacob ran against the side of the walls to prevent themselves being stuck down with flaming arrows, as other men have from a distance. The number of men falling on the field was quick, as those arrows had done the job. The remaining men with the king and his son held up their shields to protect their sovereigns, from the rocks being thrown over the walls, as they were hitting the shields hard. On the other hand, one man had his head smashed in half, and he lay dead. Father, we shouldn't stay here for too long, or else we will die here. Prince Jacob explained. The king turned from his son, and looked at the other men. Go to the mud gate now. The king commanded. To the gates. One of the soldiers chanted, whilst others followed the man towards the mud gate. The men obeyed the orders to rush towards the mud gate, as the Blackwater was burning with the flames of war. As the fighting raged on in the beach with a hundred or so Lannister men in red, fighting against men loyal to the rightful king. Jacob stood close to father, as the men shielded their heads from the incoming rocks being thrown at them, he held out against the attack with other men fighting in the open field. The prince had a disgruntled look on his face, as he wanted to spill blood, just like Robert did in the two rebellions he fought in, against the rebellious Greyjoys and the mad Targaryens. Get the ladders up. The king shouted, as he stayed in his position because moving would be foolish now. A horde of men came in with two or three ladders among the army of men clashing steel against steel on the field, with the ladders being carefully placed against the walls, even though defenders on the opposite side were still throwing rocks. Great idea, father. What if we fall? The prince said, earning a cold look from the king. Do not disappoint me, son. Better use your political mind and help me win. The ladders were held up, as the men in their ranks were protecting them from being breached by the enemy forces in the battle. Then, the king and prince began to advance, as they were climbing the ladders in a quickened pace, aware of the dangers of such an endeavor. The king and the prince began to advance, as they were climbing the ladders, being aware of the dangers of climbing high ladders, in the middle of a war where the enemy defenders were still throwing stones over the walls and there were flaming arrows to look out for. Upon landing at the top of the walls, the king gave a thunderous kick in the face of a Lannister soldier, as he leaped over the wall and landed on the battlements. The man fell back clutching onto his shield, with the king slamming his sword against the man's shield, when the man lost his shield then the king swung his sword to cleave the man in his breast, as he ended up dead. Prince Jacob unsheathed his reacher made sword out at the incoming Lannister men, standing beside his father and swung his blade against another man in red armor. The prince had a more fluid, balanced fighting style different to the way most Stormlanders fight, but it was due to the training he got from the Lord of Hornhill. His son and heir's blade danced with the opposite steel of a man, he was battling, after taking the man's shield away in a heavy blow, then annihilated the man with a swift cut of the sword on his chest, as the redness of blood oozed out. The blood splattered on the face of Prince Jacob, as King Stannis saw shades of his brother in his son. The son whom waited for this battle for over a year and now has seen it. He better not become overconfident, or else we can lose the battle and the throne. He is swift with a blade, thanks to Lord Tarly and is using that training against our Lannister enemies. The king and the prince stood back to back, as they were surrounded by Lannister men, and bought hand their signature Valyrian steel swords in their hands. Then, the both started slashing away at any man that dared to challenge them. The swords of Lightbringer and Limos were dancing against the blades of the Lion Loyalists. Watch yourself, father. The prince said, warning his father. 
Watch your own confidence, son. King Stannis replied. As the Lannister men advanced onto the king and prince, the two were ready for whatever battles were to come. Chapter 21 They will be calling this the Battle of the Blackwater, but it will be the battle where the lion's claws will be ripped from them and the rightful king sits on his throne. The prince thought, splattered with blood on his face and on his sword. The smashing of swords against those of the Lannister men, was what the rightful prince did then. He saw why the thrill of war was so satisfying for his late uncle Robert, because of the adrenaline and the excitement of killing people and proving himself a warrior and a soldier. The thrill and the rush of blood through the body, as I cut down one man after the next, it's exciting and great. I'm starting to become more like Uncle Robert than my own father, when it comes to the battle. Jacob held on to his sword limos, as it saw the deaths of ten Lannister men and more from his hand. The prince's sword and cut through another man in red, splattering blood on his armor, which were in the true colors of House Baratheon, the gold and black not the colors of his father's new sigil or Uncle Renly's ruined banners with green on it. Jacob stood beside his father Stannis back to back, as there were many Lannister men surrounding them, but the men had their swords out. And the prince and his father began the slaughter, with their own sharp blades of steel. I take the men on the left, and you take the men on the right. His father and king commanded. All right, this will be a bloody carnage to remember. It began, as Jacob and his father slew a few of those men on their respective left and right with their swords piercing the chests of the men against them, as the bodies up and blood sprayed from the carnage. Leaving many of those lion loyalists dead on the ground, as some of the men loyal to the king and prince had climbed the walls to meet them. Among them were his father's vanguard commander Sir Gaillard Morrigan, who was a part of his uncle Renly's rainbow guard, until he defected and joined their side, when he died. Another was Sir Roland Storm, known as the Idiot of Nightsong, another defector from his late uncle Renly's aside. We must move, your grace. Most of their men are hiding behind city gates, when we brought the battering ram. Sir Roland said. It gives us time, since the lions ran back to their walls like cowards. Prince Jacob jeered. We will be victorious and the rightful king will sit on the throne. Sir Gaillard interjected. Coming from a man, who was a part of the Rainbow Guard, along with the idiot of Nightsong's trueborn brother. We must move, we have the superior numbers and the city walls will be breached, as so long as the old lion remains at Harenhal. The king grimaced. I wouldn't count on it father, he could show up with a whole host of men to slaughter us all. The men were split into two groups, as Jacob had the company of Sir Roland Storm and his vanguard of men, he was someone who he liked better than Sir Gaillard, being a man from the Stormlands. The prince and the knight of Nightsong were trailing the right side of the battlements, with the war cries and the cheering of the men on the front lines, as Sir Imre could be leading those men. The two of them found two men, and Jacob had limos in hand and Sir Roland has his own sword, then the two men began the combat of swords with the other two, with the idiot of Nightsong killing both of them at the same time. Never get tired of fresh Lannister meat, don't you? Princeling. Sir Roland japed. We'll get more, if we make it through the gates without dying on the battlements. You are too uptight for your own good, just like your father, but you have your uncle's thirst for blood, which is good. Lannister blood, Greyjoy blood and the blood of Rob Stark, it's all the same, but it comes from different people. Some of my men and I have a contingency plan, if the war was to be lost, we have an escape route. Good man, but my father is stubborn and iron-willed, he will not escape like a coward but die fighting. I don't want Shireen to grow up without a father and mother to be a widow. The two men were running on the battlements, as they were looking for entrances and a way inside the walls of the city, without being caught by Lannister men and those men, who support them. You do good, for your first battle and war, my prince. The idiot of Nightsong said. Your brother is a fighting man, and I hope he can survive this battle. Same to you, it would be a shame to lose a man, with his uncle's ambition for the battlefield and a man for court politics. Prince Jacob's sword was soaked with Lannister blood, and he smiled in glee of it. I didn't know the idiot of Nightsong liked me so much. Your uncle Renly was wrong, he only said such things because he was jealous of you, your political smarts and you had the late king's respect. 
Prince Jacob and Sir Roland began the combat of swords, with the Knight of Nightsong swinging his sword at the opponent, and then killing him with a swift blow. The Knight of Nightsong knows how to eliminate, like a proper Stormlander should. It's a shame Joffrey is hiding behind the walls like a coward, to face me like a man. I want a challenge I tire of facing Lannister Lambwicks. The Prince of the Narrow Sea stood with Sir Roland, holding limos in his hand, as it was blooded with red. He charged at the man, and bashed him over the head with his shield hard, and blood oozed from his head, as he lay dead. Seven Hells, Prince Jacob. You have a swift blow, like your uncle. Sir Roland gasped. A few more men charged against them, as the prince swishes his blade against the men in red armor, then he pushed one of the men to the side, as he saw another man come at him with his sword, with the prince's reacher sword piercing through the breast of the man. Sir Roland eliminated three more in his mist, as the two heard the banging of the ram against the gates of King's Landing, and there were men still fighting on the shore against the Lannister forces. Prince Jacob's head began to spin, as he had to blink twice with his stomach grumbling with sickness, not hunger. It was his first war and the first time he would face bloodshed and death in his irises. Are you all right, sir? Prince Jacob asked. I'm fine, killing a few men doesn't bother me. Are you going to be sick here? Sir Roland replied. No, sir. My father would think me weak and stupid, if he knew. It's not so bad to be sick on the first battle, unless you can stomach the other battles. I think I can, but we need this one. To win my father his throne and dispel the Lannisters out of here. Victory is in our grasp I can sense it. The tide is in our favor, as the city gates will break down soon. The knight said, with his sword in the belly of another Lannister man. Prince Jacob was taught that bastards were shameful, the products of sin and lust, but it wasn't what he believed in, as he had a more liberal view on them. He liked Sir Roland, as he was loyal and could have joined their cause earlier on and not been on the side of his dead uncle. Nevertheless, Jacob couldn't afford to be too friendly with the idiot of Nightsong because all the other friends he had either betrayed him or have been eliminated already in the war. I must keep my own emotions at bay, Sir Roland is a good soldier and true. However, I lost all my friends to this damned war and I cannot have any more friends, unless approved by my father and mother, along with the other Florence. As a prince I must only be friends with Trueborns and no one less than. Jacob had a look outside the battlements, as did Sir Roland to see a slew of men on horses riding on the field and slaughtering many of their soldiers with the cries and sounds of men dying haunting his ears and mind. Ringing in his ears were the slew of steel swords cutting into the chest of the men, who were dying for their rightful king. He and the knight turned away and looked at each other, it seems they were wrong about their advantage and near victory in the war. Most of banners the prince saw on the field were of men with archers, flowers, lions and golden apples, which was bad for him and his father's army of soldiers and commanders. We have to retreat, my prince. Too many are out there on the opposite side. Sir Roland warned. My father must be warned. If we don't leave, then we will be slaughtered like meat. Sir Roland held on to the shoulder of the prince, with ease with the young man being close to fainting seeing a cut on the left side of his breast armor. He must have been cut when fighting against the Lannister men with his father. The Knight of Nightsong may have been on the side of the boy's dead uncle, but he would not allow the last hope of the Stormlands to die here, if his father was to be eliminated. He saw a slew of remaining army men, along with some of the chief commanders, mainly the Florent men rushing down to the Blackwater Bay, where there were ships. The thirty contingents from the Selsail Ser Davos brought to the cause. It was an effective escape route, but the prince now was able to run on his own. As the two were following the last of the men brought to the battle. It has all gone wrong for us, we were close to winning, but the old lion brought some the higher reach men and their lords for backup. We have to escape or else we will be eliminated for sport. Sir Roland is loyal and saved me, my father should reward him greatly for his service. Prince Jacob saw the thirty remaining Lysini galleys at the port, as they were the last of their broken fleet, before the imp tried his trickery with the wildfire. Renly's Shade A man shouted, as Jacob recognized it to be of Sir Guyard Morrigan. He came from the dead to fight for Joffrey. Jacob didn't believe such stories, 
as his uncle was dead. He saw the blood pouring from his uncle's green and gold armor in the pavilion tent, maybe Ser Gaillard's mind was playing tricks on him. Or someone wore the armor of his dead uncle to create a diversion between the men and lords in their forces. Unfortunately, it worked as there were lesser men and fewer lords with them now. All fickle and stupid, my father was right to dislike these high lords. I knew some of them would turn on us. The prince and the knight of Nightsong made it to the bank, where many of the men were boarding the small ships, as fast as they could. Jacob couldn't blame them because the onslaught of Lannister reinforcements, along with the Tyrell vanguard present. It was imperative they had to leave King's Landing or else they would all be feasted on by the crows. Get on the shops or else you will be meat for the enemies. Someone chanted from the bay. Prince Jacob and Sir Roland were waiting, as they would not leave without their king and come of their chief loyalists and commanders. Their forces were small, as there were only thirty ships left and not enough to carry all the men back to the island of Dragonstone. Sir Gaillard, where is my father? Prince Jacob called out. He is coming with the other men, mostly the Florence and others. The knight replied. I hope he doesn't get himself eliminated. Prince Jacob allowed the other men to get on the ships, only saving a few for himself and his father, as they came into the battle together and will leave together. My father and I were always two sides of a coin, always stuck together when others have turned on us. Father and son is the first bond a boy develops with a man, and that man is his father. I will not leave him behind to be selfish. He is my king and my lord all the same. My prince, we must leave, Sir Roland warned, with a hint of desperation in his voice. I don't want you to become an ornament in the Red Keep. I will not leave my father and our men to be slaughtered like animals. Prince Jacob refused. Mind you, my uncle Sir Imre is still out there. Finally, the prince sees his father King Stannis with an assortment of men, mostly those who carry the banners of House Florent. Father, I thought you were gone. Jacob said, in an exasperated tone, then his father ignored him. There is no time, we have to flee now. Sir Roland interrupts. The men with King Stannis boarded the ships quickly, along with most of the men whom were able to fit in all of the remaining galleys of the Lysini Celsail's Salador San. Prince Jacob knew what Sir Roland was thinking, of how foolish he was to wait. He and the knight were running towards one of the ships left on the bay, with some of them sailing away. The knight went ahead of the prince to make sure, his father the king was safely aboard the ship. Then, a huge blow was hit upon the head of the prince by a force, like the blunt end of a sword with the young man falling to the ground. Chapter 22 The busting on Dragonstone with the remaining men just arriving after the here retreat because of the vanguards consisting of reinforcements sent by Lord Tywin Lannister and Lord Mace Tyrell, and all his bannermen. Queen Celis Baratheon's eyes were around most of the recent arrivals, as her heart sank of hearing about her brother Imri dying on the battlefield. He was a loyal man, loyal to his king and the Lord of Light. The queen thought, trying to push down the feelings and the tears wanting to come out. Her daughter Shireen was by her side, alongside Uncle Axel, who was charged with running the island and keeping his queen and princess safe. Most of the men barely survived the Battle of Blackwater, as most of the Florence were responsible for the rear guard of the king and his commanders escaping with their lives intact. She knew the battle was lost, but the war was not won. Celis was told her husband King Stannis had locked himself up, wanting to be away from the other men apart from Maester Pylas to treat his wounds, he had sustained from the battle. Her eyes wandered around, and thoughts turned to her son and heir. She hadn't seen him, since he and his father left for Storm's End. Mother, is father all right? Princess Shireen asked. Of course, sweetling. He is just tired and wounded, he had just escaped from the field. Queen Celis replied. Did we lose the battle? Sometimes in life, my daughter. We win things and then we lose them at the same time, best of all is having the strength and courage to fight for another day. Where's Jacob, I haven't seen him with the other men. The question haunted the queen's mind, with her thoughts wondering where he was and why he didn't arrive with his father. Mazeter Pylas came out from the stone drum, where the king kept himself secluded from all his men and people who were still loyal to his cause. Maester, how is my husband? 
the queen questioned, in a tone of iron. The king's wounds are healing nicely, but he keeps himself away from many people. The young maester replied. Take the princess to her lessons, I must look for my son. Of course. Celis allowed Shireen to be taught by Maester Pylas, alongside the Seaworth boy Devon, who was her son's squire and the idiot Edric Storm. The queen loathed the boy he was the walking and living product of the shame her cousin Delena Florent had conducted with the late King Robert, and was his only acknowledged idiot being of two highborn parents. Where is my son, he hasn't arrived with his father and I am worried. I trusted my family's men to protect him and make sure he gets out of the field alive. If he is harmed in any way, the men of my husband will not be spared of my wrath, as a mother. Queen Celis was alone, looking out of the windows of the island to see more men arriving by the small contingent of ships provided by some pirate the Onion Knight brought to her husband's cause. Also, the Onion Knight has not been seen, since the battle. Rumor has it that he was eliminated among the ships destroyed at their fleet. It must have been the reason why Stannis locked himself away, as he must be grieving for his smuggler turned knight friend. The queen never cared for Davos Seaworth, but her son Jacob loved him, as if he was a common uncle and spent most of his time with him. Celis was dressed in the colors of new faith of red, yellow and orange. She wore a crown of flames around it, signifying her as the rightful queen of the seven kingdoms and her worship of the god Melisandre brought to the island. She saw her uncle Alistair arrive with a few men by his side, as he had a worried look on his face. He had the large ears and was quite good-looking, even though most members of their family inherited the ugliness of their house. Your Grace, you shouldn't be in this area. Uncle Alistair commented. Have you seen my son, uncle? Your prince? Celis asked, her fingers were shaking. Fearing what might have happened to her son. The prince hasn't arrived. The men are searching all over the island for him. The queen's tears were flowing from her eyes, with her heart aching. I will not give up, until he is found and safe. He saved my marriage from becoming an existence of unhappiness and discontent, he gave Shireen a brother to defend her honor, and gave his father hope of saving the Baratheon trueborn line. Dear niece, if the worst is to happen, then it will be hard news to give to the king. Jacob is not dead, uncle. Have you lost all faith in your prince? Never, your uncle Axel has sent some of the Florent men to search for him. He is adamant in rewarding the lucky knight who finds him. The queen felt light, not having the strength to balance herself with her uncle's hands holding her still and giving some sort of comfort. Celis couldn't believe Jacob was dead, if he had been then everyone else would have known now. Years of learning how to be a proper lady taught her to conceal her emotions and her tears, underneath the guise of politeness and manners. Jacob had been Celis' firstborn child and her son, the only boy from her duty-bound marriage. Dear niece, the men are searching and he will be found. Uncle Alistair said, giving comfort to his distraught niece. He better be found or someone's head will roll. Celis seated through her teeth. Hopefully not my head. You are the king's hand and you have my husband's ear and counsel. I do as I must, since I have converted to the new faith and abandoned the old one. Jacob will be displeased he still keeps to the seven. He will not bend or change for anyone's sake. The boy has his uncle's strong will to do as he pleases. I hope for the king's sake the prince is found alive. If he is not, then Shireen will be the king's only heir left. Where is the princess now, your grace? Her lessons with Maester Pylas, along with Jacob's squire boy and the idiot my husband retrieved from Storm's End. How is the princess coping with her brother's absence? The retreat and arrival of our remaining men has caused her to worry, she is worried about her brother, uncle. It's natural for siblings to be concerned for one another. Alistair, my queen. A gruff voice shouted, as the queen and hand turned around to see Sir Axel with a few men behind him. Have you found the prince, brother? Uncle Alistair questioned, of his brother. No, I haven't. We looked all over the beach and I sent two longboats to the mainland to find him. What if the Lannisters took my son, under Imri's considerable watch? The queen yelled. If they did take the prince, then the king would have received a warning message by now. How is the king? Ser Axel asks. 
The king broods in the stone drum keep he his angry brother. Of the battle being lost and most of the men butchered on the field. He is even thinking his son is dead. The king must pull himself together and unite us, since the battle is lost. Lord Celtigar is thinking about leaving with his men. Uncle Axel grumbled. The man must be silly to think such a thing, our prince is still missing and he wants to abandon his king now. Stupid men do stupid things to save themselves. The queen sneered. The queen speaks true, we should capture him and eliminate him. Axel, we should leave the man be, let the king think of the correct punishment for him, since he pledged himself to him. Queen Celis grew tired of her uncles arguing over silly matters, when they should be looking for her son and their prince. The longer it took to find him, lesser of the chance of him being alive if he was found. Uncle Axel, keep looking for him and do not rest until he is found. Queen Celis commanded. Of course your grace. Sir Axel replied, sending his men to scurry the island for their prince. Uncle Alistair, as you are my husband's hand. You and I will rule in his stead, until he finishes brooding over the lost battle and the death of his onion knight. Good that smuggler is long gone. I would be the king's best ally, if it wasn't for him. Sir Axel growled. He was the king's closest ally. Sir Alistair said, attempting to be peaceful about such sentiments. My husband and son would rather enjoy the company of an upjumped smuggler, than they do their own fellow lords. Like father, like son. The two Florent men grumbled among themselves. Has he been found, who was the last to see him? The queen mumbled. My queen, the lady Melisandre saw him in her flames, she believes he is alive and will return to us. I hope for Rlaller's sake he comes back to us. Queen Celis wholehearted believed in Rlaller and how he would bring Jacob back to her, as she believed what the Lady Melisandre saw in her visions were true. The Lady formerly of House Florent had prayed to the flames of the castle, prayed for her son and heir back. Her eyes looked among the scatters of the king's army seeking safety with their true king, and they will have the strength to fight for another day. Chapter 23 His eyes were squinting, as he could hear the crashing of the sea to the shore and bustling of men outside the windows of a keep. The opening of stern, cold sapphire blue eyes awoke, as Jacob sat up to look at his surroundings. He looked down on himself, as he was undressed. Many of his cuts and bruises have been significantly healed, since the Battle of Blackwater. A spark pain arose in his head, as the young prince didn't know where he was. He could tell he wasn't in the north or the east, because the sun shined outside of the windows and the long summer was still thriving in the south. Where the hell am I, I know I must be further south because of the heat. I wonder which turn cloak was responsible for kidnapping me and dragging me further south, they could have handed me over to the new Lannister Tyrell alliance to be rewarded for handing over the son of a known rebel and he could have had some lands and a knighthood. Jacob sensed a fear trickling down his spine, the fear of being so far away from home and wondering if his parents and family members have missed him. Mother and father think I am missing or dead. Most of the seven kingdoms think I am dead. I can use this to my advantage and make them believe I am dead, so I can get out of this accursed house and get a ship and go home. It was a castle in some southern city, as Jacob feared whomever took him will be back to finish him off. In his own heart, he didn't believe whoever healed his wounds and cuts would eliminate him because they would have done already. The young prince stood up, feeling the numbness on his head from being hit with the blunt of a sword. His mind turned to the Battle of Blackwater and how well he fought and how the battle was lost when more soldiers from the enemy side came into the city. When the old lion and the fat flower banded together with their combined forces, I knew the battle was lost, but my father was stubborn and wanted to keep fighting. Smart for Sir Roland to stage the rear guard and get the rest of our men to safety. He wondered if anyone was looking for him or knew he was missing. He knew deep down inside, people thought he was dead. Then, the doors of his comfortable room opened for a man in beige clothing, with a chain around his neck, resembling those of maesters, when they forged their chain of office and begin their service to the realm. You're a maester. Jacob announced, backing away from the portly man. I see you recovered, my lord. The maester replied. Who? Brought me here. He will be present in minutes, he was someone who knew you in the past, 
and still holds love for you. Why did he bring me here and where am I? The maester began to laugh, and cough at the same time. You are in Old Town, my lord. The city of where would be maester's study and learn to service the realm. Are you experienced? For a long time, my lord. I know your face from these parts, you used to sail with old Lord Hightower's sons and stay inside the lighthouse tower itself. No disrespect, how do you know me and why did your master bring me here? Most of the men in the chivalry of the South know of you, my lord. You fostered with the warden of the South and formed friendships with his children, but those men betrayed you to side with your late uncle, Lord Renly for a reckless attempt at crowning himself king, when there were four others in the realm. My father is the rightful king of the seven kingdoms, and you should mind your tongue. Many lords these days are calling themselves king, the ironborn pirate, the young wolf, your father and the late king of the flowers. The rumors spread throughout the realm could be considered treason, but there are some who believe them to be true. You are a servant of the realm, your loyalty is to your office and neutrality, not to any one family, good sir. You are nothing like your father, my lord. He who prides himself in his form of iron justice and will, which makes him no friend of the nobility or the common folk. You have a grayer view of things and understand a lot more, than what your father. May I ask, where am I? You told me I was already in Old Town. You are in the Uplands Castle, my lord. However, a young boy of House Rowan, only a third son holds it for his friend, a son of House Molendor. Boys and friendships are thing to behold. Are you mad or are you senile, I am in the lands of the Hightowers, and House Molendor is sworn to them and I will be eliminated, if I am exposed. Lord Molendor took half his army to court. Especially, when the Fat Flower has arranged for his daughter to marry the boy king, for an alliance of stability and wealth. You are stationed at his house, but you know your duty to remain neutral and not expose me. The Rowan boy told me not to, or it will break his heart to see you be eliminated by the lions who hold the kingdoms. Where is he, I want to see him before I get my hands on him and eliminate him. Of course, my lord. The maester said, as he exited the room. Jacob had a mind to strange the Rowan boy, when he got his hands on him and eventually, leave this southern city and go home, before he is discovered and eliminated. He knew the name of the boy. His was Sir Artis Rowan, only a third son of an intelligent and mindful lord. Many years ago, when he was just a boy fostering in the Reach, Jacob met Lord Mathis many times and began to respect him for being a man of strategy and politics. When Jacob grew into manhood and experienced the taste of wine and experienced first courtly love with Desmer. She wasn't the only person in the Reach, who claimed to love the grim, intelligent nephew of the late King Robert. Ser Artis had loved him, Jacob knew exploration of feelings and emotions were wrong, as he was devout in his faith towards the seven and wanted to be honorable in the eyes of the gods he worshipped. It didn't matter, as Jacob hated to admit himself a hypocrite. He chastised his uncle Renly's relationship with Ser Loras, when he himself had feelings for the third son of Golden Grove, when he was only a boy of four and ten. Why did Artis bring me here, did he kidnap me for revenge purposes or was he generally concerned for my safety and well-being? We ended things when I was commanded by Uncle Robert to travel forth to Winterfell. Sometimes, he reminded himself the Red Viper of Dorne enjoyed the company of men and women, and didn't care what the Lords of the South thought of him, because his idiot daughters were fearsome fighters and would eliminate them all. The only person Jacob told these secrets to was Ser Davos, a man who would never betray him or hurt him, as many other men had done before. Davos, where is he? Is he dead or alive? I don't know. The prince thought with tears streaming from his eyes. He couldn't be weak, especially when Jacob was the prince and rightful heir to the seven kingdoms. Ser Davos was more than a knight to Jacob he was an advisor, a fearsome sailor, a man who rose from nothing to a landed knighthood and a second father to him. Jacob looked at himself, as the maester of House Molendor did a great job in healing his wounds. He relaxed his shoulders. He was in the territory of the Hightowers of Old Town, a house who had been nothing, but kind and hospitable to him. Jacob felt a shiver down his spine, with the Tyrells allying with the Lannisters, it meant that the Hightowers cannot be trusted. I have to get out of here, 
before Artis gets mad delusions of romance and decides to keep me here for the rest of the war. Every child in Westeros knew of how great the city of Old Town was, long ago it was its own kingdom because of how rich and vast the town was. It was a beautiful port to look at, when the lighthouse tower brightens the city, with the ships leaving and arriving to the port. Jacob loved Old Town, it was one of his favorite places to visit in the reach when he was fostered there. He liked sailing, as opposed to swordplay because it felt natural to him, as the wind hits the sails and the ship travels. The city was still beautiful and grand in Jacob's eyes, but his mindset has changed because of experiencing war and killing people by the blood of his sword. The young prince saw a pile of clothing on the bed, as it was the clothes he wore, during the Battle of Blackwater, they have been washed and cleaned by the servants in the keep. The door opens for a young man to appear, wearing the arms of the golden apple of House Rowan. His face was oval-shaped, with his mid-length hair being fair blonde and his eyes were dark brown. The young knight had his sword by his side, but he was quite handsome and had been the fancy of many of the girls of the Reach. He was quite tall, lean and slim of build, unlike his more muscular brothers and other knights of the South. You traitor, idiot and rascal! Jacob shouted, holding the knight by his tunic hard. The anger boiled inside, as he wanted to throttle his former lover to death. The knight smiled, and eyes were widened by the fear in his eyes. Glad to see me, Jake. It's been a long time. I thought you were at war with your father. I was sent here to hold the keep for my friend, who is of House Molendor, and who is with his lord father in court. How kind of you. My father has no use for me, since my brothers are more important to him, and my sister too. Is it true about what happened between the singer and your lady sister at that feast? My lord father and lady mother thought the singer had raped her, but I knew my sister invited the man to bed at her own will, wanting to experience the pleasures of the flesh without the constraints of keeping her maidenhead. And the man was sent to the wall for it. Love in the seven kingdoms has its place, but not for us highborn men and women. Sons and daughters of noble men and women. Jacob let go of Ser Artis. Deep inside, he didn't want to hurt him because this fool saved his life from being eliminated. Why did you save me? I was with some of my house knights, but I wasn't even in the fighting. A man in my service kidnapped you for me for a handsome reward. Why? To save your life, they would have butchered you and I would have lost you again. You know why we had to end things. Ser Artis began to laugh and place his hand on the young prince's shoulder. Gods, Jake. You are too pious of your faith. Never wanting to bend the rules for me, but you will for that stupid redwine girl. You are still jealous of her. The girl may be married off to some distant Lannister in the future, it pains me that she stole your heart and your kiss. As I wanted to lay first claim to them. You are a deluded man, who needs to grow up. We are in war times, there is no time for such silly notions of love and romance, look where it got Rieger Targaryen and Demon Blackfire. The blonde knight of House Rowan seethed through his teeth, as it was expected. He didn't like to play second fiddle to anyone, especially not the fat flower of Highgarden's niece. He had a saddened look in his eyes, as a tear fell from his left eye, and then the tears started to fall from his eyes and still hand his hand on the rightful prince. What happened to you, Jake? What happened to the boy I loved, who liked nothing more to ride the Tyrell horses? The knight said sadly with tears on his cheeks. He died, with his uncles Robert, Renly, Maester Cresson, Ned Stark and Uncle Imri. The boy was discarded because he was too weak and selfish to do his duty, to his father and to his king. The man rose from the ashes of the boy, and fought his father's war and was kidnapped. Your father is a rebel, a traitor to the crown and to the realm. Nevertheless, I am weak enough to still love you, even though you are a rebel yourself and declared open war against the Lannisters and their allies. And your family being one of those allies. Jacob said, getting out his dagger from under the bed, holding it against the throat of the knight. Jake, you wouldn't eliminate me. We shared great things together, I saved your life when bandits tried to eliminate you long ago. You are a man of duty and honor, and I am a knight, a third son of my father. The prince's nose was enriched, as the knight's fair hair smelled like the flowers of Highgarden. His nose wrinkled, as he didn't like to think of such things. 
Prince Jacob held the knife against Ser Ardiza's throat, he was a bit chinless in that regard, even though he was named after the Aaron king, who rode the back of a huge falcon and slew the griffin king on the highest mountain of the vale. He hated this man, even though he had loved him in the past. Ser Ardiz grunted, expressing his jealousy clearly. He hated any man or woman, who would become friends or be closer to Jacob, when he fostered with the Tyrells. Especially Willis, the heir of High Garden, and was one of his best friends. Until the war started. Jake, you would truly eliminate me and leave me. My friends of House Molendor will want revenge, which is something you can't have on your back. The knight whispered, licking his lips together. The prince scrunched his face, not liking Ardiza's flattery, as if it will get him anywhere. Maybe, he could use the knight's feelings for him to his advantage. Ardi still desires me, even though I refrain from pre-martial bettings now. His handsomeness doesn't make it easy, but I can use his heart to escape from this place and go home. Jacob wondered why he had feelings for him, he was an arrogant highborn knight who wanted to win the heart of the late king's nephew. His heart was pounding against his chest, with sweat droplets coming from his forehead, still holding the knife to the knight's throat. I'll help you go home, Jake. It's the least I can do for kidnapping you against your will. Artie said, with a hint of sadness in his voice. Why would you, when you can keep me for yourself? It would be tempting, but if my father found out, then I will be eliminated, just for the act of keeping you alive and helping you. Jacob let go, he released Artis from his hold and still held on to the dagger, it was a gift from his uncle Alistair years was one of the gifts he accepted from the Florence side of his family, as their gifts were always extravagant. You risked a lot for me, even though you are the son of an enemy. You allowed your feelings to make you be disloyal to your father and liege lord, but I ask you to commit treason once more and assist me in getting my ship and going home. I'll do anything for you, maybe one day you will repay me. It might not be realistic, with my chances of dying in the wars of the fat flower. Jacob laughed, with his mind set on going home and reuniting with his family. He played the game, in twisting a man's heart to his advantage. The rightful prince of the seven kingdoms looked at the knight, as the man was the only thing standing between going home or a rebel's death. Chapter 24 Ser Davos was alive, he had survived the wildfire explosion on the Blackwater and was able to make it back to Dragonstone. Davos was rescued by his old friend Salador San, who was the man who gave him the latest news of what was happening in the kingdoms. He was aboard the Shyala's dance, as he had been rested from being stuck outside the coast and coming back from such a dreadful explosion. What is the news, old friend? Ser Davos asked, as his voice was tired and was exhausted. Your son Devon, the prince's squire, is alive. The boy was lucky to escape from the battle with the king. Salador replied. What of the king? Only the Florence remain with the king Stannis, after some of the others were captured and forced to bend the knee to the boy king. Thank gods, at least the king lives. Lord Sunglass was sacrificed onto the fires by the Red Priestess, as an offering to her god. The pirate said grimly, Lord Alistair is now hand of the king, but the king remains in the stone drum and sees no one, but the priestess. Dread shook the mind of the Onion Knight, as he thought of where was the prince and why didn't his old friend talk about him. What happened to the prince, is he alive and well? I'm afraid not, old friend. The king's son has been missing for many moons, and many believe him to be dead, even your queen cries for him, and so does the king's hand being the boy's uncle. The prince missing. It's what was the saddest of all news. Jacob was a dutiful boy, who did his duty to his king well. The fact that he is gone, is what makes these Florence angry and some grief for his presumed death. The defeat of his king was bad news, but he was informed of how it was the relief forces of the remaining Lannister men with Lord Tywin and the Tyrells, who joined them in saving King's Landing. I understand why the king conceals himself from all his men and his queen. Can you blame him? He believes his son to be dead and his cause to be ruined. No, it cannot be possible. Prince Jacob is a warrior in his own right, he cannot have easily been eliminated by some lower knight. Any man can be eliminated, especially when he is unarmed. Nonsense, is there any more news of the prince, did anyone conduct search parties for him? Mainly Lord Alistair and his brother Axel led them, 
but the poor boy was nowhere to be found. How did this happen, was no one at the battle to keep an eye on him? No, when the retreat was sounded by the idiot of Nightsong, the prince saved his life and allowed him to get the boy's king father to safety before himself. Selfless boy, too kind to be his father's son. The Onion Knight was glad Devon was alive, and okay, but the boy must be grieving knowing the tragedy that befell Prince Jacob and feels guilty for not protecting him. I know it wasn't his fault, but he did his duty to the prince. I bet most of the Florent men would blame him for the prince's presumed death. Then, he thought of Melisandre, the Red Woman. She had brought death and ruin to the king's cause and not warned him of the wildfire attack and the destruction of his fleet. He had lost Merrick, Mathos, Dale and Allard in the Battle of Blackwater with the wildfire explosion, as he blamed the Lady Melisandre for it. The Onion Knight didn't want to think about sad face of his wife Maria, when she found out the news of the deaths of their eldest sons, all because they were loyal to the rightful king. He thought of his youngest sons Stannis and Stefan, named for Prince Jacob's father and late Lord Grandfather. They were too young to understand the meaning of death and war. I will eliminate her she is to blame for the tragedy befalling the king and the deaths of my sons and the prince. Davos said. Davos, steer away from this course. The woman has power and might see you coming. Salador replied, attempting to rear his old friend of this course of revenge. The witch played the king and his court. She is a master manipulator, and I bet she had a hand in the prince's death, so she can bend the king to her will. You don't know that, I have heard news of him still living, but was kidnapped by some rogue knights in the battle. Don't lie to me, you may think nothing of him, but I loved him, like he was my own son and I couldn't protect him. Davos seethed, not wanting to know how Jacob suffered, and if he was really dead. We are close to the shore, and you best do well not to anger your king further, old friend. The Onion Knight thanked Salador for saving his life and bringing him much needed news, but he rebuffed his counsel on seeking revenge for his king's defeat, the deaths of his sons and the prince. Ser Davos would avenge the deaths, suffered at the indirect hands of the Red Woman and will save his king from falling slave to her wicked spell and powers. The Onion Knight had got out of the Shyala's dance, as he saw his old friend sail away, as he was on the shores of Dragonstone. Ser Davos was lucky to be alive, but he knew the Seven still had a reason to keep him in this world. His mind was riddled with grief and sadness, as his old friend told him about what had befallen the prince and what had happened to him. It's my fault, my king trusted me with the safety and well-being of his son and I failed him. Blessed boy is dead and the king has lost hope in his cause for the Iron Throne, his son and heir was whom he loved more than anything, more than his own brothers. Whilst walking on the shore, his eyes caught on two children he was familiar with very well, as they were playing together. Princess Shireen had the sapphire blue eyes and the midnight black hair of her house, as did her princely brother. With the grey scale being on the left cheek of the child, she seemed solemn and smiled at the presence of another child her own age. The boy with the princess was Edric Storm, the acknowledged idiot son of the late King Robert and the Queen's cousin Delena Florent. Unlike Prince Jacob, the boy inherited the large ears and nose of his mother's family, but had the same hair color and eyes of his royal cousins. Ser Davos, you are alive. The princess said happily, with a smile on her face. Nice to see you too, princess. I never thought you would live, since Jacob went missing, everyone thinks he is dead, but I believe he will come back. Poor child. Ser Davos thought, as he felt sorry for the princess, she was experiencing the presumed death of her brother. Edric Storm greatly resembled the late King Robert and the late Lord Renly, as Prince Jacob and ever did, taking after his father Stannis's looks with none of the florent ugliness on him. My uncle should have never cut off your fingers, Edric said strongly. He should have been grateful for your service to him. Listen, boy. He may be your uncle, but he is your king as well. Ser Davos replied, defending the honor of his king. It's a shame what happened to cousin Jacob, Uncle Renly told me he was a fearsome warrior trained by Lord Tarly. I believe he is still alive and desperate for help. The princess commented. I hope so too, my princess. I would have gotten off the island and rescued him, if I had known. What is my cousin like, Ser Davos? The boy asked. 
your cousin Jacob is honorable, even though his methods seem the opposite. He is a warrior in his own right, fighting valiantly in his father's war. He has a political mind, good for playing court games and intimidating the high lords and ladies. He sounds like a copy of Uncle Stannis, but less serious and grim. Princess Shireen laughed at the jape, even though Davos took it to heart, as it was what most people thought of his king, when he was still Lord Stannis. Grim, serious and dour. The Onion Knight knew those same high lords and ladies said the same things about his son Jacob, because he appeared gruff and unfriendly to girls and to other highborn men and women. The idiot boy was a good companion for the princess, somehow helping her cope through realizing her brother was not here anymore. The boy is a good playmate for the princess, she is sullen and sad. The poor child misses her brother and I hope the family find peace, if the prince is really dead. Ser Davos, why are you so loyal to cousin Jacob, when he is presumed to be dead? Edric asked. Well, the prince did me a great service. He treats me no less than he treats the lords and ladies around him. He defended Maester Cresson when the Red Woman and your aunt the Queen tried to make a motley of him. It's shame the old maester couldn't stop the prince's bloodlust, as it's in his blood, like your late father. Do you believe he is dead? Princess Shireen questioned. No, and if he was dead, then your father and mother the king and queen would have known by now and received a raven about his body, if he had been eliminated. It matters not, the Florent men have been searching throughout the island for many days, and still he cannot be found. Lord Florent cried, alongside the queen when they realized the prince was dead. Ser Davos knew the boy was a dead king's idiot, but he was smart and intelligent, it was years of studying under Ser Courtney Penrose for many years at Storm's End. How is Devon? was he shaken when he heard the news. The Onion Knight asked the princess. He blames himself for failing, but he stood by father's side when the battle was lost. Uncle Axel blames him for Jacob being missing. The princess said sadly. Before the boy and the princess could speak any further, the knight turned around to see a few Florent men and the grumpy, large-eared Sir Axel Florent uncle of the queen and the now dead prince. Seize him, for treason in plotting the murder of the Lady Melisandre, take him away. The man snarled, as the men proceeded to take Davos away. The cells were dark and lonely, as he felt the tears leaving his eyes, in grief and remembrance for the long-gone prince, who was in the image of what a man of House Baratheon should look like. His cell in particular was cold and frosty, due to it always being dark and there being no way of keeping warm and protecting himself from the cold. Nevertheless, the Onion Knight was unluckily caught by Ser Axel Florent, who had the grace of throwing him into the cells, as it were he was now. Ser Davos had been caught, plotting to eliminate the Lady Melisandre, for the defeat of his king and the death of his four eldest sons. This is my own folly, plotting to eliminate the Red Woman, when the Queen's men would have taken my head for it, the only reason Ser Axel didn't was because he wanted to honor his dead nephew's memory and not do it. The dungeons were dark and miserable, as the dripping of wetness were coming from above. As it's such a place for common criminals or traitors to the rightful king. Ser Davos saw the proud face of Ser Axel when he threw him in here, as if he waited for a long time to do so, as he hated him, like most of the queen's relatives. A light from a burning torch caught the corner of Davos's eye. As the person holding it, as clothed in red and the shining ruby from the necklace was what he saw. He knew it was the Red Priestess, whom he plotted to eliminate and remove from the side of King Stannis. My purpose is to keep the darkness at bay, as the Lord of Light had intended me to. Lady Melisandre spoke. What about the shadow you're birthed, my lady? Ser Davos asked. Stannis is too weak and should I draw more life energy from him, he would die. The Red Woman explained. It explains why I saw his face in the belly of darkness at Storm's End. The Onion Knight thought to himself. There are two sides of the war to come, one side of Rolaller and the other side is of the Great Other, whose name cannot be spoken. They are opposites, like black and white, good and evil and ice and fire. The Great Other is the God of Darkness, the soul of ice and his war with Rolaller is everlasting. The Other's servants often hide in plain view, but the priests and priestesses of Rolaller can see through these falsehoods, I have also seen in my flames, when you wanted to murder me. I wanted to do so, 
because you caused the deaths of my sons, who died on the battle of Blackwater and for not seeing the king's defeat through your visions. It is prophesied that Azor Ahai shall be reborn, amidst salt and smoke to wake the dragons out of stone. You have served him once, and he has other plans for you, Onion Knight. The Red Priestess says, as she departs from him. The Onion Knight had enough of the Red Woman's mad babblings and horseshit about fairy tale prophecies from ages ago. He thought if Prince Jacob had heard such things, he would have dismissed them as fairy tale stories he heard in his stay in Winterfell. Ser Davos missed the duty bound prince, as he was the only thing keeping the Lady Melisandre from capturing the king under her wicked spell. Now Prince Jacob was gone, chaos will ensure in the king's court between the men of both factions. The king's men were men, who were only loyal to Stannis, but despised Lady Melisandre for influencing the king with her mad religion. Most of them would be protected by the prince, as most of them believed in the seven. The queen's men were men, who were loyal to their king, but were forever loyal to Queen Celis and Lady Melisandre, as most of them have abandoned their own religions to convert to the one the Red Woman brought to the island. The doors of the dungeons open, for Ser Axel to appear again, but he had someone new to throw into the cells with him. Ser Davos saw the man close up, as he recognized him to be the man's brother Alistair, who was the king's hand, and he tosses him into the cell with him. The man had the large ears, and was better looking than most of the Florence, who mostly had the ugliness inherited through their family for generations. He was shaking and had tears running down his cheeks, mostly because he looked defeated. Ser Davos knew this man was a high lord, he was the uncle of the queen and was now thrown into the cells like a known traitor. My nephew Imri died with the fleet, and most of the king's bannermen were captured at the battle and bent the knee to Joffrey. Lord Alistair spoke, with desperation in his voice. The king knew some of them would be fickle and change sides at any moment, especially knowing when the prince went missing. Now I am condemned a traitor for writing a letter I planned to send to Lord Tywin, offering peace and suggesting Stannis to swear fealty to the boy king, but would remain Lord of Dragonstone and Storm's End, and I would get Brightwater keep back. What else did you offer? Lord Florent began to cry, and was sniffling through his tears. Jacob forgive me, for what I have done. In addition, I offered Shireen's hand in marriage to Tommen and Jacob's to Lord Tywin's niece Janiai. You committed grave treason by Lord, and you have sullied your honor and your nephew's memory. Ser Davos gritted between his teeth. You knew the prince was missing, but yet you offer his hand to the same girl he spurred years ago. Not treason. Never treason. I love his grace as much as any man. My own niece is his queen and my great-nephew is his heir, and I remained loyal when wiser men fled. I am his hand, the hand of the king, how can I be a traitor? Offering the prince's sister, as a hostage to the ones who hold his father's rightful throne. Have you no shame, what if the prince is alive and knew of what you have done? He is dead, Davos. I don't like to hear it, but it's true. The Florent men scouted the island and the mainland for him and he wasn't to be found. I saw the distressed look on my niece and queen's face when she had acknowledged the death of her son, she was devastated and heartbroken. If he was truly dead, we would have seen his body or the Lannisters would have sent a warning message. Stannis Baratheon will never sit on the Iron Throne. Is it treason to say the truth? A bitter truth, but no less true for that. You pledged yourself to King Stannis, when you left the fallen banners of his dead brother Renly, did you not betray your nephew and not place your army at his side? You should know better than most the importance of blood. Then, the defeated Lord Florent changed the subject. The talk of stone dragons is madness, sheer madness. Did we learn nothing from Arian Brightflame, who drunk wildfire to try and transform himself into a dragon from the Nine Mages, from the Alchemists? Did we learn nothing from Summer Hall, the great fire that caused the deaths of a king, prince and a lord commander of the king's guard? No good comes from these dreams of dragons. Ser Davos left Lord Florent to his woes and tears, he almost felt sorry for the man because he had lost his lands to loyalists of the Lannister Tyrell coalition, and he is grieving for the death of his great nephew Prince Jacob. This man is defeated, he was Stannis's hand, until his brother caught him committing treason against the king. Look at him, the sad lord who never got the chance to say goodbye to his nephew. 
my brother and my niece were angry, for good reason. They never got the chance to grieve for Jacob properly and I suspect the king is as well. The king broods all day and does nothing, while the queen and I rule in his stead. His only son and heir is missing or presumed dead, have you noticed, my lord? Celis said the lady Melisandre has seen it in her visions, of how Jacob will return to us. She and Axel believe it to be true, but the king is tired of her trickery, especially at the expense of his son. The doors of the dungeons open for Ser Axel to appear, as he walked past the cells and looked at the Onion Knight. The king will see you now. Chapter 25 The Prince of the Narrow Sea was hiding beneath a grey cloak, which covered his whole appearance, in which no one can recognize him. He looked around with stern eyes, as he left Uplands. Saying goodbye to the kind, but thoughtful maester, who saved him from catching an infection or dying. Jacob followed behind Ser Artis, as they were walking around the port villages, with many people bustling about. He heads the laugh of innocent children, who have been untouched by war, unlike those common folk in the Riverlands or King's Landing. He wore the same clothing he wore on the day of the Battle of Blackwater, but they were washed and cleaned by the servants of House Molendor. To disguise himself, the maester of House Molendor had helped him put dye in his hair, it turned his hair from his natural midnight black color into a darker shade of gray, as most older men would have in old age. Jacob liked his new hair, but he knew his parents would be horrified of what he had done to his hair, but it was the only way he could get out of Old Town without being spotted and eliminated. Artis, where is the ship old man Leighton gave to me? Jacob asked, in a stern tone. The blonde knight of House Rowan had a confused look on his face, but smiled. Don't worry, Jake. I have it for you and I risked a lot to get it back for you. Jacob grunted, as he didn't like to be reminded of how foolish he was when he was young, becoming friends with this arrogant knight, whom wanted what he couldn't give him at the time. How much did you truly risk for me? Or are you just setting me up to be eliminated? Jake, I wouldn't do that to you. The red wine would have done it, to please her lord father and their new Lannister allies. I can give less of a damn about those prideful lions, as long as you and your father live, they will never win truly. Your liege lord does, as long as his daughter is queen and a grandson is king. My father sometimes tires of following the fat flower, he is not the only lord of the reach who thinks so. Why does he then, if he dislikes Mace Tyrell? Bannermen are loyal to their liege house to a fault, like my family is to the Tyrells, not knowing they drag other loyal houses with them in this Lannister alliance. Jacob's wrist was held on to by Artis, as he didn't want to lose him in the crowd full of people in this great city of the Reach. He liked seeing the high lighthouse tower, where the lords of the city lived in. His eyes looked upwards, seeing the lighthouse peer over the city. His wrist was being dragged by the fool knight. Jake, don't lose yourself in the grandness of this city. Ser Artis warned. Sorry, it made me feel something from the past, when I was a child, Jacob replied. My father never liked such grandness, but he would have appreciated a city like this. Let's go or else, Hightower men will find you and send you to the mercy of the boy King Joffrey. A idiot born of incest, disgusting. I hope the seven punishes his mother and father for such crimes against the realm and my uncle's memory. Gods, Jake. You really are so pious in your faith, if you were not highborn, then you would have been High Septon. Jacob and Artis were closing in on the port, as it was bustling with men trading and exporting goods from places like the Summer Isles and across the Narrow Sea, where he would have liked to visit, to explore new places and new cultures. The prince kept himself under a low profile, as he held on to the cloak covering his face. The sapphire blue eyes of House Baratheon were not mistaken features, and someone highborn could recognize him and it will complicate his mission in getting home. Here. The blonde knight shouted, pointing in Jacob's left direction, with the prince holding on to his sword and a dagger Uncle Alistair gifted him. The young prince followed the knight, as he saw the beautiful, and awe-aspiring creation of a ship in his sights. Its light wood brown color with at least over one hundred oars on board the boat, as it looked to be made of the finest wood in the reach. On the side of the ship, it had sprawled words. Lady Cassanna, as it was the words written on the ship and it made Jacob feel a bit of closure within him. 
Jacob knew his late lady grandmother had been dead before he had ever been born, at the time his father and uncles were young children, having to trust each other and rule the stormlands on their own, with the helpful Maester Cresson with them. A tear fell from Jacob's eye, when he thought of the old Maester who delivered him into the world, as he did his father and his Baratheon kin years before and after. Why did he do it, knowing it was poison? He drunk it, because the Red Woman knew what he planned and made him eliminate himself. She thought Cresson's death would make me turn away from the Seven, but it was her Red God that eliminated him, not the faith of the Seven. Jake, what's wrong with you? Artie said sadly, seeing Jacob was slightly tearful. Nothing. It's none of your business anyways, you are supposed to get me home. I have ambitions of my own, exploring the Summer Isles. I heard it's the best and they worship a fertility goddess with sixteen teats. What would your father say? I don't care, he never paid attention to me. Only my brothers and sister mattered to him because of whom they would marry for alliances. I am only a third son. You have other options, the Night's Watch, training to be a maester or the King's Guard. Ser Artes began to laugh, at the notion of anything keeping him in the Seven Kingdoms, as he seemed to be tired of the politics and scheming in the South. The King's Guard, you have to be joking. Not for the boy king, who cut off an honorable man's head and sent the North and Riverlands in rebellion. Are you truly leaving Westeros, Artes? There is a lot out there, in the Far East, where the Free Cities are and the Summer Isles. I have always dreamed of exploring other places, without the constraints of being a knight and my father's son. Jacob and Artes walked over to the ship, as there were a few crew members aboard, whom looked at the prince with a suspicious eye, maybe because they might have seen him before. My eyes, they are unmissable in the Seven Kingdoms, the only people with these eyes are me, my father, my sister and Uncle Robert's bastards. A lean, but tall man approached Jacob, as he was nicely dressed, but his clothing was simple and not over-extravagant. He was bald, with stern dark eyes. He had a sword by his side, as he might be a common-born warrior. Are you Lord Jacob Baratheon? The man whispered, as he knew the kind of situation they were in. Yes, and you are. Jacob asks, in the same tone of silence. Captain Sorel. I was put in charge of maintaining your ship for you, along with my small crew. Who put in in charge of the ship? The old Hightower Lord, who had the ship built for you, as a name day gift two years ago. My crew and I were paid to be in your service by the Rowan boy beside you. Jacob looked at Artis with a stern eye, he knew there were things the knight didn't tell him, but he knew why he withheld such information. Artis, why didn't you tell me you paid these men to be in my service? Jacob grits between his teeth. I knew I had to get you home, but I used the gold my father gave me to help you. It's only because I cared too much about you. Sir Artis Rowan, you truly are a lovestruck, arrogant knight. You are going to get yourself eliminated for this. It'll be away from it all, since I planned it all. It was easy to set up, but I did it all on my own thinking. You are as intelligent, as your father Artis, unless you allow your love for me to be a weakness to you. The two young men boarded the Lady Cassana, as it was magnificent ship and it would be a shame for it to go to waste. Jacob's fingers were shaking, as he climbed aboard the ship that rightfully belonged to him. Jacob saw the men in the crew prepare to depart from the shore, as he stood face to face with the knight he had been friends with when he was a child. Jake, it's hard to say goodbye again. Sir Artie said sadly, placing his fingers through Jacob's unexposed new hair color. Keep your hand to yourself, fool. Jacob seethed, through his teeth. Emotional idiot, you are no better than a newborn babe. I can't help that I still hold out my hand to you in close friendship. It's over, knight. I decided to lock my feelings away, to not allow anyone else inside them, unless it's the wife my father chooses for me to marry. I respect your choice in doing so, for the things you did for me when we were young. I repaired it by saving your life. You really want to go. I'm sick of the politics and horseshit going on. I want to live my life for myself, not fighting the wars of the fat puff of Highgarden. Jacob felt the arms of Ser Artis wrapped around his body. Within he felt empty, as there was nothing to feel inside. He didn't want to open his heart to him, 
but he was able to keep it closed and to prove he wasn't weak, like the child he was before. The prince watched, as the blonde knight let go of him and was making his way off the ship with his head down and a sad look on his face. Ser Artis Rowan was off the ship, standing by the deck and pulled up his own cloak to keep his face covered. Jacob blinked once at the spot, as he looked at it again. The knight of the Argent Tree of Golden Grove was gone, as he had vanished. The prince looked at his small crew, as they prepared the ship to leave the port with the winds being favorable for this journey home. Jacob walked on the deck of the ship, as he peered out of the port to see the fair-haired knight out of his sight. The Lady Cassanna was sailing away from the port of Old Town, with the prince walking across the deck of the lightwood brown ship. As his small crew of men were working to get the large boat off the coast and sail all the way to Dragonstone. Jacob felt the winds pushing onto the yellow sails, with his hood falling upon his shoulders. His hair had grown longer significantly, since he last saw his father. It had reached the middle of his back, with the color of it being a darker shade of gray. His eyes turned to his ship captain Sorel, who looked to be common-born, by his simple clothing. However, his origins were unknown, but the fact of him being paid to be looking after this ship by Lord Hightower's command. Captain, I would like to speak with you for a while. Jacob spoke out, in a lowered tone. The captain of his ship came over the young prince, glaring directly into his eyes. Your eyes are unique, my lord. Never seen eyes like yours in the south. My eye color is common in the stormlands, as you know captain. I am no fool I know who you are Jacob Baratheon. The son of the Iron Justice Lord Stannis and the ugliest woman in the Seven Kingdoms. Watch your tongue, that is my mother you are speaking of. Apologizes, my lord. Those of House Florent are never friends of mine, especially with their arrogance of proclaiming blood decent from the old house gardener. The Florence are not the only house in the reach to have direct decent to the old gardener kings, there are the Oakarts and the Rowans, who have blood ties to the old house as well. Do you know why your parents married, young lord? The captain said gruffly. I do, my uncle wanted my father to marry a highborn lady of the reach, whom came from a family with blood ties to the old gardener kings, whom had better ties than the Tyrells did. My uncle basically threatened to take Highgarden away from them, if they rebelled against him again, and give it to the Florence. Hmm. The whims of kings can scare anyone, even the toughest of battle-hardened warriors. Are you highborn, since you refer to me as my lord and not my lord, like most commoners do? I am only a relative of House Grimm of the Shield Islands, with nothing to my name or wasn't born to inherit anything. I wanted to send most of my life in ports or on ships, as I like the way the sea calls out to me. You actually like being in service to someone else other than your own family. Nah. They never cared about me, as I was just an unwelcomed relative. For most of my life, I have always wanted to serve a greater purpose, to do something great in my life. So you think serving me would be your calling, my mysterious captain? You are already a wanted man, Son of a great rebel and if those rumors are to be true, then you should sit on that blasted iron chair after your father. Do you believe in the rumors? It doesn't matter what I believe, it doesn't matter to the lions or their allies, even if someone showed a great amount of evidence. It doesn't matter anyways, if they do, then they will be eliminated. The Game of Thrones has eliminated more people than actual wars, my lord. People who think they can play the game, end up being trapped or getting their heads chopped off to end their time in the game. How do you know so much, as a cousin of your house? Education is the key, my lord. Cunning, intelligence and calculated smarts are great weapons in a man or woman's arsenal, which is not poison or a blade. It's what gets lords great alliances and power, and gives women authority in a world that dismisses them. How long will the journey take, if it takes long? We should have game of Sivas for a while. It will take a considerable amount of time. Will you stay with me, even when I go home? I have pledged to serve you until you are gone. I can swing a sword better than the average knight and sail better than most lords, who are comfortable with horseback. It's nice to have loyal men, when in such times of war and strife. I have heard disturbing things about your lord father, about him taking up with the lord of light. It's my mother who does, he doesn't believe in any of the gods, it's a sore subject for him. 
I spent most of my life in the reach, knowing the high lords and ladies, the common folk and the people who make it the most fertile region of the seven kingdoms, but I heard disturbing things about your Florent relatives. What things, Captain? How they lost the lordship of Brightwater Keep, for siding with your father. They gave away the Florent lands and titles to Ser Garland Tyrell. Jacob rolled his eyes, when he thought of the second son of Mace Tyrell, the man was boisterous and loud, compared to quiet and kind Willis. He remembered all the times Garland would tease him for being too pious in his faith and refraining from premarital activities, but the man invited him to his wedding to Lady Leonette Fossaway. He was only invited because Willis insisted. Jacob never liked weddings anyways, but he knew he had to represent his uncle Robert in this special occasion and to make good with House Tyrell. Those events were years ago, when Jacob was a boy and now he had grown into a man, a cold hardened man of seven and ten years of age. Jacob hadn't realized his last name day just passed by, when he was unconscious from being kidnapped by Artis and a few knights in his service. I heard dark tidings, my lord. About the salt-smelling pirate Greyjoy, and how his last son took a few ironborn men and stormed the castle of Winterfell and put the garrison to the torch, it's truly terrible, the monster's war creates. Captain Sorel said sadly. Are the children safe? Jacob wondered, not wanting to think the worst of what happened to Bran and Rick and Stark, the boys that were left at home, when their brother and mother marched on the south. They were murdered, by the Greyjoy traitor himself. It's truly awful of how innocent children are the most tragic victims of war. Jacob felt a stoniness inside, he may have a lot of anger towards Rob for not bending the knee to his father, but he never felt any ill will towards the rest of the Stark children. He even sent a few of his own men to find Arya and smuggle her into New Keep, a castle in the mountains of the Vale, as it belonged to House Hersey, a family ruled by iron-willed women whom embodied the spirit of the Vale. Jacob never forgot how he attacked few of the mountain clan's men, when he went to rescue a lady of House Hersey from the savage men, who hide behind the mountains, ready to raid and kidnap innocent people. He rescued the younger sister of Lady Alicent, a friend he made at the behest of John Aaron, whom wanted the king's nephew to have a friend his own age. The young prince felt trepidation within he felt a mixture of excitement and dread. Returning home after being in the south for too long. He sensed the breeze from the winds coursing through his new grayish hair. Father, mother, Shireen. I'm coming back home and ready to assume my place, as the rightful prince of the seven kingdoms. Jacob chanted in his thoughts. Chapter 26 Stannis Baratheon, the rightful king of the Undoles, the Roiner and the First Men and the true lord of the Seven Kingdoms had come out from brooding in the stone drum keep to be seated at the head of the painted table. His mind was numb, as he didn't want to accept the fact of his son and heir Prince Jacob was assumed to be dead or alive. The rightful king did not know what happened to his son, but he knew someone had to be held accountable for losing the rightful prince. Firstly, he had to deal with Ser Davos, whom was arrested for plotting to murder the Lady Melisandre, when he came back alive from the Blackwater. If Davos was able to come back alive, then why is my son in the grave while others seek to mock me at the expense of a father's grief? He had sent his daughter Princess Shireen, the king's only true heir to her lessons with Maester Pylas, whom has been a good influence on her, in terms of her being more of a cheerful, happy child, as opposed to the sadness he always saw. Stannis knew Davos was forever loyal to his king, and wouldn't think of committing treason against him, unlike his short-term hand, Lord Alistair Florent, the uncle of his wife Queen Celis. The man was caught by his brother writing a letter to Lord Tywin, basically handing over his daughter and his now dead son, as hostages to the Lannisters, and almost ruined what remained of his war for the Iron Throne. The king could hear the muffled tears and woes of Lord Florent from the dungeons, where he was placed there, like a true traitor should be put and face the consequences for his crimes. That man had no reason to grieve and shed tears for Jacob, when all the man did was give him expensive gifts and never developed a true relationship with him, unlike his son did with Robert and Renly, no matter how he didn't like the king's younger brother. Stannis could have executed Davos for his treason, but it was the Lady Melisandre, who persuaded him to bring the Onion Knight to the king. The Red Woman saw visions of his son in her flames, and tells him of how Jacob is still alive and will return to Dragonstone in due time. Sometimes, Stannis had enough of her and any of the Queen's men who would proclaim the same thing, 
it was basically putting salt in the wounds of an already grieving father. Who knows if what Melisandre says is true and Jacob is still alive and returning, or is it more of her treacherous lies, to manipulate him further and cost him more in his wars to come. I am the rightful king of the seven kingdoms, or has the red woman forgotten in her path of spreading her religion among the men in my camp? She may have used her magic for my cause, but she mustn't forget her place, as a servant in my court. Then, the doors of the chambers were opened for Ser Axel, another uncle of Celis bringing a rugged Ser Davos into his presence. With the Onion Knight having a sad expression in his eyes, and had stood up in dignity, even though he spent time in the dungeons. The rightful king saw the gleeful look on the face of Ser Axel, as he knew the two men often disagreed on many things, but the large-eared man threw too much of his own weight around, simply because he was the queen's uncle. What should be the penalty for treason? King Stannis asked, looking at the two men in his presence. Death. Ser Davos says reluctantly, as if he was talking about his own plot to eliminate Melisandre. I'm not speaking of you, Ser Davos. I am speaking of the traitor Lord Florent. Your grace, Lord Florent did not mean treason, as he was mourning for his lost lands and fortunes, at the hands of the Lannisters and their Tyrell allies. Lord Alistair did it anyways, what does he have to mourn for? My son is dead, Davos and I seem to inspire treachery, whilst Robert inspired loyalty, even to those who were his enemies. Lord Florent was weeping in his cell for the prince's death, I doubt the man even cared for him. Stannis looked toward Ser Axel, who was in complete obedience to his king. Ser Axel would have me continue the war, but all of my sworn swords have deserted me. Your grace, we should attack Claw Isle, the seat of Lord Celtigar for Lord Ardrian's defection to the Lannisters, coward, Ser Axel growled. We should put his castle to the torch and his people to the sword. What do you think of this plan, Davos? The king asked. The plan is both folly and cowardice, to rape and pillage folk who had no choice, but to stand behind their lord. Prince Jacob would never have approved he would never have agreed to have innocent people eliminated. It sparked something within the king, Stannis knew his son was too concerning over the plight of the innocents during the cause of the war. His time with Ned Stark has made him a different man, a man not fitting into any constricted role in society and wanted to think what he wanted. Every man's duty is to be loyal to his rightful king, regardless of what his lord thinks or decides. The king pointed. Is it what you did, when you choose to support your brother over King Ares? Ser Davo suggested. Treason, that smuggler should be executed. Ser Axel shouted, a little too loudly for the king's liking. Ser Axel, leave my presence. You should tend to the security outside the island. The king commanded, as the knight left in anger. King Stannis started to understand why his son hated Ser Axel, the man threw his weight too much and spoke out of term many times. He was right to send the man away, because he needed time with his loyal adviser. He never got the time to think about his son, and if he was truly dead or still alive on the outskirts of the realm, fighting and clawing his way to come back home. And assume his rightful place, as his heir to the Iron Throne. The truth is a bitter draft. The choice I had to make between my brother and my king was a hard one to make. The king muttered. Why do you want to be king? My wants are not at the issue. I am king by law, and I mean to take the throne and scour that court clean. The king said, gritting between his teeth. A bad habit, he didn't care for. Why did you intend to eliminate Melisandre? She gave my sons to the flames. Those fires were of the imp's doing, not hers. If you should blame anyone it is me, who sent her away when I needed her the most. She eliminated Maester Cresson, as well as Ser Courtney Penrose and Renly. She had no part in Renly's death. Melisandre insisted on bringing you to me, instead of having you executed. I didn't know the lady was so merciful on me. The storm boy, Robert's idiot is sick. I mean not to do any harm to the boy. The king began to change the subject. Stannis didn't like having Edric storm around, he was the living product of the shame his brother conducted with Celis' cousin Delena on their wedding bed. Nevertheless, the Lady Melisandre needed him, for his king's blood. The boy was just as joyful and charming, 
as Robert was when he was a boy it made Stannis feel a surge of bitterness of the boy's presence on Dragonstone. I agree that Axel's plan was folly, and I order you to your knees. I intend to make you a lord. Your grace, I am not worthy of this honor. Davo said, obeying his king's command and got onto his knees. I name you the Lord of Rainwood, Admiral of the Narrow Sea, but I also name you Hand of the King. I am a commoner, your grace. Your lords and bannermen will not listen to me. Then, we will make new lords, then. Ones who are loyal to their king, and some will rise to the occasion. We lack the strength for another battle against the Lannisters. Ser Beristan Selmy told me the rot in King Aerys's reign started with the eunuch, Robert should have eliminated him and sent Jaime Lannister to the wall, like his old friend Ned Stark suggested, but listened to John Arryn instead. King Stannis needed Davos, as his honest advice was needed, during such a low time. He had lost the Battle of the Blackwater, and had not secured his throne, but this time could give him the opportunity to think of his next move. The Onion Knight looked bewildered, by such a proclaiming. He deserved it for being such a loyal servant to his cause, and it was only fair the king rewarded him in return. It was something his son would have be proud of. There was some sort of trouble outside, as the king and the king's new hand heard a lot of commotion and loud voices from out of the chamber walls. It was a time of war, and it could mean trouble to come. Ser Davos walked towards the chamber doors, only for at least three florent men and a man in a grey cloak, alongside another who was quite tall and lean, whom carried a sword and wore reasonably highborn clothing. What is the meaning of this? The king exclaimed, as he was unaware of what was going on, and why the guards of House Florent were there. The strange man in grey and gold clothing, kneeled before the king with his sword to the ground. Your grace, I came to return two things, which will be useful for your course. A formidable ship out of the reach of the enemies, and someone you have been missing for some time. The man proclaimed. What do you mean, my lord? Ser Davos replied, standing beside his king. King Stannis and Ser Davos watched, as the hooded figure removed their cloak from their head to reveal a young man, who looked to be seven and ten in terms of age. The king spotted something familiar about the formerly hooded man. His eyes, the sapphire blue color of House Baratheon. Those eyes were unmissable to those of the king's family and his kin. His hair was long, but in a grayish color. The color looked to be washed out, because it was dye covering his natural hair color. The king's eyes widened, at the sudden realization of who this young man could be, in his presence and none of the Florent men arrested him. Only because the man in question was his son Jacob. He had returned to him. The king couldn't believe it his son has come back. Stannis ignored how most of his men accepted that Jacob was dead, but he never believed it to be true. Father. Jacob said, with his face expressing sadness as he walked up to envelope him in his arms. Stannis was not a man of sentiment and emotion, but he could allow his guard to be lowered for the sake of his return there. He felt the warmth of his son's embrace, as he must have sent time further south to be wearing such loose clothing. You have returned, the Queen's men were right in that regard. The King said, stammering through his words. I'm glad to be back. The heir to the Iron Throne, then left his father's embrace to go on and envelope Ser Davos in an embrace as well. The king saw the tears of joy coming from the eyes of the Onion Knight, as he looked to the prince, as if he was his own son. I'm glad you are alive, your grace. Ser Davos said, attempting to hold back the tears in his eyes. I missed you the most. The king turned to the man, still on his knees and had surrendered his sword. Who are you, and why have you come here? Apologies, Your Grace. My name is Sorel Grimm of Greyshield, and the man responsible for bringing back your son alive. The man replied. Are your house not sworn to the Tyrells? They are, but I have been away from Greyshield for many years, sailing across the Seven Kingdoms and farther beyond. My family were foolish enough to get in bed with the Tyrell Lannister Alliance, as the boy king is not fit to rule. The man has a point, but what do you want in return for bringing my son and his ship back intact? I would like the opportunity to serve a just king, who will bring those wrongdoers before the seven to answer for their crimes. 
spilling blood on holy grounds, placing a boy born of disgusting relations on the throne and killing innocents to secure their power. The king looked upon his son, and asked. What shall I do with him? I claim the grim man to be my new sworn shield, as he risked his life to protect me from those who are loyal to the Tyrells. Do you accept this offer, my lord? The king said, towards the grim knight. Yes, I do, your grace. Prince Jacob commanded the grim man and the Florent knights to leave the chamber in haste, as he wanted to spend more time being reunited with his father in Ser Davos, his new hand of the king and admiral of the narrow sea. The prince turned to his father and the onion knight, brushed a hand between his long grayish locks, the dye will wear out and his natural midnight black color will return. Have I been away too long, father? You look gaunt, when was the last time you have eaten? The prince said, concerned for his father's well-being. It matters not I have you back now. You must be ready to assume your place, as my heir and the rightful prince of the seven kingdoms. Yes, father. I am ready to assume my duty in my place, since the loss of the battle, it seems you need me more than ever. Your skill is not for the battlefield, your grace, but in court politics. Ser Davos interjected. I have only just gotten back, and I haven't gotten to see Uncle Alistair, where is he? Prince Jacob asked. He has been arrested, for treason. The king said. Jacob's eyes widened at the revelation, the Florent lord was not one of Jacob's favorite uncles, but the man still had a role in molding him into the honorable young man the king sees. What has he done? The prince pressed. The man was caught writing letters to Lord Tywin, to ask for the hand of your sister to Tommen, and your hand to his niece Janiae. All because he wanted his lands back, selfish man. He almost ruined my cause and gotten our family eliminated. Gods, not Janiae. I spurned her years ago for a reason. She is average, and not a thought that goes into her head is of her own. Jacob shuddered, at the thought of being forced to marry that Lannister girl. The king, the prince and the king's hand were greeted with the presence of the Lady Melisandre, who brought a covered dish with her. The prince didn't look pleased to see her, as if he wanted her gone from this world. It is a greater battle Stannis prepares for, against the coming winter and whose name may not be spoken. Lady Melisandre said, in an alluring tone. We must move quickly to unite Westeros under the true king. Why me, I'm just a man bound by duty and justice. The king asked. It is because you are a righteous man, your grace. Though, this is not the way, but it would work. And I beseech you to give me the boy, so I can wake the stone dragon. The boy is innocent. I have my own reasons of keeping him with me. The king refuses. Only king's blood can wake the dragon. Melisandre replied. I am tired of hearing about dragons and stone magic. Go forward with your leeches. Lady Melisandre flings powder on the hearth fire, and lifts the lid of the dish to reveal three large leeches, swollen with what the onion knight assumes to be the blood of the storm boy, but the king didn't pay attention. The king picks up the first one up, and says. The usurper. Joffrey Baratheon and hurls it into the fire. The usurper, Balon Greyjoy. And does the same. The last leech was in Stannis's hand, he studied it for a moment, as it writhed between his fingers. The usurper. The king said, Rob Stark. And he threw it into the flames, and ignored the sight of burning leeches. King Stannis looked into the eyes of his son, as they were as stern and hard as his. Prince Jacob's expression was stoic, and didn't have any interest in the red woman's trickery and magic, as he was a skeptic of such tall tales she told. The king needed to think of his next move, as that next move will be the start of regaining an army to take the Iron Throne again. Chapter 27 It was tragic, how the phrase sewed the head of the dire wolf upon the shoulders of the northern boy, and nailed a crown on his head. His mother, was slain and thrown naked into the river. They violated guest right, therefore are cursed by the gods. Salador San recounted his story towards those in the court. The pirate friend of the Onion Knight retold the story of the Red Wedding, an event in which allies of the North and the Riverlands were brutally eliminated by those of House Fry and House Bolton, in some kind of evil alliance. 
Ser Davos saw the visible disturbance on the face of Prince Jacob, with his new hair color being the standout. He looked to never want to hear such things, about a boy he wanted to eliminate because of being crowned king in the north and the trident. The Onion Knight knew how the prince bonded with Rob Stark in Winterfell, before the war started and lives were taken away from the world. It was the hand of Rolaller that eliminated the usurpers. Queen Celis declared, as Ser Axel and Lady Melisandre agreed. The eyes of Prince Jacob were as cold as the snow outside of the north, and he was sitting on the chamber table with his new sworn sword, the grim knight from the south behind him. How could you say such a thing, mother? People have been murdered at a wedding, under guest right. This is Tywin Lannister's doing, I'm sure of it, anything to remove potential threats to his reign of power. Prince Jacob growled, between his teeth. Dear boy, the northern brats tried to usurp your father's throne. Ser Axel said nicely, as he looked at his great-nephew with annoyance. No one deserves to be murdered brutally like that, to have the poor woman's body thrown into the river and not even have proper funeral rites for them is blasphemy, and you should watch your tongue, or else you will join your brother in the dungeons. The prince said sternly, looking at his uncle. Ser Davos had never seen Ser Axel scared or intimated before, as he was thankful to the seven for Prince Jacob's return, as he could restore order into the king's court and get men like Axel Florent put in their place. This is Walder Frey's doing, and I will offer pardons to the remaining Starks and Greyjoys in return for fealty. King Stannis said. This will not work, my king. Only more pretenders will rise, where those have died left. Lady Melisandre refuses. You must show the realm a sign of your power. I have nothing to show. You only lack dragons, my king. The queen chimed in. The Targaryens have tired all attempts to bring dragons back from the dead, and look how it turned out. People have died or have been scarred by such madness, and you want to raise dragons again, it seems your storytelling skills are becoming faulty, my lady. The prince says towards the red woman. None of the others have paid the price, if the king gives me the boy. Of Rolaller the prophesy will be fulfilled. His dragon will awaken and spread his stony wings. It should be done, your grace. The boy means nothing, but his blood can save us all. Ser Axel replied. Killing a boy, who is my cousin by blood. It seems Melisandre's wicked tricks have enslaved you to believe every little word she says, behind the fire and the beauty is a trickster who wants to steal your soul, great uncle. The prince says coldly. The boy is the very existence on the insult my cousin and your brother conducted on our wedding bed. Queen Celis pleaded, holding on to the arm of her husband. Stannis pulls away from his wife's grip. Even if Robert defiled our bed, it was not the boy's fault and it seems you have forgotten our son has returned. He has changed too much and has become more like that smuggler, who you seem to enjoy the company of more than your own lords. The queen looked sourly upon her recently returned son. Mother, Ser Davos is a faithful servant, at least he never committed treason, like your uncle. I would like Uncle Axel to join him in the dungeons, if he says one more word out of line. Melisandre placed her hand on the king's arm, as Davos noticed he didn't pull away, like he did the queen. The Lord of Light cherishes the innocent. There is no sacrifice more precious. From his king's blood and untainted fire, a dragon shall be born. The red woman said. It would be wondrous to see stone come to life, I remember seeing the old dragon skulls in King's Landing, as a child. The king grimaced. No man is more cursed than a kinslayer. Davos speaks up, remaining his king. The red woman looked to be angered, as if he had awoken the cursed demon that was her dark soul. She kept herself composed, like a true lady and never showed emotion. Why is Edric Storm's life needed? The Onion Knight asked. Only death can pay for a life, and a great gift requires a great sacrifice. The deaths of the two usurpers proves what little his blood did. I see no proof of your ritual being the cause of the deaths of Rob Stark and Balon Greyjoy. The salt-smelling pirate fell off a bridge or was pushed up by a dissatisfied ironman. The Stark boy was murdered at a wedding, so keep your fairy tales to yourself, my lady. You are one king short. The prince said, his tone was hardened. My son is right the boy Joffrey still lives. 
The king interjected. If Joffrey should also die, it will prove the power of Rolaller. Melisandre questions. It might. King Stannis replies. It might not, your grace. Ser Davos added. Rolaller's power is mighty, and those who doubt him are unbelievers and traitors. Queen Celis says, in a bitter tone. The smuggler still has faith with those seven idols of the false faith. Ser Axel grumbles. I warned you, Ser Axel about your words being out of line. Leave and take mother and the red witch with you, and don't bother my father with your useless wittering again. The prince chimed in, on the behalf of Ser Davos. Davos was thankful, for his newfound status as Hand of the King, and for Prince Jacob's return, as it made his mother worry in her eyes of fear of how his departure has changed him for the worst. He watched, as the Red Woman, Ser Axel and Queen Celis leave the chambers on the prince's orders, as he breathed a sigh of relief of them being gone. It was just the three of them. The king, the prince and the king's hand in the chamber table together, as the prince tied his hair back in an unruly ponytail, and had his hands on the table. Your grace, your daughter, the princess plays with Edric and will be heartbroken if he is murdered. Ser Davos said, reminding the king of the princess's newfound friendship with the boy. Father, reconsider. He may be an idiot, but he is our blood. Kinslaying is one of the highest crimes you can commit against the gods, with violating guest right being another. The prince implored, towards his father. There is no harm in meeting him. This should be left alone, Davos. My concern is towards the realm, and not one boy. Melisandre's conviction of destiny may have charmed all the queen's men to believe her, but I am uncertain of it. The sword did not turn the tide at the Blackwater, but a dragon would. I have seen things in the flames too, a king with a crown of fire, burning me to ashes. Don't tell me, whilst I was gone, she converted you. The prince muttered. If Joffrey should die what is the life of one idiot boy against a kingdom's fate? The king asked. Everything said Davos, softly and bowed his head. You should go, and you should too Jacob. I will talk you with later, as you proved yourself worthy of my confidence again. Davos followed the command of his king, as he started to think of his family. Of how losing four sons made him more hateful towards the Red Woman, as he should have gone through with the plan of killing her and things would be much better without her around. The Onion Knight was accompanied by Prince Jacob, as he was ordered to leave his father's side. The poor boy had been gone for a long time to see things spiral out of control, it seems the Queen's men were more power-hungry in the Prince's absence. Nevertheless, Prince Jacob's return inspired fear within men, who were too confident in following Melisandre's manipulations, most of them feared the prince's return would give the king's men more power within King Stannis's court. I don't understand why he is being like this, more reclusive and willing to listen to the witch's words. What happened to make him so willing to eliminate a child for power? Losing the war and thinking you were dead could be the reasons, your grace. I was kidnapped, by an old face from the past. Who was it? Artie's Rowan, he only did so because he didn't want me to die. I used his feelings to help get me home. Matters of the heart should not be played with, your game playing is becoming more ruthless and your heart is becoming cold. In bad situations, you have to make use with the weapons you have. The Onion Knight knew the prince changed. His return made him more affirming and acted more like a leader, instead of a prince who stood by and agreed with what his father told him. He was a Baratheon his strong will and rebellious streak was in his blood. Ser Davos saw growth within the prince he looked determined to remind those within the king's court that he has returned and is ready to assume his rightful place as prince of the seven kingdoms and heir to the Iron Throne. The prince wanted to be a leader, and he showed it by putting his mother, the Red Woman and Ser Axel in their respective places. The knight looks at the myriads of the fantastical creatures, mostly the dragons carved into the stone of the castle, and wonders if they were really stone cravings or real dragons transformed into stone by eastern magic. Salador appears from the darkness, as the prince looked glad to see the outgoing pirate in his sights, with the pirate blinking to see if the young man, beside Davos was really Prince Jacob, but with a change of hair color. It seems I was wrong the prince does live. And his hair has changed color. The pirate said gladly. 
still pestering my father for gold, now pirate since the war is lost. The prince replied. If the dragons did come to life, then the castle will collapse into ruin. Have you forgiven me, for not listening to you before? You were foolish to think of killing the red woman, but you seem to have learned your lesson. I would rather see her gone, sooner rather than later. She is manipulating my father, and he doesn't seem to listen to me anymore. Prince Jacob said grimly. The queen's men do not care for you, Davos. They would rather see you burned alive for insulting the Red Witch and the Queen, and that you have been making your own allies, among the men who think the king is too firmly under Melisandre's control. Davos, is this true? Are you plotting with men in secret? The prince asks, in his new hardened tone. Davos couldn't lie to the prince, even though what Salador said was true. The prince knew these kind of games, but he didn't know the full extent of the problems in the court. There is no point denying it, it is true and the prince will have to deal with it. The pirate said sourly. It is true. The look of brokenness and sadness was what Davos did not want to see on the face of the prince, he didn't like being lied to after days of returning to Dragonstone. He looked upon the Onion Knight with confusion on his face. Is your king willing to sacrifice the storm boy? The pirate asks. He wouldn't, he would never allow a child to be eliminated for a folly. The higher a man climbs the farther he has to fall. The pirate said cryptically, as he leaves into the darkness of the castle. Davos believed he thought of himself, as he had risen to the highest position he knew be reached. He felt dirty about not telling the prince of mustering allies among the king's men, as his presence is what made the queen's men fear for their places in the king's court. The king's hand and the prince were strolling through the cast, as the prince's graying hair was slightly changing back to its original black color. You don't have to explain, Davos. Lying is inexcusable, but you had your reasons why. The red woman is gaining too much power for some common priestess from another part of the world. The prince spoke first. Are you not angry with me? The knight asked. No, Davos. I can never be angry with you. You are the only man I can trust, apart from my new sworn sword. The prince said, with a smile surfacing on him. About him, where did he come from? He was the captain of my ship, as Lord Hightower paid him a sum to keep it in good condition. The man can sail well, and said he can swing a sword better than most. We need men fighting for us, and Sorel is one of those men. How are you, dealing with the death of the Stark boy? I don't like to talk about death, it has become the norm, Davos. Uncle Robert, Uncle Renly, Master Cresson, Courtney Penrose. Men die all the time, but most die on the battlefield. Men who die at special occasions are the exception. Rob and I bonded, when I was in Winterfell, but it was when we were young and idealistic, in a world that expected us to take the same path. Become a great lord and inherit your father's lands and fortunes. Rob was lucky to inherit his birthright, but I never got the chance, all because Uncle Robert robbed my father of his rightful stronghold, and therefore robbing me of my inheritance. Did you care for him, even if his fellow Northmen crowned him king? I understand now fate pulls us in different direction. It was that disastrous wedding that sealed the fates of House Stark and House Tully. Both houses are scattered in the wind, but the girls are in more danger than ever before. I have been made hand of the king, Admiral of the Narrow Sea and Lord of Rainwood, by your father's decree. The knight confessed. Davos, this is a great thing for you. You deserve the position more than any of those other lords, who allowed my father to become influenced by the Red Woman. The prince said gleefully, gripping the knight's shoulder. The title won't save me from the ire of the queen's men. Don't worry, I will deal with them. Sir Axel has no choice to obey me, as heir to the Iron Throne and his great-nephew. Davos didn't understand the prince like he did before, maybe Prince Jacob changed whilst he had been kidnapped and had seen things in a greyer view. He was gladdened the prince was able to trust him, as he was one of the only men he did trust. The position of hand of the king was something to be treasured, and by honor and duty he will try to be a good hand, and better than Lord Florence's short-term reign. The two stumbled into the maester's chambers to see Maester Pylas, whose face twitched by looking at the returned prince with a new hair color and a colder stare in his sapphire blue irises. 
Your grace, how can I assist you at this time? The young maester asked, showing respect towards the heir to the throne. Nothing as of yet. The prince replied. Being hand of the king is the same as commanding a ship. I am too lowborn and uneducated for this task. Davos disagrees. Sir, there have been renewed scholars, lords and knights, who have been terrible hands, and how a common blacksmith's son had become one of the best. Prince Jacob added. I can teach you read, alongside Edric, the princess and Devon. You never learned to read, sir. I never knew. The prince said glumly, twiddling his fingers together. Reading was something a crabber's son never thought was important. I can help you, sir. As reading was the only solace I had away from the chivalry and courtly love nonsense in the reach. You are hand of the king now, and you shall be educated. I thank you, your grace. You shouldn't have too, since you have much to do, as you have returned. I wouldn't want to waste time with them, as helping you read is a selfless duty I can spare time on. Davos gleamed inside, he didn't expect the rightful prince of the seven kingdoms to stay and help him learn to read as he had other responsibilities to tend to. He felt as if he was worth more than the other lords in the eyes of the prince. The Onion Knight saw a spark shine through the prince's laughter, as he was relived. As Prince Jacob's happiness had not disappeared in favor of the grimness he saw in the chamber of the painted table. After days of learning, Ser Davos was exhausted, as the words didn't make sense to him on the first two days of Maester Pilus and the three children teaching him. He was fortunate on how the young maester was easygoing on teaching him the basics. The Onion Knight found some of the lessons difficult and humiliating, but he gaining knowledge from the words from the texted books. The prince had fallen asleep many times, as he was determined to see Davos be successful. Seeing Prince Jacob sleeping on the maester's table was a humbling sight. The boy had the entire fate of the kingdoms on his shoulders, all because of his trueborn Baratheon blood. If his father was to die, then Jacob will rule the seven kingdoms. After the children leave for the day, it seemed the knight missed the encouragement given from Princess Shireen and his own son Devon, who looked to be relieved to see Prince Jacob alive, but was shocked by his change of hair color. I would prefer a message to read, rather than a book. The prince's eyes were open, as he had a sense of bewilderment on his face. A message would be a great start of understanding full-lettered sentences. Maester Pilus gives Davos an old one to puzzle out, as the prince stood from the table to sit beside the Onion Knight, for moral support and encouragement. As he read further, Davos realizes the message was from the Knight's Watch and it was said to be of great urgency, as it was sent to the rightful king for a reason. To those five kings in the realm. The king beyond the wall is heading south with a mustered army of wildlings, and Lord Commander Mormont is missing and feared to be dead. Sent for assistance to help combat the threat of these wildlings from crossing the wall. The prince read the message out loudly. Has the king seen this? Davos demanded, as the maester looked nervous and fearful. Maester, have you been withholding important information from my father? The prince interjected. I brought it to Lord Alistair, who was hand at the time. He had told me not to waste time with it, and we had no men to spare anyhow. There is a real threat, Pylas. I don't know why sovereigns are so apathetic to the plight of the wall, but they are people of the realm. They guard us from whatever is behind the wall, and to leave them will be selfish action. The Onion Knight was reminded of the Red Woman's prophecy playing in his mind, and Stannis's visions of a ring of torches in the snow with terror all around. He also remembers what Salador told him about Azor Ahai sacrificing his wife for his sword's power. He wonders if it's the roles of Shireen and Edric play in the Red Woman's prophecy. To be sacrificed for the king's magic sword to work against this enemy of darkness. Davos thinks it doesn't matter if some wilding king conquers the north, but Prince Jacob thinks differently because he has been in the north, and spent time with the people there for days, and understands the plight of the cold region. Find something else for me to read, something less troubling. Ser Davos said, as the maester complied. Chapter 28 Prince Jacob had a flamed torch, as he went into the cold, wet dungeons into the night. It was when some of the courtiers were in a nightfire, and were praying to whatever gods they believed in. The dungeon's coldness sent chills down the arms of the prince. 
He wanted answers, of how such important information of the Night's Watch plight never reached the ears of his father Stannis, and other important members of his court. His booted feet were stood against the floors, which were quite hard. As the castle was entirely made of stone and connected to the magic of the old dragon lords from eons ago, Jacob held up his torch and made his way past the May cells. His eyes wandered through each of the cells, meant to place traitors and criminals on the island. He knew this kind of place wasn't fit for a high lord, but this high lord committed the gravest of treason, almost communicating with the enemy. Jacob knew the first rule of war, was to never talk or socialize with the enemy, and those allied with that enemy. That was the rule Lord Alistair dishonored with his scheming and lying. Nevertheless, the prince saw a man who looked filthy in his clothes were turning brown, as he could see the blue, white and orange colors of House Florent on him. He had his hands on his eyes, as he wasn't used to getting visitors. Uncle Alistair, show yourself. The prince said, in his most natural of tone. The man began to show himself, pulling his hand away from his face and a gleeful smile appeared on his face, as if he had any shred of hope for freedom. Jacob. Is it really you, my boy? Lord Alistair said breathlessly, reaching out his hand towards his great-nephew. I have returned, and brought the Lady Cassanna and Sir Sorel of House Grimm with me. Grimm, those grey-shield folk never liked my family. They always laughed at us about our complaints of our rights to Highgarden and the rest of the Reach. You know why I am here to see you, my lord. Jake. I am your uncle, and you will address me as so. For the double treasons you have done, you don't have the right to be called an uncle. The prince gritted between his teeth. I know what I did, but I had no choice. I lost my lands to allies of the Lannister Tyrell coalition, and a relative of mine is being held hostage in Highgarden. You were selfish, did you not care for the other Florence, who supported my father? Did you not care for your own brother, who calls you a traitor and what about my mother, your great-niece and my father's queen and my sister? You don't care about family at all, only about yourself. I love my brother and Celis a lot. It's why I joined your father's cause when the time was right. Only when my uncle Renly was eliminated, you joined him. Please, your grace. I didn't mean to it, I was in a desperate situation and I know you would help me. Why should I help you, you are a traitor and the treason with Tywin Lannister was only the first. You withheld information from my father, about the Night's Watch and the struggle to keep out the wildings. Your father has more important things to worry about than those insignificant men on the other side of the world. You were his hand, and you were responsible for informing him about things in the realm. And you betrayed him, just to get your lands back and you are clouded by own southern prejudice. We don't have enough men to help. So what, the Night's Watch has a small amount of men, and they manage fine daily. This wildling threat has to be addressed before things get worse. You have gone too soft, dear nephew. It seems spending time with Ned Stark has clouded your judgment and has made you weak. Jacob grabbed the scruff of his uncle's shirt, and looked in his eyes with fury and anger. He wanted to eliminate him, even though he would be branded a kinslayer by all gods and men or spilling his uncle's blood. How dare he slander the dead Stark Lord, while he will meet the same fate he did. Ned Stark has more honor than you have land now, great uncle. Speak slander again, and I will make your execution immediate. The prince growled, striking fear into the men in the cell. I want please get me out of here. You will die, uncle. You have to pay for your treason, and as my father is concerned. He doesn't consider you family anymore. The broken look on the face of Lord Alistair was a sight to be seen, he has everything torn away from him, but he committed a crime against his king and queen, and those within the rightful king's court. Jacob felt no sympathy for the man, as he tried to arrange a marriage between Shireen and Tommen, and tried to match him with Jaime I. Lannister again. He shuddered at the idea the first time, but was disgusted the second time. He was disgusted by the idea of having to marry any woman, who shared blood with those usurpers. You converted to the Lord of Light, I heard it from someone of the court. Is it true? Yes, I did. Lord Alistair replied. You are a fool to do so, that red woman attached to my mother and your brother is a demon wearing a pretty woman's skin. 
She will ruin our cause in some swift blow, if she is allowed to spread her mad religion throughout the seven kingdoms. I mean to stop her in any kind of way. I see, you and that smuggler have grown too close for my liking. Just like your father, willing to listen to him rather than your own fellow lords. At least, Davos isn't a traitor. I trust him better than some lords, who have abandoned my father's cause. It doesn't matter, we will make new lords and find new ones, who will fight for us. Your father will never sit on the Iron Throne, Jacob. You know this is true, and afraid to admit it. You know the Game of Thrones better than most, you know your father is only a soldier, not a king meaning to rule seven fractured kingdoms. Another treasonous thing to say, uncle. While you rest in your cell, you don't have much to live for. Did you know by deciding to abandon the Night's Watch, you directly abandoned your own grandson to that fate? The mention of it shook the formerly proud lord to crumble into pieces, Jacob didn't mean to be so harsh, but it had to be said and in his face, before he was to be executed in the coming fortnight. What would you do, save the Night's Watch, so you can be branded a hero? You will never be a hero, Jacob, as long as you are your father's son and carry his name. Jacob began to crack inside, he felt himself crying within. All he wanted was some respect and decency towards him, even though he liked to pretend not to care. He wanted people to like him, for more than being his father's son. It seems Lord Alistair said his last words. I will prove everyone wrong, and you wrong. You may have betrayed your kin, but I will not do the same. Your father will not win the Game of Thrones it's why he needs you. Without you and the smuggler, he will only listen to Melisandre and your mother, which isn't good. His grace should have other men around him, not listen to emotional women. I have to leave, you have spoken enough, my lord. Please. Talk to your father and reconsider. Jacob held on to his torch and began to leave the dungeons. The look on Lord Florence's face was of defeat and resentment. He was resigned to his fate, and Jacob didn't care a bit of his suffering. The prince leave the dungeons, hearing the cries of his former uncle, ignoring the wailing and began to move on and shut the doors of the dark place behind him. On the outskirts of Dragonstone, the prince began his isolation alone. He didn't want to pray, like the others, as he lost his ability to follow blindly. His thinking had begun to change on the voyage home from Old Town. Jacob still believed in the Seven, but wasn't as faithful as he was before. He knows he did bad things, and knew he wasn't going to be forgiven by the gods if he had abandoned them, in their hour of need against the god of Melisandre's religion. My father called the gods unjust beings, who took all good things away from people. Maybe it's what I am experiencing too, the idea of not being too blinded by faith, and questioning my own devoutness and the deaths that allowed one another. The prince began to walk through the halls of the castle, as he was alone. His mind pondered to what he wanted to do, when the war was over. Jacob knew he would be trapped somehow, playing the Game of Thrones, until his time in the game ended. From behind, he sees a familiar face of darkened blonde hair and brown eyes, alongside Ser Davos, a slew of other men with them. Jacob recognized them to be members of the king's men, men who are loyal to his father, and they follow the seven. He wondered why Davos and Ser Andrew Estermont had assembled the king's men, and he wanted to know what was the reason for it. Davos, what is the meaning of this? The prince said, in his iron, strong tone. Do you want to get us all in trouble, Davos? Involving the prince, knowing he would tell his father. One of the men said angrily. He is your rightful prince, is he not Sir? Sir Andrew said, in defense of the prince. We should eliminate the Red Witch, to keep her from corrupting the king further and seeing our plans. A different man ranted. It will not work I would be hopeful of escaping her notice with my life intact. Ser Davos grumbled. It doesn't matter what you do, I will never shrink my duty towards the men of the king. The prince, Davos and Andrew walked through the halls of the castle, as some of the other members of the king's men scattered away, leaving a few others following the three. The prince saw the same dragon carvings on the wall, as before. Prince Jacob knew where he was going, to the maester's chambers. He didn't know what Davos and the other king's men were planning, but he was reminded of his duty, as a worshipper of the seven and a prince, to protect these men from the ones who worship the demon god. 
The three men go to the maester's chambers, but the maester himself was surprised to see the prince among the king's men, as he didn't expect it or was he also involved in this plot. Maester Pilus turned towards Edric, as Jacob hasn't had a look at his idiot cousin, but saw a lot of Uncle Robert and his florent mother in him. The sapphire blue eyes, the midnight black hair and the large ears he had. Edric looked fearful, as if he had done something wrong. The maester was reassuring him, that the prince was good and honorable, unlike the men who worship Melisandre's religion and her god. You are to go with Ser Davos and his grace. Davos speaks with the king's voice and the prince has his counsel and confidence. Maester Pilus said. Prince Jacob admired the young maester, as he was risking a lot to help Davos and the king's men, he knew what was going on between these men. They were about to save Edric Storm from Melisandre's grip. The prince spoke against having the boy sacrificed, because he was only a child and was of his blood. It was when Jacob resigned the idea of his father not being himself anymore, losing all the honor, duty and justice for a strike at power again, after his great loss at the Blackwater. Edric was obedient, in standing up and following the prince, Davos and some of the king's men out of the chambers, and through the darker hallways of the castle. Cousin Jacob, I see your mood isn't the only thing changed from your return. Edric said. I'm only helping you, because I'm sick of losing people for the wrong reasons. You are going on a ship. Davos said, as the men were walking down the stairs of the castle. The boy box at first, as it was normal because he was idiot in a dangerous situation. Edric was unluckily to be in this role, but he was going to be free to live his life through the years without death following him. I insist on seeing Shireen and Uncle Stannis first. Edric complained, with his arms crossed. Jacob got down to Edric's level, as he didn't like how the boy had a sense of entitlement in him, but it wasn't his fault. He blamed Uncle Renly and Sir Courtney Penrose for it. Listen, Edric. This is the only chance you get in living a real life, outside this horrid game. If you don't go with us, then the Queen's men will either hand you over to Melisandre or force you to worship the Lord of Light. I don't want to worship the Lord of Light I hear he wants men burned alive. Davos shows the boy his mutilated fingers, as it made Jacob feel sad every time he saw them. It was a reminder of the price he paid for being a smuggler, and the sort of iron justice his father Stannis will deliver if he got the throne. This is what happens if you anger your uncle. The prince and Davos bring Edric to an area where a boat awaits, they were followed by other king's men, who wished to see this plan come to success. I guess this means goodbye, Storm. Jacob said, with a hint of sadness in his voice. I want to know cousin why would you do this? Knowing your father will be furious with you for doing this. Edric asked. Only because I will rule after him, I will not make the same mistakes he made. I will protect my people, and you are a person, no matter what they tell you. The prince and the king's hand, alongside some of the king's men saw Robert's idiot off on the boat, with Sir Andrew being his protector and the leader of his band of guardians. I wish you well on your adventure. Sir Davo said kindly, as the boy looked confused, but goes with the man on the boat. I don't know what you mean, Sir. Edric said, in a confused tone. You will be fine, Storm. You will be free and will see another part of the world, you might even see Dothraki on your journey. Jacob sniggered. The boat was sailing off the coast, as a pang of guilt hit the prince's stomach. He had committed treason, against his father and his king. He knew he was no better than Uncle Alistair, in terms of being crime-free. Davos, what have I done? Jacob and Davos return to the keep, not sure if they will never leave it again. Not after seeing Edric storm off and safe away from the clutches of the Red Woman. The two of them arrived at the chamber of the painted table, and wait for King Stannis. Jacob and Davos were listening to the voices behind the door, as the two of them were in the chambers, as the prince's father and the red woman arrive. Three is three, my king. All the usurpers are dead. The lady Melisandre said, assuring the king, I saw someone die and his mother wailing in grief. Joffrey is confirmed to be dead, your grace, possibly poisoned by the imp. Davos said, in a cold tone. Good riddance to that incest-born beast. Jacob replied, in a lighter tone of voice. 
I remember when Joffrey slit opened the stomach of a pregnant cat, a disgusting crime that caused Robert to knock some of his teeth out. The king reminisces, whoever eliminated him served the kingdom well. He eliminated the pets of his own siblings. Murdering Tommen's foal and another of Marcella's cats too. The prince added. I must wake the dragons from stone by sacrificing the boy. Melisandre urged. Swear that there is no other way. If you fail, the world will fail and fall into darkness. The red woman said sadly. If you gave the boy, then I will give you your kingdom. Fat chance, of that happening. Prince Jacob mumbled between his words. You can't, your grace, because Edric Storm is gone. Davos cuts in. From the expression on the face of Lady Melisandre, she didn't see it at all in her so-called magical flames. She looked almost surprised to have not seen it coming, a win for the hand of the king, in the mind of the prince. You meant Salador San kidnapped the boy for ransom. The king said. This was Davos's doing, and I'm sure my king, your own son facilitated the escape. The red woman interjected. Jock. Is this true? His father Stannis asks, not in the tone of a king, but the tone of a father. It is true I helped him. Only because you were going to allow him to die, he's only a child and of our blood. Jacob answered. I hope for your loyalty, Davos, it seemed I don't. I kept my oath, to protect the king's people, in which Edric Storm was one. Davos replied. If I must sacrifice one child to the flames to save a million from the dark. Then it will be worth the cause. Then, you are no better than the Lannisters who eliminated the Targaryen children, and laid their bodies at the feet of Uncle Robert. The prince gritted between his teeth, therefore angering his father. You have doomed Edric Storm, as you have doomed everyone else. Melisandre said, in a tone laced with malice. A king protects his people, or he is no king at all. Davos answered. Am I to learn a king's duty from an onion smuggler, it seems you influenced my son to commit this treason, but he will be punished later. The king said angrily, consumed with hateful feelings towards his loyal knight and his son. Davos kneels on his knees, and bowed his head low. The prince knew what was going to happen, the man was volunteering to be executed, if that wasn't honor then what was honor. You can take my head, your grace, but I beg of you to hear me out first, before I go. Speak quickly. Jacob saw Sorel appear, as the knight entered the chambers. The taller man had his arm wrapped around the prince, to shield him from what he was about to see. His father killing a man, he considered his best friend. The prince leaned on the grim man, the man who risked a lot to get him out of Old Town, even if it meant him seeing the justice his father wields. A shed tear came from the prince's eye, as he was about to see the Onion Knight for one last time. Davos fumbled through his cloak to draw out a wrinkled piece of parchment, but it was his only shield. The thin and flimsy thing, could mean the difference between life and death. A king's hand should be able to read and write, Maester Pylas has been teaching me, with the help of the prince and the children. He smoothed the message, and saw the words under the light of the magic sword. To those five kings in the realm. The king beyond the wall is heading south with a mustered army of wildlings, and Lord Commander Mormont is missing and feared to be dead. Sent for assistance to help combat the threat of wildlings from crossing the wall. Ser Davos read out loud. The king withdrew his sword from the Onion Knight, as the man began to stand on his feet. Davos dusted himself off, to look like a man who has seen forgiveness and will live again to serve his king. We should aid the Knight's watch, father. It might be the key for us to earn the respect of the North and it might be the chance we need to gain the throne again. The prince said, wiping the tear from his eye, and being let go by his sworn shield. Your grace, the other usurpers refuse to help them, but you are the only king capable of saving them. Ser Davos said. This message and your new ability to read has saved your life, and it has made me see why my heir trusts you more than any of these lords I'm surrounded with. My son may be a bit soft-hearted inside, but his mind is in the right place. He thinks with logic and realism, not the fanatical urges of the Lady Melisandre and the Queen's men. You and my son are right I must take my remaining forces to north to defend the wall. I don't care what these southerns think of the Night's Watch, 
but they guard the realm from whatever is behind the wall, if they fall, then the wildlings will pillage, rape and steal from the innocent, and I cannot have raiders and savages in my seven kingdoms. The king spoke. The prince was relieved, to see Davos able to keep his head in his life. And he was surprised to see his father forgive him, even though inside the king knew it was right for them to spirit Edric Storm away, as his father didn't like his presence much. In the coming days, Jacob hoped he was able to mend the fragmented relationship he had with his father, when they got to Castle Black, as it wasn't as strong as it was during the War of the Five Kings, he wanted that relationship again. The question is, will Jacob be given a chance to prove himself to be a capable leader, in being able to lead a host of men to save the Night's Watch and the Wall from the Wildling forces? Chapter 29 The voyage to the north was a tireless journey, as most of the men King Stannis had left from the Battle of Blackwater, as it was most of the men from House Florent and some others. Queen Celis was aboard Fury, the main ship on the king's remaining fleet, as it was the one the royal family and other vital lords and bannermen were on. Sounds of the sea crashing against the ship made the queen feel strange. She was born a southern lady and never dreamed of sailing across the seas of the kingdoms. The smoke from Dragonstone made her think for her traitor uncle. Uncle Alistair was a traitor for even thinking of committing treason against the king, and almost ruining their cause for the Iron Throne. It's his fault, the traitor could have been a good hand, but because of his treason, the smuggler was placed in a position. That smuggler has influenced my son, stolen the storm boy away from Lady Melisandre, the world could have been saved, if it wasn't for him. The man deserved to be burned alive, for his treason and for withholding information from the king about the troubles at the wall, as it was told by her son the prince. She looked at her daughter, as Shireen was happily playing with her brother Jacob, making his sister laugh at some jape he made. Her children were together, as it was the only thing that mattered to the queen. Celis was surprised, when she saw her son return. With a new hair color and a new sworn sword by his side. Sorel of House Grimm made her feel threatened, as the Grimms of Grey Shield and the Florence disliked each other for years. Nevertheless, the man was capable of protecting her son, unlike the men at the Battle of Blackwater. All of the king's men, remaining bannermen and knights were upon other ships on the galleys. Her eyes glared at the Seaworth smuggler, who was beside her son and he was comfortable with him being around. Celis never liked the man, but her son and husband defended him against those of their own family members, when they made snide comments about his low-born beginnings and reasons why the king keeps him around. The man tried to murder the great lady Melisandre, which should have gotten him executed for treason, but the king kept him around and made him hand of the king. The queen's men were her men, as they followed the religion of Melisandre. They grumbled snide things about her son Jacob returning, which could give those seven worshipping fools power in the king's court. Idiots, these men hate those of the king's men, but Jacob is my son and they will do no such thing to him. Their rightful prince and the king of the seven kingdoms, after his father. They should show him respect, even though he worships the seven. Celis would protect her son, as it was Rolaller who brought him back to her. He must have planned something for Jacob, as he returned him for a reason. The queen never questioned Rolaller, as he was the god she believed in now. The god who inspired many of her men to follow in the worship of this deity Melisandre brought from the east. Her uncle Axel stood by her side, as the self-proclaimed leader of the queen's men and her representative on the king's war council. Uncle, what are you complaining about this time? The queen asked bitterly. His grace, the prince's return is a blessed token of his truly. Sir Axel replied. Those simpering fools loyal to Stannis think they might get something over our men, using my son as their figurehead. The prince is strong-willed he would never want to be used for someone else's ambition. He has changed, uncle. Something happened to him in the south, he would not talk about it, it must have been terrible for him to keep silent on what happened. He never told who was responsible for kidnapping him. I think it was allies of the Tyrells that took him, and tried to hand him over to the Lannisters as their show of faith. Luckily, this Sorel Grimm protected him and helped him come back to us. That man scares me, your grace. The Grimms never liked us, and sit on their island of the shields, laughing at our rightful claim to the reach. He is nothing like the rest of his family. The man chose a worthy cause, to serve the rightful king and be the prince's sworn shield. 
The smuggler has too much influence over Jacob, he keeps him by his side. Just like his father in that regard. What if the king makes his grace, the prince marry a woman from the north? I wouldn't allow it, but Stannis said it was what must happen, if we were to gain another army again. The king's word is law, it's one of the only reasons why he agreed with us moving north. To save the night's watch and to find a northern wife for the prince. I will speak with the king about this. Dear niece, the smuggler hand suggested it towards the king, and he agreed with it. The prince spent time in the north, and knows the noblewomen there. If I had a hand in it, Jacob will marry a southern woman. I don't want my son to be married to a woman with the coldness of the north in her blood. I want to see my grandson or granddaughter at the end of this war. I hope so too, my queen. With Uncle Axel leaving the side of the queen, Celis walked on the deck of the big ship, which belonged to her husband, and it hadn't been ruined at the course of this war. Her mind was rattled by the thought of Stannis plotting to marry Jacob off to a northern woman, but she knew why he was doing it, to secure an alliance with the cold region, to provide more men in his fight for the Iron Throne again. Any northern lord would be lucky to have a daughter, who could possibly be a princess and the next queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Jacob must marry, Celis. It's time. He has been unmarried for too long during this war, he is still young and at seventeen years of age. Any man of the north would the foolish enough not to want their daughters to be queen. The words of her husband spoke two days before the voyage. Celis was saddened, by the thought of Jacob's wedding not being the joyous occasion she wanted it to be, as he was her only son and she wanted the best for him. The world was at war, and recently it's known for weddings to be more dangerous than the battlefield. The queen didn't like it, as her son was worth more than some savage north woman in his bed, and possibly birthing his children in the future. Her eyes wandered on her son, who was alone. Without the grim sworn shield behind him, as he must have sent him away to have time on his own. Celis remembered the day she brought her son into the world, he was a quiet baby and never cried loudly. It was the silent trait he inherited from his father. Jacob was different, more stern and hardened. He wanted to prove to his father, that he was a capable leader and wanted to lead a host of men into the battle against the savage wildings. My boy was born a leader, he has qualities of both his foolish Baratheon uncles, but that drunken Robert knew how to lead men into war and eliminate people. It's what my son wanted to inspire towards, to be more battle-hardened than his late uncle. The queen walked on the deck, as she flinched at the sea crashing against the ship with the waters overboard. It was her first trip aboard a ship, and she was uncomfortable with the long voyage towards the wall. The prince turned around to see his mother standing beside him, watching the halves of the sea flowing alongside the ship, steering the course towards the north and towards east watch by the sea. Mother, I thought you were not speaking with me. Jacob said solemnly, fiddling with his hair. Your hair, I don't like the color, it's terrible. Celis replied. The color will fade out, I did it to protect myself from people who would know my face and my coloring. What happened to you, when they kidnapped you? Mother, I was taken by bannermen of the Tyrells. I was lucky to escape with the help of a maester, who healed by wounds from the battle. It was when I found Sorel, who was the captain of my ship, and he helped me get home. The man saved your life, and has talent with a sword. The queen said, in a lighter tone. It's why I wanted him to be my sworn shield. Mother, I know the man's family has had problems with the Florence in the past, but he is a different man to his lord cousin. Your father is planning on marrying you off to a woman from the north. It's my king's will, mother. I cannot disobey father, or otherwise he will never trust me again. Why are you against the Lady Melisandre? She has brought goodness to our cause, your father's cause. The queen pleaded. The woman is untrustworthy and a liar, mother, the fact that Edric Storm was gone should tell you, that he is not the one. You and that smuggler committed treason, against your father, the king. I don't know what has gotten into you, I think this prolonged stay in the north will be good for you and will make you a better prince for the kingdom. Mother, your men have been saying bad things about me. About how I should be disinherited from the throne because of my part in the treason. Don't listen to them, they only think of what Lawler and Melisandre thinks. You are my son, and I forgive you. 
You had a reason to send the boy away, and I don't blame you. The smuggler influenced you to do so. Mother, you should stop insulting Davos. He is hand of the king and father's most trusted confidant he should be treated with respect. From you and those idiots of the queen's men. I may not like the man, but I will try. For your sake, as I will do anything for your happiness and well-being. The queen said, enveloping her arms around her son, and bringing in him close to her. Celis felt the warmth of her son with her. Jacob leaned against the shoulder of his mother, and embraced her. Her hand brushed against his newly grayish hair, as he began to pour the outcry of tears, which were on her shoulder. I want to be a leader, mother. I want father to see me as being capable, as being more than just his son and heir. The prince said, sadly in the arms of his mother. Your father has a lot to think about. The queen replied. This was the first time, the queen felt a closeness and nearness with her son, even though her has a lot of weight on his shoulders. Being the prince and the heir to the Iron Throne, it was a lot of pressure and expectations to exceed. The queen missed her son, and was happy to have him back. Even though, the queen's men were not so glad because of the protection he provided for the king's men against them. Celis had faith in her son, even though he didn't believe in the same god she did. She knew he could be a skilled leader, if Stannis gave him the chance and let him prove himself, to be more than the son of Stannis Baratheon and be a man in his own right. Chapter 30 Prince Jacob was walking across the cold snows of the war camp, as he had been staying there for at least three days, since the voyage from Dragonstone to Castle Black. He heard the busting of men, whom were preparing swords, horses and shields ready for battle. He was walking alone, as he left his sworn sword Ser Sorel Grimm to prepare for battle, as it was going to happen son. Jacob was trembling through his fingers, as he heard the shouts and cheers of men running across the snows. The prince felt out of place in war camps, as the battlefield was not his area of expertise he was a courtier and knew the game of thrones inside and out. He could fight well, but he felt useless when it came to doing what was needed to be done. Among the men getting ready for battle, the flags of many noble houses were flapping the cold winds, as it signified the remaining men who were on the side of the rightful king. The prince missed Shireen, but knows she is safe at Eastwatch by the sea with his mother Celis and great-uncle Axel, along with several of the queen's men, who stayed behind to protect the queen and the princess. Jacob ignored Sorel on the journey to the wall he noticed his own growing harshness towards people. It was because he couldn't afford to be sentimental and weak, as it was expected of him being heir to the throne. The grayish color from Jacob's hair was disappearing, as his natural black hair was returning. The small scar under his left eye from the Blackwater was quite prominent, but Jacob learned that scars and wounds make the warrior. I miss Uncle Robert. He would have loved another battle, as he was begging for one in the form of the last Targaryens and the Dothraki. The stories I hear about him during the rebellions of the Mad King and the Greyjoys made him out to be this larger-than-life war hero, but the hole in his heart from losing Lady Lyanna changed him. Prince Jacob was confused, as to what he must do. He may be a man grown, but he was only seven and ten years of age and was still figuring out his place in the world. He was determined to be a leader, and to prove himself to be more than being his father's copy. He noticed the absence of Ser Davos, as he wasn't on the field. The man was sent on a diplomatic mission on the orders of his father King Stannis. The prince missed having him around, but he had Sorel around which made him feel less alone. The coldness of the region was felt, but the prince's gold and black furs were keeping him warm, protecting him from the chills of the almost winter weather. They were the same ones he wore in Winterfell two years ago. Prince Jacob walked across the snowy fields, with troops preparing for battle and getting excited for another chance of victory of the field. He was unwelcome in the north, as it was the realm of the old gods, he could see some of the queen's men looking their noses down upon the north. As a worshipper of the seven, Jacob had prayed the night before the battle. Mostly to the warrior, who was key to success on the battlefield. He also prayed for his father to get some protection from the gods, against the red demon in a woman's skin, who wore red robes and had unknown powers. The prince saw a large tent, as it had the symbol of his father's red, yellow and orange sigil on it. Jacob never liked the sigil because it represents a bad omen, 
and the seven could punish his father for turning their backs on the true gods of the realm to worship a demon, and follow the words of a woman, who will lead him into a war he cannot win. At the corner of the prince's eye, it caught the sight of the Lady Melisandre, who was dressed in new red robes, from the ones she would usually wear. It seemed the fire inside her kept the cold from freezing the priestess to death. The prince saw the woman approach him, as he wanted to see his father before the battle and discuss their plans at the last minute before the fighting begins. I see you are alone, my prince. The Lady Melisandre said, in a melodic tone of voice. Shouldn't you be at Eastwatch by the sea with my mother and the rest of the men, who worship the ground you walk on, my lady? Your father commanded me to stay by his side, he has a use for me. I saw your return through my flames, you couldn't have been eliminated easily. I want you to stay away from my father and the rest of my family. Your kind are not welcome in the seven kingdoms, my lady. The prince said defiantly. Your father is the Lord's chosen, and you cannot deny it. My father is just a man, my lady. A man wedded to honor, justice, and duty, he is hardly the man made for a mythical hero. The red priestess was closer to the prince, and he felt the heat of the fire radiating from her. Jacob felt like he was in an outer body experience. As if he had left the world of the living and entered the one of the dead. Her pale fingers clutched onto Prince Jacob's shoulder, as he felt a shock through his body and a feeling of emptiness was present. He sensed his body had betrayed him and surrendered to the touch of the Red Priestess. In his younger years, Jacob had his fair share of having feelings of admiration towards women, but he was devout in his faith and never fucked a woman, unlike his late uncle Robert did and had many bastards as a result of it. Rulaller has a purpose for you, my prince. You are a strong, capable warrior who can champion him and make him the true god of the kingdoms. The priestess whispered in his ear. Didn't one of your own try to convert my uncle years ago? Was he the Thuris of Mir? The prince asked, shrugging Melisandre away from him. The priests and priestesses of Rulaller worship him in their own ways, it's how we were trained in the temples of Ashai. You are a foreigner in a world that cherishes their own gods. Most are stubborn and are loyal to their own, they do not welcome outsiders with foreign religions. Your resistance to the Lord of Light is futile, you hold on to your faith for the false gods is a waste of your loyalty to the true God. I don't know what fairy tales you like to spin for the Queen's men and my mother. I know better because I think with logic and reason, not the mysticism and stories you like to spread among my men. They are not stories, my prince. They are truths I have seen through my flames, and a second long night will be upon us. The prince began to get irritated, he didn't like seeing this woman around his parents, but his father kept her around for a reason. Jacob rebelled against having her around, as he knew she was bad for their cause for the throne. The display with the flaming sword on Dragonstone was quite the entertainment. The prince said sarcastically. It was a ceremony, proclaiming your father to be the Lord's chosen champion against the forces of darkness. The Red Priestess replied. My father is many things. Rigid, uptight, bitter and unfeeling, but he is no chosen hero. I don't care what you think, you and those other Red God-worshipping fools who want to worship fire. I will keep my faith to the seven, for as long as I like, I will not be intimated or manipulated into betraying the gods who have been there for me. The prince said loudly. Rulaller would have been grateful for a loyal worshipper such as yourself. You cannot be persuaded, it's in your blood. The defiance and the boldness within will make you either an enemy to your own people or an unlikely hero among them. Why did you come here? To persuade me or to seduce me like you did with my father? Your father needs me. I have the power he wants to seize the kingdoms and to save the world from the great other. I was praying for the men and for their victory on the battlefield, along with you and the king. You can take your prayer to your false god and throw it behind the wall. The prince gritted between his teeth. As the prince said those words, the lady Melisandre looked angered, and didn't expect such defiance and resistance from Jacob. She had another look of pity on her face, as if it was another of her tricks to play him. The Red Priestess looked at the seven-pointed star around the neck of Prince Jacob, alongside a golden stag. The prince wore it as a symbol of his faith towards the seven, and to protect him from being seduced by the woman's wicked powers. If you excuse me, your grace. 
I am to lead a nightfire for some of Rulalares' worshippers before the battle. Prince Jacob saw Melisandre walk away, as her red appearance stood out against the coldness and snows of the north. He looked at her, as if she had some kind of effect on him, but he was strong and able to resist her wickedness. Ser Davos would have been proud. Nevertheless, the prince felt a pull towards her as if it was a dance between the light and the darkness of choosing between the seven and the religion of Rulalar. Jacob breathed a sigh of relief of her being gone and out of his sight. He felt a sense of betrayal within him, as Jacob was not the honorable person he pretended to be. The prince committed treason against his father, by helping the king's men save Edric Storm from the grasp of Melisandre. He was lucky to have his father forgive him, because the king knew Jacob did the right thing no matter the cost of it. The prince opened the curtains of the tent to enter through the spaced location. It had some of the captain knights leaving the tent, as they had their armor and their swords prepared. Prince Jacob was alone, as he missed the presence of Davos always standing beside his father King Stannis, who stood up and still looked at various maps, of the Wall and the Northern Region. He felt low in himself, remembering the treason he committed and how Davos's life was almost ended because of his actions in helping him. Father, you wanted to see me. Prince Jacob said. Preparations are ahead, and the men are about to march beneath the wall. King Stannis replied. I want to ask you something, unless it's too unimportant for you to consider. What is it? I want a chance to lead, a host of men into battle. You have always praised my political cunning, but I want to prove myself on the field. Monkeys and fools require things, but you do not. You are my son, and you should be expected to lead, you are my heir and will rule after me. I expect this battle to be a test, to see if you are a capable leader and to earn a victory for yourself. After what I did, I thought you would disinherit me from the throne and I would never have your trust again. You did what you believed to be right, even though it is treason in the eyes of the Queen's men. This move was the right thing to do, if we didn't then we would have been invaded by Lord Redwine's fleet and have been eliminated by the Lannister allies. I'm not a fool, Jacob. Davos told me about your relationship with Lady Desmara years ago, and Renly's last few words confirmed the truth. Father, whatever happened between Desmara and I, it's finished and I'm ready to assume my duty to whomever I am going to marry. Your marriage arrangements will be discussed when we reach Castle Black. You have been unmarried far too long in this war, and your availability and youth is an advantage I have over the Lannisters. Tommen is only a pudgy boy, who loves his cats too much. He is being controlled by the other Lannisters, who will ruin the alliance they have with the Tyrells. How do you know? Underneath the pomp and foolishness, Mace Tyrell is power-hungry and will do whatever he can to seize the power he wants. He won't get anything under the Lannisters, who will not share their power willingly. That doesn't matter, we have a battle to fight and to get you married off as quickly as possible. I'm only saying father, Tommen is only a boy and it will be years before he is able to consummate with Lady Marjorie. I fostered with the Tyrells long enough to know Lord Mace will change sides to whatever will benefit him the most. You were confrontational with the Lady Melisandre. Father, I don't understand why you and Mother want to have her around. She is a walking disaster waiting to happen, she will spell doom for our cause for the throne. I requested your presence because I want you to give you something. It was hard to require, but it came with Robert's bones to Storm's End. Prince Jacob didn't know what to expect, what was to be given to him that once belonged to his uncle Robert. He already wore his late lord grandfather's pendant around his neck, and his few days' growth of beard on his face resembled his uncle in the days of the Mad King. The prince and the king stood next to a box with the crown stag on it, it looked strange to Jacob as it felt like his uncle was still alive and with them. The box was opened by the two of them, for the prince to be faced with something he never thought he would see. Uncle Robert's Warhammer. The weapon was just like how some men described it to be in the battles he fought. In the colors of gold and black, crested in the crown stag of House Baratheon and it had been cleaned. Why is it here? This was the instrument that ended Rieger Targaryen's life and eliminated Ironborn men years later. I keep it as a memory of when Robert had not become a shell of the man he once was, a strong man who could turn enemies into friends. A leader in war, but a terrible king who couldn't rule the kingdoms alone. What is it doing here? 
Knowing those brats were good for nothing, Robert told me when you returned from fostering with the Tyrells. He would have wanted you to train with his war hammer and to potentially inherit it when he was gone. Why? The Lannisters hated your presence in court, only because Robert favored you more than those pretenders, as you had his likeness compared to the Lannister looks of Joffrey and Tommen. We must stop the wildlings and save the Night's Watch. The North will be grateful for the assistance given, especially when things are getting tougher and there are more wars to be fought. I will not have savages and pillagers in my seven kingdoms, most of them will be dead by nightfall. This king beyond the wall, he should be left alive for interrogation and maybe a peace treaty between our sides. We do not negotiate with savages, and those who fight for them. It's the only way to keep the Night's Watch safe from harm, and to not cause more problems than we already have. What has Ned Stark taught you about the wildlings, while in the North? Unlike the other lords of the North, at least Lord Stark will be willing to listen to the wildlings, if he ever came across them. He would question them, as if he does any other criminal of his region. Most of the northern lords would rather see them all dead. For good reason. I hope we can survive this dreadful weather, to even pass through to get to the throne. You will marry one of the north's daughters, whether you like it or not. I don't know what Davos told me about your relationship with the Redwine girl, but all thoughts and feelings of her must be put away. I fear I may not live to see my grandson at the end of this war. This game is more tiring than the war, every move that is made could be the difference between life and death. Robert wanted you to wear the armor representing our house, the antlered one he and John Aaron had fashioned before I left my position as master of ships. He wanted to make a great warrior of you, since the two Lannister brats were lacking anything in strength and fury. Jacob felt a stoniness within, he didn't know how much Uncle Robert had invested into his future, to the detriment of his own pretender children. He was loved by his uncle and bigger things were planned for him in his uncle's reign as king. The prince and his father looked through the intricate maps detailing the places around the wall and beneath it, as it was where the wildling army could be stationed. Preparing for another attack against the Night's Watch. This time, the rightful king and his heir, with their remaining soldiers and bannermen will come and save the day. Prince Jacob was upon his grey horse Misty, as the young man was looking around with his sword limos by his side. His eyes looked to see Sorel, who was riding behind him on his own horse with a host of men behind him. The prince was fashioned in gold and black armor with antlers decorated around it. He placed an antlered helm on his head, as he could see the snows of the north and the men marching on their horses with him at the helm. Jacob felt the tall, arching warrior he wanted to be. In the armor of stag antlers and his sword by his side. His mind was set on gaining some glory for himself, and to hopefully see Jon Snow again, as he was one of his last remaining friends in the world. To see Jon again would be great, but we are not the idealistic young men we were two years ago. I am the heir to the Iron Throne and the future ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, and he is a man of the Night's Watch and an idiot. The prince knew things were changing, and things couldn't go back to the way things were in the past. Too many lives were lost and there are more wars and battles to be fought, for the sake of the throne and the kingdom. We shall march in unison, as the host my father is leading will surround the wildling camp beneath the wall. Most of them will have no escape, and will have no choice, but to fight us or die. Jacob said, in his most commanding tone of voice. Yes, your grace. Sorel replied, as he gestured some of the men to come forward on their horses. These wildlings think they can enter our seven kingdoms, without consequences of their own folly. Some will die and others will either bend the knee or die. The prince chanted. As your prince and future king of the seven kingdoms, all criminals and traitors will be dealt with an iron fist, if they don't like it then they shall die for their weakness. The men in the host began to follow the lead of Prince Jacob, as he motioned his horse to ride faster, with his sword behind his back. He could see perfectly through his antlered helm with the men in his command behind him. The trotting of horses, and the metal sound of shields clanging was what the prince heard, whilst riding misty through the snows of the north. The conditions of the weather didn't make it ideal for a battle, but the prince was warm in his gold and black furs around his armor. The adrenaline and the rush of blood through the body of the prince had him feel excited, for another chance of victory on the battlefield, whilst he performed well at the Battle of Blackwater. 
he wanted to secure this win for his father, whom he failed in the last battle. Prince Jacob had several thoughts running through his mind, but he pushed those aside because he had wildings to fight and to make an alliance with the North. Ruling with an iron fist is the way father wants to rule, and I am becoming more like him than I would have liked. His way is the only way the seven kingdoms can be united after war, the weak monarchs of the past are destroying the kingdoms, and only an iron rule can put it back. The young man's horse rode past the belly of the wall, with Sorel by his right side being his right-hand man throughout this stage of his journey through Westeros. The man from the reach looked to be content, reaching out to his sword in case he needed to. Riding through the snows was quite the struggle, as most of the remaining men in the rightful king's army were from the south and were not used to the cold conditions of the north, but Jacob was used to the cold, having been a guest here once. If any of the wildlings try to attack us, ride them down or eliminate them. The other men of my father's host will surround them, and there will be no way out. The prince shouted. Prince Jacob knew he was getting older, he wasn't the same young man of ten and five that stayed in Winterfell with an idealistic mindset of remaining friends with the people he bonded with, as some of them turned into enemies and others died. He had seen his looks change, as he had grown a beard for the last few days. A lot of the men remaining from the Stormlands, had almost mistaken him for Uncle Robert in his rebellion days, with colder eyes and an iron will. The ride through the forest was swift, with other men of their host riding in a united front. Waving the flags of many of the noble houses of the kingdoms, some of the only ones honorable to stand with the rightful king. The host then rode into the forest, with the battle cry sounded with the men ready to eliminate and win the day for their king and the watch. With Prince Jacob riding in front of the host, and leading them to a new victory. The prince pulled out his sword, in the midst of the battle cry. He held on to his horse Misty, as he pulled out his sword to strike at an incoming wildling, with his blade limos stained in blood once again, he was ready to fight. Prince Jacob galloped through the forest, striking the blow of his sword against another wildling, whom had tried to shot an arrow at home. His helm and armor protected him from dying easily, like a few men in the host. Gods, the cold and the frost is making this battle harder to fight. What will happen if a snowstorm was to be upon us when we march for Winterfell? The young man held on to his sword tightly, as he heard Misty neighing at the sight of another dead wildling by her rider's hand. Prince Jacob saw a spear going through a wildling, as it was through the heart. The smell of blood and death excited him, as he had wanted to fight another battle. To prove himself to be a true Baratheon, like his uncle Robert. He saw the host he was leading coming from one side, and the other half of the host his father led coming through the forest trees, to surround the wildlings around the center of the woods. Prince Jacob struck a swift blow against another wildling, as a few were charging against him and his men, but some of the men in the host were slaughtering them with swords and the sharp end of the flag of his father's sigil of yellow, red and orange. Men from the two hosts were accompanied by some of the rangers from East Watch, led by Cotter Pike, whom the prince didn't like due to his ironborn blood. In a crash collision of the two hosts combined together, into the center of the wildling war camp, and began the blood, slaughter and the harshness of battling swords against axes and long knives. The prince began cutting down some of the adversary men of the wildling army, with his sword stained in red blood, and his eyes were stern, looking to his surroundings and those of his men. Sorel shouted, as he struck his sword through an axe-wielding wilding, whom was about to eliminate him. The prince was exhaling more, with his chest tightening and his hand losing his grip onto his horse. Sorel, watch for the archers. The prince shouted, towards his knight friend from the south. Prince Jacob threw his dagger, the one Uncle Alistair got for him against an archer hiding behind the trees, and he had had fallen dead with a striking blow. The column of riders coming forth was helpful, as the prince tightened his grip on his horse, whilst holding on to his sword, to strike down at a long knife holding wildling with the sharp, silver edge of his blade. The wars will never stop, as long as there are men fighting them. Whether it's the war in the court or on the battlefield, the killings will be the same. And I am no better than those who do so, because I am a game player and a warrior. Prince Jacob held the line, with the trotting of his horse causing him to fall off his horse and head first onto the ground of the field. He began to pull himself back up, holding onto his blade and putting his helm back on his head. The prince gutted a wildling, 
whom tried to eliminate his horse he held on to his blade, as it had blood trickling down it, and more blood for it to be tainted with. Gods. This. The prince gritted between his teeth, as he would normally never utter bad language. The young man kicked down another with the heel of his foot in a hard blow. He gritted between his teeth, as he sensed the blood dripping down his lips, and he licked his lips and smiled. He had never felt such a rush of confidence before, and he liked it. Prince Jacob felt himself change he felt more like a war warrior, than a political savvy prince he was before the battle. He saw Misty come, as he began to mount his horse again, holding on to his blade tightly in his hand. The prince motioned his horse to ride further, as most of the men from his host followed him, slaughtering wildlings in his path. Hold the line, don't let any of them come through. The prince shouted, as it echoed through the forest. Prince Jacob recognized his father Stannis's subtler antler helm, and the glowing sword of Lightbringer in his hand, striking down several wildlings whom dared to attack him, with most of the Florent men fighting with him. Many of their remaining men circled around the wildlings and began to eliminate them in a bloody fashion, and most of them looked towards their prince, who was leading many men of the host to victory. Jacob began to be caught off guard by the mass assault of knights attacking the central camp, but he swung his sword against a wildling, who tried to eliminate Sorel with an axe, with the Reacher man having a stunned look on his face. Protect yourselves, and don't break the line. The prince commanded. The host led by the prince's father smashed through a contingent led by some wildling with orange hair and a great beard in the same color. The man looked to be the leader, as he was one of the more accurate fighters among them. Jacob began to truly understand why fighting and killing was so thrilling and gratifying for him. It was in his blood, as Baratheons were born to fight and display unimaginable fury against their enemies and foes. The wildling host breaks, as more of the knights emerge from the trees and the corners. Prince Jacob was assaulted by a bigger wildling man, who held a large axe, bigger than any ironborn and had a black cloak on. I am not a boy of ten and five anymore. I am a man of almost ten and eight. I am a prince, a warrior, a son, a brother and a future king. I will not back down from a fight nor will I give up, if I do, then I belong in the grave. The prince gripped his blade, and gulped down his fears and doubts, and began the dance between axe and blade, with the prince's fingers bleeding. And him kneeling down to force a heavy kick onto the chest of the wildling, and maiming him with his sword. From afar, hundreds or thousands of wildlings were dying around him. Jacob was used to the sight of dead bodies, but this was a lot for one army on the opposite side. Some were captured by their men, and others were dead as a sign of the battle coming to a very bloody end. Stannis. 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 The knights began to chant, as it signaled their victory and the battle being over and it being won. Victory. For the king and the Iron Prince. The knights chanted, as it gave the prince a sense of astonishment and pride, knowing he helped gain the victory for the men. Chapter 31 The rightful king and his heir Jacob were in the elevator, making their way to the top of the wall. The Night's Watch were grateful for the assistance against the wildlings, as some of the men from the watch those who came from King's Landing had mistaken Jacob for a younger version of Robert, which infuriated the prince's father a lot more than failure. Jacob may have the likeness of his uncle Robert, but he will always be his father's son and heir. The young man was tired the battle was long and there were a few loses in their host against the army of wildlings beneath the wall. Nevertheless, Jacob proved himself on the field, taking charge, exerting commands, and was able to fight, even when he fell from his horse. He seemed to be a stronger fighter on the ground, rather than on horseback. The prince felt a little unsure about himself, and what he did in terms of scheming and politics, but he knew whatever he did was for the right reason, even if it was morally wrong and considered treason by others. The lift stopped at the top of the wall, as the prince had a solemn look on his face. He wore the furs of gold and black on him. Out of the antlered helm showed a young man, who looked completely different than he did, when he first left Winterfell. Prince Jacob had beard growth on his face. His sapphire blue eyes were piercing cold, and the scar underneath his left eye made him more intimidating than the tone of his voice. He had grown a bit taller, and was more muscular from the fighting. You did well on the field, I couldn't have expected better. 
Stannis said, in a lower tone of voice. I appreciate the compliment father it means a lot to earn your respect. You proved yourself to be a capable leader and commander, your next test will be against the Boltons on the field. I would like nothing better than to burn them to ashes and dust, along with their phrase too. You will see your mother and sister soon, until a new Lord Commander is chosen and the Night's Watch is more organized, it looks like a band of bandits than protectors of the realm. Most of the brothers of the Watch were bandits from the Riverlands, who would rather freeze than lose their heads. I suspect Davos will have his hands full with the mission I have given him. The man is loyal to you father how could you have doubted him? Only because you listened to the witch and almost eliminated him. Should I have disinherited you, as the Queen's men commanded I should, because of your role in said treason? I understand why you did it. You believed what you did was right, regardless of how they feel. Of all my years of traveling through the Seven Kingdoms, I never thought I would see a wildling woman with the beauty of a southern lady. The prince began to laugh. Keep away from the wildling princess, Jacob. Your weakness for beautiful women will be your downfall. It was the weakness of Robert, who couldn't keep his hands off any available whore in the Seven Kingdoms. Unlike Uncle Robert, I can control myself around women and I haven't participated in premarital relations. His father Stannis placed his hand over his face, and looked to be embarrassed. Enough, I don't want to hear it anymore. All right, let's change the subject before you get even more embarrassed or snap in anger. The prince muttered. Prince Jacob enjoyed bringing his father out of his comfort zone, and japing with him. It might have made things a little more awkward between father and son, especially when it came to women and the subject of sexual relations. The prince's mind was at the end of the battle, when he saw some of the wildlings being taken as prisoners, including Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall and most of his loyal cohorts, but the prince felt sorry for the fallen wildling king and widower. The man had to see many of his people die, and had to find out about the death of his wife, as she died during the birth of their son. It made Jacob think a lot about the views he had, and whether anyone was truly good or evil, or are all people in the morally grey zone when it came to intentions. The death of the wildling queen was the only thing Jacob felt sad about. War is such an exhausting endeavor we are going to need more gold to finance the rest of the war. We are in need of food, resources and more men to fight with us, and maybe we could survive the winter. The prince said. We will need to send an envoy to Bravo soon, as it's one of the only places where we could find the funds needed for the war. The Iron Bank is the key, the Lannisters are not paying what they are owed, particularly during Uncle Robert's reign. The prince learned a lot about the Iron Bank, during his time with the Tyrells and in court. He knew this organization of strange folk from across the sea, could be the key to the downfall of the Lannisters and might turn towards Jacob and his father. The young man heard the sound of the elevator stopping at the wall, he turned to see the Lady Melisandre all clothed in red, along with Jon Snow. He looked different to the last time Jacob saw him on the King's Road. Jon was more rugged, with a full beard on his face. He was a man, and not the boy the prince saw before. On his face looked to be of a man, who has seen a lot of things behind the wall and was alive to fight another day. Prince Jacob glared daggers at Melisandre, as he didn't want this insect to influence his last remaining friend to her mad religion. The prince stood by his father's side, in a protective manner and stood as if he was already a king. I know of the stories you heard about me, but I am no traitor. John explained. I do not believe you to be a traitor. I knew Ned Stark and Jan Oslint, and no one would doubt the man's honor or honesty. The king said, in his usual iron tone. I know it was you, who found the dragonglass Samuel Tarly used to slay the other, and you held the gate at Castle Black until I arrived. It was Donal Noy, who held the gate. The man was honorable and did his duty, he would have made a better lord commander than any of these fools contending. Prince Jacob spoke, to ease the discomfort between the three men. Cotter Pike and Ser Dennis are good men, whom Lord Commander Mormont trusted. Lord Mormont trusted too easily, and that is what led to his demise and his end. The king said dismissively, you found the magic horn and captured Mance Raider's child. Dalla died in childbirth, so there wasn't much capturing involved. John said, in a saddened tone, as if he knew the woman, my lady, 
were you responsible for the death of the skin changer's eagle? The Lord of Light has fiery talons, John Snow. The Lady Melisandre replied. Your Grace, Mance Raider's good sister Val requests for him to see his son. Why should I do such a kindness for a deserter? It's for Val's sake. The free folk have their own brand of honor and choose their own leaders. This made Prince Jacob feel a bit soft inside, even though he tried to block away his emotions inside. He had seen the wildling princess, when the other wildlings were being dragged to Castle Black in chains to be prisoners of his father. The wildling princess Val was beautiful, as he hadn't thought of the word to describe a wilding at all. Her hair looked to be spun from gold and she held a spear, like a true northerner to defend her own people from their enemies. My true fight is here, against what the Lady Melisandre calls the god of night and terror, perhaps this could be your fight as well, King Stannis says. Rob Stark failed me by trying to become a king instead of remaining Lord of Winterfell, and maintaining his friendship with my son. Now I need a Lord of Winterfell loyal to me. Theon Greyjoy destroyed Winterfell. John pointed out. It can be rebuilt, and I need a son of Eddard Stark to win the Northmen to my banner. The king can make you a Stark in truth, instead of an idiot. Melisandre added. I took a vow, to the Night's Watch to hold no lands, father no children and to remain neutral in political matters. John stammers. Rolaller is the only true god, and a vow sworn to a tree has no power. The prince didn't like how the red woman was being openly disrespectful towards John, and the religion he and other northerners followed. The north are loyal to their gods, my lady. You shouldn't impose your own agenda onto him. I have been speaking to Mance Raider, and that I plan to let the wildlings through and let them settle in the north. In order to ally with them against our common foe beyond the wall, but the man himself will be executed, and I will also wed the new lord of Winterfell to the wildling princess. Val will never submit she is a woman of the free folk. The women of the free folk require to be stolen to win their affections. Jacob saw the anger on his father's face. It was as if the father himself came down to judge the wrongful harshly and to send them swift into the seven hells. Do you mean to refuse me? The king said angrily, with his tone of voice being louder. I ask for some time to consider such a decision. Do not take long. Jacob watched his father put a thin, fleshless hand on John's shoulder. Since he came back from Old Town, he had been concerned about his father's well-being, as he had become gaunt and losing the flesh from his face and his hands. Say nothing of what we've discussed here today. To anyone. When you return, you need only bend your knee, lay your sword at my feet, and pledge yourself to my service and you shall rise again as John Stark, Lord of Winterfell. The prince knew this kind of decision would need a lot of thought, and it will conflict with John's sense of duty and honor to the Night's Watch, no matter how hostile the environment was to him. It is selfish to want him by my side and fighting together, it could have been Rob and I, if he had rejected the crown of a false king. Prince Jacob knew he had to talk to John, away from the prying eyes of his father, the Lady Melisandre and others of the king's men on the wall. After getting down from the elevator, Prince Jacob felt conflicted as well. Between his own wish fulfillment and his duty to respect John's choice whatever it was, he knew his old friend's life on the wall wasn't easy and had a lot of hardship. How could Jacob know, he was highborn and the future ruler of the Seven Kingdoms. The prince wanted to be alone, away from the constraints of being heir to the throne for a moment and remembered that he was human and had limits to how much more he could take of boring council meetings and being called your grace all the time. I want to go back to the time Uncle Robert was the only person being called your grace, and I was his nephew and loyal subject, now I am in that place. The place he was, the highest position in the Game of Thrones, and I am to be king after my father. Jacob walked through the snows, and saw many men in black cloaks, and they looked to be busy, ignoring the presence of the prince, which he didn't mind because he wanted to be an ordinary man, before he had to go back to being a prince. The young man sometimes hated how he was turning into his father the bitterness, the harshness and the denial of penitence and forgiveness for anyone. Jacob wrapped himself warm in the gold and black furs, with his hair loose and past his shoulders. He sees John training against a brother of the Night's Watch, and looked to be more of a fluid fighter than Jacob has seen of how Knights of the Stormlands to fight. The prince trotted his heavily booted feet in the shows, 
as he had grown used to the cold and the chills of the northern region, and beyond the north of where the Starks used to rule it. The combat match had been stopped, as the prince felt a sense of optimism of how John could still be his friend, and can keep his attachments away because of how Jacob lost most of his other friends. I see you have improved on your skill, since I last saw you in the armory. Prince Jacob said. Your grace, I didn't expect you to see me. John replied. Before I was crowned a prince, I was Jacob of House Baratheon, a political savvy boy who didn't have much friends because he was too much like his father in personality and likeness. I still had two uncles and a loyal maester before they all died. I'm sorry for your losses, your grace. And I'm sorry for your losses too, John. The prince said kindly, as he John lost most of his family, but he still had two sisters, who were alive. You have grown a beard the last time I saw you. Yours has grown more than mine. Jacob laughed, as he knew his own beard was nothing compared to John's. Some of the black brothers had mistaken you for your uncle, they believed King Robert had come back from the dead. My father hates it, being compared to Uncle Robert in every shape or form it annoys him, and it saddens him a lot. The decision your father gave me is a hard one, it will require a lot of thought, as it conflicts with the vow I made to the watch. John, I know my father can be harsh, bitter and uptight, but this war is tiring him out. He doesn't look to be himself, as he is losing the flesh from his hands and his face, he is barely recognizable apart from the flamed crown he wears. At least, your father is still alive and you can see him. It made Jacob feel guilty he realized John would never see his father again because of the Lannisters, he knew he would be able to avenge Ned Stark and others, who were eliminated by the prideful lions trying to keep Jacob and his father from their rightful throne. I'm sorry, I spoke out of turn. I should be mindful of my words, and how I say them. I thought you were dead, your grace. The Lannisters were fools to assume I was dead, I was helped by an old friend from the past. You were fortunate to come back, I thought you were dead for sure. John, don't listen to the fools like Slint and Thorn. Sir Alistair has always disliked my family because he used to fight for the Mad King. I didn't know, your grace. He hates you because you are Ned Stark's son and me because I am the late King Robert's nephew. I thank you and your father, your grace. If you hadn't arrived, I wouldn't know if we would even still have Castle Black. My father's hand Sir Davos Seaworth suggested it. He may be of humble birth, but he knew better than those high lords, who are apathetic to the plight of the wall. I convinced my father to take the remaining men of our army and to help defend the wall. How long will you and your father stay? Do you not like having us here? Jacob asked, in a stern tone of voice. No, it's just there is an overcrowding issue that needs to be solved. With the wildling prisoners and your father's army stationed here, there are too many mouths to feed. If I had been a different man, then I would have you arrested John, but I am not. I'm still your friend, underneath the crown and the title of heir to the Iron Throne. Your father doesn't feel the same way. I'll try to convince him, unless he has allowed the Lady Melisandre to get into his head. She is a strange woman with a foreign religion I will not convert to. She seems to have an agenda of her own. To spread her madness throughout Westeros, no way. I will throw that witch off the top of the wall before I allow her to plunge my father into a war against the faith. The prince gritted between his teeth. Why did your father choose me, out of all the brothers on the wall to be a confidant? He needs advice, he doesn't know the North and its people like you do. I need your advice too, John, you see. I am to be wed to a noble woman of the North, to secure an alliance and to help my father continue the war further. The prince asked nervously. What can I do to help, your grace? John asked. You know the noble houses and the people who rule them, there must be a few unwed daughters for me to wed. It's a matter for your father to be noted off it's a big decision. Soon you will be someone's lord husband and future king. Sometimes, I want to remain a lord for a bit longer. The weight of the crown and title of prince is waiting down on me. I'm forever trapped in the game, unless I die. Prince Jacob and John were walking through the snows of Castle Black, as the prince felt sadness within himself. At one hand, the man in black was still the friend he bonded with in Winterfell, 
but the two of them had different stations in life. The prince felt at ease with John, because he could tell him his true feelings. The only person he could do that with was Ser Davos, and he wasn't here. He missed the Onion Knight, and prayed to the Seven for his safe return. The chills of the wall made Jacob feel optimistic of how he could grow and develop in the future into a better man, a stronger leader, a militant commander, a loyal son, a less absent brother and be the best heir he could be for his father and for himself. Chapter 32 The rightful king, Stannis Baratheon was sitting with a small audience of people, including his son Jacob sitting on his right side and the Lady Melisandre on his left. The climate on the wall was getting to his bones, and it didn't make him feel any different than he was towards the small audience of brothers from the watch. What is taking so long, why haven't you chosen a new lord commander yet? The king gritted between his teeth. The main brothers of the watch in this audience were Sir Dennis Malister, Cotter Pike, Samuel Tarley, another brother by the name of Bowen Marsh, and Maester Eamon, as the Tarley boy was there to provide assistance to the aging Maester. Another familiar face present was Yano Slint, the former commander of the City Watch. He was a sniveling, an honorless schemer who wanted to rise high his methods were of bribery and betrayal to get what he wanted. The king's son glared at Slint with a sharp stare, knowing his son had all the power in the world to get a bit of vengeance on the man, for what he had done to Ned Stark and the Seven Kingdoms. No one has achieved two-thirds of the vote yet. The black brother named Marsh explained. I don't have time for delays you must choose your next commander by nightfall. Excuse me, your grace. My royal council would be most useful in such deliberations. Slint says in a tone the king hears from the courtiers in King's Landing. Slint's proclamation made some of the Black Brothers angry, and rightfully so. Yano Slint would make a poor consoler, as it was evidenced in how the imp was the one, who sent him to the wall in the first place. The Night's Watch has always chosen their own leader. Maester Eamon pointed out. Slint would make a terrible Lord Commander, with his history of bribery, spreading ugly rumors and betraying hands of the king. The prince sniggered. That is all lies. Slint protested. I saw the evidence of your crimes I would have you executed if I was king than Robert. The king replies. A man's past transgressions are wiped clean when he joins the watch. The maester said. Maybe, but others will still remember those transgressions very clearly. The prince said calmly. The watch cannot help you in your contest for the throne. Sir Dennis spoke out. I do not require that, but I want some of your castles, as well as the gift. King Stannis assured. The gift was given to the watch in perpetuity. Bowen Marsh protested, as he looked to be threatened by the king's presence. What do you mean to do with the gift, your grace? Cotter Pike asked. I mean to make better use of it than you. The king replies in a stony tone, I intend to restore the other ruins on the wall, and to help the watch guard the wall against whatever it out there. There is a war for life itself, and if you fail, my king the world dies. Lady Melisandre interjects. Prince Jacob rolled his eyes, at the proclamation as he didn't believe in Melisandre's visions. Stannis knew his son to be skeptical of anything the Red Woman said, but he wasn't alone in his thoughts. Is it the war for the dawn you speak of, my lady? Maester Eamon asked, if it's true, then where is the promised prince? He stands before you. Stannis Baratheon is Azor Ahai come again, the warrior of fire. In him the prophecies are fulfilled. The red comet blazed across the sky to herald his coming, and he bears Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. The declaration made Stannis feel uncomfortable, as it was his son that should be the shining hero. The king didn't believe he was Melisandre's chosen hero, as he was only a man of flesh and blood. All of you are excused, apart from Tarly and Maester Eamon. They should remain. The king said, as most of the brothers excited the main keep. Jacob had his hand placed on his head in boredom, as this is what he will have to contend with when he rules the Seven Kingdoms, having to listen to many people and their problems. It was a life Stannis prepared for his son. Is it true, Samwell? You eliminated the other with Dragonglass? The prince asked, in a different tone he used towards Slint. It is frozen fire, my king. 
The small weapon was able to eliminate one of the cold children. Melisandre replies. I have ordered the mining of obsidian to begin on Dragonstone, where there are rich deposits of the mineral. The king stated. The dagger shattered when I tried to stab the white with it. Samuel said nervously, as the young man was finding his confidence. Whites are only dead flesh come alive, but the others are something more. The red woman replied. What of the passage through the black gate at Nightfort, the one you and the wilding girl found? I intend to make the castle my new seat, and you must show it to me. The king said, in the usual iron tone he uses when talking to people. I don't know if it will open for a man, not of the watch, but I will agree to show you the castle. I asked to see Lightbringer, I want to know what it looks like. Maester Eamon asked. You are blind, Maester. The prince said. Samwell will be my eyes. The king reluctantly draws out Lightbringer to see it shine like the sun's rays on the water. He didn't like having to pretend to be something he wasn't, but if it gave the blind maester a bit of peace of mind, then so be it. The sword glows like sunshine on water, Maester Eamon. Samwell tells the maester. The two of you are to be excused, and the watch had better have chosen a lord commander by nightfall. The king said, giving the ultimatum. As the Tarly boy and Maester Eamon exit, Stannis turned to his son, who had a glum look on his face. He had begun to sit up straight, with the coldness of his eyes on the king. The king was not pleased with the lack of attention his son had upon these deliberations with the watch, it seems the journey from Dragonstone and the battle has tired him out. The Lady Melisandre made her leave out of the main keep, as well because she respectfully wanted the king to talk with his heir alone. Do such deliberations bore you, Jacob or are you in your own world? The king growled between his teeth. You shouldn't interfere in matters that do not concern us. The Watch are incapable of choosing a leader after Lord Mormont's death. Like Maester Eamon said, Father. The Watch choose their own, whether you like or not, maybe it's the cold getting to you. The prince japed. You want to make japes at me, you think you are funny. Robert would have laughed at that insipid joke. The king gritted between his teeth again. The whole teeth grinding habit is unsightly father, even Uncle Renly said one day your teeth would shatter completely. Renly was immature and an ostentatious fool, never taking his position of maester of laws seriously, and he thought he could be a king. The king said, in a tone the prince never hears regularly. The decision you gave John, it's a complicated one. It conflicts with his sense of honor and duty, if he does refuse the offer, he will be a great asset to us. Especially with the eventual choosing of my northern wife. What do you truly think of him, Ned Stark's idiot? The king asks. I believe John is trustworthy, unlike some of the other brothers on the wall, apart from Samwell. You know the women of the north, since you have been there and feasted among their lords. Not as well as John. I was only a visitor, and John was born and raised in the north. He knows everything about the region, and it will be helpful to us. You value him a little too much, Jacob. I understand because he is one of your last friends left, as the others have become our enemies and others have died. I thought you would belittle me for being too caring, as it's not your style, father. After the voyage and making myself known on the wall. I have thought things through, you are a man and you make your own choices. No matter how old you are, you will always be my son. Stannis was used to Jacob being outspoken, and wanting to ask questions. It was in his nature to be curious and to find out things, it was what made him a great player in the Game of Thrones. He questioned a lot of things he thought were wrong. Like the sacrifice of Edric Storm and how the Queen's men painted the Red Wedding in their view. The King blamed it on the years Robert made him foster in Highgarden with the ambitious Tyrells, where his son learned how to play the Game of Thrones, and knew about the overlords of the Reach in a personal manner. Jacob's knowledge of the Tyrells was valuable to Stannis, as they were allied with the Lannisters and needed them out of the way to seize the Iron Throne. This time on the Wall will not be forever, we must take back the North and gain another army to fight the Lannisters. The Boltons rule the North, as the Starks are all gone, apart from two missing girls. What was Jacob's gain, hiding the younger one in the Vale? Have you seen the Night Fort, father? It's a bit of a ruin, 
John showed me and you plan to make that your new seat. The prince questioned. The castle can be restored, and this new seat is only short term. Until we have a plan to scrub the north clean of Boltons and Ironborn. I'm looking forward to beating down some Ironborn, after all the stories Uncle Robert told me about them, and how they were fierce fighters who used axes and sharp knives to fight. Don't get too overconfident, you may have beaten down wildings beneath the wall, but you haven't been face to face with warriors, whom honor is as foreign to them as the seven. We are the last male progenies of the Baratheon Trueborn line, no matter what those idiots out there think, the future of our house rests upon whomever will be my wife. This made Stannis think, as what Jacob said were one of the reasons why he kept fighting for the Iron Throne, and never wanted to give up. It was because he and Jacob were the last trueborn Baratheons left in the Seven Kingdoms. The king knew his wife Celis never agreed to marrying off their only son to a northerner, but it was the only way they could secure a long-term alliance with the north. The cold region had unwed daughters, whom one of them could be queen. Love is a fickle thing, Jacob. You were lucky to end things with the red wine woman, when you had the chance. She isn't my concern anymore, she and her family are traitors who will be dealt with. I don't care about her anymore, as securing your rule is more important than some silly girl from the Reach, who had delusions of marrying me. Good, your marriage arrangements will be discussed, after I talk with the new Lord Commander. As the talks between father and son continued, the doors burst open for a black brother to come in and announce. A new Lord Commander has been chosen. Who has been chosen? The prince asked, in the iron tone the king would use. Jon Snow, your grace. He has been elected with a unanimous vote to lead the watch. You should go and congratulate him, Jacob. Your presence might make him trust you more than he does of me. The king said, as his son stood from his seat to leave with the black brother. The king began to ponder in his own thoughts of how his son had shown the makings of a king, and was coming out of his idealistic, whimsical shell, and was becoming the man he didn't expect his son to become. This could be the start of rebuilding his relationship with his heir it could be as strong as it was during the War of the Five Kings, or will their newly formed relationship make them even stronger than once before. Chapter 33 In the cold, musty winds of the wall, a knight sat among the others. The brothers of the watch were training, for the war ahead and how the fate of the world will be decided. It was the coldest place in the world, and the knight was lucky to survive. Ser Sorel Grimm of Greyshield was among the men, who made it to the wall to save the knight's watch from the wildings, led by the king beyond the wall, who was now a prisoner of King Stannis, and didn't have much time left on this earth. The knight of the reach was alone he usually was close with Prince Jacob. He saved his life, and brought him back to his parents, which got him a knighthood and a position on the king's war council, only because the prince said so. His dark hair was shorter. He had it cut because of the cold weather, and how it wasn't good for his hair. Being from the south, and being in the north made Sorel a bit grumpy and hostile, as he wasn't used to such conditions. This weather is going to eliminate me faster than a sword sooner than later. I am here because of my prince, and I have to protect him. Maybe, when the war is over, I can have a place on the king's guard, but it will be complicated because it's a profession dedicated to the protection of the king and I will be his guard, not his friend. Throughout this journey to the wall, Sorel and Prince Jacob grew closer, as any good friends would. He was the only one keeping the prince from falling apart, because he missed his mother Queen Celis and sister Princess Shireen they were at Eastwatch by the sea, under the protection of several of the queen's men left behind. It made Sorel look at himself deeply, and how possibly betraying his family would affect him, and how the war will end with them being dead for being Lannister and Tyrell supporters, as Stannis Baratheon doesn't know the meaning of mercy or forgiveness. As a man from the south, Sorel didn't like the king much, but only tolerated him for the sake of his son and heir, who he liked very much, and would sacrifice himself for him, because who would in this den of people with unknown motives and schemes? His eye caught on Sir Justin Massey and Sir Richard Horp, two men who were loyal Queen's men, and men he didn't like very much. Sorel knew these men were hoping to suck up to the king for some lands and fortunes from dead houses. Stupid fools, as long as the prince has influence over his father. Those men wouldn't get a single gold dragon from this war. Sorel knew ambitious men, 
because he lived with them and was the son of one. Men who would give up their morals and principles for a bit of power and fortunes, but he was no such man because he had given up his own ambition to serve Prince Jacob. The cold winds were frosting on his furs, in which were in the darkest of colors. It didn't keep him warm enough, as he was still cold and felt like the cold creeped into the deepest parts of his flesh. The knight had his sword by his side, as it was made of good steel. Sorel may be a knight, but he was still a man from a highborn house, and had a name in the seven kingdoms. He accomplished thing his own male relatives wouldn't have done. Fighting against wildlings, sailing a ship to keep a valuable man out of Lannister hands and was pretty good at what he could do. Sorel rattled his mind on the recent meetings with the king, prince and the new lord commander. The boy Jon Snow wasn't bad, but his idiot status plagued the poor boy wherever he went. He had the coloring of his stark father, but he trusted Prince Jacob's opinion of him being good and trustworthy to their cause. Unlike a certain red priestess, Prince Jacob's advice for his father was logical, realistic and his father listened to him, as fathers should do with their sons from time to time. Grim, shouldn't you be with the prince? Sir Justin said, walking past him, as the man was also alone. His grace needed a break, the meetings with the Lord Commander were draining him. Sorel replied. The prince should learn how to be a king, and not hide behind you. The other knight said bitterly. He is already a better king than the brat Tommen. At least you said something that makes sense, Grim. Sir Justin said, folding his arms across his chest and trying to make himself look bigger than he actually was. Sorel of House Grim didn't hate him, as much as he hated Horp. Massey was a decent fighter, and they don't make them as they used to anymore. He was fun to play with, because most of the worshippers of the Red God were bitter and cold folk. We could be great friends, if you didn't dislike me for my loyalty to the Seven. Typical Reach man, always holding on to such faith, even when the Lady Melisandre has proven lawless power among us. Listen to the Red Woman any longer, and she might have you eating the bodies of the burned men next. Are you mocking me, Grim? Telling the truth. Others of the Queen's men would like to see you burned alive. Only if they were brave enough to eliminate me themselves, and face the wrath of the prince. You may be a prince's man, but the king's men think you are one of them. Think what you want, sir. The truth is the prince doesn't like you, and others of the king's men would like it if most of you stayed with the queen. Keep your seven corrupted bias to yourself, man of the reach. The knight said, and began to walk away. Sorel didn't mind having Massey around, because he didn't have many friends, apart from those of the king's men who had the bigger numbers at Castle Black. It was nice to be among men, who still worshipped the seven, even though not all did. The prince must be waiting for me, he is alone with his grim-faced father and the boy commander. He will need me more than ever now, because this war is going to take us into the heart of the north, and a lot of men will not survive the storm. For the Knight of Grey Shield, Sorel had his first taste of the battlefield, and hungered for more, because it was in a man's nature to fight and eliminate, not be holed up in a castle, as many lords of the Reach liked to do, when a war came. He wanted more. He wanted a taste at a real war. A war when men gave their lives by the sword and the shield, not the war of politics and scheming. It was not his avenue, but he was willing to be the man, who served his prince well. Through the last few days, Sorel had seen Prince Jacob change. He had grown from a defeated boy into a strong, capable man who began to look a lot like the late King Robert, by some of the men who had seen the late king, whilst he was still alive. Most will deter true loyalty in the hearts of men, who are true and honorable, as those kind of men were a dying breed in Westeros. As long as Sorel lived, he was there to service Prince Jacob, and be there for him when he needed it. Lord Davos was away on a diplomatic mission on the king's orders. It made the prince's time at the wall hard, and he struggled emotionally, but he didn't show it. Sorel's heart pained, when he saw the prince secluded and miserable, it was evidenced he missed Davos he looked up to the Onion Knight, as the second father figure in his life. And missed the man a lot more than he let on. The prince doesn't have any friends, other than myself and Jon Snow. He has lost them all to this war, and I am afraid he will close himself up forever. He is the kind of man, that doesn't share his feelings very much, 
and will have that wall behind his emotions. The knight stood and watched some of the Black Brothers training, and them clashing swords with one another. He smiled, as he didn't know how these men could live in these conditions and still fight evil day in and day out. It was something Sorel admired about such men. How they are willing to die by their oaths, and will never turn back from their duty to defend the wall and the realm of men, from whatever was behind the wall. A bigger war was coming ahead, and it wasn't over some ugly chair. It was about life and death, and how those in West Eros will have to band together to even make sure there is a world left to live in. Chapter 34 Stannis Baratheon, the rightful king of the Undoles, the Roiner and the First Man and the true lord of the Seven Kingdoms was in the king's tower waiting for his son and heir Jacob to show his face. As he has a lot to discuss with him, and the new lord commander of the Night's Watch. The king's eyebrows were arched, and he was sorting through the many rejection letters from most of the northern houses. He wanted their armies pledged to him, and for them to swear fealty to him, as the true king of the Seven Kingdoms. Stannis couldn't afford to look a fool in the face of such vital decisions in the coming days. With the continuation of the war, to find a northern wife for his heir and to seize the throne he has converted, since this war began. I want to meet the northern girl, who will be our son's wife. You may choose the girl, but I want to be at his wedding, no matter what you or your lord say. The king remembered the words his wife and Queen Sela said, moments before the battle at Castle Black. The battle was grueling, due to the cold conditions of the north, and how the remains of his army came from the south. Jacob proved himself to be a capable warrior, a leader, and an able commander worthy of his father's trust. Stannis knew the severity of the situation, and how Celis and Shireen will not be able to attend the eventual wedding, because they were such safer at Eastwatch by the sea, where they won't be in fear of their lives because of Bolton or Lannister loyalists. Robert and Renly were better suited for organizing weddings and feasts, but Jacob is my only son and I want the best for him. Coming with the gold and expenses for the war, the men and the resources for the eventual winter will be difficult to acclimate, unless I marry Jacob off to a northern house with wealth and status. The wedding was something Stannis didn't have time for, as his mind was focused on the war and scrubbing the north clean of Ironborn and the Boltons, who hold it for his true enemies the Lannisters. On the other hand, this arrangement was the difference between a long-term alliance with the North or will it add to the weight he has to shoulder on. He has to arrange the marriage under secrecy, to not have his enemies knowing his plans. The door of the king's tower opens for the king to see his heir in the gold and black furs, and had his sword limos by his side. He was without the reach man knight, Ser Sorel Grimm, who was always by the side of his son. The scar Jacob had under and over his left eye made him more intimating. Celis didn't like how he came out of the battlefield with a permanent scar on him, and it will ruin any chances of him getting married. I see you are as grim as ever father. Jacob said, pulling a chair to sit face to face with his father. You would be if you received many rejections instead of fealties. Father, you cannot expect the North to bend to you with no Starks around. They are only loyal to their own, and worship the old gods, as fiercely as I do the seven. Do you have anything smart to say or is it more of your jargon? The king gritted between his teeth. My jargon father, is the difference between us getting the north on our side or plunged into a war with the faith. I don't want to hear any more of it, you have already voiced your displeasure for having the Lady Melisandre around. I don't trust her, she is an unknown factor. People have died, since she arrived on these shores. How is the Lord Commander? The king asked. He is handling his position well, considering the weight he has on his shoulders. There are a minority of black brothers, who will do anything to sabotage him. Slint and Throne are sure to be the leaders. John trusts me, but is wary of the Lady Melisandre, but for good reason. The woman inspires nightmares of all men, who sleep in Castle Black. I don't like it, how the men think of you as Robert returned from the dead. Any man who has been further from the wall is sure to be mad. We can use it to our advantage, as the Lannisters believe me to be dead, and we could use the same ruse the Tyrells used to cause some of the lords to abandon us at the Blackwater. We must focus on the north, and how we are going to liberate it from the Boltons and the Ironborn. With the salt-smelling craven dead his son is a hostage of the Boltons, 
his brothers plotting to attack the Reach and his daughter still in the north. The grim knight I am not sure of is intentions. His family are sworn to the Tyrells, and I cannot have another betrayal in my ranks again. Sorel risked everything to bring me back to Dragonstone, he was a man without a purpose but sailing boats from Old Town. He saved my life, and helped me become a better fighter on the field. Don't want you to get attached to him there are no friends in the Game of Thrones. Only allies and enemies. Those words spoken by Stannis hit his son hard. Jacob's expression turned from the warmth, to his head being lowered and pondered in his own thoughts. His son's mind was a complex one, as it was made for politics and scheming. He could have made a great addition on Robert's small council, and could have saved him from the Lannisters. What is done is done, and there was no going back, as going back would mean the end for Stannis and Jacob. I know my own mind, father. No forgiveness, no penitence or weakness, as long as there are enemies to be eliminated and a throne to be claimed. This marriage. It will be the final sign of you being a man. Not a boy anymore, not the boy I finally got to hold in my arms, after misfortunes plagued your mother and I. The king said, attempting to hold back any sign of emotion. The Starks are gone, and John will never abandon his vows to the watch. We are in this war together, and we have to start trusting one another. It seems Lord Commander Snow trusts you more than he does of me. John is more comfortable around someone his own age, and someone who doesn't intimidate him so much. Stannis didn't like it. The truth of how Jacob was right in some aspect, but he would never admit it to him, as he was the father, the king, and the last patriarch of House Baratheon. Jacob was a different man, to the one who went out to fight on the Blackwater. He was only a boy of six and ten at the time of the battle, but now he has fully grown into a man, and his physical appearance made him more of a warrior than the king's late brother. The heir to the Iron Throne had a grown beard on his face, and the eye scar was evidenced on his face. Stannis knew his son was battle-hardened, and wanted more. He wanted another taste of blood on the field, and he will get his chance again. The door opened for Lord Commander Snow to enter, with the Lady Melisandre behind him. It made his son brittle at the Red Woman's presence, as he didn't like to be around her at all. The defiance Jacob shows towards Melisandre came from the Baratheon side of the family, but she pays no mind to it. The Red Priestess went outside, as soon as her eyes turned to the prince with the seven-pointed star around his neck, signifying his fealty to the seven and his defiance against her god. The prince offered the Lord Commander his seat, as Prince Jacob pulled up another to sit to his father's right. He held his hands together, and looked between his father and the Lord Commander he called a friend. Most of the northern houses have rejected my offer of fealty the last letter sent was from a child of age ten of House Mormont. The king spoke, giving the letter to the Lord Commander. Bear Island knows no king, but the king in the north, whose name is Stark. Jon Snow read out. Prince Jacob was amused, of his own father being refuted by a mere child, but this child was noble and came from a house of resilient women, who fought to protect their lands from ironborn. She is only a child, father. Pay her no mind. Jacob interjected, in a lighter tone. So far, the only house to have declared for me is House Karstark. Luckily for them, their current castellan Arnulf offered me his niece for a marriage alliance with my son. The king said, in an iron tone, however, I ask for gold from the watch to pay off Ser Davos's sellsail friend Salador San. Your grace, I would recommend you take White Harbor for gold. Lord Manderley has two unwed granddaughters, as they are eligible for his grace, the prince to marry if he chooses to. Never, Lord Manderley is fat and useless, and will contribute nothing to my cause. He responded to my letter full of excuses of age and cowardice. Father, we have won the support of a portion of House Umber, led by Moore's Umber. We may have been rejected by many houses, but there are still some who will not bow to the Boltons and the Lannisters, after the Red Wedding. The prince said. The wildlings are still seeking shelter south of the Wall. The Lord Commander said, changing the subject. I tend to burn Mance Raider as a deserter tonight. Your Grace, I have known the man for some time, he could have eliminated me but he didn't. He has his own sense of honor, 
and has inspired tribes of wildlings to follow him instead of fighting amongst each other. I'm sorry, John. The man may have been your friend, but he is a criminal. The law states the way a deserter has to be punished is death. Prince Jacob said, in a strong tone. What will be the fate of his wife's sister and his child? The wildling princess will come to no harm she will stay on the wall with the rest of her people. Gilly has become a wet nurse for her own child and Mance Raider's son, and I plan to send her and her child south. For what reason, Lord Commander? The king asks, and the king's heir wondered too. She is just another mouth to feed, and I want her gone. Tough decision, but it's the right one to make. For the betterment for the rest of your black brothers. Jacob interjects. I demand lands and castles from the Night's Watch. King Stannis grumbled, shuffling through the letters on the table. I already ceded land in the gift, and the other castles belong to men of the Watch, John objected, wanting to preserve lands belonging to the Watch and his black brothers. I offer to have my own officers man the abandoned forts, and to command some of your men as a garrison, your grace. You may lead the men of the Night's Watch, but you will not command men of my army to do anything, Lord Commander. Prince Jacob hand his hand out, to cut off his father. As he was brave to interrupt the king, and turn to face the Lord Commander. What my father is meaning to say is that we need our men. We don't have much men, since many died, during the two battles of the Blackwater and Castle Black. The only way we can have more men, is if I marry someone from a wealthy and powerful house. The decision on the wildlings will be complicated, as your brothers will not like it, no more than your father's lords, but I mean to allow the wildlings through the wall. Those who will swear me their fealty, pledge to keep the king's peace and the king's laws, and take the Lord of Light as their god. Even the giants, if their great knees can bend, they will be settled on the gift. When the cold wind rise, we shall live or die together. It is time we made an alliance against a common foe. I appreciate the offer, your grace. I shall discuss it with the wildlings, and see what they will think of it. You are excused to take your leave, Lord Commander. The prince said, folding his arms. Stannis was unsure of how Jacob could be diplomatic, in the middle of a complicated situation with the wildlings and how to shelter them from what lay beyond the wall. Lord Commander Snow left the king's tower, and the door was closed after he had left. Leaving the rightful king facing his heir, who looked to be thinking, due to his lack of focus and concentration on matters on the wall. Stannis looked through the many rejection replies from the northern houses, but there was support from House Umber, half of the noble house led by Moore's Umber, and the other half of the house supporting House Bolton, led by Hother Umber. The king thought about the suggestion from Jon Snow about Lord Manderley, or as Stannis liked to call him fat and useless, about his unwed granddaughters. The alliance with the Manderleys would benefit Stannis more than the match offered by the Karstarks. Two marriage offers at the same time the North must be desperate to oust the Boltons. Jacob said, in a grim tone. House Karstark has declared their support for our cause, it would be wise to consider marrying Lord Arnolf's niece. House Manderley are the wealthier house, and I don't trust this Arnolf Karstark. He seems too eager to marry his niece off, even though she is the rightful heir of Carhold, if her brother is eliminated by the Lannisters. What do you think we should do with the Wildings? Letting them through the wall is going to cause problems, especially with the Northern Lords, who for generations have had their lands pillaged by the Wildlings. House Umber especially won't take too kindly to having Wildlings settling in the North. I should have asked the Lord Commander if the Umbers had any unwed daughters also. Prince Jacob was amused, of the idea of his own father and Lord Wyman Manderley being linked as good family, it was something Stannis did not want to envision to happen, because it could be a reality and it would be worse than being injured on the battlefield. The awkwardness of marriage aside. The Umbers, the Karstarks, and the Manderleys were powerful houses in the North, and all held true loyalty to the Starks, but the North was fractured and were fighting each other, instead of banding together against the true enemy. Roose Bolton and his mad dog of a idiot. Father, do you truly believe yourself to be this ancient hero reborn? Jacob asked, as it was a hard question. I don't know any more. I am only a man of flesh and blood. A man bound to honor, duty and justice. I am not a man made to be a mythical hero, 
you are meant to be such a man. Why, my strengths are not on the battlefield, but in court and politics. I regret allowing Robert to send you to Highgarden, who knows what the Tyrells have taught you. A king's word is law, and there was nothing you could do. I learned more from the Tyrells, than I have learned inside King's Landing. When we leave the wall, and rest at East Watch. Your mother and sister will be informed of who you will be marrying. It will be hard for Shireen, she is still a child and doesn't know she will be gaining a new good sister. Your sister will adjust and will learn to accept things, but your mother will have a harder time. She planned for you to marry a southerner, and has voiced her displeasure of the idea of you marrying a northerner. Your mother was born and raised in a reach, where they value their own and are ambitious. They don't think much of the North, and do not care for them at all. You may not like what I tell you, but you need me more than ever. My political cunning could mean the difference between making new allies or making more enemies than we already have. Stannis knew Jacob was a man grown, and had seen his former uncle Alistair Florent burn for his crimes of treason, why would the wildling king be any different, as he will be punished for deserting the watch? The glares between father and son were tiring, it was what was expected when having a son more politically minded than wanting to be like his father. The execution of the king beyond the wall will be the next step for Jacob, to see if his heir was prepared to make the hard choices and the difficult decisions needed to become a good king. Chapter 35 Prince Jacob stood in a corner with his eyes on the wildling Princess Val, as she was with two other wildlings. Her long, blonde braid and white furs made her a true northern beauty, the kind that could rival the ladies of the south. The young man wasn't sure whether she would talk to him or puncture her spear into his heart. The conditions on the wall made him grit between his teeth. Jacob hated the cold, but he knew his time here couldn't be too long and he was ready to spill blood in the north. Gods. Will any of our men survive the days being here or will a few die due to the conditions? Prince Jacob's eyes were still on the wildling princess but the stern words of his father were ringing in his head, imploring him to stay away from the woman because she was a wildling and a savage, in the eyes of his father. He was walking through the treks of snow across his boots. He was alone, and he didn't have Sorel around him, but he knew he had to not get attached to the man for good reasons. Jacob sensed his heart was hardening by the second. It was happened when he got older, hardened and more aware of how the world actually was in this new grave view. Being a prince, heir to the ugliest chair in the kingdom and a high-value target made Jacob a lot less reckless in what he was doing he was more calculated in his actions and began to play the game, as he and his father are getting closer to the end goal. To be sat on the iron throne with the bodies of all their enemies lying in the throne room. His presence on the wall caused a lot to stare, as if none of the Night's Watch had never had visit from royalty before, and they were saved by the rightful king. Not the usurper, who try to hold his father's throne. Seeing Val made Jacob think of his inevitable wife, of how she would be and which house will she be from. Will she be pleasant looking? Will she be of a wealthy house? Will she be able to take on the mantle of princess and then queen? Where is Sorel, he should be with me, as he is my sworn shield after all. The prince muttered to himself. The prince's father was right about one thing. To never grow attached to people because they can turn quickly and can become another enemy to be eliminated. Sorel was a man of the reach, from a house sworn to the Tyrells and he had disobeyed his own liege just to keep Jacob alive and to help him on his journey to get home to his family and to resume his role, as heir to the throne. Duty was paramount in the eyes of King Stannis, and everything else just got in the way or needs to be disposed or eliminated off. Prince Jacob strolled through the snows of the Black Castle, and wrapped his arms around himself. The prince was old enough, to make his own choices and not be so reliant on his father's counsel, but it was a hard decision to think about, as it was going to determine his future. He was a future king, and he needed to start acting like it. He began to walk into the Lord Commander's tower, as it was dark and smelled of old smoke. It must have been when the old Lord Commander was eliminated. The air thickened, as Prince Jacob walked up the steps. Some of the tower still remained, even though two floors of it were burned and ruined. The blackness within the tower released a haunting whisper, echoing the atmosphere. It made the prince shake his head. He heard voices, when he was getting closer. 
Prince Jacob didn't understand how John could stay in this place, even after the Lord Commander before him died in this very tower. I would never understand the way of life here. I am highborn, my uncle had been king and was lucky to be afforded the privileges that noble society has given me. As he got there, he saw the faces of John and Samuel. His eyebrow was raised, and he didn't understand how he and the Tarly boy were distant kin and he didn't inherit the ugliness of the members of House Florent. Your grace, how can I be of service? Samuel said, turning his head to face the prince. I hear you are to be departing from the wall. I am to train to be a maester for Castle Black. I heard two queen's men have gone south of the wall. John inquired. Horp and Massey were commanded to go I wanted less queen's men around to cause trouble for the Black Brothers. Gilly and Maester Eamon will be accompanying me to East Watch by the sea to make the journey to Old Town. Prince Jacob saw the glow in Sam's eyes when he mentioned the wildling girl, he must care for her a lot and has to deal with criticism from the other black brothers about her presence on the wall. He wished he found someone who would care for him beyond him being the rightful prince and highborn. Someone who would be with him, and not having to call him your grace all the time. Samuel mentioning Old Town stirred something within the prince, as it made him remember how it was where he ended up after the end of the Battle of Blackwater. He had the luck of the seven on his side of not being caught and eliminated. May the seven bless you on your journey, Samuel. The prince said lightly, as it was not a tone he would use often. I would say the same to you, your grace. Be careful, Samuel. The south isn't too kind these days, there is still a war going on and much of it is controlled by the Lannisters or the Tyrells. We are of the Night's Watch we are to remain neutral in political matters. True, but it wouldn't apply to those foolish enough to think you are allied with my father. Jacob was worried about Sam he was journeying into the south with a maester and a wilding girl. All he knew was that the Lannisters and Tyrells ruled the Seven Kingdoms, but it wouldn't last for long, as there will be power struggles between the two rich houses. He learned an important lesson from the Game of Thrones. No powerful house will want to share power with a house they feel is beneath them. Prince Jacob felt out of place. John and Sam were close friends, and trusted each other more than anything in the world. It gave a cruel reminder, of how his mind was still stuck to the past in that regard. I need to stop thinking about the past, I thought I had gotten over it. However, it still hurts to see other people happy and I am just stuck in a hole of darkness. I hear you will be married soon, your grace. Sam announced, you will be someone's lord husband soon. My marriage problems shouldn't deter you from your own quest. It will be a long and hard journey, and I hope you come back alive. I didn't know you thought so highly of me, your grace. I realized that I should be fearing my own mortality, going on to another battle and fighting again. Death will come for us all, your grace. John said cryptically, as the prince knew what he was talking about. Unless everyone else can put their petty squabbles behind them and focus on preparing for the winter. Banding rival groups together is not easy, and I have seen firsthand. Prince Jacob chuckled, even though the bitter enmity between the Black Brothers and the Wildlings was not good because his father intended to band to two together. It's a good idea in writing, but putting it into action was another task. I am prepared to take my leave, and I will be there to see you, Gilly and Maester Emanoff. I'm honored by such a kind gesture, Your Grace. You must have more important things to do. Not so much, other than war strategy for long hours of the day. I'll be glad to take a break away from reading maps of the North for most of the day. Is it true, you got your scars from the Blackwater and the battle south of the Wall? Samwell asked, looking directly at the scar beneath his eye, and the one on top of his lip. My uncle always says that battle scars make the warrior. My condolences for your loss, your grace. It matters not, people die all the time and soon enough we will be dead too. It's a bold thing to say, your grace. John said. I say it because I believe it to be true. It matters not what the lords and ladies think, I believe this winter will be a harsh one and whatever is behind the wall must be stopped. The White Walkers. I read something in a book in Old Town when I was younger of how Valyrian steel can eliminate of the cold monsters, as those kinds of weapons were made in ancient Valyria in dragon fire. 
The idea of death intrigued Jacob, and sometimes it made him wish he could have died on the Blackwater. To not have the weight of being a prince, a future king and a future husband on his shoulders and he could be elsewhere. It was hard, to live in a world that was empty and cold. The people in it were the shadows of who they used to be and were shells of who they were. Shells filled with the illusions of power, grandeur and status. Jacob didn't want it, but by honor and duty those titles were forced on him. He had to bear the brunt of it. His father didn't have much time left he was getting older, thin and gaunt by the days. It might have the coldness and the discomfort gritting his bones, but Prince Jacob brushed a part of his hair backwards, as it was growing longer. It might even have been longer than Uncle Robert's, when he was young and in his prime. The prince made his leave of the Lord Commander's tower with his black cloak following him from behind his still and cold blue irises. Why am I overthinking, making rash choices and slipping back into the comfort of being my father's favorite soldier? The thoughts rattling into the prince's mind, and he was close to lashing out in the open. His cruel, snappy mind didn't leave him alone, as he was stuck with those thoughts, as an extension of the feelings he had pushed down in favor of following his father without question. The crossroad of manhood was not as easy as lords claim it to be. It's internally suffocating to try and live up to the expectations laid out in front of young men. Crippling self-hate and the self-doubt is in there all the time. Jacob feels he is always on a hangman's noose, whether to be hanged for failure or to be set free for following duty and nothing else mattered. Prince Jacob was bored he was sick of reading maps and the limited books inside the keep. It was the day after he spoke with John and Samuel about the latter's journey to the citadel to train and become the new master for Castle Black. It was a noble endeavor, even if his own father Lord Randall didn't see it that way, like many of the manly and brutish high lords. He was accompanied by Sir Sorel Grimm, the knight who owed a lot to him. The knight wore more layers, as he understood it. Sorel was born in the south and has not visited the cold region of the north before. The prince stood with the knight, as the two were inside the common room of the castle. As it was the only part of Castle Black that was properly warm and had a fire going on. Most of the Black brothers were finishing their morning meal. I'm sorry, if I have acted improper towards you. Jacob said, walking with the knight. What do you mean, your grace? Sorel asked. I may act out of character, but the cold is getting into my bones. Mine too. Us southerners are not cut out for the cold weather. How are we going to survive the rest of the war? Luck and faith from the seven, your grace. I'm not sure luck will help us, there is only so much luck can do for someone before they realize it was their perseverance that helped them through tough times. How did you become so skeptical about such things, your grace? I'm starting to think wider and outside of my own mind. It's something that John said that made me realize the hardships of what we are going to face. As long as you have a clean sword and a good eye, you will be fine. I hope you are right, if you are not, then you will be dead before me. Prince Jacob then heard irate voices in his ear, as he turned around for it to be John and that lumbering fool Jan Oslint. He never liked the man, and he took a liking to watching men like him be humiliated or being ordered around. And then he saw a crowd of men, from his father's army, the other black brothers and others surrounding them. The prince stood up, and the knight followed behind him to see what the dispute was about, as it has many men interested. The iron prince stood beside John and the other men stepped back, as most didn't know the prince was in their presence. I see you are failing to comply with the orders of your lord commander. Prince Jacob said sternly. I didn't vote for this traitor and idiot. Slint replied with anger in his tone. Brother Slint, you were ordered to take command of the castle of Greyguard. John commanded. He has been elected, and you should respect the decision made by most black brothers, who did vote for him. With all due respect, your grace. He is too young for such a title, being young and inexperienced gives him the license to do what he wants. Punishment for refusing a direct command is death. John said. Prince Jacob didn't like it when men would grovel to him, but he only liked it when they would beg for mercy from getting eliminated by a sword. Just because these fools voted for you, it doesn't mean I must be ordered around by an idiot, who seems to have most of these men heeding your commands, and that scarred prince favoring you but not me. Your grace, 
should I cut off his fingers? Sorel shouted, etching to pull out his sword. He was tensed, as he wanted to defend the prince's honor, even though he can do it on his own. Noit's the Lord Commander's choice to make about his punishment. Jacob said, with his hand out. As the knight put his sword away, John cleared his throat and said, Take Slint to the top of the wall and hang him. He instructed to two black brothers, who seem eager to do so. You will not through with such a thing, Tywin Lannister will have his retribution if I am harmed. Slint says arrogantly. Prince Jacob and Ser Sorel began to laugh, as he knew what really happened to the old lion, who claimed to gold. He was dead, as will be the rest of house when he and his father were on the throne. You cannot do such, Slint. Tywin Lannister is dead, and you are making empty threats just to save yourself. Liar, you are telling lies to further your own father's agenda. No, it's true my lord. He is dead, he was murdered by his own imp son. The same one who sent you here. Yano Slint's eyes widened, whilst he was being taken by the two black brothers. He looked as if he had seen something come back from the dead. It was satisfying to see fear in the eyes of men, who think they cannot be afraid of anything in the world. Your Grace, I apologize for my comments. Stop this execution. Slint complained. Most of the men went outside, as they were following wherever the Lord Commander went with a slightly imprisoned Slint, who was to be hanged for all men to see. Outside was a different story, as it was colder than inside the common room. Jacob with Sorel behind him were in the midst of the Black Brothers, as they witnessed Yano Slint, a man who used bribes and scheming to get ahead, to be pulled down to a lowly rat in need of killing. Are you going to let him eliminate me? Slint yelled, as Jacob ignored him. It was cruel to say he wanted the man to die. For the things, he had done to others and how the blood of Ned Stark is still on his hands. All the brothers on the wall gathered around, along with the king's and queen's men of his father's army. They were all together to see an execution, and hopefully it would send a signal to Throne to stop his scheming against the Lord Commander as well. Ed, fetch me a block. The Lord Commander said, as the black brother named brought him one. Prince Jacob has seen his fair share of blood and mauled bodies, but it didn't stop him from wanting to see this insubordinate fool dead in front of all the Night's Watch and his father's men to see. Slint was placed on the block with his head bent on the block of wood. He looked to be scared by the tears streaming from his eyes, but none of the other men saw it. The prince looked up at the king's tower to see his father on the steps. What is father doing, he must want to watch Slint get his head chopped off. Or is he inspecting me, judging and criticizing my lack of involvement in the situation? Jacob ignored the sight of his father watching, and focused on the beheading itself. He had Sorel with him, as the southern knight's eyes widened and stepped back. He must have seen his fair share of beheadings for small things in the south. John pulled out his sword, as it was Valyrian steel with a sharp silver edge. It had the hilt of a wolf on it, even though it must have belonged to the old lord commander, G. or Mormont he never saw John with a sword like that in Winterfell. Slint looked to be scared, and he began muttering like a madman. Have mercy my lord. I will obey your orders I will be insubordinate no more. Too late for that. Prince Jacob thought in his mind. He folded his arms, and watched in silence among the others. Please, my lord. Mercy I'll go. I will. Slint begged, but the swing of the steel sword swiftly takes his head quickly, spilling the blood from his headless body. The prince's eyes widened, and covered his nose. He was used to blood from the battlefield, but not executions or beheadings, as his mother would always keep him from them. At the corner of the prince's eye, he saw his father Stannis standing there. Looking at John, as a sign of having earned the rightful king's approval and trust. It was vital to catch the king's attention, and this beheading did and he had his eye on the Lord Commander. Chapter 36 Heavy, hard winds were not much of a bother in these parts, but it was, being marched by guards in the middle of a storm. The heavy armored knights were pushing Ser Davos Seaworth along a straight line, and were not so relenting and were pushing him further up the pathway, of what looks to be a stone castle in the far distance. He was in Sweet Sister, one of the three islands of the Three Sisters. 
Davos was captured by the men of Lord Burrell, whilst he was stranded on the island he tried to find a way, getting to White Harbor, the seat of House Manderley. The Onion Knight was on a mission to represent his king and his claim. It was another time, when Davos had to part from Prince Jacob again, after all he wasn't sure about his new sworn shield, Sorel of House Grimm. The man had been from the Reach, his family was a vassal of House Tyrell, the enemies of King Stannis. Selsales are avaricious by nature it was the cause of Sala making too much of a complaint about his gold from King Stannis. If the prince had been there at the scene, he would have eliminated my old friend for dishonoring his father's name and honor. The guards were bringing him through the gates of a castle, and the stench of rotting fish and pig waste was in the air. Sister Tun was a mean, small town, and it wasn't as illustrious as the bigger towns in the Vale of Arryn. Breakwater Castle was quite imposing and grim. The bridge of entry was of black basalt and a rusty iron gate. The small arm of knights marched the Onion Knight through the bridge, and the steps leading into the cavernous stone keep, with the entrance covered by threadbare Myrish carpet. The halls of breakwater were gloomy, and water drops were falling from the ceiling. The flame-lit torches were glowing brightly, as the banners of the white spider crab on a grey-green field were displayed it was the sigil of House Burrell. The Onion Knight was lead into the main hall, only to interrupt Lord Godric Burrell in the middle of his supper. The Lord of Sweet Sister didn't look to be pleased to be interrupted, whilst eating. Davos saw the guards leaving the main hall, not wanting to disturb their lord further. Lord Godric's eyes were on the knight's maimed hand, and looked back at him. The man seemed to be aware of who he was. The Lord of Sweet Sister wasn't a pleasant-looking man, but earning his ire would have dire consequences for the Onion Knight. What are you doing here? Lord Godric said, offering the Onion Knight a seat at his table. I was on my way to White Harbor with a message from King Stannis to Lord Wyman Mandalay. Ser Davos replied, taking the seat the Lord of the Castle offered. How did you end up here? I was stranded on the islands by storms, and I was washed up here. The Onion Knight said. Ser Davos was reminded of how his old friend, the Selsail Salador son and his small fleet of Linnesi Selsails was smashed by the harshness of the storms, since departing south of the Wall. His old friend had been compliant, during the beginning of the war when it came to waiting for his reward. On the other hand, much time has passed and Salador grew impatient of waiting he was frustrated of King Stannis's continual inability to make good on his promises of gold dragons for his services and only staying by his side because of his long friendship with Davos. The Lysini Selsail decided to abandon Stannis's cause and gave Davos a choice to make. To follow him into Essos or to leave in a small longboat to continue his mission, and Davos choose to leave Salador San, may have been his old friend, but the life of a smuggler was not the Onion Knight anymore. He was a changed man, and had a new purpose and title of Hand of the King he would never abandon his king and prince, even for an old friend. My friend travelled south to raid the Lannisters at Stannis's command. Ser Davos lied, concealing this fact. It was a sore subject, having to disown an old friend for common sense. I should turn you over to Lord Sunderland, the Lord of the Three Sisters. He would sell you to the Lannisters for a great reward. Isn't Lord Sunderland sworn to the Airy, and by rights should turn me over to Lady Arryn? Davos countered. Lisa Arryn is dead, and Lord Littlefinger rules the Vale, as Lord Protector now. Lord Godric foretold, would your king ransom you for anything I desire? You should send him a raven and ask for yourself, my lord. Is the imp at the wall, as well? No, the last I heard he was the stand trial for murdering his nephew. It matters not, the imp murdered his father and escaped. Lord Godric replied. My lord, I implore you. I need to send a raven to inform my king. The Onion Knight pleaded. I refuse to involve myself with this game, and I will not be inclined to get involved. Lord Godric offered Davo some food, as it was a sign of him being a guest rather than a prisoner in his castle. As hungry as he was, the Onion Knight accepted the food given to him, and began to eat. Ser Davos was assured even a robber lord and wrecker like Burrell would not violate guest right for one night. The food was pleasant, and didn't expect for such a lord to even treat him with courtesy. Lord Mandalay will not ally with Stannis, for a shipload of Freys passed here to get to White Harbor. 
Lords Wyman and Old Walder have made a pact and intend to seal it with marriage. Dread filled Ser Davos. He was stunned by such a declaration, considering the phrase eliminated Lord Wyman's son. He feared for his king, knowing he desperately needed White Harbor and one of Lord Wyman's granddaughters to wed his son, the rightful heir to the throne. Wouldn't Stannis's son make a better husband for Lord Manderley's unwed granddaughters? I'm surprised, not that I didn't believe the rumors of Jacob Baratheon being eliminated at the Blackwater, but some in the kingdoms believe him to be dead. It would be a dread to think what happened if everyone else knew he was alive and unmarried. I must go to White Harbor. I don't forget easily, of how your king or Lord Stannis as he was before personally threatened to hang me unless I stopped wrecking, and he forced me to hang few good friends of mine for the same crime. Never liked Stannis Baratheon, unfeeling prig he is and from what I hear, his son is no better. With Tywin Lannister dead, a child king rules and will not stand a chance against Stannis and Jacob. King Tommen has the wealth of Casterly Rock and the might of Highgarden, as well as the Boltons and Freys as allies. On the other hand, Cersei Lannister is an incompetent ruler, and you would be in chains if her uncle Ser Kevin Lannister was in power. I'm fortunate you haven't treated me like a prisoner. The alliance with the Tyrells will not last, especially when the king is only a child, with a man of marriageable age at the far corner of the north. You know Ned Stark was on these shores long ago. Shipwrecked, like you are and finding a way off the island. At the dawn of Robert's rebellion. The Mad King had sent to the Airy for Stark's head, but John Aaron sent him back defiance. Gulltown stayed loyal to the throne. In order to get home and call his banners, Stark had to cross the mountains into the fingers and find a fisherman to carry him across the bight. A storm caught them on the way. The fisherman drowned, but his daughter got Stark to the sisters before the boat sank. They say he left her with a bag of silver and an idiot in her belly. John Snow she named him, after Aaron. Were you there during the war? No, my father could have sent his head to the Mad King, but allowed him to go on his way, and left him with parting words of warning. What were they? If you lose, my father told Lord Eddard, you were never here. No more than I was. What I don't grasp is how that prig king of yours is able to keep his son unmarried for so long, during the war. The right opportunity wasn't available to the king at the time. It's a shame, noble men like Jacob are rare nowadays. The boy can fight, he has a mind for the game and is highborn. I'm surprised no woman married him in the beginning, it only further proves how like his father he is unpleasant, grim and a bore. The cause of it is the king, it's he who most prospects fear. He judges with a critical eye, but his mother objects to having her son taken away from her. It's always the women, who try to stand in the way of duty. Young men need to socialize with other women besides their relations. Not wrong there, my lord. Even the most ambitious and cunning of lords miss their opportunity, it matters not your king and prince will freeze in the north sooner rather than later. Did you host the Freys, whom were travelling to White Harbor? I did sup with them, but I would never remember their names, as there are many Freys to remember all their names and some were even named after long-gone royalty. You will not intend to keep me prisoner here. I will allow you go on your way, but if Stannis ends up on the losing side of the war. I will deny you were ever here on Sweet Sister. Lord Godric said. Of course, my lord. Take the advice my father gave to Stark years ago, and I will forget you were ever on my lands. It was like I was never here. Ser Davos had to watch himself, he knew Burrell was a robber lord and was not worthy of being trusted. He did his duty and told the Onion Knight the updates of what was happening in the kingdoms, worthy of telling his king, as recent developments have presented an advantage for him. With Tywin Lannister dead, and a little boy sitting on the throne. It was only a matter of time before the Tyrells would desert them for a better alliance. On the other hand, King Stannis must marry to his son any of Lord Manderley's two granddaughters to secure another army, and a chance to win the throne again. The Onion Knight knew what he had to do his mission for the king was of utmost importance. He was grateful for Lord Godric's hospitality and for treating him more like a guest than a prisoner ready to be eliminated. Davos bristled of the idea of having to look at anyone of House Fry, whilst at White Harbor he knew he had to do this for the sake of his king and the prince he left behind at the wall. 
Chapter 37 A great pyre was constructed outside, as the execution draws near. King Stannis wanted this to be over and done with, but he knew he had some resistance to what he thought was right and how this king beyond the wall needed to pay for the consequences of his crime of dissertation of the watch. His son and heir was staring into the snow, and was not looking at him. Jacob didn't want to see another man burned, as he did with the traitor Lord Florent. Stannis sensed his son's hostility towards him on this issue, but he needed to understand why Mance Raider has to die tonight. Spending time with Ned Stark has made him more aware of the severity of death, and the meaning of penitence. As my heir he will learn that most people are not worth saving or forgiving. The king thought. All men of the king and the knight's watch will be watching the man die, and there will be one less traitor in the realm. The lord commander argued with him about sparing Mance Raider, but the king refused, as it would only make him look weak in front of lesser men. He was man of honor, duty and justice. To uphold the laws of the seven kingdoms, and to dispense rightful justice to lawbreakers. The king loathed himself, of how neglectful he was being towards his heir. Stannis envied the reach knight Grimm for providing an emotional comfort for his son he was supposed to be there for his son being his father. Jacob brushed off the snow from his furs, and was trotting towards his father. Standing by his right side, and looking grimly at the constructed pyre, and the cage, which will house the former man of the watch and wildling king. You don't have to go through with this, you can stop this. Jacob said coldly, with his arms folded. I'm standing firm in my word. The man will be executed tonight and there is nothing you or the Lord Commander can do about it. You could cut off his head, rather than burn him alive. It's a more honorable way for him to die. The man has no honor, deserting the watch demands penance of death. You will understand such things when you are king. Even as your heir, I still don't understand why you refuse to listen, and follow what Melisandre tells you. Is it because she is feeding you false hope of magic getting us the throne? I'm not sure what to believe anymore, all the fantastical fairy tales Melisandre likes to spread, I've never believed in it. I only followed because the power she has is real, and she may be useful for the days to come. I doubt it. Stannis didn't fully understand his son, as the young man was different to what his father wanted him to be. It wasn't terrible because he had the makings of a great king he had his mind, knew how to use it in political situations and he was able to learn about people and how to use it to his advantage in the Game of Thrones. It was why he needed Jacob. Stannis was more a soldier, not a man made to play the Game of Thrones, but his son learned from the Tyrells on how to play this dreadful game his intelligent mind was needed in order to accumulate allies in the north and to stand a chance of gaining the throne. The men began to gather round. Most of the brothers from the Night's Watch and the king's own men were in attendance. The king glared at his son, sensing his discomfort of having to witness another execution, and not being able to do anything to stop it. King Stannis gripped onto the hilt of Lightbringer, and shuddered. He didn't truly believe he was the hero in the prophecy, but only clung on to it because of his goal of being on the Iron Throne. Nothing else mattered than retrieving his rightful place as King of the Seven Kingdoms. At least, most of the Black Brothers will be satisfied. Prince Jacob whispered gruffly, none of them would miss him anyways. Not the Lord Commander. King Stannis replied. John spent time with the man, it's only because of his sentiment towards him. The law is the law, and he must die for his crimes against the Watch. Will you make the same choices when it comes to putting your former friends to the sword? Such as those Tyrells and those who care for you in the Reach? Only the traitors and cowards should die, killing them all would be a waste and cause more problems. Many in the Seven Kingdoms don't like you, it will take a miracle for it minds and hearts to change about you. None are too fond of you either, being my son and carrying my name. The usurpers fear you more than they do me. You are young, intelligent and look more like your uncle than whom they believe to be the rightful heirs. Are you praising me because it might be the last time you might do so? You have earned it. I never liked the smell of coal and fire, it's the burning of the seven all over again. The king watched, as a few men placed the former king beyond the wall into a cage. The madman was muttering whatever words he could to save himself from death. 
his eye caught on the Reachman Sorel Grimm standing beside his son, as his sworn shield. His head was covered by a hat. Stannis gritted between his teeth he never liked Grimm, but he was an above-average fighter and he owed the man for bringing him and Celis their son back from Old Town. The man's family were sworn to the Tyrells, and he needed to be watched. Mercy. He is no king. Witchcraft will never give him kingship. The king beyond the wall shrieked, and he was thrown into the cage dangling over the pyre. Stannis ignored the man screaming, and did not believe any of it. The man was a deserter and a wildling he was going to die and no one was going save him. Even his own people were content in seeing him burn to his deathbed. The king grumbled under his breath he was playing a dangerous game, allowing others to believe he was this hero reborn. He only went along with it because he wanted to see what more could the Lady Melisandre do for him. Her stories may be flawed, but her power and what she could do was real. Let's get this over and done with. I cannot remain here for long. There are war councils to be had and we need a plan on how to cleanse the north of Ironborn scum and Bolton scum. Let the Lord Commander deal with the wildlings. Stannis sees the red woman standing beside the pyre all the men on the wall were focused on her. In these times, there will be a battle between the light and the dark between life and death itself. The Lord of Light will prevail against the one whose name cannot be spoken. The Lady Melisandre said, whilst she had the horn in her hands. The red woman saw fit to throw the horn into the pyre. She said moments before how this was going to be the cause of the destruction of the wall, and how it needed to be destroyed. The only thing his logical-minded son Jacob agreed on when it came to the Lady Melisandre's storytelling. The pyre was now burning aflame. The light of the fire reminded Stannis of the burning of the seven. He did not know how Jacob would be affected by it, as they were the gods his son worshipped, since childhood. They were the gods his wife Celis abandoned from her girlhood, alongside the rest of the southerners in his army. The wildling deserter was shrieking, with the flames burning through his tattered clothes and the wildlings were watching in a stoic manner. From the corner of the king's eye, he saw a row of archers with air bows at the ready. He knew the Lord Commander would do something to end Mance Raider's suffering the man was his friend and he would do anything to end his misery. Jacob stood beside his sworn shield from Grey Shield, and covered his nose. The stench of burning wood and coal bothered his son, as it reminded him of Lord Florence's death. The circumstances were the same both men were oathbreakers and deserved to die by the law. The king heard the Lord Commander order his men to shoot Mance Raider with arrows, as the men obeyed him. He scowled at how the arrows put the wildling king out of his misery he thought Jon Snow would see sense, but he had interfered with an execution. Abandon your false king, as the Lord of Light rejects him. Embrace Stannis Baratheon, as he is the true king in Azor a high reborn. The red woman chanted. Discomfort sat within Stannis. He knew deep inside this was a fool's show, but he had to save face and show strength as the rightful king. The king stood beside the Lady Melisandre, and drew Lightbringer, for the sword's light was so bright that the wildings and men had to cover their eyes. You have a choice, whether to kneel before me and live or go die beyond the wall. Those who serve me will be promised food, shelter, and assistance from what lays behind the wall. The king proclaimed. The gates of the wall were opened, and most of the captive wildings entered to kneel before the king, feeding the pyre with fragments of white pieces to feed to the fires of Rolaller. The king wasn't blind or deaf to the muttering from the Black Brothers most of them were not pleased of having wildings allowed through the wall. This has to be tackled carefully, father. We already have enough problems, as it is. We don't need to be dealing with another war between the Night's Watch and the wildlings. Jacob had said to Stannis the night before. The king gritted his teeth it was not right for him to envy his own son. Jacob's own political cunning made him more likable towards the men of the watch, and made Lord Commander Snow trust him more than he did the king. The Lord Commander dares tell me not to make the wildlings kneel. The boy is sentimental towards these savages, I am the king and my word is law. My own son would stand against me given the chance for his dear friend. Jacob was all Stannis had left. He could not afford to isolate his son from him, especially when he needed him the most. His son's eyes were weary, and he stuck by the reach man, 
holding on to the man's wrist longer than he should have Jacob did not look directly towards the king, and if he did, his eyes would widen and keep his distance from Stannis. The execution was over, and most of the captive wildlings that knelt were fed and sheltered from the cold of the wall. Most of his captives were apprehensive of the Lady Melisandre, and they had reason to be. His heir Jacob always stood away from the Red Woman, and clutched onto the seven-pointed star around his neck, whenever he had to be in the same room as Melisandre. My son is devout in his faith, and Melisandre won't leave him be. Jacob fostered with the Tyrells, and shares their devotion to the faith of the Seven. I will never understand religion, but my son's belief in the Seven has kept the Southerners loyal to me. The king began to look at his own gaunt hands, and realized how Jacob's concern for his well-being wasn't sentiment or weakness. Jacob wasn't a man of action, but was more comfortable with averting situations and learning from the outcomes. It is what he needs to acquire in order to be capable of ruling seven broken kingdoms. Stannis held on to Lightbringer, and saw how this sword was the only thing that proved he was the savior of Melisandre's prophecy. It was a terrible crime to lie, but it was necessary because it kept the Red Woman by his side and willing to serve him. It made the wildlings and the brothers of the Watch fear him, which was what the king wanted. Fear and terror could do anything to anyone, which was how the Lannisters have held on to the Iron Throne for this long, even under a child king. Stannis looked towards his son, and he was speaking with the Reach Man. He saw shades of Robert in him he had a desire to be a leader among men, to lead them into war and to gain glory for his king. Chapter 38 The rags and the cloths of a common sailor were what Ser Davos had adorned, in order to keep his presence unnoticeable to the citizens in White Harbor. It was a large port, with many people bustling through one place to another. It was a manner much different to what he originally intended, but it was necessary, to the secrecy of his mission. I will be rewarded greatly by the king, if I am able to secure this alliance. I know how difficult it was to find Jacob a wife, it wasn't the young man's fault he inherited the most unpleasant qualities of both his mother and father. The Mandalis would appreciate a man of high birth, not a social climber like a fry. In front of him, Davos caught on new fortifications, such as higher walls and more men on the grounds and along the shore. He has been in this place before, having taken a ship from here with Jacob and his son Devon, on their voyage back to Dragonstone. It was at simpler times, and when things were not so complicated. The North was even more secretive than he assumed. Being in war made Davos more aware of the new jetty walls, which could be hiding warships. He shook his head, of how Lord Mandalay could have any use for warships. The Onion Knight thinks of East Watch, where the King Stannis commanded Queen Celis and Princess Shireen were to stay for the duration of their time at the Wall. He remembered something a black brother told him how Lord Mandalay would never ally with the Boltons, but Lord Burrell said it was what the Merman Lord was going to do. As Davos sees the small galley's dock at the shores, a warship appeared at the corner of the knight's eye. It was a large ship, bearing the lion and stag sigil was proudly on the ship's flag. His heart sank, knowing what the robber lord told him of the fray's presence in White Harbor. The Onion Knight strolls into the city, it was filled with refugees from the war. He kept his cloths on, as he didn't want to be discovered by any of the passing Mandalay troops, whom held tridents instead of spears or swords, in which other soldiers of the Seven Kingdoms armed themselves with. He walked through the fish foot yard. It was seeming with people of all kinds were here and all did something. There was a young girl selling cups of fresh milk from her nanny goat, and others such herb women, scribes and money changers going some form of business with what looks to be a hedge wizard. It was something Davos wanted to remember for his youngest sons when he got back home to them and his wife. Davos glimpses the gates of Old Mint were opened. Through previous visits, the iron and oak doors were always closed, but it was a huddled place where old men, women and children were housed, most of them were refugees of war. He wasn't sure of what Lord Mandalay means to do with them, but they were seeking shelter from one of the only places in the north untouched by war. The former smuggler stopped beneath the colonnade, not knowing where he was going through the crowded square. From his years of being a smuggler, he learned secrecy and deception were the only things that kept him alive in those times. I am not that man anymore. Who never had a real purpose other than gold? I have a purpose, of serving my king and his heir. 
I owe everything I am today to the rightful king, and treated his son as if he was an eighth son of mine. Trotting past an apple stall, Davo started to feel a little hungry. The meal from the robber lord satisfied him enough through his journey. Fruit wasn't something the onion knight enjoyed, but Prince Jacob enjoyed what the harvest of the reach brought to him. Davos began to miss him, and thoughts turned to his own sons. He was fortunate of his younger son Stannis and Stefan were as far away from harm and war as he liked. His other son Devon was still at the wall, as a squire for Prince Jacob. Originally, Devon was meant to be the king's squire, but the prince chooses him to be his squire instead. Not one to object his son's wishes, the king accepted. The prince's return made Devon happy, and not having to face remarks from the Florence anymore. The Onion Knight trades a halfpenny for an apple, to the seller, who owned the stall. The man was a stranger, but he was an inhabitant of White Harbor and must know of the tidings and news of what was happening in the city. Crowded square, I've never seen such before. Are most of the people northerners? Most of them are small folk from up the White Knife, while others are from Hornwood, whom sought sanctuary inside the city walls. Who can blame them, with the idiot of Bolton running loose, killing and harming whomever he wants? The apple seller replied. What becomes of them? Most survive by begging and stealing. Some of the young girls become prostitutes, while any boy of descent height can find a place in Lord Mandalay's barracks, as long as he can hold a spear. Guilt sat within the Onion Knight. He had come on a singular-minded mission to deliver his king's plea towards the Lord of White Harbor. The people around him were the casualties of war, and his presence of potentially bringing war onto Lord Mandalay's doorstep wasn't what he had in mind. Are most of the troops guarding the ports? Lord Mandalay is recruiting troops, it's all I know of it. The apple seller replied. Ser Davos saw through the apple seller's suggestions. The sight of the heightened walls and the new soldiers in the city indicated what he already knew of Lord Mandalay's intentions. The Merman Lord was hosting the phrase in his city, and the robber lord told him of how the alliance between the two houses were to be sealed with marriage with Mandalay's two granddaughters marrying two upstart phrase, who were not good enough for such noble ladies of the north. The mission may seem hopeless, but I will do what I can for my king. He has entrusted me with arranging this pact with Lord Manderley. The king was content of keeping his son unmarried, so ambitious lords can fight each other for the chance of their daughters to be queen. Ser Davos liked the idea of it. These pompous lords fighting for whatever can bring them closer to the throne, but he knew Prince Jacob was sought after, even hiding behind the wall. After this mission was over he hoped to see the prince again, even if he was for a short time. Davos has been away from Jacob for far too long, even though the prince was a man grown and can take care for himself. The Onion Knight was curious to know what was going on, it had been a long time, since he departed from his king and much has happened. With the Lannisters weakening, it will only be a matter of time for when their allies will fall with them. Lord Manderley was the unknown he could make the difference of this long mission being a success or a grievous failure. Ser Davos made his way to Lazy Eel, a known wine sink in the city. A place where unsavory characters would enjoy the vilest wine and meat pies full of lard and gristle. At times, the pies were inedible to eat on their best gates and some were poisonous on their worst days. In my smuggling days, the eel was known to those who would venture there. City guardmen and officers would not be caught there. It was only for solliers and fishermen whom didn't know any better. I only visited here a few times, but never came again, because of fear of being arrested. The place was quite crowded, when the Onion Knight entered the wine sink. The ceiling was barrel vaulted and stained black with soot on the walls. It was the same as he saw it years ago, as nothing had changed about the sink. The stench in the air was of smoke, spoiled meat from their pies and stale vomit that hasn't been cleaned for a long time. Ser Davos covered his nose with his cloths. He could see many sailors and some fishermen drinking and enjoying themselves, others would be gossiping among each other. Ser Davos stuck closer to them, and maybe he might catch a few words from their mouths and those words could be valuable to him. I hear tiding of how Robert Glover is trying to raise men in the city to take back Deepwood Mott, but Lord Manderley refused to help him. One of the sailors said. 
What of the Dustins and Riswells, they're joining Roose Bolton to fight the Iron Men at Moat Kylon? A second sailor replied. A small portion of House Umber have joined the Boltons, led by Hother Horsbane. A third sailor interjected. Mandalay better join Bolton too. The lions have Lord Mandalay's son. I thought the phrase eliminated his son. Ser Davos said, causing the sailors to face him and stop talking for a while. The Lannisters eliminated one son, Wendell, but the other son Wyllys is still a prisoner of the throne. The news dismayed Davos he knew from a father's point of view of how he would do anything for his sons, if they came to harm. A sense of kinship made the Onion Knight sympathize with Lord Mandalay for such circumstances. The former smuggler did not like the Queen Celis much, but began to understand why she wanted to keep her son away from marriage he was her only boy and would do anything to keep him with her. I hear of how dragons have some again, and the Mad King's daughter has tamed them. The first sailor said, with wide eyes. No one knows the name of the princess, she is half a world away. The second sailor wondered. The name of the Targaryen princess is Daenerys. I do not know what came of her she might sail back one day. Ser Davos said, in a neutral tone. Sail back. I talked with the steward of the slow-eyed maiden Pentos, who told me of how a silver-haired girl with three dragons tried to book passage with them to Westeros, but the captain turned her away. A bravosi oarsman spoke out. Ser Davos was intrigued, of how creatures from long ago have returned to the world. It reminded him of one of the books Prince Jacob borrowed from Old Town, which was about the Valyrians and the dragons of the Long Age. The Onion Knight knew at the back of his mind of how the captain's voyage ended badly, refusing worldly royalty was something no man should have done, especially if the princess had fire-breathing monsters at her command. One day, I would take Stefan, Stannis and Devon to see those dragons someday. They would be excited, still being children. The thoughts of his sons turned to Prince Jacob, and what the robber lord said about him. Ser Davos didn't take insults to his prince lightly, even though what the lord of Sweet Sister said was true about the prince being almost like his father. Loyalty made Davos ignore Prince Jacob's flaws, such as lack of niceties, a hardened heart from battles and loss and an unpleasant demeanor towards women. Ser Davos didn't blame the prince for his flaws, for his father and mother taught him to be strong. The Onion Knight began to leave the wine sink, with the stench getting onto his cloths. He didn't look back a sit was den for the drunken fools and gossipers with nothing better to do with themselves. The bustling of the people outside the fish foot yard made the Onion Knight dwell on the diplomatic mission he had to complete on the command of his king. And if it was worth making the plea to Lord Mandalay for King Stannis's cause to fight back against the Freys and Boltons. I cannot give up, if I did, then I would have disgraced myself, as hand of the king, as a subject of my king and my family. I came all this way to plead my king's cause and I will. Of all the lords, I was chosen for this mission, to gain the Mandalays as allies for my king and find the prince a wife. His mind thought towards the Knight of Grey Shield, a man Ser Davos didn't trust much, but the man was a worshipper of the Seven, which made him more likely to find friends among the king's men. Sorel Grimm was a man capable of looking out for the prince, whilst the Onion Knight was away. Ser Davos was far from the lazy eel, but he wouldn't have been in there for nothing. With some of the sailors gossip told about how some of the northern lords were coerced to serve the Boltons, only to fight a common enemy down at Moat Callion, to liberate the castle from the Ironborn. Being so far from the wall reminded the knight of a crude story told to the remaining queen's men at the feast before his departure from Eastwatch. By Sir Axel Florent, the last of Prince Jacob's uncles with Alistair burned for treason and his Baratheon uncles Robert and Renly were dead. The uninvited Florent man had slyly compared Davos to an ape in prince's clothing, which earned him the ire of Prince Jacob. Sir Axel was an arrogant man, who only obeyed Queen Celis, but he would obey his great nephew and his king, when he was commanded to. Sir Axel should be careful with his words. He doesn't have the favor of the king and his heir. He proclaimed himself leader of the queen's men, being alike with the men who worship the religion of the red woman. Underneath the arrogance, Sir Axel envies me, I have the favor of the king and prince, whilst he only has the favor of the unforgiving queen. Sir Davos has been through too much to get to White Harbor, to at least attempt to fulfill his diplomatic duty to his king. 
He kept his letters to himself, with gold and black to symbolize the true sigil of House Baratheon, before the variation of flags and sigils during the War of the Five Kings. The Onion Knight began to climb the hill, it is quite grand, but he had climbed it before. This time he was alone and wearing a disguise to keep him from being eliminated. The proud and pale castle of New Castle had thick white halls, with the merman of House Manderley flies from the towers and the gates of the castle were closed and had armed guards standing outside of the keep. King Stannis is no friend of Lord Manderley, calling him fat, useless and a coward. The man is weary from all the fighting and politics, whom can blame him when one son is dead and the other a captive of the enemy. A marriage pact with Prince Jacob might sway the Lord to abandon his fruitless alliance with the phrase, for a suitable match. Ser Davos cleared his throat, not knowing how this would end. Lord Mandalay's living son was being held hostage by the usurpers, who hold Stannis's throne. It could dampen his chances of being able to persuade a high lord, weary of war and politics to put his house and his honor on the line with the possibility of being the grandfather of a queen. He had gotten to the top of the hill. The high castle made Ser Davos feel small, and he caught his eye on a guard, who had taken notice of him. At the corner of his eye, the Onion Knight sees twenty-three new warships in the inner harbor. It was what the apple seller told him of the Merman Lord preparing for war, with new ships and recruiting soldiers to patrol the city of White Harbor. What is your business? A guard asked he emerged from the gate to address the man in common cloths. Davos showed him the black and gold ribbon, bearing royal seals. I need to see Lord Manderley at once. He said, my business is with him, and with him alone. Lord Manderley is hosting guests from House Fry. It would not be prudent to disturb him. The guard replied. My business is of urgency. You dress like a common peasant, but you carry royal seals. The guard seized the knight, by more of the guard appeared. Ser Davos expected it, coming to the castle of a lord weary of strangers and those he views as traitors. The guards were not, as rough as the one serving the robber lord of Sweet Sister. He had gotten this far, to fulfill his mission to his king and now the knight would have to play the game of high lords for his own survival. Chapter 39 The grumbling of the men in the council chamber bored the rightful prince of the Seven Kingdoms. He was surrounded by the king's men, queen's men and some of his father's remaining bannermen and commanders. He sat on his father's right, in the high place of honor. Jacob ran his hand across his bearded face and boredom his eyes were rolled, whilst his father didn't see his bored son's face. The prince caught his eye on Sorel, who sat among the king's men. Jacob had begun to trust Sorel a lot more the man was more than just his sworn shield, but was his ally. The prince couldn't hold back hard tears from falling from his eyes, being apart from Davos affected him more than he let on. Jacob saw a collection of letters by his father and most of them were replied from northern houses, whom were either going to refuse his father's kingship or swear his fealty, as the rightful king of the seven kingdoms. All of them are rejections, apart from a reply from the leech Arnulf Karstark. I met the man once, and he is an untrustworthy player. The man always envied those in his family higher in status than he was his son Cregan is a snake and must be vying for the lordship of Carhold if they succeed in throwing Alice into my arms and out of their household. The return of Sir Richard and Sir Justin displeased Jacob more he was no friend of any of the Queen's men, but as heir to the throne most of them had no choice to obey him. Uncle Axel being the foolish pounce he was, would never object to anything his great-nephew told him to do, being one of his last remaining uncles living and desperately seeking his favor. The heir to the throne cleaned himself up to look presentable in front of the lords of the council. He was clad in the colors of his mother's house, with his gold and black furs over his shoulders. His hair was tied in a sufficient ponytail, his beard was trimmed with some of the men able to recognize him. The doors of the chamber opened for John to arrive, to see the two wildings and Melisandre present. Jacob didn't want to look at the red woman in the eye, for she would capture him in her evil spell. His father was a fool to bring her here, this was a war council meeting and she had no place in it. Leaving her at the wall will be his one wish, with her foreign power being what scared him more than being on the battlefield again. As a worshipper of the faith, the red woman's religion had no place in the seven kingdoms, 
whilst his father was on the path to kingship and needed the faith and the high septum to turn against the Lannister Tyrell coalition and turn to the prince and his father. Rattleshirt will be under your watch, Lord Commander. The Red Woman informed. The man cannot be trusted. John protested. The Lady Melisandre shows John the red ruby gem, on the wildling's wrist. He is bound to me, blood and soul. As long as he wears the gem, he will serve you faithfully. My father summoned you to this war council for a reason. I know you wouldn't want to be seen as partial to him in the Game of Thrones. As a former guest of the Starks, I do not know much about the Northern Lords, but as a man born and raised in the North, you have knowledge my father wishes to know, as the Northmen will be fighting under our banner. Prince Jacob said, in a neutral tone. The Northmen would look to his grace's son as an eligible husband for any of their unmarried daughters, as his grace the prince will need to choose wisely from the more loyal of northern houses, and not those who turn to the Boltons. Foolishness, his words are useless, your grace. Sir Godry objected. Jacob's father Stannis ignore the man's provocation. Sir Godry Faring was one of the queen's men, but one of the more foolish ones. The prince didn't appreciate the man disrespecting one of his last remaining friends in the world. If Ser Godri said any more, then he would have been sent out on the prince's orders for insubordination and contributing nothing to the war council. I want to know if Moore's umber can be trusted to bend the knee to me. King Stannis asked. I would advise you to take his oath, your grace. John replied. It will only bring me half of the umber forces. Father, half of the forces is better than none. Hother Horsbane is only fighting for the Boltons because of the great John being a prisoner of the Red Wedding. Prince Jacob interjected. It would be prudent if his grace shall listen to the counsel of his heir than some upstart idiot. One of the Queen's men sneered. The prince never understood why men like these swore their loyalty to his mother Queen Celis and the religion of the Red Woman. It's mostly due to them wanting to push their superiority among everyone else. Prince Jacob held the hilt of his sword, itching to eliminate the man, who dared to insult John. I plan to leave the wall to take on the Bolton idiot at the Dreadfort unaware. Lord Arnulf has been urging me to attack claiming it is lightly garrisoned. The king announced. The plan will fail, your grace. The Lord Commander foretold. Many of the Queen's men were scorned, and most of them should have stayed at Eastwatch with his mother and his sister. Prince Jacob placed a hand over his head it was better when Uncle Axel was controlling these sorts of men, they would listen to him, being their leader and his mother's best man. The prince glared at Ser Godry, being the main troublemaker, but Jacob's father ignored him and the rest of the queen's men. Silence, explain why my plan will fail, Lord Commander. The king said, in an iron tone. Silencing the queen's men with fear. Unless, you win over Moore's umber to your cause. His forces will cut yours to pieces, as it crosses his lands. Second, the dread fort will learn of your coming, long before Lord Bolton's arrival, a small garrison can hold the castle against men many times their number. The combined armies of Ramsay and Roose Bolton will outnumber you five to one, and will easily destroy you, as you lay siege to the dread fort. The northern lords you seek to rally to your cause, whom have suffered generations of wildlings pillaging their lands, will not be pleased to see the wildlings crossing their lands. It would be wise. Moore's Umber offered his fealty on the conditions of having the skull of the burnt wilding king, a pardon for his brother Horsbane, who is fighting under duress for the Boltons, due to his nephew being prisoner of the Freys. The prince replied. The lord commander is a coward, do not listen to him, your grace. One of his father's cowardly captains objected, urging the prince to want to slap him at the back of his head. You are all excused, apart from the Lord Commander and my son. The king commanded, with all the captains, bannermen and other men exiting the chamber. Prince Jacob was glad, not to have any of those rebellious queen's men around. He will have to speak with Uncle Axel about disciplining the troublemakers in the war council. In his mind, Jacob knew John's knowledge was vital, and dismissing it would be a foolish mistake. As a former guest of the North, Jacob may know some of the noble houses, but he wasn't a man born and raised the North to know every detail about their lords and ladies. It must have been the reason why his father needed to keep John close to him. 
In the chamber, it was just him, his father, John and the Lady Melisandre. The red woman's glare bristled the prince he would be glad to never see her again, having to continue the war for his father, and giving him counsel. Jacob knew his father was a soldier, a commander, and not one for playing the game of thrones, it was why he was needed by his side. You should consider my offer of Winterfell to you. King Stannis said, in a quieter tone. I cannot accept, your grace. Sansa is the rightful heir and I cannot forsake my vows. John refused, with his father's disgust fairly showing on his face. On the other hand, Jacob was glad his father's ire was not directed at him for once, but understood why John refused the offer. For the sake of his honor, as a man of the Night's Watch and the Lord Commander he was responsible for leading and organizing the Black Brothers. Making decisions on the Wildling prisoners still stationed at the Wall and to prevent another civil war between the Wildlings and the Night's Watch. I plan to reward Winterfell to Arnulf Karstark. The king said, reading through the unread letters. The Karstarks abandoned my half-brother in the war. He personally beheaded Lord Ricard for killing two Stark prisoners. Those prisoners being the sons of Ser Kevin Lannister, the sheep holding the throne for the child king. I haven't heard from Davos in days. The absence is a sign of White Harbor being a lost cause. I promise a source of more men, if you allow me to keep the wildlings at the wall, to occupy more of the abandoned forts, your grace. The Lord Commander said to the king. The decision is wise the wildlings should stay on the wall. The northerners are already skeptical of us as it is, fighting a war against the staunch lords is one we cannot afford. The prince interjected. Recruiting the mountain clans would be more sufficient, with them being loyal to my father's memory. I suggest marching through the mountains to win the clansmen to your side, and then attack Deepwood Mott to defeat the Iron Men to rally the north on your side. John suggested. The plan is likely to be a success and it will impress the Northmen enough for them to flock to my banners. The king agreed. I will have to warn you, your grace. The clansmen are deeply devout to the old gods, the presence of the Lady Melisandre will not be welcome. I will remain at the wall with the queen and the princess. The Lady Melisandre said. The ironborn would be weakened, only the dead craven's daughter remains in the castle, not having the full strength of the Iron Fleet or Ironborn men. She will be a worthy hostage, to get rid of the remaining Ironborn still in the north. The prince mused. The prince's father rubbed his jaw. When Balon Greyjoy rose against my brother, I beat the Iron Men at sea, where they are the strongest. On land, taken unaware. I. I won a victory over the wildlings and their king beyond the wall, with my son leading another half of my host. If I can smash the Iron Men again, the North will know it has a king again. You are excused, Lord Commander. The prince said, rising his hand, signaling the Red Woman to leave as well. Of course, your grace. The prince may be the closest person to his father Stannis, but he never understood why he made the choices he did. He wouldn't make the same choices himself, being the more politically minded of the two. Jacob was excited to continue the war, to have the opportunity to slaughter the remaining ironborn in the north, along with the Boltons and Freys. At the back of his mind, the prince could see the anguish of his mother, begging his father not to send him to war again, having returned twice with scars and being scared for him. His mother was right to be afraid, he was the only son of a dying house and he was the future of House Baratheon, whether he liked it or not. With the Red Woman and the Lord Commander left the council chamber it was the prince and his father alone. Prince Jacob was less talkative, during the council meeting. He didn't want to impose on his father he sensed his father must be angry with him, not wanting to tell the prince to his face. Do you have faith in Davos completing his diplomatic mission, Jacob? Stannis said, in an iron tone. The Onion Knight has never failed you. He will succeed even if he has to give his life for you. Marrying Arnolf's niece will happen after we have recaptured Winterfell. It's not a wise decision, father. I met this Castellan once and know enough. The man and his relatives are snakes, they only pledged themselves to us in order to have Harrion eliminated by the Lannisters, and then assume the lordship of Old Ricard's lands. You still hold hope for Davos securing the Manderley alliance. I know the urgency to marry quickly, 
it's only a matter of time before our enemies realize how my youth could cost them their allies. I would like to know why after Uncle Renly's death, why haven't you engaged me to Maid Marjorie when you had the chance? The Tyrells and the Florents have been feuding, since the beginning of days. Such a marriage would not happen, if I had my way. Mace Tyrell and the fool Paxter Redwine thought they could starve me into submission, since then your mother and I agreed to put all notions of such an alliance out of the window. On the other hand, I don't like any of these bannermen at all, especially the Lickspittles that came over after Renly's death. I must make use for them, but the prideful lord of Highgarden would cut off his left foot, before he would allow your mother's family to grasp power from him and his ilk. Unlike those loyal to the Tyrells, the ladies Melissa and Rhea, first cousins of yours once removed are married to powerful lords, who could persuade their husbands not to take arms against you. Speaking of first cousins once removed, what happened to Lord Alakine Florent? The last I heard, the man is seeking refuge in the Hightower to flee from the Fat Flower's second son and his army. Stannis answered. Do any of them know I'm alive? They do not need to know, most in the South believe you to be dead and I would like to keep it that way. Let the dishonorables fight amongst themselves, and then Tyrell's own lords can turn on him. You shouldn't doubt Davos' loyalty to you. He is one of the only men, who stayed with you when we endured the loss on the Blackwater. He had to bear your own harsh and boorish character and never disobeyed you. You should reward him greatly, if he is able to secure White Harbor and a wife for me. You would choose a girl from Mandalay's brood rather than marrying the Karstark girl. Father, we do not have much. We need provisions, food, men and gold to continue the war further and maybe survive the coming winter. If mother had her way, she would leave me unmarried and allowed the lords of Westeros to fight amongst themselves, it sounds more of an attractive idea than marrying anyone at all. Are you afraid of the sept, Jacob or are you trying to test my patience? The king gritted between his teeth. As my father and king, it's your duty to inform mother and Shireen, who I will be marrying, unless you will inform her of not marrying me off any time soon. Do you remember the wedding tourney you attended in Robert's stead? How you won the melee and attempted to win the hand of Lord Tyrell's daughter? It's their loss, you would have made a fine husband to whomever Robert had chosen from the Reacher families. Was it true what Uncle Renly said? Of how you, Uncle Robert and John Aaron were scheming to marry me off to Maid Marjorie. Mother would not have liked it at all, along with the other Florence, who most despised the Tyrells. It is true, but the wedding tourney put an end to those plans. Renly was always complaining, of how difficult it was to find you a suitable betrothal he and Robert placed blame on me for some of your unappealing qualities, as if I raised you to be unlikable. I raised you to be a great man, but your uncles will always find fault in me, because of the rejections of potential brides and not being any closer to finding a betrothal. The reason why Robert was seeking out the Reacher families is because a king's nephew is desirable to them, after his own pretender children. You could be the foulest man in the Seven Kingdoms, and those courtly lords would still take you, as a husband for one of their maiden daughters, not out of love, but a desire to be closer to power and iron throne. You never told me any this before. Why now? Are you afraid of losing me to the war or marriage? The war is tiring me out, Jacob. After this chaos and anarchy is over, I would like to meet my grandson before my eventual death. Of all the useless men and knights, I have around me, you are the only true man I trusted and had faith in, not because you are my son. You give me good counsel, advise me against those who willfully try to ruin my campaign and still held faith in the Onion Knight, even though I mistrusted him, much to my regret. Ser Davos will return. He hasn't failed you yet, he stuck with you when lesser men abandoned you on the Blackwater. I assisted him in his learning to read and write, so he could be a good hand to you and he was willing to be executed if it meant serving you well. You shouldn't doubt his loyalty the Onion Knight's allegiance and honor is rare in Westeros, even the Florence who are only loyal because of me being the next king and my mother being queen. Jacob was amused, to see a smile appear on the face of his normally grim-faced father. The day you were born, Robert feasted and drank until the morning. I gathered he was only delighted to have a nephew, who resembled him more than the children his wife bore. The next day, he would jest of how the Tyrells would be shitting themselves, not only was their claim to Highgarden fraudulent, as Lord Alistair would say. 
A true-born nephew of the king had the blood of the gardener kings in his veins, it put more fear in the Tyrells and made them more cowardly and craven in that regard. The prince began to laugh. It was a humorous image to see the lord of Highgarden fearing for his wealth and position of power. Jacob was no friend of Mace Tyrell, after rejecting his suit for Marjorie's hand and desperately wanting to suck up to his uncle Robert. He knew the fat flower would be dead soon, and how Willis would make a better lord than his incompetent and short-minded father. Iron Wrath is still in hands of those traitor Whitehills. It would be prudent if you sent me to lead a force against them. It would be foolish, I need you with me when we take Deepwood Mott. The Glovers know you and negotiations with them will be easier to stomach than if you were absent from my side. I need to speak with the Lord Commander, before we leave the wall. He might be able to listen to a man his own age, then one old enough to be his father. I would warn you, your friendship with the idiot boy will not end well. I need you to be focused and ready to counsel me always. The prince lowered his head he didn't want to listen to his father, only because he was wrong. He doesn't believe in having friends because he was bitter and cold himself. Jacob did things on his own terms, and didn't care for what his father suggested. He was going to speak with his old friend alone. The abundance of wildlings on the wall made Prince Jacob a lot more aware of his surroundings. He didn't care for them much, only if they didn't cross into the north and ruin his father's chances of getting the Northmen under his banner. The war council was on his mind, and how Jacob would have to face the field again and he will have to be strong, like the stag of his house sigil. He was the antlered warrior the wildlings saw cut down their forces in the snows, he was the iron prince who struck fear into the hearts of the enemy and his own men. The man of eight and ten didn't care what others around him thought, he was to be their king and they would have to respect him. If they didn't, then they would join other treasonous men in the grave. Some of the wildlings were intimated, looking away from the Iron Prince's scar under and above his eye. The scar was from the Battle of Blackwater, his first real battle. He begun to like the edged scar, it made him look fearsome and a warrior. The prince went into the Lord Commander's tower its entrance still smelled like old smoke and the fire, which eliminated the old bear commander. Some parts of the tower were restored, in no part done by brothers of the Watch, who still respected their Lord Commander, unlike some of the others. A whisper escaped through the walls of the tower the haunting voice echoed in the air. The first floor had been restored, even though the second was ruined. The whispers made Prince Jacob shiver through his bones, it was a haunted tower and he didn't understand why his old friend stayed there. The prince pulled the door open, to see John in his small office. He didn't want to cause any discord between the Lord Commander and his King Father. Prince Jacob only wanted to be the peacemaker, and to soothe things between the two sides. He gulped, not knowing how this conversation will go. I didn't expect you to come here, your grace. John said, looking at the prince in a stern manner. I wanted the opportunity to speak with you, before my father and I leave Castle Black. You know how to reason with your father, even when other men are fearful of him. I am to rule after him. I know he can be blunt, angry and uptight, I fear for my father. The war is taking much from him, but he still has his strength and his will to fight. I'm not sure if the mountain clans will be welcoming of an undull faith worshipper like myself into their halls. As long as you appease them and give them a reason to fight for you. I heard things from your other black brothers, the ones who hate you. Is it true you had a wildling lover and it's why most of them hate you? Why would that be of interest to you, your grace? The Lord Commander wondered. I believe we have more in common than a persistent for honor and justice. My black brothers, they think of you as emotionless and cold. I believe them in some regard, but I would like to hear your side of the story, your grace. Jacob's eyes softened, he hated himself for having any sense of vulnerability. I wasn't always cold, Lord Commander. There was a time when I did have feelings, but I locked them away when various people I cared about started to die off like flies. I'll tell you a story, something I only told the Onion Knight and no one else. I might have slipped a few words to my sister, but she would bestow pity on me, as if she could make me feel better. I'm interested to hear it, your grace. I always envied the more handsome men, like my uncle Renly, Sir Loras and your brother Rob. The jolly and friendly fools, they could get anyone to like them for nothing. 
My father raised me to be a strong lord, and a strong lord I became. I was sent to High Garden when I was young, to be raised in the home of a man, who almost starved my father to death. When I came of age I won a melee and asked for Marjorie Tyrell's hand, but her father rejected my suit. I know what men say about me, how I am uncaring or have no love in my heart. There was a time I did. I did love someone, but that love soured and rotted like a past-gone peach. You were kind to Samwell, even when other brothers of the watch make japes at his expense. Samwell is kin to me, his mother Melissa being my first cousin once removed from House Florent, it's difficult to recall any of my relatives, most of them I have never met and others I have met once. None of them are true to me, John. They only see me as advancement for House Florent and nothing more. Is it the reason why you are closer to your Baratheon kin than your Florent kin? Being fostered in the reach wasn't so bad the fruit harvested tasted great, the wine was sweeter and there was always a tourney once in a moon. As a ward of the Tyrells, I was accustomed to meeting with their banner men on a regular basis. Took a liking to Lord Redwine's daughter Desmara, she was one of the only girls in the reach who didn't fear me. She was a beauty, but not a greater beauty than her cousin maid Marjorie. Her visits to High Garden were the only times I had with her, before she went home to the arbor. I began to resent her, for crawling her way into my heart without permission. I loved Desmara, but I was foolish to think she was any different to the power-hungry Southerners. Her father commanded her to stop seeing me, as Lord Redwine was to betroth her to some lord. I guess the lucky groom was Dick and Tarly, reasonable boy and dutiful son to his father. I would have been happy for them both, much to my displeasure. Pax to Redwine hated my father and wanted revenge for his and Mace Tyrell's ill-thought siege. He would rather cut off his sword hand rather suffice the idea of his only daughter's courtly love being the son of Stannis Baratheon. Why would tell me all this, your grace? I'm just the Lord Commander, doesn't your father know? I trust the Onion Knight with secrets like these. My father makes it no secret he held his grudge against the Reacher Lords, who tried to starve him. Rightfully so, the bannermen of the Fat Flower underestimated my father's strength and will. He may not have as much as the other usurpers in this war, but my father never forgot why he was fighting for the throne. For the kingdoms to have a strong ruler to repair the realm and to avenge the dishonor on our house. Admirable goals, your grace. You have changed, you were not the man I met at Winterfell, who treated me like an equal among Lord Stark's trueborn children. War changes people, John. I have eliminated a great deal of men, and I am going to eliminate more. As a southerner, it will be a challenge to survive the northern snowstorms. I will endure it for my father, as I must do everything else. My apologizes, your grace. For refusing your father's offer, I stand by my vows to the night's watch. It matters not, you have honor. Ned Stark and your brother Rob had honor, but honor and ignorance of the game has led them to the grave my father will get over it he has more important things to focus on and might reward Winterfell to a loyal Northman. Rest assured, I will never allow that Snake Arnulf and his kin to have the seat of House Stark, as long as I have my father's ear and counsel. I know an opportunist when I see one, and Arnulf Karstark is no different than a Tyrell. I guess this will the last time we will speak with one another. The Lord Commander said. I will miss it, having someone trustworthy around me. I don't have men like you around, only Sorel, but he is not for small talk being my sworn shield. Lord Davos is away and I do not know when he will be returning to my father's side. The Night's Watch is grateful for the assistance provided from you and your father, your grace. It's good to see a king, who cares for the struggles of the wall. With most of them fighting a war, I didn't expect any help to come to the wall. You should meet Ser Davos one day he would appreciate another man of honor such as himself. He may be of humble birth, but he knew better than most of those lords and bannermen, who would rather leave Castle Black to be sacked and pillaged by the wildlings. I hope to see my mother and sister again, before I take the field once more. The thought of his mother Celis and sister Shireen softened the prince's heart. He has grown accustomed to being separated from the most important people in his life. As a prince, a warrior and the last son of House Baratheon, it was Jacob's duty to assist his father on the field of battle and in war councils. He was a man of eight and ten, 
but his beard and physical changes made him look older, which made him look every inch a warrior of the Stormlands. However, he had shrewd intelligence, from being taken under the wing of the Queen of Thorns, as a young child and learned the game of the High Lords through a clever, sharp old woman, who had power through her oaf son. Jacob was going to miss John it didn't matter because could make new friends among the northerners, who are rebelling against the Boltons and Freys. As the heir of Stannis Baratheon, he wasn't afraid of lords, who would flay their enemies rather than face them on the field or those, who would hide under a bridge to avoid a war. He may not like war, but he only fought for the memory for his uncle Robert, who had been made a motley of by the Lannisters and his council. The prince was older and might be strong enough to wield his uncle's warhammer. He had trained with it when he was younger. He would like to smash the hammer between the ribs of the Kingslayer, the Leech Lord and the Lord Troll of the Twins, who should be living under the bridge, like the rest of his hideous kind. He ached to be with his mother, he may be a man grown, but he still needed his mother's comforts until he was to go to war again. Jacob was glad not to be here any longer. His thirst for blood was greater than it was before, and his sword limos hungered for it. The prince was willing to oblige his sword's need for traitor's blood, and the blood of those who stand in his father's path towards his rightful throne. Chapter 40 My son will never go back to the field. I almost lost him to the Blackwater and against the savages beneath the wall. The queen thought solemnly, whilst sitting on a bronzed chair with many of her queen's men, sworn knights and ladies with her. Queen Celis Baratheon was impatient she wasn't comfortable in East Watch and voiced her complaints. The men from the watch, whom were stationed here tried to appease her and her men, but it proved to be futile. The accommodations were not to her standards, and the commander of the castle Cotter Pike didn't make her stay welcoming at all. She and her daughter Princess Shireen were stationed here, whilst her son and her husband were at Castle Black. Her heart ached to see her son again, she loathed to be separated from him again and she despaired for his life every time Jacob went to the field. Jacob is a prince and his father's heir. His duty to be by his father's side, no matter my objections. Stannis will send my boy to the battlefield again, many mothers have lost their sons to this war, and I will not lose mine to the snowstorms of the north. On the journey to the wall, Celis pleaded with Stannis not to send Jacob to war again. He had returned with scars on his face. She pitied him of how her son's good looks were ruined and how no one will want to marry a scarred man. The queen would get the same answer every time she tried. Her son was heir to the Iron Throne. Jacob was to rule after his father and him fighting the further battles proves how a prince should be on the field and by his king's side. Celis saw how her son has changed physically he was not the same boy who sailed to Storm's End with his father. Jacob had grown up throughout this war. He had become a man and his growth of beard was proof of how like his late drunken uncle he was in looks. Celis knew Jacob was not a little boy anymore, no more would he run to her when he had an accident or if something had upset him. He was a man grown, has seen the battlefield and has eliminated men by his own hand. Behind her stood Uncle Axel, who proclaimed himself Hand of the Queen and Leader of the Queen's Men. Celis wasn't blind to the tensions between her uncle and her son, as both believed in different gods and their views were not alike. Her son protected the simpering fools of the King's Men, whilst her uncle led the queen's men. The differences were always there, but it wasn't as if Jacob hated Ser Axel like he did Lord Alistair for committing treason against the king, the prince and those within the king's court. It's been so long, since I last saw my son. It was on the ship before he went straight to the field again. Celis said. Jacob is the heir, my queen. It is his duty to be by his father's side. Uncle Axel replied. This could be the last time I will see my son, before Stannis sends him off to another war. Prince Jacob is a fearsome warrior, he must fight the war further. As much as you would like him to stay with you, the boy is a man and he must fight alongside the king. A letter was sent from my husband, he will be informing me which northern girl will marry my son and will be birthing my grandchildren in the future. It's the king's prerogative, my queen. The king does as he sees fit. I do not like it, your grace. The prince should marry a lady with some kind of refinements from the south, but the king has made his choice and will tell us in due time. I want to meet her, uncle. The woman who will be Jacob's queen and my good daughter, 
but my husband said Shireen and I would be much safer on the wall. I will never see my son get married, it's one of the things a mother looks forward to when their children grow up, maybe, I will be there on the day Shireen gets married, but Jacob is my son. I will never get to see him experiencing joy and happiness for the first time, since his uncle Robert got him that grey horse on his eighth name day. That horse looks at me, as if it wants to trample on me, dear niece. A southern horse was not meant for such weather. Sir Axel said sourly. The grey horse makes my children happy, and their happiness comes before my own wishes. As a mother, I want to keep Jacob from the grave, but he somehow yearns for it. It showers him with glory and Stannis doesn't deter Jacob from fighting at all. It's Jacob's duty as his father's son and heir to be on the battlefield, no matter how it pains Celis in her heart to think of losing Jacob to the war. Uncle, get the men organized. My husband and son will be arriving soon, and a meal shall be prepared for when they arrive. The queen commanded. Of course, your grace. Sir Axel said. Celis trusted her uncle, he was the only man she trusted to be loyal to her and lead the queen's men. She still prayed to Rolalares fires from time to time, but it wasn't the same without the Lady Melisandre guiding her. The Red Priestess brought nothing but goodness to her husband's cause, and she would remain on the wall, since war camps and the battlefield were no place for a woman. The fool Patchface with his green and red checked motley on he was entertaining her daughter, some of her ladies and other members of the king's court stationed here. The fool was Shireen's only companion, and was there for her when she had to be separated from her brother again. Her little girl will smile for her brother and father will be arriving soon. It will only be short term, how can Celis explain to Shireen of how her brother will be at war and will not come back for some time? I will ask to have the commanders of the castle changed. I don't like this man, he is unpleasant and doesn't know how to respect royalty. Queen Celis complained. I'm sure the king will think of something, your grace. Sir Axel replied. The box with the crown stag on it, uncle. My son is ready, to assume his uncle's warhammer and prove himself further on the battlefield. The queen said gleefully. Dear niece, this marriage the king has arranged will be the final symbol of the prince leaving boyhood behind and finally becoming a man. It takes a man to endure marriage and to be a father to future heirs to the throne. I can't bear it, uncle. The thought of Jacob being sent to the field again and he may never come back to me alive. Celis placed a hand over her face. A few tears were falling from her eyes, at the thought of never seeing her son again. As the queen, she didn't have the power to keep her boy from the grave or from the blood and death the war brought on him. The idea of honor and glory showered Jacob with a sense of determination and blinded him to the thought of how death will affect those who loved him. Celis knew her son's duty was to be by his father's side at all times, but if she had her way. Then Jacob would be unmarried throughout the rest of the war and would settle down to a southern bride of her choosing, but she cannot argue with her lord husband on such matters. Celis may be the rightful queen, but in the end, she had to obey Stannis's orders and stomach the realization of having a northerner for a good daughter. All her thoughts of her husband's choice of a northern wife for her son were not laced in niceties. She will try to be kind to her son's eventual wife, only because the girl had no say in matters. The girl will be Jacob's queen and Shireen will end up having a new sister. It would be good for Shireen, to have another female noble around her, instead of being surrounded by the queen's men and the queen's own serving girls and ladies. The king has ordered the Lady Melisandre to stay on the wall. He has a point the battlefield is no place for a woman and she would be eliminated by those savage northmen. Sir Axel grumbled, with malice in his tongue. Silence, uncle. You will remember your future queen will be a northerner. You will keep your opinions to yourself in such matters. The king has decided, my boy will marry a girl from the north and secure a great alliance. Queen Celis replied. Dear niece. The king is stubborn and will not change his mind. Poor Jacob, the boy will be forced to bed a girl, who believes in those dead trees of the forest. His bride should at least be a girl, who believes in the same faith as him. It is done, uncle. It cannot be undone. It's the king's wishes and Jacob would be a fool to dismiss his father's order. He is desperate to please his father, 
to have his forgiveness for the treason committed with the smuggler Davos. The queen grumbled, she despised the smuggler Davos, a man her husband deemed worthier than his fellow knights and lords around him. Celis held her tongue, for the sake of her son and to not distance him further from her. Her boy, who had come back from the south with a scar under her eye and his hair was grayer than an old man's hair. There were a few muffled voices from outside of the rooms the queen and most of her sworn knights, men at arms, lady companions and serving girls for her daughter. She rose from her chair, with all the dignity and honor of a true queen with her flamed crown upon her head. Her eyes caught on the sight of her husband Stannis with the same styled crown on his head. He looked gaunt and his eyes were full of sternness. He was in the black furs, whilst his armor had the sigil of the stag and the heart of the Lord of Light on his breastplate. The knights and most of her companions kneeled before the king, and he allowed them to rise on their feet. He ignored most of them, most of the queen's men wanted to the favor of the king, but that favor had to be earned. Her son Jacob appeared with his father he looked more like his father, but his beard looked to have been trimmed and his furs had a gold trim with his cloak being black. His hair was in a ponytail, the queen's eyes were upon her son's scars. Celis feared Jacob's looks were ruined by them, no woman will marry her boy, only for gaining tokens of his victory against the savages beneath the wall. Jacob! Shireen exclaimed, rushing over to hug her brother. With her arms around her brother. A smile appeared on the face of Jacob, being reunited with his little sister. I missed you too, little fawn. I hope you have been good for mother and uncle Axel. Did the wildings hurt you, brother? The princess asked, looking at the second scar on Jacob's left cheek, it must have been a wound from a battle axe or a knife. It's only a small cut, no man can ride me down. Jacob, you and your sister should find a chamber in the castle. Your mother and I need to speak on important matters alone. The king said, in his usual iron tone. Of course, father. Come on little sister, I'll tell you more about the giant I saw at the wall. He was a great fellow and never spoke to anyone. Jacob said, leading his sister out. With the men at arms, sworn knights and the queen's serving girls and lady companions following the prince and princess out of the sight of the king and queen. Queen Celis didn't expect her husband to greet her with anything, but courtesy as his wife. Their relations have been distant, since the execution of her uncle Lord Alistair. The man deserved to die for being a traitor and almost having her children eliminated by the Lannisters. She sent Uncle Axel away, because she wanted to speak with her husband alone and maybe make him see her fear of their only son being on the battlefield. She and her lord husband sat on the two large chairs in the main foyer. Celis looked to the fire, as it was warm and it kept her and her retinue from freezing to death. Her heart gladdened to have her two children reunited, even if it was going to be for a short time. Jacob needed to be with his little sister and his mother before Stannis sent him to the field. Who will our boy be marrying? As his mother, I would like to know the name of the girl, who will be my good daughter and Shireen's good sister. Celis asked. Jacob will pledge himself to the eldest granddaughter of Lord Wyman Manderley. I wanted to pledge him to the daughter of the long-dead Ricard Karstark, but Jacob has refused because he believes the Castellan of Carhold and his son to be snakes. Aren't they the only house in the north, whom keep to the seven? It's better our son had a wife, who will share his faith. His faith in the seven has kept the southerners loyal to me, and it might gain the north on our side. I pleaded once and once again, my lord. I don't want to hear about our son freezing in the ditches of a snowstorm. Jacob is a man grown, woman. He will fight and will be by my side for the remainder of this war. Stannis said, in an iron tone. You have made all the decisions, my lord. You were the one who decided our son was to be married off to a northerner. He may rule after you and he may be your heir, but he is my son too. Doesn't his happiness count for anything? Have I not consulted you on such matters, my lady? You may have, my lord, but my opinions never mattered. Our son afraid, my lord. Of disappointing you again and breaking your trust, after the treason he committed with your onion knight. Things haven't changed, my lady. Our son still dislikes the Lady Melisandre, and for good reason. He wants to clear my path to the throne from any visible threats, and he believes she will be the doom of our cause. 
The queen thought her son had been influenced by the king's men to dislike Melisandre, but she knew at the back of her mind how her son followed his own rules and never allowed others to influence his thoughts and his opinions. Celis was glad Jacob was here, but knew he was to be gone from her. Her husband still stands by his order, to have their son on the battlefield and in the war. You have barred Shireen and I from attending the wedding, did you not read my messages given by Ser Godri faring days ago? The queen said. It is safer for you and Shireen to stay at the wall. The north is cold and harsh, a snowstorm is coming and enemies lurk at every corner. I may allow a northern girl to be my good daughter, but please my lord. Don't rob me of the opportunity of seeing our son getting married. I will leave a portion of the queen's men with you and I would even leave Jacob's reach man knight to protect our daughter. The grim knight is better off protecting our son, since you want him to die in that dreadful snowstorm. You will not test my patience, woman. He is a man and he will stand and fight, his boyhood days are long gone and you will have to accept it. As you wish, my lord. Celis lowered her head, it didn't matter what Stannis thought. Jacob was still her little boy, even though he was a man grown and ready to fight. The communication may have improved, but the relationship was still strained, all relating to the failures of Stannis not being able to sit on the Iron Throne and most of the other forces abandoning him for richer pickings and the Lannisters. The Queen would keep Shireen close to her as a result. She may have had her son ripped from her by the war, but still had her daughter, her little princess and heir to the throne if Jacob died. She ignored whatever feelings she had towards her dead traitor uncle, it was his fault why the smuggler was appointed hand and why Jacob distrusted House Florent. My son will be taken away from me again, but I must be strong for Shireen. She will need me for days to come and will need comfort for when her brother is gone again. I am fortunate I will be seeing my boy for one last time. Celis was not alone. She had Uncle Axel with her and several loyal Queen's men with her, apart from Sirs Richard Horp and Justin Massey, who will be journeying south with her husband and son for the rest of the war. She was confident those belligerent knights will be competent enough to keep their rightful prince safe from their enemies. After the evening meal between all members of the royal family, Celis sent Shireen to her chambers early, whilst her uncle and husband had things to discuss in terms of the arrangements for the protection of the queen and princess, whilst the king and prince were going to be fighting in the north and maybe further south. The tension between Jacob and Axel has decreased, and the two have learned to get along with one another. It gladdened the queen's heart because she didn't want her son at a war of words with his last remaining uncle. Celis realized Jacob wasn't in his chambers, but wanted to stand at the East Watch balcony and see the view from the castle tower. The queen knew her son was intrigued by history and liked looking from the highest point of any castle, just to see the view outside of it. It was a habit developed from his time fostering with the scheming Tyrells and their bannermen houses. She would not have allowed her son to be fostered by those ambitious cutthroats, if she had a say in Jacob's fostering. He doesn't speak, unless it's with his father and sister. My boy has become sullen and quiet, since his time at Castle Black. My husband informed me of his budding friendship with the idiot Lord Commander I'm glad he put an end to it. A prince shouldn't socialize with those beneath him. The Queen could see by Jacob's face of how the war has made him isolated, to have no highborn friends around him and for him not to talk to anyone, apart from those in his small circle. Long ago, before the war, Jacob had good relations with other houses, but now her boy has been branded a rebel and a traitor to the throne he is the rightful heir of, after his father. Celis went up the steps of the tower. She had briefly seen Ser Sorel, her son's sworn shield, but he was as sociable as a man without a tongue. Was she right to place her hope and trust in this strange man from the south to protect her son on the battlefield? Her eyes caught on a figure standing in the balcony with the full view of the northern landscape, covered with snow and the harsh winds blowing through. Her heart ached to be separated from him again, but this was her last chance to see him, and be his mother before he was to leave her again. Jacob looked more Baratheon than he did Florent. It was always the case, since he was born. Celis was fortunate, he never inherited the prominent features of her house which made her family the most mocked house in the Seven Kingdoms. She didn't like how some of his good looks reminded her of the dead pretender Renly, but the man was her son's uncle and respected it. Mother, I didn't see you arrive. Not with any queen's men. 
Jacob said, turning around to face his mother. Your father and uncle are discussing the arrangements for your sister and I. Celis replied, not in the cold tone she would use with her uncle, but the softer tone of a mother. I have seen things mother, in my dreams and in my head when I was at Castle Black. I don't know what they are, but father says they are a manifestation of what men go through after fighting long wars. You have been fighting too long, my son. And I will have to fight again, for one last time. To liberate the North and Riverlands from the rule of Lannister lackeys, who are cursed by the gods. The North is a harsh place, Jacob. I don't want you to die out there, without me ever knowing. The Queen said, with tears falling from her eyes. Celis was not the kind of woman for tears and sentiment, but for her son she was willing to let her guard down, just for Jacob to see the human side of her. To see how afraid, she was for him and his safety, as a mother to a future king and the lady of a dying great house. Jacob could see things on his own accord, it was what made him a player in the Game of Thrones, it was how he survived through being kidnapped and fighting a battle against unclothed savages beneath the wall. I won't die, mother. I see it your eyes, you fear for me. It's been a long time, since I truly had a chance to stop and think about everything. The war and becoming someone's lord husband, it's a responsibility Uncle Robert has been preparing me for, and I will not disobey father again. I will marry the Mandalay girl after we have recaptured Winterfell. Your father chose the Karstark girl for you, why did you refuse it? It was your father's wish for you to wed her. The Karstarks are kin to the Starks by blood, and were one of the only houses, who pledged themselves to our cause. Lord Ricard and his sons are dead, mother. The current Castellan is a poor excuse for a man and his own son Cregan is the dirt under my shoe. I would rather die than allow those men to manipulate father and to possibly get him eliminated by turning their cloaks to the Boltons. Why choose the Mandalay girl? The Mandalays are the richest house of the North. The winter is coming soon, and we will need food, provisions, horses and more men to fight for us. Father may not like Lord Wyman, but his gold will help us survive the war and possibly the winter. You have truly grown up, war has changed you. For the good and the bad. I may see a man in front of me, but you are still my little boy. I would have chosen a southern bride for you, and stopped you from fighting the war any further. I see what it's doing to you, you will never live a normal life after the war. You knew what the Mad King's rebellion had done to your uncle. He was never the same after all the violence and fighting. Mother, I knew what was happening to Uncle Robert. I saw those vultures trying to pick off his weaknesses to gain power for themselves. I regretted not being there in his hour of need, and I couldn't even say goodbye to him. Jacob said, with tears beginning to leave his eyes, and his head lowered in sadness. Celis opened her arms for her son to fall into them. His head was resting on her shoulder, and tears were falling from his eyes. Jacob was missing his uncle, and he couldn't express it towards his bitter father. She was the emotional pillar Jacob needed he was surrounded by stone-hearted men, who didn't understand the concept of human emotions. Her arms were wrapped around her son. The queen wasn't used to her boy being vulnerable in front of her, he only reserved his emotions for the smuggler hand. She hated how Jacob would rely on Davos to help him deal with his growing emotions and had not come to his own mother for advice. Celis knew Jacob was a grown man, and would shut out his true feelings towards his father because she knew how stubborn and hard-headed Stannis could be. Her son pulled out of her arms, and looked at the view beyond Eastwatch by the sea. The queen herself didn't like the place, it was an empty castle near the wall and it was where she had been stationed on her husband's orders. But if Jacob saw the beauty is such harsh lands in the north, then maybe he might be able to love the northern girl chosen for him. I don't want to leave how will I explain to Shireen why I am always gone and how I never stay with her. What if I die and she doesn't understand why? Jacob said sadly. Your sister is old enough to understand such things. She may be young, but she sees what is happening around her. Celis replied. She shouldn't have to. I may have had my innocence taken by Uncle Robert's death, but I don't want Shireen to have her childhood taken away from her by war and strife. Your sister is a princess, and you are the heir to the throne. The future of House Baratheon is on your shoulders. 
you and Shireen are the last trueborn Baratheons left. The northern girl has a great burden on her shoulders, you will have to share the burden with her. What burden mother? The girl is to be your queen and the mother to future Baratheons to come. As your mother, I will do my duty to guide her any way possible, as a queen and a wife. I didn't know you cared so much, mother. Long ago, you never even thought of agreeing to have me married off to a northerner. Your father ordered the marriage be with a loyal Stark vassal, but Uncle Axel has warmed more to the plot, only because he wants your father's favor. I have said my goodbyes to Shireen and Uncle Axel after supper. I do not like having Horp and Massey with us on the journey south. The Queen's men will cause problems for father and will prevent him from getting any allies. I entrusted those men to protect you. All the King's men will be traveling south with you and your father, and the remaining Queen's men will stay with me and your sister. It's only fair a few of my loyal men accompanied you. I will compromise on the account they stay away from the Northerners. Only father and I will enter the halls of the mountain clans. I will have to brush on my political cunning and persuade these men to join us against the Ironborn. Do as you can. The queen said, placing a hand on her son's face. His eyes light up with joy and a smile appeared on his face. Queen Celis may seem like a cold-hearted woman on the outside towards her men and those around her, but with Jacob she could be a mother and show another side of her. Her heart was weighing down on her, having to see her boy for the last time before he was gone from her. She loved him with all her heart, and would be torn to pieces if she lost him to this dreadful war. She didn't want to be one of the countless mothers, whom had lost their sons in the war. Celis would have prayed to Rolaller every night in devotion for him to protect her son, whilst he is at war and to make sure he lived long enough to see her again.